Good morning, hello and welcome. A very warm welcome, in fact, uh, in more ways than one. Welcome to Goodwood Revival 2023. It is a sellout event. Everyone is arriving bright and early this morning and we have got a jam-packed schedule. Three days celebrating vintage fashion, iconic cars, and we'll be having an immersive delve into yesteryear. Celebrating the circuit's first decades, the very best in automotive engineering is showcased across 15 races and tributes paid to the great and the good of this fantastic track's unique history. today's schedule so we'll be kicking things off on two wheels 200 motorcycles take to the track just after nine o'clock then it's practice sessions that kick off the morning we've got that track parade lotus 75 years celebrating that british mark at 11 25 and uh, 12 15 there we've got the st mary's trophy presented by a model of course, we are celebrating a year that marks the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And then we will continue with racing, uh, more practice sessions throughout the day. Uh, we have a tribute to Carol Shelby at 3.30 p.m., over 100 years marking his birth. And the practice session for the Richmond and Gordon trophies will be at 3.50. One of our favorites, the RAC TT celebration at 420, followed by the Glover Trophy, Sussex Trophy, and that last practice session of the day, the St. Mary's Trophy. And our first race, the Freddie March Memorial Trophy, will kick off this evening and going into dusk at 6.30. What a schedule. We cannot wait to get going. Well, there we have it, an absolutely packed day. Obviously, practice will be getting underway very shortly. Joining me now, we have David Green and Rosie Tapner. Guys, looking absolutely dashing. We have stepped back in time. We love doing it, but it's not just about the fashion. It's about the racing as well. David, tell us what is in store. What are we celebrating over the course of well, this weekend? So much to see here. You're looking around. We've got all these fantastic cars and so much to celebrate in terms of dates and anniversaries. We've got 75 years of the famous Lotus brand and Carol Shelby. He was born in 1923. So you're in 100 this year, so we'll be celebrating his life as a constructor and a driver. Fantastic. And we've just been woken up by the fantastic flyover by the Spitfires. What a great way to start the revival. It's so incredible. It's exhilarating. The hairs are already standing on my on end, um, and it's just only getting better. Rosie, tell us a bit about the fashion and what you'll be doing here this weekend. Yeah, so I'm so excited. Obviously, there's so much action on the track here this weekend, but off the track, we've got a lot of action as well. I'm going to be going around the Revive and Thrive area, looking at the fashion, but also focusing on sustainability. We are talking Revive and Thrive, talking about getting some of your outfits from the past and just redoing them and, and getting some vintage outfits but bringing them back and that's what it's all about but I do feel like I've walked straight into a film set this really is quite something it really is amazing the attention to detail it just blows my mind every year now there's another favorite who we love seeing here at Revival and that is of course our wonderful pit lane reporter who will be down in the assembler area throughout the whole weekend Ed Foster now Ed had a special moment here last year he actually won a race in the Levant Cup, but it didn't all go quite to plan at the start. Let's take a, a look at what happened. Um, he had a bit of a tricky start, shall we say, but then managed to miss the action on track and finished. Well, he took the glory, he took the medal home uh, and had his first win here, taking that finish line at Goodwood Revival. A very special moment for Ed, I'm sure. Uh, but we cannot wait to hear who Ed is going to be talking to over the course of this weekend. He'll be bringing, what a reaction there. He'll be bringing us all of the uh, action from the drivers 
Let's go down to him now. Ed, who can we expect to see on track and what cars are you most excited about seeing? Well, Nikki, uh, thank you for that. Um, many happy memories of last year. Uh, I got home and my mother said I was a bit over the top with my reaction. So there won't be any of those this weekend. I'm in the assembly area. I'm going to be talking to the drivers before they go out. I'm going to be talking to the winners on the podium. But I thought I'd start here because this is a Jaguar SS100 Pycroft Special. And this won the very first motor race here at Goodwood on the 18th of September, 1948. And we're surrounded by history. So, Scott, if you just follow me, um, we mentioned the fact that we're going to be talk we're celebrating 100 years since Carroll Shelby was born. Maserati 250S here, he raced that in period. And if we go down the line, um, you can see the assembly area is already really quite packed. There's an HWM Jaguar here, uh, number 74, and that was driven by Tony Gaze. And Tony Gaze, as many of you will know, was the man that suggested to the then Duke of Richmond that actually the perimeter road of the circuit here would, of the airfield would make a very good circuit. And here we are, 75 years later, celebrating all those years of motorsport. So come back in a bit, and I'll be talking to some of the drivers just before they go out on circuit. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ed. I love how close we can get to all of the cars over the course of this weekend. I think that's the beauty of the revival, isn't it? I mean, we're standing in one of the greatest car parks in the world. So much history and heritage. And you can walk so close, or you can actually kiss it if you really wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it, though. Well, if you look at some of those cars in the Levant uh, race, they are so fantastic, so rare, and obviously so expensive. And we're going to have some fantastic races, lots to look forward to. We've got the Ford War Trophy, which is I'm really looking forward to. We've had that name before at Revival, but for this year, it's all 9-11. So 60 years of 9-11, which is going to be fantastic. It's going, to, it's going to be fantastic. It is indeed. Um, and Rosie, tell us a bit more about what you're wearing today. So, obviously we're still in back in time. Tell us about your fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I've gone very 60s today. I thought we'd start off young and fun for the first day. I'm going to hopefully be going 60s, 50s, 40s over the next few days. But I thought I'd start off 60s, which was always where the colour came in. The dresses got a bit shorter. It was a bit more fun and flirty. Bit of a romantic time as well. The beehive is there. I've got my sunnies just in case because it is going to be warm today. And it was just the time of really good fun. And life just really came into its own. And it was great. Uh, just awesome. So I'm looking forward to seeing a few more girls hopefully wearing their 60s today as well but going through that revive and thrive area we had a little look at it yesterday i don't know if you guys have had a look at it yet but it is amazing and we've got a wonderful stage there where there are going to be talks about the different types of fashion the different eras as well so i'm really looking forward to going down there and it's not just about the fashion it's the music as well so we're going to be really in depth all weekend you're going to be booging we want Absolutely. to see some dance moves watch out brilliant well i can hear the roar of engines going on over there in the assembly area which means only one thing we we are about to kick things off. Let's go to our commentator, Ben Edwards. Well, here we are, looking forward to cars and motorbikes coming out onto the circuit to celebrate the beginning of this 75 years of Goodwood. Wonderful to have you with us. I do hope uh, everyone enjoying the, the ride in. I know it takes a little while to get in with so many people coming in, but uh, once you're here, there is so much to enjoy. And the Duke of Richmond is going to lead things away in a rather beautiful Bristol 400. He'll be uh, taking that around in just a moment. We can see him lined up on the grid right now. Or on his own before we see the bikes come out but that will be the first uh, vehicle that will be going to come out the production of the bristols was post-war in fact about the same time uh, that goodwood began goodwood began in 1948 the bristols were first begun in 1947 and uh, the bristol 400 that was built for some three years up to 1950 and the duke of richmond is about to take this rather glorious version um, bmw engines they would use uh, the the 400s and uh, then, of course, became a very prestigious brand of uh, cars in the UK. And, of course, Goodwood it knows very many prestigious brands, and it has Rolls-Royce just down the road as well. So lots to look forward to. Uh, now, I'm joined in the commentary booth by two two-wheel specialists right now because we are getting ready for a motorbike parade coming up in just a few moments. Uh, Lee Johnson, motorbike racer, and uh, great to have you talking with us this weekend. A many-time winner of the Northwest 200, a road racer with a huge amount of experience. You had a tough start to the early part of the season, Lee, but uh, it's lovely to have you with us to talk about bikes, not just the parade today, but the Barry Sheen Memorial race, of course, which you've raced several times here at Goodwood in the past. 
Yeah, obviously I would I would much prefer to be out there on my bike right now, but with um, with the big crash we had at the start of the year and we're injured. But honestly, it's a, it's a privilege to be at Goodwood, whether I'm sitting here or sitting on my on my motorbike. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here either way, especially with the weather we're having right now. It's going to be a, a spectacle. So I'm really looking forward to this parade as well. And luckily, we've got a, a specialist sat beside us as well. So he's going to inform both of us about what's happening. Yeah, so while we're watching the Duke of Richmond go around in the beautiful Bristol, uh, Ash Dyer has joined us as well. Now, Ash, you're not from far away, and you spend your life working on, on motorbikes. Yeah, motorbikes, um, lots of car work, lots of spanner work for my dad when he was racing. Um, running a, a company now, restoring um, classic Harley Davidsons and um, generally American cars, but British classics as well. Just down the road in Poling near Arundel, so... Yeah, called Grease Stores, all going very well. Have you ever restored any Bristols? No. <laughs> They're slightly <laughs> unusual, aren't they? They are, very strange shaped car, but quite nice. Very pretty, yeah, yeah. very pretty. Um, the American side of things, of course, on the bikes that we're about to be going to look at are the Harley Davidsons, as you mentioned. And what we're going to be celebrating um, are anniversaries, basically, because for Harley Davidson, it's 120 years since the brand began. But they're not the only ones celebrating. We've actually got 100 years of BMW Motorrad, so the BMW motorbikes. And we are, we've actually got some pretty stunning BMWs racing in the Barry Sheen Trophy as well, I noticed uh, walking down the paddock earlier. Um, we've also got a celebration of 125 years of the Norton brand, another famous British brand that had so much success in racing uh, particularly pre-World War II or post-World War II. Um, and then 130 years of the Royal Enfield. Uh, there's not so many of the Royal Enfields, but because there aren't so many of them still around, but uh, they will be there. But it, they're not the only ones. We've got other bikes that will be coming out in just a few moments, and that's what we'll be looking forward to. We're just seeing the Duke of Richmond, though, do this opening lap which is lovely to see in the Bristol 400 around this track that all began on the 18th of September in 1948, um, sanctioned by the Duke of Richmond and making it all come together. This perimeter track of the RAF West Hampton airfield constructed during World War II as a, a relief airfield actually for RAF Tankmere. And, um, and then, as Ed was telling us earlier, they uh, sort of came up with a plan um, Tony Gaze was one of those, the Australian pilot, who uh, was very much a part of Goodwood becoming um, a major part of motor racing. And of course, um, before the war, Brooklands had been key, but Brooklands had been used very much during the war and could not be re-initiated. But Goodwood was in 1948, and that's what we are celebrating this weekend. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen, the Duke of Richmond heading back in in the Bristol for now. We will be seeing plenty more of him over the course of the weekend. And of course, he is the man that has put all of these newer events. Remember, Goodwood Circuit stopped racing in at the end of 1966. There was no racing going on here. There was a lot of testing, but it was the Duke of Richmond um, who then took it all on again. 25 years ago, this all began again with wonderful cars being able to, and bikes being able to race here at Goodwood. So we'll see plenty more of the Duke of Richmond over the course of the weekend and his connections with so many of the racers and drivers and so many of the fans here as well has made a, a very important part of the modern world of historic racing. So there we go. As I say, the bike parade is going to be getting underway in just a few moments. It's the biggest ever parade, actually, that we've ever seen here. Um, some 200 bikes. And after that, we've then got cars coming out. So that's why they're in the assembly area already, uh, because we've got the Freddie March Trophy cars uh, coming out shortly. That will be for their actual qualifying session, and that will be the first race of the weekend. It's going to be this evening. Myself and Alice Powell are going to be commentating on that. Alice is with us already. She'll be um, with me in a few moments' time. But we've got the Barry Sheen Trophy now. The, there, I know, Lee, you've been all obviously walking down there already, looking at some of the bikes. You've raced some of the bikes that are there, haven't you? Yeah, quite a few, obviously. I've done Goodwood now three or four times. Um, and yeah, obviously, when we won uh, with the K Brothers on the MV, that's the bike that Michael Dunlop is now, is now riding this year. So. It's going to be quite hard for him not to win. I think the bike is that good. He's going to curse me for saying this, but no, the, the MV is a, a beautiful piece of machinery and was probably a little bit ahead of its time in, in the other manufacturers with the Nortons and stuff at the time. So, yeah, that's, that's probably my pick for what, what is going to do well this weekend. But as we all know, these older motorcycles, the chances of them all keeping going is the, is the biggest task. And with, with young modern riders that are trying to ride them like modern bikes, it doesn't always help. Right, here we are, looking at the parade. And 
actually, um, Ash, I was just, when I was talking to one of the riders just now before this all began, he did say to me, I wonder if they're aware that you know, there could be a bit of leakage of oh, yeah, these like that, bikes. Um, yeah, these are old bikes. This, so just to, to remind everybody, these mainly are bikes from the 40s, 50s and 60s. We have got some earlier ones, but there, there will be, might be a little bit of oil leak and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, they certainly drop oil, yeah. Um, just nature <laughs> of the beast, really, the way they are. It could make the next practice session a bit yeah, challenging, couldn't They've it? actually got a skid pan underneath with a hole drilled in it deliberately to let the oil come out. Right, OK. So that's, this, this, as a motorbike racer, this worries me greatly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I can imagine all that. The, the bikes won't be coming out straight away, the Barachine bikes coming out a little bit later, but uh, yes, it could be an interesting one for these uh, Jaguar C-types and D-types and all sorts that we're going to be seeing out there in a little while. But the, yeah, the, the parade is, is going to get underway. Um, we're basically celebrating what's called the classic era of 1940 to 1960. And Ash, one of the key things about a lot of the bikes you, we're going to be seeing out there, a lot of them Harleys, but also from the other brands that I was talking about, is that a lot of them were military bikes, weren't they? Yes. There was yeah, a yeah. massive demand on military bikes in World War II. Yeah, huge demand for the dispatch riders, and um, just they used the Americans used the WLA basically as a as a work, workhorse. That's the Harley that's Davidson WLA. Yes. Yeah. And what power? What kind of power? Um, probably, I think they're about 30 horsepower. Um, a seven seven fifty flathead um, side valve. Yeah, very, not much power, but they'll just keep going all day long. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting that, that with, the, with the bikes, um, the modification, so many, so many of them, so many of them were just modified by owners after the, yeah. after the war. So what we're going to be seeing, and a lot of style, what choppers, also... Bobbers started first. Then yeah, so remind, tell me what chopper means on bikes. Choppers later on in the 60s, on a bobber, what they would have done is got your standard military bike and what they call civilianised it. So cut off the rear bumper, put a small lamp on it, bigger bars called Flanders bars, something like that, peanut tanks, um, just personalised them to their own style that they wanted yeah that's the thing isn't it personalization yeah of these, of so many of these motorbikes that were used in the war uh, and then became they all became slightly unique in a way oh yeah i mean they made estimated between 80 and 90 thousand wla's and wlc's during world war ii that's so, an amazing number isn't it oh huge huge there were so many left that they were just cheap giveaway motorbikes that they customized for them for their own use you know and made it how they wanted them to look there we are, look, Harley Davidson name up at the front. Yeah, so just looking at the screen now, is this is this a colour? So quite a lot of people are wearing yellow and black with the they're Harley logo. The, um, That's the, is that a, a, a brand? or yeah, is no, it they're a, called the Hornets. It's another club. Oh, right, OK. It's a club of riders. Yeah. Ah. Uh -huh. well, but you could... Uh, the sound of the Harley Davidson. Actually, yeah. It's very distinctive, isn't it? It is, yeah, banging away. Yeah. Beautiful lady here with the neck scarf on yeah. and the bow and in the wind. This is a lovely opportunity for them to all gather together. Um, and as I mentioned, we are mainly celebrating Harley, but not only Harley, um, we've got a lot of uh, BSAs as well, the great British brand, of course. The BSAs, uh, 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 we've got a great many of those. Uh, the Harley Davidsons, probably more Harleys than, than anything else, but we've got some another American brand, Ash, the Indian, um, yeah. which is a lovely brand as well. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Um, they're, they're 741. B was their military base bike. Um, that was only a 500cc V-twin, but much the same design, flathead, side valve. Not a lot of power, but you know, it gets you from A to B, and they're bulletproof. And I was I was down there earlier looking through the paddock, and both the Harley Davidson and the Indian have um, a clutch on the left foot. Foot but, clutch. But one has one has uh, a gear lever on the right, one has a gear lever on the left. The Indian's got the gear lever on the right hand side because it doesn't have a right hand throttle; it's a left hand throttle which makes it even more complicated. So you've got a foot clutch, a left-hand throttle, and a right-hand gear change. But you do sit on a face and forward, yeah? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's the real trick, going backwards. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> to leave for you as a bike racer, if you suddenly had a, a throttle on the other side of the handlebars, how would that feel? Uh, yeah, I think so. Some of the Nortons that we race and stuff have a, a left-hand gear change, which is OK until you get into a little bit of a sticky situation. And I imagine that would be the same, because everything is, is cool and collected when you're just riding along. But when when there's a bit of a stress moment, that's when it sort of comes to the front. Look at this, it's, it's wonderful. Then there's a very much a military bike. You can see the RAF uh, was still written on it. So uh, many of the bikes here were as they were in World War II, but many others are very much 
developed versions by the owners who, as you, as you say, Ash, bought them very cheaply post-war. Yeah, very, very. The military had to get rid of them. They, they just had so many thousands of them, they had to get rid of them. They were cheap. Well, so, a lot of the American stuff was left over here as well because of the Lend-Lease program. Okay. Um, so basically, we only stopped paying, I can't remember when it was, paying America back in World War II, like 20 years ago or something. So all of their goods, they just went home and left them here. Yeah, so excuse my knowledge of the World War II, but did this all happen because of in World War One horses would have done? No, actually, or, bikes, or, did, bikes did begin in World War One. Yeah, I. they was, did have some bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually picked up the bike industry a bit. I was reading about that earlier. That, that even in World War One, they they were quite significant for getting people about. Mm. Um, and uh, but World War Two was even bigger, you know, because bikes were, were were a big thing by then. And you can remember this? No, no, I was reading. <laughs> I was reading about it, mate. <laughs> but it is key. It is key. And it, and that's what's so fascinating. Here we go with the bikes heading out. And you're getting a very distinctive smell. Um, we've got four strokes and two strokes, which uh, the two strokes, of course, a very distinctive smell, haven't they? And, and a lot of oil we can also smell. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, so they're all lining up. They haven't been given the release yet. They're going to be doing a, a, an out lap, I think, and then a complete lap and then back. Um, although maybe some of the older bikes, we do have some bikes, although this is mainly celebrating the 1940s, 50s and 60s, um, there are a few old bikes out there. Um, there's a, a 1921 uh, ABC, as it's called. There's not many of those around in the uh, in the industry of motorbikes. That was they were created in the the, the company was created in 1914 with a uh, flat twin in 1918, and they created one of the first scooters actually in 1919. They worked with the um, the Sopwith Aero company at Brooklands, and uh, they created what was called the ABC 400. That went on to become quite a popular seller but they stopped producing bikes after 1923. So I think we've only got the one ABC out there. So if you do see that, you're going to be a lucky a lucky person to spot it. Would uh, would this be quite a normal group? Like, or is this is this seen as being a really big group of, of Harleys in one place? Is this something that would it's happen normally a, or no? It's a pretty large collection of Harleys, to be fair, yeah. Um, on your bike rallies and stuff, yeah, you get a lot of them, yeah. We've got a, you saw a four-wheel bike at the end. Well, it's not really a bike, um, but that is actually really, really early. Um, and it, it was about 1900, 1901, I saw it, and they said they might manage just one lap with that one. And, and that is classed as a four-wheel bike, because I'm slightly confused. Well, no, it, looks, right. it isn't actually, I don't think it's quite classified as a four-wheel bike, but it looks like one. It's on, yeah. it's on almost bicycle wheel. Yeah, I was trying I was trying to see, did it have handlebars or did it have a steering wheel? I couldn't yeah. quite see. The, we maybe see now as they come past uh, towards the end. Yeah, we may be able to see it because it's down towards the back. But uh, look at this great contrast that you've got heading out there and this rather wonderful noise as well. Got a, an E-type leading them around. And uh, you can see that everybody has got a, a, a lovely opportunity. This, this guy looks like one of the Viking warriors here with his, <laughs> with his helmet on. This is amazing, isn't it? It's a spectacle for people to be able to see. Ash, did you know that this event was coming? I mean, have you had many people getting in touch with you because you restore Harley Davidson? So have you had anybody come along and say, oh, I need to go to the Goodwood event? No, what well, it was, um, Greg, who's running the Earl's Raceway, he got in touch with me um, and said, can I bring some bikes? And I said, no, but I can get you in touch with the guy who runs the 45ers club, Clint. Um, so they hooked up and basically I think the 45ers bought about 50 or 60 bikes down. Wow. So a fair, fair input from them, which was good. Um, and I think the rest of it basically just gone through everything word of mouth, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's just the sheer variation of colour, size, mm. shape, well, even that, clothing we and, that is, and motorbikes that is as well. The thing after the war, it was all such a personal thing, what you did to your bike, you know. I've restored standard ones, I've restored ones with great big vandal bars on them, painted them gold, painted them blue, you know. what? It's such a personal thing. Um, but it's all on a basic platform as such. The, uh, the military Harley Davidson. Yep. That, does that have any rear suspension at all, or no. is the suspension all in the seat? No, rigid frame and a sprung seat post. Sprung seat, yeah. Yeah, they didn't, Harleys didn't bring out till uh, 58 was the first sprung rear end. Yeah, that was called the Hydroglide. Then, no, the Hydroglide was the one with the hydraulic fork, sorry. And then later on in 58, it was called the Duo Glide. There we have one of the earlier bikes uh, heading around as well. As I said, we've, we haven't got many bikes from the early 1900s, but there are a few to celebrate, which is lovely to see, isn't it? Heading around. We've got quite a few um, 
Nortons, of course, here as well. We're going to see more Nortons racing in the Barry Sheen uh, trophy. The little BSA Bantams there, by the looks of it, the GPR oh, ones. Yeah, actually, those three, the red ones, I was talking to one of the riders earlier, so those three were telegram deliveries. And, and those three guys are actually riders who were doing it at 16 years old. They joined really? the post office and they were delivering telegrams in this Chichester area. They were based at the Chichester uh, post office and their job was to deliver telegrams on these BSA Bantams. And he was telling me to remind it, this is like going back to being 16 years old. And, and all three of them were doing it back in the day when telegrams was the way of communicating because not even everybody had telephones when he was 16, let alone, of course, the way we now communicate online. And they were key to, to delivering telegrams all around this part of the country. Imagine how that must feel for these guys now, never mind when they were 16, getting given a motorbike and saying, right, go and do this or deliver this as a job. It must yeah. have been amazing both then and now. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. He said, uh, I said, how did it carry on? He said, well, when you were, when you got to 18 working for the post office, you, you had to move into full-time post office job, which was a slightly different thing. In the end, he went off to a different uh, part of the industry. But he absolutely yeah, had such great memories. But look at these other bigger, bigger bikes as well. I mean, the, the, Bantams, the, the BSA Bantams only a 125cc. Most of these bikes, Ash, are... 750s, 750 12, and up. 1200, some of them yeah, are. 1000cc. Um, they, they, in America, they do it in cubic inches. So you've got 61 cubic inch, 1000cc, um, 74 cubic inches, 1200cc, and 80 cubic inch is 1300cc. And so Harley Davidson produced some of the bigger, the bigger motors over yeah. the years, even early on. Yeah. But the, um, the basis of what you find now are basically what's left over from the war. Yeah. Uh, all WLs, WLAs, WLCs. Yeah. And that was a 750, was it? That was a 750, yeah. Your WLs, your basic civilian model. C, um, A for American and C for Canadian. Um, South African forces had some. There was, you know, like I say, 30,000 of them went to Russia, believe it or not. Um, yeah, incredible amount. And anything you get back from Russia is... Um, seriously badly broken i yeah. can imagine but lee we've got some fantastic faces out there haven't we some people really enjoying themselves it's just the sheer variation of outfits we've got a young lady here now in a set of dungarees with a, an open face helmet smiling on her on her manx norton it's it's absolutely incredible there was a nice survey car out there the harley davidson three-wheeler okay they um they were based on the 750 engine, but believe it or not, they made that engine from 1937 wow. to 1973 when they stopped making survey cars. Exactly the same engine. Same engine for that long? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. From 37 to 73. What yeah. did they do that just as a bit of an advert because it's just the number turned around? I don't know. I think they just um, stopped making the survey cars as such. I, I, I'm not really too sure. But yes, I think it's one of the longest running productions of an engine in, in history. Oh, lovely. It's a, it's a, here we go. They're going to go around for one more lap and then they'll be heading back in and uh, then they'll be all lining back up on the field um, to uh, sit and watch everything else that's going on today. And everybody who is here at Goodwood will get a chance to walk past these bikes and just pick up some of the remarkable history of them and the way that they've been changed, adapted, modified and are still running, which is, which is lovely to see, I have to say some of these big devices as well and people who are just enjoying getting a wonderful ride out there that man's doing an awesome job of keeping his hat on and that sidecar <laughs> for, for starters it's absolutely beautiful that's quite an old model is it ash that they're yeah the flat tanker yeah normally 1915 to 20 something like that i like the plastic bag wrapped around his leg to stop the oil going all over him no way is that what <laughs> I was talking to uh, another rider. I mean, that's what, as you say, one of the earlier ones. Um, one of the other brands, which there's not many of, is um, the Triton, which was a combination of Triumph. And we've got plenty of Triumphs out there, actually. We haven't mentioned, but there are plenty of Triumphs out there. But the uh, Triton combination of Triumph and Norton was... Yeah, it was the Manx Norton, well, the featherbed frame, the famous featherbed frame with um, twin-cylinder Triumph engine in it. Yeah, be it from a T120R or whatever you lay your hands on, really. So, so some people felt the Triumph engine was the better bit, but the Norton frame was the other better bit. Yeah, the Norton frame was definitely deemed as the better frame than the featherbed frame, yeah. You get a slim line and a wide line. Uh, look at that style of uh, riding. <laughs> yeah, just got her legs wrapped around, wrapped around the rider. That, I don't think there's any rear... Is there any rear foot pegs on that bike, or is that, that for that reason? That's your classic bobber style, that, that kind of bike. It's basically built for one person. So right. She's just sitting on... Well, they, 
they thought about how to just sit on the back of the bike. Yard. I was looking at some of, some of the seats on some of the Harleys are huge, and some of them are, are tiny, narrow. So they all have different names, presumably, as to the, the different yeah, types of seats. Yeah, you get some of this big seat. I'm a bloody name right now. Um, but you get your wide saddle seat, and yeah. you get your little bobber seat. Um, I've totally forgotten. Oh, they made, don't worry, no, no, no. Of a big long seat, which is very, very ugly. But um, yeah, no, no. It's all part and parcel of the different styles that that, that people have mm. and uh, have adapted to over the years. I, I think I would require a rather padded seat, having no rear suspension. I would, I would like to try and make the bike as comfortable as possible. Even on this this racing circuit, which is is pretty smooth, you can see the bike bob up and down as it as it goes along. Look at this. This is amazing. Yeah, this is a very early bike. You look how narrow those tyres. I mean. They're, Basically, they're like bicycle tyres, aren't they, from those very early periods of creating motorbikes. That is a... I think that's a Royal Enfield, what they call... During the war, they called them a flying flea. OK. Um, it was another bike that was deposited from aeroplanes, like your little whale bikes, the para bikes. OK. So um, will, will that be a 50cc or a, a 125, oh, something like that? It's quite a small... Were, I think they were 50, possibly 100cc. But they've actually got the early ones, they've got rubber band front suspension on the forks. Okay. If it, it possibly an early one, I can't see. No, that's got spring in it. So, I tell you what, actually, Royal Enfield. Interesting, you talk about Royal Enfield because the four-wheel sort of bicycle with a motor on the back. We were talking about. Do you call it a motorbike? Um, I haven't actually seen it going around yet, but it is. It was out there. That's a Royal Enfield. The, the quadricycle, I think it was called, mm -hmm. um, and that had a De Dion engine. So De Dion was, of course, uh, one of the very earliest creators of cars, and they created that uh, that. That, that four wheel that was a Royal Enfield in uh, 1899. Um, Royal Enfield started building actual motorbikes in 1901. So, so yeah, we do have a few of the Royal Enfields here this weekend. Um, obviously, a, a brand that's not quite as uh, big as the Harley Davidsons. So basically, what you're saying with that information is car people have to thank bike people for yeah. for the, the basis of their motor Absolutely. vehicle. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. You know, and we had uh, companies like uh, Singer and Sunbeam coming into bikes and then going into cars as well. Um, and we do have some of those here this weekend. There is a, a, an early Singer uh, motorbike here. Um, and they, they were racers from 1909 to 1914. So um, racing in motorbikes, of course, started very early. Um, Isle of Man TT, something you know well. Um, that started in the, in, in the 1900s, sort of 1905, 1906, wasn't it? The first TT, 1907, I think. Um, and so, so some of the bikes that we've got here this weekend were from that period, even though this main part of this parade is, as I mentioned, the 40s, 50s and 60s, and those military bikes that Ash has been uh, telling us about as well. Yeah, it is a nice style. This is amazing. If you can see this on the screen right now, this guy is proper chilled, cruising along with his shorts and braces on, open top, what I would call a cannon helmet, where you, you look like you're going to get fired out of a cannon. But, yeah, it just... Absolutely, only a good wood would you see such a thing. That's a small BSA, I think it's a C10. Um, they did a magneto version, an electronic, that looks like the electronic. One was a C10, one was a C12, I think. Okay. Uh, memory testing me now. BSA was such a, a brand in the UK, wasn't it? I mean, it was the, the biggest brand of motorbikes in the UK. Huge, yeah. And a key part for so many people growing up and getting their first opportunity of transport uh, for so many people growing up in the 50s and 60s, for example, getting to that age where they could, they could actually find uh, something that would get them a bit further than just walking, it was usually motorbikes then. Uh, cars, of course, were becoming a bit more common, but they, they weren't so common for youngsters. It was motorbikes very much. BSAs were often the key part of that. So it's lovely to watch, lovely to see this experience of these older bikes and for riders who have maybe restored them themselves or maybe they've been members of the families. You know, I can imagine that with many of these bikes, they've been uh, owned by fathers, grandfathers, and have, have kept in families for, for many, many years. Yeah, very much so. We just got on a um, ticket, picked a bike up yesterday. It was a Rocket Gold Star BSA that was, um, unfortunately, the chap died and his son's got in contact with us and wants it all just nicely reassembled. And, so, yeah, it's, like you say, very much so kept in the families and through bloodlines, and, yeah, um, it's good that they keep them alive, though, you know. Yeah, it creates a beautiful memory, I think, to be fit to have something that your your dad at a certain age got all this enjoyment out of, and, and, yeah, and you get to complete the whole process again. And 
luckily for us nowadays, Goodwood Revival gives you that chance to be able to come here and do that. And maybe your dad was here before you, so it's it's a very very rare occasion to be able to to do the same thing. Lee, your dad got you a bit more into racing, and he? he didn't have old bikes himself, but he took you along to uh, to bike racing quite early in your life. Yeah, obviously, with with growing up in Northern Ireland, road racing was sort of the pinnacle. Between that and rallying, is the two biggest sports in our in our little country. So. Yeah, luckily for us, it was always on our doorstep, and um, you got to see your heroes going very fast, very close. So, yeah, it was a, it was a brilliant childhood to, to be able to witness that. That's what got you tempted to get involved, yeah? Yeah, unfortunately, that's what's uh, given me the bug. <laughs> well, it's lovely. Uh, it's really great that it's given you such a, a great thing to get build up on. That's a rather wonderful outfit, isn't it? All part and parcel, of course, of the weekend here at the Goodwood Revival, celebrating um, the 1940s, 50s and 1960s and uh, people are asked to, to wear uh, kit from that period and I have to say it is beautifully done by so many people and we get these remarkable images. So, lovely to watch. We'll be seeing some cars out on track in just a moment but let's take a look back at the parade from the bikes. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. As the official luxury cruise partner of Goodwood Revival, visit our spacious cruise ship at Gate 2A as we celebrate the romance and glamour of luxury travel. We'll capture you looking your very best. You can chat with the crew and enter to win an unrivalled VIP experience with Regent Seven Seas Cruises aboard the world's most luxurious fleet. Come on board and discover why Regent is the best luxury cruise experience on the Seven Seas. Well, the wonderful thing about Goodwood Revival is it brings the, some of the greatest talent in motor racing. And I'm delighted to say that we have a very special guest here with us this weekend. Let's go down to Ed Foster and find out who. Jensen, Al, I, I love the months of preparation that go into an event like this. And uh, Jensen, I'll start with you because I think you drove this car for the second time down the road yesterday. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I, I own a car here at the Revival, but I've never actually driven on a track. So um, yeah, today going straight into qualifying probably isn't best, but I've got this weapon with me, Al. So Al's done a bit of, bit of driving in this. What have you done? You've done Monaco? 
done a lot of racing in it, not for 10 years, so it's been exactly 10 years since I was last in it, so yeah. but you won. got a few laps on the test, which what is good. You, what did you win? Uh, Monaco Historic twice in it, Le Mans Classic and Silverstone, so yeah, we've done, done a lot in the car, it's going to be nice, real nice to get back into it, to be fair. Does your apprentice listen to you when you try and tell him things? <laughs> yeah, he actually is, to be fair, yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, I've just sort of explained what the car's like on the outlap and, you know, there's a few things that you need to be aware of with it, but no, we're going to send him out for the first time. It's not ideal to be going out straight in quali, but at the end of the day, he'll, he'll get the job done. Look, the, the car's it, it's really one of those cars you just sort of jump in within the first few laps, you're easily onto the grip of the car. So, really, it's just down to the, get the braking points right and, you know, he'll be right there on it. So so basically, no pressure. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really easy to drive. It's <laughs> lovely to drive, yeah. Joseph, you came to the Revive a couple of years ago, and obviously back now. Um, driving historic cars on a circuit like this, it's, it's very different to kind of everything else you've done, isn't it? Uh, it is, it is. But um, to be fair, this year, I've only driven cars that have no downforce. So I've driven in NASCAR in the Cup Series. I drove in NASCAR at Le Mans. So... I sh it should feel a bit more natural to me. It's a little bit lighter, but it should feel a bit more natural going a bit more sideways. And um, yeah, it's always fun coming here. And I think a, a lot of guys that come from downforce cars to this, initially it's a shock, but it's so much fun. We don't get to drift in, you know, in F F1 car. If you do, you, you're facing the wrong way. So no, it's, uh, it's definitely a cool experience. Guys, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And here we go. The cars are coming out straight away. Uh, in preparation for this qualifying for the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. And I'm glad to say Alice Powell has joined me. Alice, isn't it a beautiful morning? It is. It's a lovely morning. And I was amazed already for Friday, the amount of people that have turned up to come and, and watch. So great to see the, the bikes. I was stood up, lucky to stand up with you in the commentary box. They were just amazing, <laughs> fabulous models out there. And fabulous looking faces too, weren't they? Yeah, that's, I think you should try and grow a beard like that, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there were some great views. We've got uh, full face crash helmets on now. They have to have full face crash helmets on in open cars, understandably. But this is the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. So this is celebrating the Goodwood nine hour races, which were held from 1952 for, and 1953 and 1955. And there you are on board Jensen Button's car, in fact. Um, and so this car that uh, Jensen is sharing with Alex Buncombe, and uh, they were talking about it a moment ago, we've now got an onboard camera with it as well, which is going to give us a, a lovely view. There it is, and you can see already he's uh, just getting to grips with machinery, and I think it's great. And we're so lucky to get such a, an array of drivers here, especially people like Jensen, and there's, you're going to see so many of them racing around in different kind of categories this weekend as well. Yeah, uh, just playing around with it at the moment, getting it, uh, getting a bit of feel. We've got quite a few Jaguar C-types. I tell you what, this car that that Jensen actually owns. Oh, and we've got a, a Jaguar C-type off already. Uh, that's the uh, Fred Wakeman, Sam Hancock car. Uh, both very experienced drivers. So I would imagine that that is a uh, mechanical issue, probably, that has occurred to the number 11 car. Yeah, it doesn't look like he's uh, gone off or hit anything, so that's really unfortunate because obviously this is the only official practice that they will get uh, before, yeah, before they go out again later on today. You're looking at something slightly different there. That's the Fraser National Le Mans replica. Uh, raced at Goodwood um, in 1955, so a car that would have been here many, many years ago. Um, and actually, it's an ex-Tony Brooks car, and as we mentioned, Tony Brooks was one of the key people to making this whole Goodwood event come together, or the Goodwood circuit come together. So you're seeing a, a real mixture of lovely machines, um, sports cars racing in those uh, 1950s periods, and we're celebrating this year is actually the 70th anniversary of the second of the nine-hour races, funnily enough, and we're capturing the the spirit of those races but we're not going for a full nine hour race but we are going for a two driver <laughs> race aren't we yeah no i think uh i think they should maybe have just gone for it why not but uh <laughs> yeah this first race as you said ben was won by peter collins and pat griffiths back in 1952 as uh, we can already see I, I, I was just wondering when we saw some of the bikes going out whether that's going to make the track a little bit slippy for some of these drivers uh, going out of these, these old machinery so it'll be interesting to see how they cope with that because there was a, a few bikes that looked like they were chucking out some uh, some fumes this is uh, Connaught uh, the ALSR 1.5 
this is a bit more unusual. You won't see many of these. It's actually a sports car based on a Formula 2 car. Um, and Les Leston, who was a racer in period, he won the class at the Goodwood Nine Hour in 1955 in this car. Um, and uh, it's Peter Mann who's the entrance of this. Uh, it's a car that has uh, regularly been raced by John Ewer. Uh, so it's been back here at Goodwood for many years. It's, it's sort of at home for it almost. 1954 it was actually made. And uh, Paul Griffin and Will Nuttall are sharing it this weekend in the event itself. And of course, some of the cars are going to be very rapid and going for the race wins. Others are not quite so quick. They might be earlier versions, but it's still a, a wonderful weekend to enjoy in this stylish machinery. Now, I'm not seeing much oil down. What are your, what are your thoughts on the track conditions? Well, that actually looks pretty good, doesn't it, to be honest, Ben? Um, it's very different from the members meeting that we experienced earlier on in the year. Where I'm, I'm pretty sure the practice sessions on the Friday were a little bit wet, so we were blessed with the really nice weather this weekend. So I'm expecting track conditions to be fairly good. Looks like the gra bit of grass I saw early on being chucked up by a few of the cars. Dry grass as well, which will float about and stay on the track a little bit. Uh, but it looks pretty good, I would say, at the moment, which is obviously a great sign for the drivers. It does, yeah, absolutely. And they, they prepare all the grass and everything so beautifully, don't they? It's all so wonderfully mowed and so elegant as well, um, which is great to see. So just heading down towards uh, the end of the long, long straight, Martin Hunt and Pat Blakeney Edwards' car. This has actually set the pace so far, the number 74. This is the HWM Jaguar of 1954. It's another ex-Tony Gaze and a Peter Whitehead car. So again, this was very much a, a key car in period of racing here at Goodwood. And it has set an initial pace, uh, 131.6 it now goes to. But we will see quite a few changes in those lap times coming up. Yeah, and it's actually quite interesting, Ben, with the pace set already. It just gives you a sign of the track conditions. But the pace last year was a 131.3. It was pole position, so already getting pretty close to that. Gosh, yeah, no, that's impressive. We're only three tenths away. Um, that is impressive. Last year, the uh, the race was won by Frederick Waitman and Sam Hancock in the C-type. Uh, we had a C-type 1-2, actually, because we had Nigel Webb and John Young. Um, we've had a Maserati win a couple of years ago, Aston Martin DB3 back in 2017, and we've got uh, a couple of Astons here this weekend as well. So it's going to be fun to watch and see and what the changes are. But at the moment, this is very much the car that's setting the initial pace. It's a big entry um, as well. 28 cars have so far set a time, so it's impressive. Yeah, and we've got some great drivers as well. We've got Darren Turner out there, Manuel Piro, Jake Hill, Jensen Button, Alex Brundle, and the list goes on and on and on. People will be shouting, say, you've missed this person, you've missed this person, but pretty much in every car that's out there, we have got a very competitive driver. So uh, one of the races to look forward to for the weekend. Definitely, I agree with that. And uh, as you say, actually, the number, I'll keep my eye out for the number 16 uh, car, the Cooper. Jaguar as well, because that's uh, Katerina Kivalova and Vanina X. They're sharing um, a, a car, the, the number 16 Cooper Jaguar. With, oh, and there is a slight spin for the James Cottingham, Alistair McKay Ferrari. Um, Looks like he's kept it going, but it's quite busy out on track with 28 cars uh, beating around. Let's have a look whereabouts on circuit that might be. It's quite hard to, to say. Oh, so it's actually a woodcut. So one of the trickiest corners on the track. Let's have a look. He's on the brakes. He's getting it sideways, gets it on the grass, nearly saved it. And then <laughs> just last minute, a bit dusty there offline. You can see all the dust being kicked off. So that's a really tricky corner, Ben, because you're coming in so on the brakes. You can see when they're turning in there that they, uh, they haven't got the wheels straight because naturally that's the, the way the track goes and then it bleeds into the chicane. So a really tricky corner there, as being demonstrated by the 82 car. Definitely helps when the grass is dry when you do something Definitely like that. Definitely does. Definitely does. <laughs> it is dry, and we know it's going to be very dry over the course of the weekend. So, uh, But it's uh, back up to speed. This is a beautiful Ferrari, a 500 TRC to 2 litre. Um, you've got a big change, a difference in power, really, of some of the cars that you've got on this group. Some of them have got 1,500cc engines. For example, the Connaught we were looking at earlier. Um, you're looking at uh, a 3.4-litre 
powered, a Jaguar powered HWM at the moment. They're the number 56 car. Um, and actually, at the moment, I think it's Gregor Fiskin at the wheel. Jake Hill will be taking this car over. And because it's a two driver race, that, that each, each of them will go out in this qualifying session for a certain period. And maybe Gregor will hand over to Jake Hill. Within the next five minutes, Jake will no doubt be very quick in it. Yeah. Our, uh and we can see just from uh, from if anyone watched the uh, Festival of Speed and even the members meeting here, Jake was, uh, he's never really going in a straight line, is he? It seems to be a quick way for him, but he's always ragging whatever car he steps into. But as you said, Ben, I expect that he'll be hopping in very soon. I'm, I'm just looking out of the commentary box window. We've got cars coming into the pit lane already to, to make ch driver changes. So, but the times are tumbling. Look, already we're into the one, deep into the 130s. Yeah, that's impressive isn't it so uh, the fastest car so far is the Richard Wilson Richard Bradley Maserati 250s uh, that's actually quite a heavy car there it is yeah I think it weighs around about uh, near about 700 kilos and then you said about difference in engines we've also got a difference in weight with uh, I'm guessing it's going to be the Cooper Climax Bobtail which is the, the super lightweight weight weighing around about 400 kilos so I think that's a great thing about these kind of races is they all have a benefit. Some are lightweight, some are powerful, but that's what makes it so close. No, I agree. You're absolutely right. Um, they increased the engine size, but made it heavier <laughs> uh, with this Maserati 250S. So it does have a 2.4 litre straight six engine. Um, uh, but interestingly, one of the greats of motorsport, Jim Hall, took his first win in this very car. They were only made two. Apparently, this one was driven by Jim Hall and by Carol Shelby. And of course, Carol Shelby is going to be celebrated all weekend here at Goodwood. No, exactly. And uh, that car is certainly not hanging around <laughs> at all, is it, Ben? In the 129s now. Wow. Yeah, 29s. My goodness, to see this group, as you said, um, looking at what they had done before, that is impressive. Impressive lap times. Look, I think it's coming into the end of this lap. It looks as though there's going to be a swap over between Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley. Um, but this is obviously working extremely well, this car at the moment. Uh, the Maserati showing good pace. Second fastest, though, is the Jensen Button Alex Buncombe <laughs> car, the C-Type, that Jensen was talking about uh, a little while ago with Ed Foster. And it's interesting that they've already got that second fastest time. Uh, oh, oh, no, there's been a contact. Oh, that's such a shame. That's the Gary Harmon, Nick Fernborough, Cooper Jaguar, the T33. An original car, oh, that always hurts to see oh, something like that. That looks like this had a spin round and made contact with the wall, Ben. I mean, it's, yeah, it doesn't look like it's running very true on the front left there. A little bit, looks like maybe some bodywork is rubbing as well. So that's definitely going to be uh, coming into the pits. Let's have a little look. Oh. Yeah. So actually, it doesn't oh. look as bad no. as, a, as, it, as I thought it was going to be, but that's definitely going to warrant a trip into the pits. Absolutely, as you say, I thought the hit was harder, but it's obviously very thin bodywork, such thin bodywork to keep the weight down that even a, a bash like that has done. Yeah, a lot you can of see that that's the bodywork just rubbing there, so that's going to have to come in and uh, be pulled out if they can pull it out or do anything with that. But doing a great job keeping offline, keeping out of everybody's way who are still pushing. We've got some extra drivers now and the, the number 66 car has just jumped to the top of the times. Oh, really? There you are. The Jensen Button, Alex Buncombe car has gone to the top. So, uh, well, Jensen's always so rapid around here. We've seen him leading races, but things usually manage to go wrong for him, don't they? So we'll see whether it works. Well, he's hoping you're not jinxed him now and it's all going to yeah. go right this weekend. We shall see. We shall see. Um, but uh, you are, as you mentioned, we've seen quite a few driver changes. Jake Hill now taking over from Gregor, as we mentioned. Jake Hill is now in the car, the, the superstar from British Touring Cars, um, who has... Uh, he's having another very strong season this year. Maybe not going to be uh, fighting for the championship quite as tough as he... as hard as he was last year. I think I had quite the same level. Uh, but he is right up there all the time. And uh, Jake is fantastic here at Goodwood. He's been racing here at Goodwood for many, many years and has had a lot of success. And as you mentioned earlier, Alex, he's always fun to watch. He is. He's making his revival debut as well this weekend, racing here. And he's never sat in that car. But I can tell you, don't be phased by that fact, because uh, he will be very, very fast. The number 55 car that you're looking at here is the C-Type of Nigel Webb. 
and uh, Chris Ward that was second here last year. Uh, it was John Young sharing with Nigel Webb last year, but that was a that was a quick car, no doubt about it. The 55 car that is currently down in 14th position on the lineup. So we'll see whether that picks up a little bit more speed as we're beginning to see more drivers coming out. As we mentioned, there's Jake Hill then in the number 56 car. So if you're, you're watching out there, that's the, the one to look out for. A car, the HWM Jaguar, that uh, was a winner at Crystal Palace in 1953. Of course, Crystal Palace was another racetrack, sadly not used nowadays, but when Goodwood was um, on the scene in 1948, Crystal Palace came along not long after that. <laughs> no. As you can see already, Jake is uh, not taking it easy. He's bleeding out now the van corner. And it's also nice, a lot of people, I didn't expect my first trip here to Goodwood. It, how, uh, it's not flat, is it? It's, uh, and it's quite a very tricky circuit, very fast circuit. Jake did demonstrate that in the members meeting, didn't he, when he had uh, a little bit of an off, but he came back through the pack, showing his brilliant driving skills. So showing proudly there the, the BRDC logo on the side of the car as well. Yeah, nice to see. I tell you what, we're, we're Gregor are already setting the fourth fastest time in this session, uh, P4 at the moment. That does indicate that with Jake and his abilities around this Goodwood circuit, they really do have a good chance of potentially strong, taking pole. That's a strong combo. That's a strong combo. And these are all proper racing drivers as well. So as much as they're here to enjoy Revival, enjoy the event, I can guarantee you they will be trying everything to try and make sure they're on the top step as Jake's fighting the car hard through Woodcut and bleeds through the chicane now, constantly making adjustments on the wheel as he heads up the start-finish straight. Over the line he goes, and we'll keep an eye on this lap a little bit. He uh, he was quick in the Gordon Spice earlier this year, the members meeting. Uh, had a big battle with Rob Huff. He actually won the first heat by 0.15 of a second, but uh, in the end, it didn't go so well for him in the second race, so he that dropped him down a little bit. But yeah, let's keep an eye on, on his times here, because I think there is a, a possibility that Jake Hill's going to be challenging the Jensen Button Alex Buncombe car that is currently fastest on a 128.9. Very rapid indeed. Uh, whether Jake can go any quicker, we will find out in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, everyone, he's a little bit down in the, in the first sector uh, compared to the fastest first sector. So he's around about a second off. So he's just uh, his first time, as I said, s sitting in this car. So I can imagine he's just getting acquainted to the, the controls and the feel and the handling of the car as he'll start to, to wind it up. We've still got just over 13 minutes left on the clock. Second fastest, still the Richard Wilson, Richard Bradley Maserati that we have seen putting in some impressive pace. Uh, then the HWM of Martin Hunt and Pat Blakeney Edwards. This car currently fourth that we're watching on screen. Uh, the car that got damaged uh, at hitting the barrier still actually quite well up there. I hadn't realized it was as high as fifth the car that got damaged, but uh, that's where it is right now. And then sixth fastest at the moment is the number eight uh, Cooper Climax of John Clark and Barry Cannell. So, and it's just gone back out the pits, actually. The damage is obviously, uh, I wouldn't say fixed, but maybe altered, so it wasn't, it's not rubbing on the wheel. So we'll have a little look and we can spot that uh, going round. But we can still see Jake Hill lights on now, and usually in a sign in touring cars, that means that you mean business, as you can see, constantly fighting the wheel, never really have a rest through this circuit, especially in the old cars like this, because it's just so fast, Ben. He's got a little bit of traffic in front of him as he heads in through the second part of St. Mary's Corner now. Let's have a look at the slow-mo. Look at that. Look at the way they drift. I love that's what's so great about here at Goodwood. The tires they have to run. There are no slicks, by the way. You don't you're not allowed to run slicks, and of course they wouldn't have done in period. And you get this wonderful drifting. You do. And there we go. There's the damage uh, damaged car that's sitting in fifth place. The 520s back out and uh, no bodywork rubbing now, which is a great sign. I guess it's Nick Fernborough who's out in it at the moment. Um, and as you say, that's good news. So, so although it looks quite damaged, as we saw when, it, when we saw the replay, clearly uh, it's just light damage on bodywork. Very, very thin bodywork. 
there to reduce weight, and they've done well. They've just pulled it off the wheel. It was rubbing against the front wheel when he came back in, but they've got it running well. And you can see it's being driven properly now, really sliding around. Yeah, this is where they'll be turning up the wick now. They'll uh, know that the track will just start to improve and improve after they've been uh, clearing it maybe from some bits that were left on the by the bikes. But in the 128 uh, now, so times are really starting to tumble, Ben, and I expect that they will continue. Maybe we'll head up into the 128.5s. Would we see the 127s? That might be... Uh, a bit too much to ask, but uh, I'm really glad to see uh, see the Jaguar back out. This is going to be a race we're looking forward to later in the day. It's going to be the first race of the weekend. A bit of smoke coming off the number two car. Uh, that's the uh, Ferrari 750 Monza, and it's definitely looking a little bit smoky. You can smell it as well through uh, through the commentary box window. Doesn't see anything, so it's coming. Th yeah, that's. I would say that's going to have to make a trip into into the pits. Famous history car, that one, it was a, a car raced by Phil Hill and Carol Shelby, finished second at the Sebring 12-hour race in 1955. Um, and it won elsewhere in the USA. It was mainly racing in the States, uh, this Ferrari Monza, with its three-litre four-cylinder engine. And I'd hope that three-litre four-cylinder engine is okay, because it's definitely looking a little bit smoky. Now, let's see what Jake Hill does on this lap. He hasn't actually gone as fast as uh, Gregor yet. And whether he's had a clear lap, I'm not sure. He's had to get past a little bit of traffic on this lap. Oh, 31-0 he's just done. So uh, that's a pretty good lap by Jake. And we've just had a mover up the field as well. Someone else, another car joining uh, the Button car in the 128 is the Webb and Ward car, the number 55. That's Nigel Webb and Chris Ward, which is an ex works car the jaguar c type has jumped up now so as i said but it's very very close at the top of the times yeah sorry jake's wasn't actually a 31 i thought it was but no he was uh, a little bit off that still and and uh, so the 31 6 that was set by greg or fiskin that is still the the pace that's been set by that car um, but as you say two cars well two cars in the 28 one in the 29s now so that number 55 car chris ward and nigel webb that we we talked about certainly going well there it is just in that group and uh, second last year and now second fastest oh, oh, oh. big slide but well held well, <laughs> he will say that's all under control uh, just getting a little bit of traffic into the final part of the chicane set to middle a personal best middle sector not quite fast enough i would say to jump up to the top of the times lost a little bit of time in that middle sector but actually, the Button and Buncombe car went purple in that middle sector. So let's just have a look at the replay here. Oh, I wonder if he's just put off ever so slightly with the traffic in front of him. But well held. Very good job. Beautifully done. And yeah, the, the, to the edge of the track was just perfect. Not getting a wheel on the grass. That was lovely. All the car there. You just saw the Fraser Nash Le Mans replica uh, going through. Slightly different looking machine. <laughs> and look at that slide again. Really beautifully done. That is a into St Mary's, the right left. And it's obviously got oversteer, oh. but it's it's beautifully controlled. Looking, well, I would say in control. He's going to say it's in control. Got the 66 car as well. So he's been chased down. So actually on the same piece of track, we have the, the current leading car, the, the Button and Buncombe car, and the Ward and Webb car. So uh, I think it, I think it's probably Chris Ward in it now, and he's an incredibly successful historic racer. I mean, he, uh, over the years, he's won plenty of stuff here at Goodwood. He's won the historic Monaco, uh, winner of the Whitson Trophy here, for example, at Goodwood in the past. And uh, he was a he was a Formula Four champion of Alton back in my early in my days of 1993. So he's he's a, a superb racer, Chris, and I think he's putting together another good lap. And sliding the way he's sliding the car around is is great to watch. Let's just see what this lap is as he comes across the line. Is it any quicker? I don't think it is. No, but the button car has yeah. gone even quicker now. 128.2. So maybe maybe I've got that wrong. Maybe we will dip into the 127s. This is fantastic seeing these uh, these impressive times coming down and down. Jake Hill car as well now has popped up into fourth, getting finally into the 130s. 
as we can see, some, some great on boards. It's Alex, yeah, it's Alex Bumcombe in the car now. Okay. Because uh, Jensen was in it earlier. Um, but he is, he's, doing a, he's doing a lovely job, isn't he? And he is. Those on boards are fun to see. They are great. Yeah. So I don't know there if he's maybe deciding to have a little bit of a, a cool down lap. Notice there's a little bit of traffic ahead because there is a, a big spread across the, the field here. We've got cars that are still in the, the 140s, 141s, and, and what a great view here, Ben. Yeah, actually, Alex is waving. <laughs> I don't know who he's seen down there. Uh, down at Levant, maybe he's got friends watching from down there. There's a, there's a lovely grandstand up on the outside. And he's just having a, a little... I think he's just looked at the TV screen as well and realised we're riding on board with him as well. Maybe, maybe. And the fact that they are fastest with this car, they've got pole position, it doesn't look... Now the tyres are all getting a bit hot. I don't think anyone is actually getting any quicker at this point. No, so he has he has done a really slow first sector and middle sector, so I'm guessing that not only is he trying to get space for traffic, but also just to give those tyres a little bit of breathing space. And saying that, he's popping into the pits, maybe have a bit of bleed of the pressure, because he's still got five minutes left. Unless he thinks, do you know what? We've done a good enough job, so we're, we're going to park it. So we'll wait and see what they do. But there's the mechanics there that are heading into to check the tyre pressures. Yeah, lovely shots from onboard Alex Bunker. I notice, like so many racing cars, of course, the speedometer doesn't actually do anything on that car. It's only the, 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 rev, the revs that shows up. So you have to make sure that you are going extra slow <laughs> coming into the pit lane. You don't want to be caught speeding. No, you can't tell on that speedo. But yeah, it's, you're, it's a good point, though, because um, in the race, they will be swapping drivers, and there are quite uh, strict limits on what you're allowed to do in terms of coming into the pits, the speed you can go at, how long you have to be in the pits before you head out again. No, exactly. So lots of conversations. Jensen's having a good old chat there, maybe trying to pass over some of his advice. But again, this is a very strong combination as it's showing on the timing screen at the moment. That's the number three car you can see at the moment, the Aston Martin DB. 3S and actually they were quite successful weren't they? Yeah. They were undefeated here for, all, for the three occasions uh, of this race so we'll expect them to, to make further further way up the field as they're, they've popped up now currently in sixth place. No you're right and uh, it's being shared by Simon Hadfield and Darren Turner they're both rapid um, they're currently sixth fastest with the DB3 uh, three litre straight six engine and uh, yeah Aston Martin beat Jaguar and Ferrari in each of the three years of the nine-hour Goodwood race. So it, it really did come together for Aston Martin extremely well to be here at Goodwood. Whether they're going to be able to make that work uh, as we go into the 2023 version of the revival, we shall have to wait and see. But, yeah, it's lovely to see it out there once again. We'd feel deprived if there wasn't an Aston out there. It looks like it's Darren Turner behind the wheel of that. We know how successful Darren is behind a wheel of an Aston Martin. Got a little bit of time to find, so 3.6 seconds off the pace at the moment. But uh, the Button and Buncombe car is seven tenths up the road from, from anybody. So uh, hopefully Darren will be able to uh, manoeuvre it a little bit faster around the track to, to make, uh, make himself a little bit further up the field. As you say, a great Aston Martin driver, a GT1 Le Mans winner in the class for Aston Martin in both 2007 and 2008. And uh, he's been a key man for them for, for many, many years. But he's also done very well here at Goodwood. Um, his last Le Mans actually was 2019 with Aston Martin as well. And uh, he was runner-up in the GT1 World Championship with Aston in 2011. So it's, it's been a huge part of his life. And it's lovely to see him racing what... Uh, is a DB3 which has such history here at Goodwood as well. Still uh, the clock ticking away, we're not seeing many changes, many improvements on those lap times. And of course, Alice, as we go through the day, with these high temperatures being forecast, as we're already feeling, um, the, these high temperatures make life a bit challenging, not just for tyres, but engine temperatures, all sorts. They, they've got to be a little bit wary. Yeah, they, they certainly have. Try and make sure that they get cool them as much as possible when they when they come into the pits tire temperatures as well but all very experienced people running these cars as we can see a hand raised there from the number 
31 car probably going to pull into the pits but yes we're already definitely experiencing on my way up here to the commentary box i was certainly feeling the the weather but i'm not going to complain no absolutely we've known far worse <laughs> we certainly have and it's great to see all the cars out there and no restrictions uh, on them being on the track so that's lovely so we've just got under two minutes to go in this first practice session of the weekend the freddie march memorial trophy and the current fastest car is sitting in the pits. It is the car of Jetson Button, the Formula One world champion, uh, having set the pace. Uh, Alex Buncombe alongside him. He's had a good run in the car as well. Second fastest is the one we've got on screen right now. It's the number 55 Jaguar C-Type X-Works car. One of the first of the production C-Types then uh, sold on to customer, and Duncan Hamilton had it. Um, early in his years. Oh, I'm getting ever so sideways, going through oh. a different wheel on the grass on the exit of Woodcut. Still pushing hard to try and uh, close that 7 tenth gap, uh, but decided otherwise. And is he, no, I thought he was maybe coming into the pits. Looks like he slowed down a little bit, a little point to the pit wall. As you can <laughs> see, just kicking up a little bit of dust there. And I'll say, no, it didn't really trouble me too much. But that's going to be a, a corner I would expect full of, of incidents is Woodcook, because it's very, very tricky. We've seen a few incidents there. We saw some earlier this year at the members' meeting as well. But hopefully they can keep it all clean. And uh, with the session ticking away, and the checker flag will be out by the next time he comes back to the line, maybe be coming straight into the pits. Just behind, you can see uh, the white curtain. Uh, Jaguar Hanskin, that's a slightly unusual car, actually, the one behind. Uh, there it is, the number 10. That's, a, that's an interesting machine. That's uh, a, a modified XK120, which was done by Walt Hanskin in America. He, he kind of wanted to get something like a C-Type, but he couldn't get a C-Type. So they, they modified an XK120, and uh, well, they won at Watkins Glen with it in 1953. And that sort of got the contact uh, between Walt Hanskin and Jaguar, which went on to a very uh, impressive career, really, that he had. So this car, fundamental uh, to Walt Hanskin, it's, uh, it's being driven by Peter Hardman and Andy Middlehurst, two very, very quick racers uh, this weekend. So let's hope see how they get on. It's not so far up on the list of times, to be fair. It's quite near the bottom of the grid, so maybe it's not running quite as as to plan, but it's lovely to see it. Yeah, it's a beautiful looking car, as you can see in the background there. Chris Wall raising his hands, so checkered flag is now out, Ben. So I can't see on our timing screen anyone really making any big improvements. So it looks like the button and bunkum car is, is pretty safe for P1. Does look that way. Nice little slide coming through uh, for Jake Hill as he comes over the line. Um, but uh, Jake hasn't managed to... Oh, yes, he did go a little quicker in the end. OK, uh, so Jake did do the fastest lap in that car. Gregor Fiske did a 31.6. He did a 30.0 in the end. So that was uh, pretty good from Jake, but it's not quite as fast as the Jensen Button Alex Bunker machine. That beautiful Jaguar C-Type. And the C-Types have gone well here in this event before. In fact, winning last year, the Frederick Wakeman Sam Hancock C-Type. It was a 1-2 for C-Type, so it's a clearly a car that works extremely well here at Goodwood. And they have set the pace in the session. Second fastest for another C-Type, the Chris Ward Nigel Webb car. And third fastest for the Maserati 250S of Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley. Then this car that we're watching on screen, fourth fastest, and that is the HWM Jaguar, a uh, slightly earlier car from, uh, from 1954. So lovely to see. And uh, we shall see how they all get on later on today in the race, of course. It's going to be our evening race uh, at the end of the day, due to start at 6.30 p.m. Yeah, exactly. So do make sure to stick around. Looking forward to a fantastic battle especially for the lead, but the times are very, very, very close be between some of the rest of the field, P2 and P3 as well. So I I'm expecting some, some close battles and some close fights all the way through the field, Ben. Yeah, me too. I think there'll be some great, great fights going on, some great racing. Um, I noticed the uh, Bobby Verd Pro car is quite a long way down the list. Um, Bobby and Martin Verd Pro sharing a HWM Alter number five, um, 
this was an earlier car. The, actually, the HWM other one I mentioned is, was a 54 car. That was a later machine. But the, uh, the Verdon Row car, 1950, that was raced by Sterling Moss in the 1950s. And uh, originally with a two-litre engine, but then they fitted a Jaguar engine. But the Bobby Verdon and Martin Verdon Row car, that's down in 21st place on the grid. But it, as you say, there'll be battles all the way down between some of these fantastic machines. Exactly, and we've obviously got to have professional drivers racing these cars as well. I can guarantee, even if they're starting out of position and they're here just to enjoy themselves, if they're a racing driver, they're going to want to make as many moves further up the field as possible. It's all about competition. There's another one that slightly surprises me um, that is quite a long way down. Oh, I think it had a, yeah, it had a problem. Um, didn't do many laps. Oh, did it do any? Yeah, did a few. It's the Alex Brundle, Gary Pearson C-type. It's 14th on our list. Um, it did do a reasonable number of laps. Okay, I'm not quite sure what happened. If they had any problems with it, maybe. But that's another Jaguar C-type that I was sort of expecting to be uh, up near the, near the front. But the Alex Brundle, Gary Pearson car, that's a little further down. So that might be one that we see moving up in the race itself. Yeah, exactly. There's plenty you can have a look down that list, of course. But I can sure that tell you that Alex Brundle won't be wanting to hang around in P14. He'll be wanting to make moves <laughs> into the top 10 very quickly. Yeah, he's always very rapid. Had a very good Silverstone Festival uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, always very rapid in historic cars. We're going to see him in Formula Junior, and I tell you what, I, I, I think you and Alex are doing that one, and uh, that's going to be a good... I think Alex is going very quick in that. Let's take a look back then at the practice for the Freddie March uh, trophy, and we saw some wonderful cars out there, particularly the number 66 Jaguar C-Type that Jensen Button went out. It's his very own car. First time he's raced it, though, he was telling us, and uh, it was quick right from the start, that C-Type going through the session, ended up setting pole position. Did by a good seven tenths of a second, but we know from these historic races that doesn't mean anything, but we saw some some great driving out there and some, some offs. We saw some offs, didn't we, from the number 82 car as well, and some great car control as we're getting a good replay of this now, just constantly uh, making corrections on the wheel. Sports cars from the 1950s. Yep, as you said, we saw this moment for the number 82 Ferrari, the James Cottingham, Alistair McKay car, uh, a class winner at Le Mans in the 1950s, and the Maserati also working very, very effectively. But you've got a real mixture of machinery, Jaguars, Allards, Maseratis, Ferraris, Cooper Climax, uh, the Cooper Jaguars, and we saw this incident too, didn't we? That was a, a look like a, a, a nasty one when we saw the damage, but actually the hit wasn't that hard, and Nick Fernborough in the end put in some pretty rapid times. But the Jetson Button car and Alex Buncombe that they are sharing, that is definitely uh, in a top spot. We saw Alex in the car in the second part of the session. This was a rather lovely view, and we also saw plenty from Jake Hill. Yeah, we did. So he'll be another one wanting to make moves further up the field as well. But it's just so lovely, isn't it, Ben, to see different types of cars. You just went rattled through there, the, the variety of cars. So don't forget, as Ben said, looking forward to some racing of this later on at around about 6.30. The 1950 stars, drivers from today getting the best out of them. Been really enjoyable watching the Freddie March Memorial Trophy qualifying.
If you get into one of my cars, you get in the wind. Good morning, hello, and welcome to Goodwood 2023. This is the Action Sports Arena. Well, it's a beautiful day here at Goodwood, and uh, we are looking forward to more action coming out onto the track. But let's take a little bit more detailed look at how the track layout at Goodwood works. Let's take a look at the Goodwood circuit, largely unchanged since its heyday back in the 1960s. 2.36 miles of an unforgiving circuit. The grass banks are close, the grass verges are even closer. Heading off the start, you head first towards Madgwick, an off-camber, tricky right-hander with a bump at the apex. It is so, so important to get the line right and get a good exit as you charge up towards Fordwater. A daunting right-hander, again off-camber, slightly dropping downhill at the exit as well. It is incredibly high speed. Up towards St. Mary's, first goes right, then go left. Don't be too greedy with a curb on the left-hand side and that'll put you offline. The track drops slightly downhill and then back up again towards a double right-hander of Lavin. Getting a good exit and traction out of here is hugely important because that leads you onto the fastest part of the track. Through the little kink, heading towards Woodcut. A long, long right-hander with the apex seems to take an age to get to. The back of the car always edgy and then you get hard on the brakes for the chicane. We've seen many an incident there with drivers getting just a bit too greedy with the curbs and the walls of the inside line. Get all of this right and you will be the winner across the line. Easy as you like. Good morning, everyone. This is Alex Jake speaking to you, whether you're trackside or wherever you're watching around the world. I'm delighted to be joined once again as we move to practice for the Goodwood Trophy which is Grand Prix cars from the 1930 to 51 era. I'm alongside an expert in all things. It's a very good morning to Bruce Jones. Oh dear, built me up a little too much <laughs> just there, but uh, always such a strong feature of the Goodwood Revival. 25 years since this great event surfaced, and uh, some of the cars that were competing in that first revival still here with us, including the ERAs that have just been so mighty in period. Joined by Torbert Largo's the fantastic looking Sunbeam V12 Tiger and a car that makes the best noise of the entire weekend. The uh, BRM continuation, the Type 15, a car that made great sound in period, but often didn't get very far at all. But uh, 30, get this, 36,000 parts had to be manufactured for this uh, run of three continuation cars. Wow. Let's hope we get to see it go round, not once, not twice, but many, many times. It's a really <laughs> mix, uh, rich pot we're mixing here today. It certainly is. Vehicles making their way out on to the circuit. Green flag there and determined to keep things running on time on this opening day of the meeting. And the, the ripping calico sound is the BRM accelerating up towards Magic. They've got it the last one out of the collection area. It's got that enormous bluff grill on the on the on the square nose of the car, but the sound alone, close your eyes and listen for it. It'll be the last car coming round. What a sound the BRM is making. And again, this circuit, Alex, as you know, is about the flow. You need to look out for and being driven supremely by one of the people who put it together, Rob Hall of Hall and Hall, and he has driven so many cars so well. But uh, someone said to him, um, he said, building these cars. So I think it was, some, it was 2,000 technical drawings, and they got this car together, and they said, did you lose sleepless nights? He goes, look at me, I'm only 21. <laughs> Uh, excellent stuff. Uh, for those of you who have got yourself a programme, you can see this car 
being worked out the wheel by the great Juan Manuel Fangio, who raced in this back in 1953. And it sounds absolutely magnificent. As we have 70 minutes on the clock, this will be our second race of the meeting. We'll have one race at the end of today, which will be the Freddie March Cup that we saw at the entrance for that in the previous session. This will be our second one. It will be a 20-minute race, one driver behind the wheel. And there is that magnificent 15, the, uh, the Mark 1, and, uh, being driven by Rob Hall. And you know it when it's coming past. Fantastic thunderous sound. It all went quiet a, a couple of moments in between the sessions. I had to crunch the volume up in the gun box to hear myself think. How magnificent on a glorious day for motor racing. Well, it's hardly so back in period when it, you know, it made an enormous sound and then something would break on the grid and the fans threw coins over onto the track for BRM to get it right. <laughs> and finally it is. But again, motor racing is about pioneering. Are these Grand Prix cars and Quattrorettes from some pre war and some up to the very early 50s you know it was a passage the engines obviously stood at the front that revolution was yet to come but these cars i love them so much just because you can see what the drivers are doing you can see the sheer level of input and rob hall is trying to keep it smooth down into st mary's he goes very slight rise between the first part now when you turn left this is where the motorbike ride is hated there's a bump somewhere in the middle and again adjusting steering on the throttle as much as with the wheel and uh, rob hall making moves fastest so far by dint of uh, two laps on the board so an outlap and a flying lap nick topless top of the charts that's in r4a customer car built for pat fairfield back in the 1930s 1935 he's fastest by best part of two seconds from mark gillies so that just shows the progress that uh, nick topless has in that number four era look out for it uh, going very fast and already you can see last car out of the track the brm is cutting through the field having to take to the grass slightly at the lap kink that was a little bit exciting there for a hall but uh, a safe pair of hands so making the way now picking through as he goes out of Wuko corner towards the chicane and well, it's very much uh, reminiscent of outside of the track at this time of day. It's so busy. As we go onto the main straight once again, 50 minutes to go in the session, topless top on a 137 790. It's that moment in the commentary box where you have a slight <laughs> intake of breath, but Rob Hall knew what he was doing. He was threading the eye of the needle. He wants clear track and then his pace will come. His best lap is third fastest. He's uh, 0.8 of a second down on Nick Topless's time. And Topless has just improved again. One minute 37.1 and the number three ERA on screen at the moment, the P green car, Mark Gillies, who makes these things look so easy to drive. The constant adjustment of the throttle, a little bit of the steering as well, but uh, these cars are so dynamic. English racing of automobiles, and they had huge success around Europe. And if you just watch the steering wheel, you can see how animated here you have to be. As we check in with Mark Gillies now at the wheel, into the chicane that closes out the lap, and then checking down into the cockpit, see whether car number three is going to move up the order we well, hope well i expected that to go top he didn't quite, and it did no, he did a slow time oh and how 2.6 seconds clear you talked about the adjustment of the steering wheel but all the inputs from mark are as small as they possibly can be there's no elbows out it's a little twitch the wrist here constantly and again you can see stiffly sprung going over modern cars would have suck up those uh, bumps but these really ride them so mark's knowledge of the track i'm not sure he thinks all is right he's slowing down as he goes towards forward water he's looking down into the cockpit or maybe he thinks i know this car i think a 134.5 is as good as it can get certainly his rivals would dream of that duncan ricketts has gone up to second position on a 136 six and now over the line hall goes to first position in the 15 the much height and deservedly so on that lap time BRM has gone to the front of the field on a 132.806, a margin over the rest of the field of 1.7 seconds. Wow, very, very impressive indeed. So we thought 134.5 was enough. No siree. So let's just run you down the order. Rob Hall topping the BRM, second Mark Gillies, third Duncan Ricketts, fourth Nick Topless, who had set the initial pace, but a lot of the other drivers were a little in the traffic as they came out of Burn. It took them a couple of laps after leaving the assembly area to get the, the clear track and not much time at all for the driver who started stone last, but uh, certainly Rob Hall is making it fly, making it sound brilliant. 
but a huge diversity in this field. Delage, Talbot Lagos, and one that really catches my eyes, the 1938 Alfa Romeo 158 Alfetta, the car that dominated the World Championship. Dormant during the Second World War, but uh, the 158 followed by the 159 were the bee's knees in 1950 and 51, and it's great to get an opportunity to see that out on the track. That is car number 41. Yeah, 26 cars out there at the moment. You're seeing the top 10 times on the left-hand side, but 26 circulating and loads of motor racing art. There's no other word for it. As we check in, the number 61, the outer, the man who was third last year, just acknowledging as they try to fight for their own private piece of the racetrack, the 2.3 miles on the Goodwood circuit. Well, it's just great to see, you know, an Alta as we're looking at the, the one there, number, number 61 with uh, Baxter on board, Ian Baxter, ex-George Abacassis car, and again, exactly the same driving style as Mark Gillies, a little touch, a little twist, but the balance of Alta looks absolutely fantastic. Yeah, always enjoyable for us to get that shot there. You can just see how much they have to work the wheel. But as you say, Bruce, very, very precise for a car of this era. And looking round the windshield there almost as he makes his way through, trying to take the tightest possible line with 11 minutes to go, whole top of the page at the moment as they communicate well with each other about leaving room and about taking space. Right, the two fastest cars in the pits. We saw Mark Gillies looking in the cockpit of the number three ERA. That's R3A, that's in the pits. The BRM, that's top of the charts, 1 minute 32.8 seconds, 1.7 seconds for good. That's Rob Hall, he's done what he needs to do. Session still has uh, 10 and a half minutes remaining, could go back out, but the car's running well, the car's sweet, he knows the track. And it's great, again, great to see signalling from the driver. That's Ben Fiddler, it's Raymond May's car, phenomenal one. Raymond May's so successful on the hill climb circuit, but it's respect for fellow drivers indicating where you're going to be where i want you to go past or in fact i don't want anyone to come past that's the mantra uh, there for ben fiddler r4d it's the uh, you know it's just so fab looking at these cars really is oh a moment there well that's uh, really unusual julian majouf has gone for a little bit of a rotation only out of ford water wouldn't have been much of a scary moment whatsoever and that's in the glorious 308c out from mayo x raymond summer car but he's back on the track I tell you what, let's have a little look. See, that is the Alfetta that I'm still That's 41, so it wasn't number one. I got the right manufacturer as an Alfa Romeo, but as it came over the crest, let's take oh my word. When you're when you're a few degrees out going through Ford Water, it's a big moment. When you're about 35 degrees out of true. Good save, sir. Yeah, lucky he didn't go further, but lucky he kept it running as well. All good as he returns to the racetrack, Peter Grenfell in the 158 Alfetta rejoining the circuit. Well, he's done well, he got into 10th place with that, so he's certainly pressing on. I apologize for picking up the car, and then, of course, moments later, there he is on the grass. But again, I love the deep period detail, the nose of the car, each of the drivers had their own individual um, sort of dashed line around the grill to identify, because, of course, the first ever Grand Prix at Silverstone and first World Championship round, you had three of them filling the front row, and one dark red car looks quite like another very useful certainly for those who were providing commentary on that day and they were locking them out on the front row at silverstone in that famous may day to begin the formula one world championship so you're looking at the car that currently is 10th fastest uh, hall gillies topless fiddler gans baxter rickett uh, dowling birch and then the driver you're looking at at the moment the top 10 at the moment for what will be the second race of the Goodwood Revival in 2023. Can anyone find a time to post into the top 10? And there's an improvement for Dowling, who moves up to fourth position now. Good effort from him in another one of the many ERAs in this field. Well, this is a really, well, that's a really special car. I'll come back to Remus in a moment, but uh, right now, looking at some of the uh, more exotic cars in the field, because we don't see them so often, that's my, definition there. It's a Delage, owned by Paul-Emile Bessard. This was built, this is a nice tie-in with uh, Remus, because they were both run by the White Mouse garage of uh, Prince Tula, cousin. And so it's nice, they're running nose to tail there. You've got the same livery and the royal family of Siam, as it was back in the period. Thailand, of course, in modern parlance. There's Siam on the tail and, and Bibira, this car, later owned by Duncan Hamilton, Tony Roll. But it's just a continuation of these cars, the ERAs of the period. This is very special, the first revival meeting 
this car took one of the victories in one of the feature races back then to have it still racing now still looking exquisite but uh what a time. Prince Schuler buying the cars for his cousin, for whom he was the guardian, for Bibera. Bibera racing all around Europe in those cars, but just seems exotic, doesn't it? Thai royal family based in Europe, running cars run by British teams. Yeah, and you, many of you will recognise the name Prince Bira, who was brought into the consciousness of many modern fans thanks to the explo exploits of Alexander Alban and uh, the Thai drivers being compared in recent times thanks to the success of the Williams driver uh, in recent years. King of tyre preservation, I think it's... I, I'd hate if it wasn't being noticed as much as it should be. Alex Alban just doing an exquisite job and for a lot of people to have a team with a real bloodline there, Williams doing much better is, is a heartwarming time. Yeah, I can tell you having... Oh, off the road we go with car 18, that's the Maserati 6CM, uh, Marcus. Uh, has gone off the road there and parked up in the 1938 version of that car. Yes, just trying to work out exactly where that is. When you get a car that goes where it isn't supposed to go, but he's done the right thing. Problem getting away from the side of the circuit. Of course, we have grass expanse and then tyre walls, and you don't want to leave car a car where it may get hit. So good job there. Any late improvements? Well, I tell you who's making the move. Great that we've caught. Uh, the number 44, Ben Fiddler, ERA, that's the ERA 4D, R4D, because he's fifth fastest at the moment, and he just banged in the fastest first sector of anyone. He's done it very cleverly, about half a dozen cars in the pits at the moment. That gives him that wonderful thing that you want, clear track ahead, and you can see he is really... You know, car language is one thing, but this is car language and driver language. Baxter has gone up to second place. Now, foot to the floor. Last corrections on the wheel as he applies the power. Can he take this improvement to the very front? He can! Super time from Fiddler for a 1.31.9. And it was as quick as it looks. Well, that is... I didn't think anyone would get under 1.32. I was amazed by Rob Hall's time in the BRM. That was a real press on that. But suddenly, on our timing screen, when it goes green, that means people are improving. If it goes pink, that is fastest of all. And that's exactly what uh, Fiddler has just done. But half a dozen other drivers, ten other drivers, their last lap was their best so far. So we're going to the final five minutes of this practice session. And uh, people are really getting a grip of their cars and feeling the heat in the tyres. There's going to be a lot of heat in the tyres today. And uh, again, trying to make track space for themselves. Just looking at uh, number nine ERA, David Morris, such a star for so long in ERAs. He wants a better lap, so he had to get past the Sunbeam V12 Tiger in the background there and get clear track. Going past Duncan Ricketts, who just pulled out in the later ERA uh, from the pits. And now a lovely sweep through Madrid. Great view, and great to see so many of you already lying in the circuit. It's a treat on track throughout the day. Well, that was a great lap from Fiddler to take his car 44, the ERA, the D-Type from 1938, these cars. If you've come late to this, if you've just rolled through the gates, plenty for you to see here on site today, or if you've just pressed play, uh, there is lots to enjoy, Fiddler, uh, with the cars from 1930 to 1951, Grand Prix-era cars, as Gillies has just moved up to third position. Yeah, Mark Gillies and Rob Hall came into the pits. Rob Hall has kept the BRM in there, but having seen that fabulous, fabulous lap last time around from Ben Fiddler, Mark Gillies only did two flying laps before he pitted and decided he is going to try and take a tilt to get on the front row. Traffic becoming a little bit of an issue. The MG just being passed there, that's the Bellevue special. Long, sleek tail, but certainly not able to match the pace of the fastest of the ERAs. This period, 1930 to the early 50s, kind of spans a lot, but of course these were the pre-war cars. Then we had six years of nothing happening and these were the cars when this circuit opened the goodwood circuit in 1948 these are the sort of cars that were current because of necessity there hadn't been the time the money uh, to build many new cars after the war mark gillies on the move that p green r3a owned by richard skipworth he's had mark driving his cars for a long time ex raymond mays ernst von delius but it's funny, in period, these race for, you know, the span of the war, but they've raced far longer in the revival, 25 years, since it's given just the perfect place to come and play. Oh, fantastic, as he pushes on. Now, uh, Morris has moved up to fifth position in car number nine. That is another ERA out there. And this one from 1936. And David Morris has moved into fifth position with a late lap. Two minutes, 41 seconds to go. 
second right. Gillies is very near his best, about a third of a second down. He had traffic, he's got more traffic. He's got VJ Malia. Yes, VJ Malia replacing uh, uh, Force India in former days on the outside of the circuit. That's rather scuppered uh, the line into, in the, into uh, Madwick. Mark should have enough time to come round and start the further lap, but you know, oh, he has got the pace going. Again, the pace of the uh, the acceleration of the V12, some being certainly plenty, but a much heavier car. Mark Gillies, that's experience. You could have tried to cut up the inside going into Madrick, it could have come unstuck. So he knows he's got enough time for a further lap, a, a chance to improve. But at the moment, Gillies in number three is third, 44, still top of the pile. Ben Fiddler in R4D, working way at the wheel. His last lap, oh, quite a lot slower. He backed off, but this lap, he's certainly back on it again. I think he's doing the one-on, one-off routine. You can certainly tell when he is pushing to the limit. So this is the fastest time. And it's a 131.9 that no one has been able to get near at the moment. Bit of a field spread, I think you could say. 28 seconds between the fastest driver and the slowest out there. But it's not only a demonstration of this fantastic machinery. You've got those at the front really pushing on. And, uh, and so we saw earlier in the session Hall with a, a super effort in the distinctive PRM. And he's stayed in the pit since then. Fiddler's gone out, he's pushing on, he's going to try and take it further away. Gillies needs to improve in the first part of the lap. He's very quick in the second two sectors, so if he can find a clear piece of racetrack in the first sector, he could well be threatening at the front. And I'll tell you, he has found a clear bit of track. David Morris, car number nine, R11B. Uh, ERA, Reggie Tung car, he's just banged in the fastest first sector of anybody by about half a second. Ben Fiddler still pushing on, he's still fastest, it's his to lose, but David Morris is mounting a challenge. Well, how good is this lap going to be for Ben Fiddler? He's got, he's going to cross the start finish line, win time. Well, there we are, 35 seconds in hand, so he can do this lap, he's got this one in. How much traffic ahead could be the big issue for him? Now, this is going to be fascinating, the driver's straight out there immediately. And that's David Morris trying to make space, car number nine can't get up the inside and he will also just by the skin of his teeth have time to do one further lap. Well it was a terrific first sector for Morris and not quite what he wanted to see in the final part of the lap. Let's see though if, he, if it's enough to move up. I think he move up, he's fifth at the moment, crosses the line, he looks across, does his time improve? No he's down by, yes he goes up to fourth, he gains a position, timing screen a little slow, he's got to find 1.4 seconds. I don't think he might do that, but I think he could get himself up onto at least the second row, possibly the front row. Traffic will be the deciding factor. OK, these are the final laps in what has been a very entertaining session. Flag is waving and we are ready to see whether anyone can improve late on here. There's some personal best still being put on the board. Really entertaining session. Certainly those from the top five giving us a real show. And the pushing continues by the look of that camera angle. Well, top six cars covered by 1.8 seconds, but one thing over the years, a Goodwood Trophy doesn't seem to matter how close it is in practice. When you get to the race, some of the drivers just really step up. This is sort of a step towards the race, as hard as they're pushing. Um, but uh, let's see, can anyone topple? 1 minute 31.967 seconds, that's top of the chart. Ben Fiddler in ERA R4D. David Morris, we're looking at him now, he's really pressing on. Oh, look at that, lovely clear stretch of track. He's got uh, the kink. And then Woodcut and the chicane to go. Let's see if he's going to improve. How's he doing first part of the lap? Well, hasn't improved on that. He's very, very close to his previous time, though. This is going to be improved, I'm sure of it. Just waiting to see whether this magnificent machine from 1936, the ERA B-type, not far to go. Just the chicane. Is there any time for a late improvement inside the top 10? Some trundling back to the pit, some being sent back into the paddock. Over the line he goes, is there an improvement on the board? It's a good effort, but he will stay where he was before that final run. It's Fiddler, Hall, Gillies, Morris and Baxter, the top five. Yeah, just one thing I noticed. Oh dear, right at the end, car 17, that's Brad Baker, R10B. Uh, little rotation by the looks of the tyre marks there, and he's uh, luckily it's the, the slowing down lap, so uh, that will be cleared out of the way. That's the approach to, to Lamb Corner. So he probably got it slightly wrong coming out of St Mary's and doing that correction. When you correct the correction as your wheel goes one way uh, and the other. But anyhow, car clearly unharmed, driver unharmed, and that will be removed. But uh, let's have a look if we have the moment. Uh, caught beautifully by the camera crews. So that was um, that was the lightest get off when you come into Lavins and you're rotating. So <laughs> well done, sir. Well, the Goodwood Trophy sees 
Brad Baker pushing the car. As he uh, looks around there. One of the things of cars of this period, of course, we mentioned they raced both sides of the war, is that uh, they were owned by multiple people because their careers were so long. The Whitehead brothers uh, had this car, then it uh, moved on, as so many of them did, and uh, later was raced by Peter Walker. And, of course, uh, was, it could be quite a quick hop into Grand Prix racing back then, but there weren't as many steps on the ladder. And uh, also, if you were B. Vera and you had a cousin who bought you a lovely stable of cars, it was even <laughs> easier, but uh, great to have that exo exoticism. Uh, thanks to all the marshals around the circuit who have enabled Baker to rejoin the circuit. For well, everyone taking the acknowledgement of the crowd around the 2.3 miles, and this was the action then of the Goodwood Trophy and the practice session to set the field. The qualifying session out there, plenty from different eras. The star of the show, though, without doubt, that BRM. Amazing sound combined with amazing speed and great to have this rich mixture. The Bugattis, ERAs as far as the eye can see, Alfa Romeos, including that wonderful 158. Alfetta that uh, dominated the start of the World Championship in 1950, but uh, certainly Rob Paul got out, got the job done in that BRM and was top of the table. He was eventually toppled, though, but uh, you could just feel the pace starting to rise. Julian Majou pushing so hard as ever, slightly sideways there in that 308C Alfa Romeo. That was a good lap. There was a very good lap from Mark Gillies that put him in contention. It was Ben Fiddler who delivered the fastest time in that session for what will be a 20-minute race. These cars from 1930 to the early 50s. A wonderful shot. There's some brilliant camera work, but uh, you can see Rob Paul looking down. Why did I just slide a little bit there? Oil on track. Was it his oil? Maybe this is why he came in. Famously, uh, particularly front-engine cars, anything leaking goes onto the rear tyres, and uh, when that's happening at Madwick, it catches your attention. Uh, great to see uh, Ian Baxter going so well in the Alta. And this glorious Maserati, Pat Blakeney Edwards, Jamie Burgle's car there. Again, precision through the chicane. The drivers know those walls aren't concrete anymore, so but they still want to avoid them. And then pushing on all the way to the end. And thoroughly enjoyable to see the drivers out on track as we get the revival up and running. There was the fastest driver. Car 44, P1 once again, Ben Fiddler. OK, we can now check in with Rosie, who is down at Revive and Thrive. Well, I've come down to the Revive and Thrive area and I'm here with Narissa, who has got a fantastic stall here. Tell us, what are you doing? Uh, so this is the sewing atelier. Uh, so we've curated a range of craft workshops that are aimed at modern makers with a bit of a vintage twist. So there's currently a beading workshop going on behind us. Um, and then also we have a curated collection of craft supplies and accessories from small businesses and then also from, you know, my <laughs> excessive stash as well. Um, of Craft supplies. So yeah, it's just a crafty space to be for Goodwood Revival, basically. It's really important that we're sustainable nowadays and we really need to be more wary of that. And yeah. those techniques that you are using is, is how we're going to do it. Tell us about your outfit, though, because <laughs> there's a bit of a story to this outfit. OK, it's quite a long winded story, but basically it was um, some furniture fabric um, from the new craft house, which is a small business uh, that sells like dead stock fabrics. So it was a jumpsuit last night. <laughs> that I made last year um, and then I basically decided to cut the legs off of it because it's really really hot so um, yeah so again like having basic tailoring skills and being able to do that kind of stuff means that my outfit was be able it's now like fit for purpose this weekend so yeah. how did you get into doing all of this because we all need to probably learn it but how did it come about for you so when I was 11 I decided I wanted to be a fashion designer slash lawyer Wow, uh, so that's niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I was watching too much Ali McBill. Um, <laughs> but spoiler alert, that didn't happen. I uh, went to university, so I studied, fa studied fashion marketing and PR. And um, throughout the course, I kind of picked up skills. So I started out by buying things from the charity shop with my pocket money. I got my first uh, sewing machine when I was 13. Um, in fact, I got a tattoo to commemorate it uh, last week. Um, but yeah, so I um, got my sewing machine and then just I used to upcycle things or, um, you know, make little things for my 
dolls or whatever. So I've just always been quite crafty. So yeah. And in terms of inspiring the the next generation, we often find these techniques from our grandparents, our parents. What does it mean to you to be inspiring a younger generation? That's uh, quite a. <laughs> I'd like to thank my mum. Um, it's great. It's amazing. It's really nice. I think um, for me, I couldn't foresee a world where I didn't do this stuff. It's my entire personality at this point. So it may, and it makes me so happy and it's mindful and it helps me to unwind and relax. So it's really lovely that I'm able to pass that on to other people. Well, listen, it's great to have you here. How brilliant is that? It's great to learn all these new techniques so we can turn lots of our old clothing into new clothing. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. gut health affects every single aspect of your body from your brain wiring to your energy output to your hormone regulation to how clever your immune system is everybody benefits from better gut health because it makes your body work better I would thoroughly recommend Goodwood gut health program it's been quite life-changing really Ready, Steve, um, another Goodwood revival, another Barry Sheen Memorial Trophy. Is it, it's not really the first time you've shared a bike with a Sheen, is it? Well, you, you, didn't you qualify for his dad once? Uh, yeah, I most certainly did. I'm hoping he's going to qualify for me today. It'll be faster, but yeah, it's sadly 20 years since Barry passed away. It's definitely my last race here at Goodwood because I'm too old, but I've been coached or come back because Freddie said he'd ride. And it's a real treat for me to be able to finish my career of racing motorcycles with Barry Sun. So really looking forward to it. But we're going to have fun. There's a lot of unbelievably good riders here, but we're in for fun. And Freddie, you said it's been a while since you were here. It's quite a demanding circuit, isn't it? Yeah, see, I haven't ridden here for about eight years, so it'll be interesting. But we're just going to go out and have a bit of fun. You know, as Steve said, it's his last race, so it'll be just a good day out. Steve, are you all the rider that should never retire? Why, why, why are you retiring now? Uh, physically unable to do what I'd like to be able to do. I mean, there comes a point that mentally I'm sure I can, but the old body is sort of giving up on me a little bit, so I'm going to call it a day, but a nice way to finish my career. It's been 50 years. Well, Steve, from, from all of us, thank you for all the memories. They've been pretty great. Absolute pleasure. I've loved coming here. Thank you. I might get an invite back maybe just to play cricket. Oh, enjoy it. You know, thank you very much. Well, very lovely to hear from Steve Parrish there, uh, a man I've known well, having he's raced on four wheels as well as two wheels over the years. And Lee, uh, he's highly regarded, of course, and it's rather interesting to hear that this is going to be the last time he, he rides a, a race here at Goodwood. Yeah, you always know when you've had an amazing career, when you can get the chance to retire twice in your, in your sporting career. So, yeah, obviously a very big name, both in, in two wheels and four, with going to truck racing and stuff, I believe, after he went to, to the motorbike racing. So I've got Lee Johnson with me, winner of TT Northwest 200. Was it five times winner there? Is that right? I'm not very good with stats, so this oh, is probably right, the wrong okay. the wrong situation. But you've for won me, here but, yeah. at Goodwood as well, and you know a lot of the riders that are now heading out for what is the Barry Sheen Memorial Trophy. Now this is a, a two-rider race, 
uh, for bikes, uh, 500cc, raced up to 1966. But you've got quite a lot of current riders, well, riders who do a lot of current racing who are out there and will be very competitive. But you've also got owners who may well be the first ones to go out. Yeah, so there's obviously a, a, a big variety of levels and levels of motorcycle on, on both of the riders. So you've quite a lot of current riders that I still race with now. Um, some retired riders that were, were of a very high level, professional level, like, like Steve Plater. Um, and then some other guys that have the opportunity of having enough money to own one of these beautiful motorbikes and then decide that they want to do some racing as well, which I think is amazing to be fit to come here have a pro alongside you and it's, it, it's as such as a pro-am event that like you see in, in a lot of other sports and stuff so yeah what an awesome opportunity for someone to be able to, to build their bike buy their bike come here and then have a pro rider ride alongside them at this, this beautiful track it is lovely so we've got a whole half hour qualifying session it's a decent session because they will be switching these bikes over between riders as we uh, go and there is the steve parish freddie sheen bike the number seven suitably enough of course uh, <laughs> Barry Sheen's famous race number, and it's Freddie, the 35-year-old son of Barry, who is uh, competing on that bike. I think, actually, it's uh, Steve on it at the moment. Steve Parrish, the extremely experienced and former teammate to Barry Sheen in 1977, one of the years that Barry Sheen won the World Championship. Yeah, what, what an awesome experience this must be for Freddie to ride alongside one of his dad's uh, team partners and then obviously in a race that's named after his dad as well so it must be a surreal surreal feeling for Freddie to be able to do that and obviously he's grown up with having such a famous dad he's, he's probably quite common to these sort of events and happening absolutely looking at number 25 there that's the Mike Farrell Dean Harrison matchless uh, G50 and the matchless uh, a competitive bike a single cylinder racer made uh, a lot for privateers in the late 1950s, competed against the Norton Max. We've got plenty of Norton Maxes out there, haven't we? Yeah, it's quite interesting, this pairing. So Dean, Dean has been here before. He was here last year, but um, due to the, the classic motorcycle and the, the common of the, the bike breaking down, he only managed to do three laps on the bike and, at this track. So he's just mentioned to me there before that he, this is literally like his, his sort of first session. So the, the, the teammate's going to go out first, check the bike over, do some laps, make sure everything's all right, and then he's going to going to give it to Dean for the rest of the session to try and try and help him learn the track. OK, well, that'll be good. So it's Mike Farrell who's out on the bike at the moment. This is a, a, a bike that actually we raced on the Isle of Man uh, with Derek Woodman in the 1960s, between 61 to 65. Um, it was actually fourth on the Isle of Man uh, in 1964. It then was moved over to New Zealand, interestingly enough. It raced out in New Zealand for a few years and eventually came back to the UK. And so we're seeing this matchless G50 uh, out on track right now. And it's actually being followed, as you see, by uh, Steve Parrish on the Norton Max 30M. There are quite a few not the Norton Maxes. Uh, the number seven one behind this is, of course, one of the key ones. There it is, the Norton Max. Uh, a very successful bike of the early 1960s and it'll be very interesting to see how Steve Parrish gets on here. Uh, we've got an initial lap times set at 132.8 and that has been set so far by the Michael Russell, Michael Rutter, Norton Manx. They're both actually very uh, good riders. Both of them are experienced riders with good experience uh, here at Goodwood as well. Yeah, experience being the polite word for elderly gentlemen, I think, with, with both Rory. Yeah, that's a very strong team, uh, both uh, to have two riders with sort of equal equal ability. Mike Russell's obviously a very good class of rider in his own his own right, and, and Michael Rutter's needs no introduction as to what he has done in the world of motorcycling. So they seem to be doing a 32.8 right now. A, a 29 is, is sort of the time they're going to be aiming for. If, I don't know if they'll get to that in the first session, depending on if some of these guys have been here testing, but I believe the test was cancelled that was here okay. a few weeks ago so it's actually yeah. very interesting what you're saying that you think they'll be in the 29s i was commentating on the freddie march trophy a little uh, just an hour, a half an hour ago and you had sports cars from the 1950s and they were doing almost exactly the same they started in the 31 32s got down to the 28s and that's what you're or, well 29s 28s so it's similar similar sort of lap time yeah it's it's obviously a rare occasion to see motorbikes and cars on the same weekend because in modern sport nowadays that never happens so it's another one of the, the great spectacles that you get to see here at uh, Goodwood Revival. Oh, we have a we have a stopper already in the in the first sort of five to ten minutes of the first session. That's the uh, that's another of the Norton Manxes. That's the Keith Bush Connor Cummins bike. 
Yeah, that's Keith on the bike now, because okay. well, obviously anyone that knows Connor is of is of great stature, and this this man is not quite as tall as as what Connor is. But yeah, that's unfortunate that they've they've managed to break down so early. So they've probably only got maybe two, well two to three laps in. I wonder if they're going to be able to get it back. Cause they're quite a long way away from the pit lane. That's a bit of an awkward one. This is the George Thomas Davy Todd Norton Max 1960 bike. Um, own, uh, the entrant Tony Dunnell. Yeah, this is the youngest actual Terran in, in the motorbike class this weekend. The both riders are, I think, well, Davey's 26, 27, and I think um, his teammate is the same. So, yeah, you compare that to the likes of Rutter and his teammates, uh, yeah, there's a fair old age gap, maybe 20, 30 years difference of, between riders, which is which is another awesome thing to be able to, to race together, both here and the cars. And you've experienced it yourself here at Goodwood, um, and being able to do that. Now, one thing that's quite interesting is the uh, the MV Augusta is not up there yet, is it? Well, I had a, a long conversation with Michael Dunlop earlier, and I think there might be a slight bit of sandbagging going on at this uh, at this period of time. Nobody nobody wants to, to rub a pie in their face straight away, so I think, um, yeah, they'll be getting out for a little bit of a steady run round. I don't know if, if uh, Michael or his teammates out there first, so if we can Actually, see... it's in the pits. It's still in oh, the pits. Yeah. yeah, I'm just looking at our timing list, and at the moment, the number 42... Yeah, they haven't even done a lap. Yeah, the MP Augusta, which we are expecting to be quick because you've you've <laughs> you've done well on it in the past. Yeah, I've I've won both here and at the the classic TT and the at the Isle of Man. So that's that's rather strange. It's sort of a known fact that something that has that sort of advantage in, in power is always more likely to break down than, than something that's a bit more steady. So yeah, I hope the guys get it going just for the fans more than anything to be able to see and hear that that beautiful MB another good lap from the Rutter Russell bike. Meanwhile, we're looking at the number 11 there. That's down in 18th position at the moment. That is the Josh Brooks and Norbert Revholtz. This is a BM, one of the BMW Caxor. Uh, then, and Frederick Caxor was a, a specialist in the 1960s. He would, he would build special frames uh, for racing. He was a private racer, but he had a lot of success, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's something that we've lost nowadays. You know, like back in the day when, when one-off people sort of decided to go build a frame with it with a good engine and and you could go racing and be competitive but yeah look at it just looks completely different to everything else out there you can see the cylinder sticking out this, yeah it's sticking out this side. the bmw engine it really those cylinders really stick out wide don't yeah. they yeah which is which is something that bmw have carried to yeah. now even with the boxer engine and stuff like that so yeah it's not it's not dissimilar it's just having a, a quick look down there with a the leg off for a, for a bit of oil as you do it always makes me wonder because the airflow, it's an air-cooled air -cooled BMW engine. You, you look at the, the layers of how the air goes through, that goes straight onto your foot. Yeah. So your foot's getting yeah. pretty warm. Okay. That's, that's the other thing that people don't realise. It, it's a beautiful day out there, but all the heat that's radiating off that engine is coming in, beh in behind the bodywork to the rider, so it's, it's probably 20 degrees more sitting in there and on that bike now. This is, this is, I tell you what, this is a competitive bike as well because James Hillier, and Dan Jackson are sharing this. Uh, Jackson won the Halewood overall um, last year. And uh, James Hillier, he's won uh, all sorts of bits and pieces. Uh, regular Isle of Man racer and bike promoter as well. And it's a beautiful matchless G50 from 1962. Yeah, the 37 is actually James' racing number in, in modern bikes. And he's quite a local a local rider to down here. He comes to some of the members' meetings and stuff. So I know he, he really likes riding the classic bikes and he loves his track. So, yeah. One of the other interesting in partners is uh, number 28. Well, it's Mossy and Mossy, if you can see them there. They're 28th at the minute, the number nine. But that bike is actually built by their dad. Their dad is a, a, a restoration company that builds classic motorbikes. So the father supplied the bike, and both sons are currently racing the bike. So there, there can't be too many parents like that here this weekend. That's lovely to know. That's a really good story. Uh, you're looking at the Sebastian Beres John McGuinness bike here. So John McGuinness, yes, he's riding this weekend. On a matchless G50, a real legend uh, uh, at the Isle of Man. 23 wins at the Isle of Man uh, TT in his career. Amazing. Yeah, he, John needs no introduction, I don't think, in, in, no matter what motorsport event you went to, whether it be Formula One or a rally, and the, the people there will know know who he is. And 
anybody that's seen him seen him race will will be fit to spot him straight away. His, his stature and his style stands out stands out a mile. So yeah, he's still a very very competitive rider. But even though his age, well, his age, well I don't want to say his age on here, it's, but um, early fifties. Early fifties, polite. Yeah, but yeah. he's you can see on TV now he's absolutely. Presumably absolutely you've playing. raced against him quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot. It, it was it was strange really because obviously as a kid he was a hero and then you end up racing with him and become really good friends and travel the world together so yeah he, he's helped me immensely in my career as a lot of other riders that have that have raced alongside him and still current do now he still helps younger riders and and that's just the, the type of person he is and what where's his where are his kind of real skills and talents is it is it in pure riding skills or is he a very much a kind of engineer brain as well always getting the best out of the bike what, what, how does he work yeah john is a very he comes across or tries to come across as not such a calculated person or he makes it a fun and joke of everything but he's a he's very smart and shrewd rider there's no way you win that amount of tts and and become as famous he is without having that knowledge. And I think people forget, John was a very, very good short circuit rider before. He's known now as a TT superstar, but John's done Grand Prix 500s, 250s, you know, won 250 British Championship a lot. And, and that level is is high in, in modern day as it was then. So he's a very, very accomplished rider. Well, he's second fastest at the moment. So he's done a 131.9. As you guessed, we're down in the 29s now, one minute 29. Whether we're going to get in the 128s, we shall see. But uh, we may well do when some of the other riders come out. But that is, yeah, that's a good effort. And I have to say, uh, that is a beautifully uh, a beautifully done bike. Now, you're looking actually at another one there. Similar, now, this is the MV Augusta. Right, this is the bike you know so well. And this is the one we do expect to be rapid. Somebody was pulling off there. Yeah, so this is Hornby out on the bike now. Michael's not, not actually done a lap yet, I don't believe. But he, he seemed to have his hand out or signal to, to come into the pit. Oh. So. I don't know whether it's because that bike, that's, that is that's bike still, we saw that's earlier. Still, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, Bush. Oh, and there's the 56, that's the Matthew Hebb, Ian Duffus, Norton Max, that's pulled off as well. Always going to get some mechanical problems, aren't you? Yeah, the joy of, of riding these beautiful old machines is that the, the, that's the, the biggest part of the race. You, lap times and everything are great right now, but until you see the checkered flag, it's all completely irrelevant. So It's uh, a slightly different world in racing, isn't it? Both in bikes and cars. That the reliability of modern machinery is so different to how it was in the 1960s, for example. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing with... As you see on the screen here now, Michael Rutter, very, very experienced rider, a lot of mechanical sympathy, and he could probably get a bike round at maybe two tenths, half a second slower than some young modern rider, but the bike will finish because of his mechanical sympathy, his style, his smooth, his smooth riding style. So that is realistically a better option to, to having someone slightly younger and more aggressive on the bike that doesn't, they've never had to have that sympathy. Yeah, no, I can fully understand that. And uh, in the 1960s, 70s, that that was just as important in Formula One as it was in, in motorbikes. You had to look after the car uh, or the bike, depending where you were. And uh, often the really top, top riders and drivers were able to do that. So just seen a good improvement uh, up there for the number 12 bike of Ian Bain and Steve Brogan, another of the North Max. And uh, another rapid pairing there. They've got themselves up into second place, but the top bike is still this one, the number 68 bike. And uh, Rutter and Russell are looking in to be pretty good shape here. We'll see how that goes. We've still got just over half time to go in this qualifying session, and we're going to see the other riders coming out. There you are with the bike that's gone up to second now. Yeah, it's it's interesting on the timing screen because the, the, most of the bikes now at the front have all done eight laps, but we can't see as to if someone's gone out and, and done five of them and set the time. So obviously you're looking at Steve Brogan now, who's obviously up in the second place. So we don't know if that's Steve Brogan or Ian Bean that has, has done the time, unfortunately. But either way, it doesn't matter because that's their qualifying position or that's where they're going to set off. Oh, somebody else is just pulling over there on the back straight, slowing down. Hopefully they can make it back to the pits and not have to number 21. Oh yeah, that's going a little bit slowly, isn't it? I hope they yeah. can make it back. That's the Luke Hedger, Ben King and Matchless. Um, whereas we're still looking here at the Jeff Baines, uh, the owner of this one. Um, won two British Historic Championships. And uh, oh, now being used for Goodwin, a little bit on the curb there. Yeah, Steve, Steve Brogan, he's obviously a very, very accomplished um, British superstar. And 
superbike rider and won quite a few British championships. So the, the likes of him and Bean, who has also won quite a lot of classic championships, is a very, very strong, strong pair, and both have that mechanical, mechanical sympathy. Here you're looking at number 125, Steve Player. Yeah, that, that the famous helmet that he's he's run for quite a long time. Right, that's good to know. This is another of the matchless G50s, and uh, as I say, competed against the Norton Max. They both had the single cylinder 500 cc engines, different versions, of course, of the same. And it's another beautifully presented bike. This bike, actually, uh, I was looking back at the history of it from the notes we've been uh, provided, and it, it's been written by Wayne Gardner here before. So, you know, famous riders on many of these bikes in the past. Yeah, and then a, a lot less famous rider than that myself was supposed to ride this oh, really? bike. Yeah, well, so they lined up for I've it. just been talking to the guys down there. Yeah, they did an incredible job. It looks absolutely absolutely amazing so yeah steve steve is getting the the joy of um taking that lovely motorcycle around this weekend ah great stuff well, here's davy todd tucked in behind steve brogan okay getting a nice a nice slipstream down the down the back straight so let's see if that maybe helps his lap time or else he's, he's been passed by him maybe we just had um yeah we're looking at some sector time still popping up there that are looking pretty good let's just see what uh they do are coming across the line this time. We're going to see any improvements. 29.9, still the fastest. Yeah, 29.4 we've gone to now. Look at that. So that was a good gain on that lap. Yeah, yeah, that was a good guess by me. I think a 29 to start off with. Very good guess. But yeah, I think I think I can't remember what the the lap record is on the MV. It's maybe 27 or 28. So, um, but yeah, 29 is a good good strong lap time for this first session. So the MV Augusta still hasn't done a complete time lap. We saw it out there, but it's come back in again. So um, whether they actually have a problem with it, I don't know. But for some reason, it is down at the very bottom of the list, down in 30th place. Yeah, you just see on the screen here now, um, Steve Brogan's getting held up by Michael Rutter. So see if he, if he goes for the pass or to, to get a, a slipstream down the back straight. Nice opportunity. We might well see this in the race when we get to the race itself. A little bit of slipstream. Here he goes. Yo, know, little tap on the <laughs> little tap on the shoulder. It's, it's such a fun feeling riding here for that reason. You know, when you're used to riding um, modern superbikes. They're both being passed. Oh, wow. Davy Todd's got the got the jump on them there. Straight line speed there for Davy Todd. Where's he get that from? Very impressive. The motor on that bike's working well. <laughs> There you are, lovely, lovely to watch that. Davy Todd, that's the 1960 uh, Norton Max. And uh, that, the entrant to that one is Tony Dunnell, who has uh, sponsored a lot of riders, of course, over the years. So it's a well-prepared bike, another quick one. And right now we've got uh, the Brogan Bain bike, number one. Well, the fastest, number 12, the Ian Bay Steve Brogan bike, fastest currently in this session with 11 and a half minutes still to go. Plenty of time, and we're going to see some more coming into the pits, I would think, for rider changes coming up. Yeah, it's interesting now with the, the temperatures being so high, and these tyres are not not designed to really be ridden this hard in this temperature, and even the bike was getting the heat soaked into the engine and stuff, so I think, really, see the, the outright performance of the... Oh, he's lost his gear selector there, the... The lever's hanging down on the left-hand side, so his, his gear selector rod, he's about to realise now when he goes for a shift, I think. Oh, maybe it's the rear brake, sorry, wrong side. Ah, uh, yes. My bad, I used to, oh, <laughs> used to no, look at it on the other but side. But that's a good yeah. point, isn't it, because some of the bikes do. But there is a bit of a dangle as well. Yeah, yeah, so it's the, it's the selector rod for the actual lever, so quite a few of these old bikes with the, with the drum brakes and stuff, the, the rear brake tends to work better than the front brake sometimes, which is never the case on a modern bike but yeah you, you sort of do a front brake rear brake gear change in, in that sort of motion just to try and get the maximum out of trying to slow the bike down okay well we get a lovely close-up view thank you to our fantastic cameras uh, camera operators throughout the goodwood weekend here um, yeah that, that's actually tommy hill so previous okay. uh, british superbike uh, champion of i'm gonna guess and say 2014 or 15 maybe but yeah, very, very accomplished motorbike rider. And then we can see Freddie, Freddie Sheen. Yeah, yes. So Freddie's got out on the bike now. That's good news. Um, 
as we saw Steve Parrish on the number seven earlier, but it is now Freddie Sheen, you're saying, so let's see what sort of times they can do with that. The number seven uh, bike is currently down to 17th position, so we'll see whether Freddie's going to be able to lift that up the order a little bit. Meanwhile, we're still looking at the, the number 23 bike currently third fastest here, and we'll see if there's going to be any more coming from Davy Todd. Yeah, his last lap time was, was a second off, um, the, the fastest time, so I don't know whether maybe he got held up, or sometimes with the, with the tires like these and stuff, it's better just to cool down for a lap, do a steady lap and get a bit of the heat, heat built back down, and, and then go and attack again for, for another run round. A slipstream is massive as well. When when the power is so low, that makes such a difference to, to try and get, get a good lap time in. Lee, you've raced here several times at Goodwood. Of course, you've done a lot of road racing over the years, a lot of success. In terms of riding a, a bike here, what are the main challenges of the Goodwood circuit? What, what are you, you going to get right? Where are the challenging parts of the lap? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is obviously the momentum with, with the lack of horsepower. So anyone that's come from riding a, a smaller CC bike is used to trying to keep that momentum up, which is not the way you ride a current superbike. So firstly that, keeping the momentum up. And then obviously these bikes don't handle well. You know, the input into the handlebars doesn't happen straight away. So you get your brain around that. The brakes don't work straight away. So it's almost like a slow motion version of, of things. So you have to preempt a lot more what's about to happen. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely Definitely an acquired thing that you have to get your brain around, and some some modern people get on them and, and hate riding the bike. But I I personally love love it. I think it's great fun, and to be out there roaring around with some of your best friends on a beautiful day like this around this beautiful track. What more? Oh, big front end chatter there for oh ho, ho, Steve so, Brogan. Is that just that the front telescopic not working properly? So or? It, it could be a two things. So it could be that he might have downshift gone in, and there's a bit of judder off the engine, which creates chatter. What we would class his chatter has come from the rear right through to the front and then obviously he can't put the input into the handlebar and therefore the bike won't turn so yeah he, he was really looked that was a I don't think that was a save on his behalf I think it was just the track was wide enough and he got away with it that's interesting isn't it you certainly don't see that much on modern bikes do you no that that would be if that happened on a modern bike you would be in the gravel trap right now I think yeah wow. Yeah, fascinating. Well, well done, Steve Brogan, for that one. Yeah, he, had, he dealt with it well, didn't he? Handled it well. But, uh, yeah, it's quite unusual. You can see it's got a lot of shake in that bike everywhere. Yeah, so I, I don't know if that is whether it's due to a setting thing now or the heat or maybe the engine. It's almost like something slightly out of balance. So maybe the wheel weight's come off the front wheel or th there's a lot of things where, obviously, in a modern bike now, we just come back and look at the telemetry and, and download the data and see what's happening. But, yeah. Steve's going to have to have to use this footage now to be able to change some settings. OK, well, we'll see how it works out. It's still a rapid bike, there's no doubt. It's still setting, uh, has set the best time so far, 29.2, 29.8. We've just seen an improvement there once again for Davy Todd, 29.813. So that's second fastest, and the Rutter Russell bike down to third now. Yeah, Todd was getting a good toe round behind Brogan to do that lap time. So like like we said before, it's a, it's a good advantage to have that little marker, especially on a flowing track like this where you know, just get on the throttle that little bit earlier and, and off the brake that little bit earlier, just because it's it's so flat, but it's almost blind because it's so flat. So, yeah, having that, he's, he's caught Steve up a little bit more here. So this might even be a faster faster time again for, for Todd. OK, and there we are. That's the third fastest bike right now. And uh, we'll see all, what they... All the top three are... Oh, he's got held up in the chicane. So the top three in the group right now are actually riding round together. So whether that's they're all getting a toe off each other or, or Steve's towing uh, Davy Todd and Michael around for them lap times. That's interesting, as you say, yeah. This three, this, this trio you're watching right now are the fastest three out there. So whether it is the toe that is helping, but certainly for... Um, the number 12 bike up there, Steve Brogan. He, he hasn't got the toe, but he still has got the fastest pace so far. Yeah, and knowing Steve, he will happily claim that the other two guys are only there because he's towed them around. <laughs> so um, that, will, that will not be a problem for him to say that after the session. Into this uh, challenging right and then left. And you've got that sort of off camber zone here. It does take you out wide, doesn't it? Yeah, all of a sudden the, the track, the guys, Davey there is right out to the white line. The track does come back to you quite fast. And 
like I say before, these bikes walk quite a lot as, as Rutter just took, took the front there into the, that right-hand corner. Um, the bikes walk quite a lot, so if, if you're walking and, and that means that the front tire is pushing already, so when the white line comes up to you quite quickly and all of a sudden the track feels a bit narrower. This is lovely to watch. We've only got four and three-quarter minutes to go in this session. Um, just having a little look down the list at the moment. There hasn't been any big jumps uh, further down the order, I don't think. Freddie Sheen uh, still a bit further down in uh, 19th place in the on the bike he's sharing with Steve Parrish, but Freddie's out there now. That's uh, quite a good lap time from Dean Horace, and considering he's never, never really been here before and only done three laps, they're up in the sixth position right now, and that was Dean's, Dean's last lap time that's just done that. So, yeah, it's a good, good lap time from Horace. You could probably maybe expect him to, to make another jump just with track knowledge and, and not knowing the bike either. So someone like him that hasn't been here maybe will take a step at the end, whereas most of the other riders around him have either been on that bike and, and here quite a few times before now. That's an interesting one. So, okay, that's bike number 25 um, you're talking about, and uh, he's just beginning to get up to pace. Just going through there, you saw the number 129. That's the Luke Bailey Howie Mainwaring Smart Matchless G50. That's uh, a front running bike in the Lansdowne uh, competitions that are, of course, a very big part of historic bike racing nowadays. But right now, this is the second fastest, the number 23. Uh, George Thomas and Davey Todd, with Davey putting in some quick laps. We still don't have a lap speed, or a lap time rather, from the 1966 MV Augusta 500. Um, and that's a great shame because that is the bike we're sort of expecting to be the bike to beat. Uh, but Michael Dunlop and Andy Hornby have not done um, a single flying lap on it. Yeah, that's a, sh a shame. Like I said, more so for the fans, even because there will be quite a lot of people here who come just to see that MV. It's one of them really rare motorcycles that that um, doesn't get seen very often, probably here and, and maybe the, the Manx Grand Prix is probably the two, two main steam races that, that to get the bike will get seen at by and ridden at this sort of level. You see Dean Harrison here now in, in screen getting, getting used to the track and, and used to his bike. Yeah, this is good to see. So he did improve last time around. We'll see whether Dean Harrison is going to be able to... He's done a good middle sector, uh, uh, or sorry, actually first sector. He's done a personal best in the first sector already. Whether he's, he's got a bit of traffic around, that might not help him here. Yeah, he's got held up just going on to the back straight, and obviously that's probably the most important part of this track on these bikes. So if you get if you get held up, and unfortunately the people that have held them up have now just rid away from them, so they have slightly more slightly more power. But yeah, you'll, you'll get um, probably two more laps in. How long have we got left? Yeah, two minutes ten. So definitely get one, maybe yeah, you'll get then get the checkered flag after that. So yeah, as you say, a couple of laps in. Um, we'll watch him through the chicane. He really seems to clear track now, so yeah. this should be, should be a good lap for Harris. Let's have a look and see how this goes then. So uh, that lap was a bit slower. That was a 133.1 compared to his 131 that he set a couple of laps ago. As you say, he's got a clear lap. Let's watch him. Tell me what he's doing here. Tell me what the riding's like. Yeah, you can you could see straight away in the turn one the, the vibration and the front chatter of the bike. It, Realistically, these guys are trying to make these motorcycles do things that the bank doesn't actually want to do. They're stressing them into positions and loading them. So this is quite a fast corner here, committed in staying in top gear and then, then back one and in. You don't really trail brake or anything and then straight back on the gas. And it, he's committed there. These, uh, these classic bikes prefer to be on the throttle because it takes away the vibration of the motor. So when you're off throttle, there's quite a lot of chatter and it goes through to the front tire. So you'll see the guys brake a little bit earlier, get on the throttle earlier, actually at the apex, and then it calms the whole bike down and then obviously helps you run onto, run onto the back straight. But yeah, Dean looks really good here on this lap. Yeah, let's see how this lap goes for him. Um, this is going to be interesting to see whether he can make it any better. Are we going to see a few improvements? We've just seen the number 37 bike move up slightly, the James Hillier Dan Jackson. That has gone up to sixth place now. I'm not sure this is going to be much quicker. It's bouncing around a little bit. Maybe those tyres are a bit warm. But let's just see. Still got 30 seconds. He'll get another lap out of this um, to go quicker again. And as he goes over the line, let's have a look at whether that... Oh, yeah, it is an improvement. 130.2. So, what do you reckon? Can he get a bit more on this final lap? Honestly, I believe me talking to him on the way around has, has <laughs> helped the situation, if that's... If that's pretty, I could tell even from the commitment in the first two corners, um, 
yeah, he looked really good on the bike. And obviously a little bit of a stone to the speed of the bike in, the, in these classic bikes. But yeah, he's riding the bike really tidy and, and committed, as we can see from the, the footage right now. And as you say, he's learning all the time, isn't he? Because, you know, getting used to all of this, Dean Harrison is, is doing a good job. Uh, just you can see how it reacts to the bumps that are a little bit through the left-hander. And, and like for people that know that ride a bike, when you can see it on the television, that, that feeling you get in your bum and your handlebars is a lot more movement than uh, than what we're seeing right now. So it's like, yeah, you, you come in after a race and go, did you see my big moment? And you were like, no, it wasn't really that spectacular. And then in your own head and in the feeling, it was massive. So yeah, he's, all them little movements you can see on that bike are a lot bigger when you're sat on it. I can imagine that. I can totally understand that. He's got a bit of traffic up ahead, but hopefully he can get through here cleanly. He's got a very nice style of really getting down low and straight, picking himself back up, moving around into the final section of the lap now. Oh, Todd and Todd and Thomas have just gone ah. quickest there now, and so it, it must be Thomas on, on the bike now at the end, I believe, but, or unless Todd has done a pit stop, no? Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good point. Let's just see if this is any change. I don't think so. No change on that lap, was there? Slightly slower on that one, 30.5 as opposed to 30.2. But as you say, the bike that has now gone to the top is the George Thomas Davy Todd Norton Manx. So that has uh, set the pace at a 29.175. Oh, it is It is Davy Todd that's done the time as well, because okay. here he comes now on screen, bike number 23. So, yeah, he's... He's put that lap time in right at the end there for to go. Good to go timing. Pole. Very good timing. So exactly one tenth faster than the number 12 bike. So uh, the Ian Bain, Steve Brogan bike, just one tenth of a second between the two Nortons. We, um, we obviously didn't see that on screen, but I, I reckon that Steve Brogan will claim that he's towed him round for that lap time. <laughs> We shall see. And it's a Norton 1 2 3 because Michael Russell and Michael Rutter have gone third fastest with their Norton Manx, the 1961 bike. Fourth fastest then uh, is the matchless of Mike Farrell and Dean Harrison, who was picking up more, more and more pace at the end there. Uh, just that final lap didn't work quite so well, but uh, first of the non Nortons, if you like, uh, coming out and setting the fourth fastest time. And then fifth fastest is the number 17 of Stuart Tom and Tommy Hill. And Stuart, who uh, an experienced engine builder uh, on the committee of the Lansdowne Classic. This this bike was rebuilt in the early 1970s, so they've uh, they've been going well with that one. Yeah, so obviously the, this is all well and good being the fastest, but it's obviously the, the biggest thing is how quick your second rider is or the second time. So obviously on the aggregate aggregate races, that's the most important part. So we can't read too much into who is just the overall quickest because obviously they, they normally have to do between six and eight laps each. So it's quite important that the second rider is as quick. So let's have a look at the Barry Shee Memorial Trophy qualifying session. And we saw some great action out there, didn't we, Lee? Um, so these beautiful bikes from the 1960s, early 1960s, the majority of them. And the Norton Max is the, is the sort of dominant form. But the BMW-powered bike you just saw there, also fun to see. But uh, the front runners on those Norton Maxes are getting their absolute maximum out of them. So many of these bikes are beautifully prepared. That's the BMW RS54 short stroke we were just looking at and the style and the riders balance lovely to watch yeah so obviously i the thing i like the most is is the elder statesmen of the the sport tend to sit on the bike a lot more a lot more upright style whereas you see they're in shot for a second ago with someone like richard cooper with the more modern style is hung really off the bike but in acquaintance it, it ends up being a similar lap time which is quite quite funny you know both both are very very successful uh, we saw some some great riding and some superstars as well. The legend John McGuinness on the number 45. Uh, John McGuinness, uh, he's ninth on the grid in the end. So we'll see how that goes. Number 12, that ended up second fastest, Ian Bain and Steve Brogan. That was rapid throughout the entire session. Some, of course, getting a little caught up in traffic at times, but there were no major dramas. We had one or two bikes pulling off with uh, mechanical problems, but thankfully most of them were able to continue. There you can see where the knee's on the ground and the cylinder ahead of the BMW engine is almost on the ground, not quite. Number 17, the Stuart Tong Tommy Hill bike. That uh, was pretty high. That was fifth fastest in the end. 
Uh, but uh, as we mentioned, the pace in the end was set by the number 23 bike of George Thomas and Davy Todd. So it is the Thomas Todd bike, there you are, that will be starting from pole position for the Barry Sheen Memorial. To hear them start and then... <laughs> gut health affects every single aspect of your body from your brain wiring to your energy output to your hormone regulation to how clever your immune system is everybody benefits from better gut health because it makes your body work better i would thoroughly recommend goodwood gut health program it's been quite life-changing really to buy rotation which is a rental app which we bought to life by Ashita. thank you so much for being here just tell us a little bit about what you do so i founded by rotation i'm the founder and ceo we're a social network where you can lend and rent designer fashion with each other so you can save money make money make new friends dress in the most latest coolest designer fashion out there and save the planet one rental at a time. I was saying earlier, you know, it's nice to know that somebody else is old is someone else is new, and we don't always need to buy in new fashion, so the idea of actually renting to people is great. But also, you've got some special dresses here, haven't you? Tell me about some of them. So, some of them belong to very well-known, iconic people. Um, actually, we have one piece just here. Uh, it's a vintage dress that belongs to... Okay, uh, there's a vintage dress that belongs to Dame Helen Mirren, uh, who everyone knows as like an iconic actor. She's worn it on the red carpet twice, and it's a vintage dress. And all the rental income that she's making from it, she's donating it to Women for Women charity, which is such a great cause. It's so fantastic. You're doing so much good here. And in terms of the rental service, you know, thinking about sustainability nowadays, why did you come up with it? I mean, look, I was one of those people who was an ex-shopaholic. So I grew up in Singapore. National hobbies are eating and shopping. I really excelled in the latter. And I wanted to bring a service which was more about borrowing, sharing with each other. You know, we've seen that with Airbnb, with Uber. Why not with our clothing, right? It's so simple. I completely agree. That's amazing, though, that you've come from someone that was a bit of a shopaholic, but now has tailed it back down. Was there a reason for that? I think that it needs, I think sustainability and circular fashion, all these big buzzwords, they need to be much more inclusive to the average mainstream audience, like the ones who shop on the high street. Because if you use big buzzwords, it's going to scare people off. And the sustainable fashion you know, side of things, the industry, it's very much an echo chamber. So for me, I wanted to make it fun and accessible. And that's why we're also here at Goodwood Revival. Well, listen, I was about to say you are at Goodwood Revival. It's so fantastic to see you here with all your pieces. So you can come down here and check them all out but also have a look at the app as well by rotation don't miss out thanks so much rosie now we're down here we've got the assembly area behind us you can hear those revving engines and very shortly we are going to be celebrating 75 years of lotus it was 75 years ago the colin and hazel chapman set up lotus and wow, what a history it has. Um, David, can you just pick some of the amazing cars that we're going to get to see take to the track? 75 Lotuses all together. Well, as you say, 75 years since Colin Chapman put together his first car and it achieved success very quickly. We're going to have, a, well, a snapshot of pretty much everything you've got on there. You've got those amazing John Player special cars. We can see here, uh, you know, Graham Hill there with Colin Chapman. We've got... Colin Chapman, their private jet. By this point, he's doing quite well and uh, signing out there front. But he's uh, he went on to win, obviously, with Jim Clark in the um, 
1963 first world championship. Sterling Moss got a win for him at Monaco for the first time. And we're here seeing all the cars here. That we even got uh, Johnny Herbert, Karun Chandog, our very own Karun driving the cars down there. It's going to be a fantastic celebration. Some proper motorsport legends. I mean, Sir Sterling Moss, obviously, famously uh, taking that Lotus in the 1960 Grand Prix, I think it was. Um, but really, it's a special moment. And I love how Lotus first started. I think it was Colin who built his very first car in Hazel's parents' garage. They were See? obviously very understanding. <laughs> so anyone building cars in garages, you know, there is hope that you could go on to have and such a successful career. And he applied his mantra there, which was simplify and then add lightness. And that pretty much sums up Lotus, his you know, theory about car building and racing. And of course, it was very, very successful. Right. Well, there we go. I think on that note, we can hear the engines are revving. The cars are being pushed out to the track. So let's go down to Ed's down in the assembly area. Clive Chapman, we're celebrating 75 years of Lotus, um, surrounded by some of the greatest cars your dad produced. What were your earliest memories? Oh, um, going to Grand Prix with my sisters in the 60s and um, pushing, I think it must have been the 63, the first run at Hethel and uh, burning my leg on the exhaust. Uh, one of the painful memory, but, uh, and then uh, Jochen winning a brand Hatch. Uh, in 1970 it was a great moment. So much history here today, but it really it started with the car behind you, the Mark I. Um, this is one that you built from scratch, this is an exact mm -hmm. replica of the, the first, well, it wasn't called a Lotus then, I don't think, but there's the very first car. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got about half a dozen photos, fortunately, in the, in the uh, family album. Lotus in China wanted a show car, so we built them one, and having done that, we thought, well, we've got to have one here and a running one, and the guys, uh, because of Goodwood, basically, um, if it wasn't for 75 years being celebrated here, this would still be in the workshop, six months off being finished, but the guys did an amazing job to get it done. There's no slower project than your own project, is there? Absolutely right. We've got 11 customers here who are running in the races. They are definitely number one, but they're also here in the parade and just supporting the mark, and it's so nice to see. Formula One cars, Formula Junior, Formula Two, sports cars, touring cars. You know, Lotus really did compete everywhere as the gas turbine yeah, car yeah, um, uh, passes us here. Have you, have you got a favourite or is, is that like picking between children? I do really like the 72. Um, you know, I was just becoming a teenager, black and gold. Emerson was, was a really nice, still is, uh, a great supporter of the mark and collected me from school a couple of times. And they're, they're the kind of things that really stick in your mind. And um, it just ran for so long, six years, three world championships. Fantastic, Clive, enjoy it. Thank you very much indeed. So it's Ben Edwards and Alice Powell with you, ready for this Lotus Parade. And Alice, it really is a remarkable collection. It's lovely to see uh, Clive Chapman, son of Colin, there. I did see him briefly earlier as well, and he, he was telling me a little bit about that the rebuild on that, uh, what, what's called the Mark I now. As he said, it wasn't called Mark I then because it was the first car that Colin Chapman ever, ever developed. Um, and it is a remarkable history of cars that you're looking at there in front of you created by a man there's a, there's a, a lovely book about colin chapman uh, written by mike lawrence called wayward genius um and uh, and he starts the book his uh, conclusion is one word sums up colin chapman and it is star the most charismatic and brilliant engineer in the history of motor racing he says in that book and and you can understand when you look at the, the sort of, of what these cars are like and how they developed amazing it's incredible and i think that just shows what incredible engineering Colin was was able to do and to, to produce and we're so lucky we're, we're going to see a lot of cars heading out on track but it's nice to see them back here at Goodwood we're obviously going to see plenty of them of cars racing of, of Lotuses racing over the weekend we had the wonderful tribute as well anyone that was at the Festival of Speed we had the great Lotus tribute but you just look through the history overall for for Lotus and especially sort of team Lotus where they had you know I think it was 489 starts in Formula One, and and that is just absolutely incredible. And we're going to see great drivers going around as well. And uh, Johnny Herbert is one of those uh, which you can see now. Oh, it's lovely to be able to watch uh, some of this stuff that's going on. Uh, I don't think that's Johnny oh, in no, the car not, now. It? No, no, that's Martin Stretton who's in that car uh, currently. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, we're going to be seeing some uh, stars. There's Johnny. Drivers. 
there's Johnny. Yep, so he's in one of the slightly earlier uh, uh, Lotuses. And this was a period when Mario Andretti joined Lotus and then went on to win the championship in a slightly later car this. We'll see the Lotus 79 coming out in a moment. That was the car he won the championship. This was the slightly earlier model. And uh, Johnny Herbert's going to get to have a run. And of course, Johnny was a, a key Lotus man himself at one time in his life. Hello, so case, it's lovely that he's going to be back in a, a, a Lotus, an older car than uh, he would have known in the days just as ground effect was being discovered this was just before uh, ground effect really became a big deal and then the lotus 79 was the key one where ground effect became such a, a major factor and colin chapman was uh, absolutely crucial to creating that he wasn't the only one but he put a lot of the uh, background into doing it and johnny no doubt looking forward to coming out and playing isn't he yeah, he's always got a great big smile on his, his face as, as John is. The Duke of Richmond has a little look, a chat to, to the marshals down there who, as always, do a fantastic job. We wouldn't be having this event at all if it wasn't for, for the marshals and controlling the, the assembly area. And Johnny, he'll be, he's head of the field as well. Looks like he's in even a competition to try and get down there as early as possible. But uh, it's great to see some great liveries as well that not just cars but also some fantastic liveries the john player livery as well that old Ma nigel mansell car there so nice to see not just the iconic cars ben but also the liveries too absolutely right yes and this is uh this is that's the slightly later uh, lotus as well there is karun right so there's karun chantok who's going out in the lotus 79 so this is in many ways one of the most uh, uh, classic Lotuses winning the championship in 1978 with a really dominant performance with the ground effect and of course ground effect is something now in Formula One um, but it was Lotus that basically created ground effect and particularly with this version this was the sort of uh, the next car on after they first created ground effect this worked so brilliantly well and for Mario Andretti and Ronnie Peterson it was the dominant car of that year so sadly Ronnie Peterson died in an accident in actually the, the year, the 78, uh, the 77 car from the previous year at Monza at the same time that Mario Andretti won the title that year. So there was a, a big element of sadness, but it was a dominant force in that year of Formula One. No, exactly. And you touched on that how the ground effect and how that has played a, a big history and part in, in Formula One. And I think that just shows that, that how intelligent Colin was that is now it's still around now and we're going to have the pleasure as well to have the onboard camera above Curran's car for, for the lap that he's taking around. But the lovely thing about Lotus is of course they started creating Formula One cars in the late 1950s early 1960s Colin got involved Chapman got involved in fact in in working with some of the other other major front runners in Formula One and then creating his his own cars and of course there was a time before wings were were anything and it was time for his first Formula One car we're not looking at that just yet the front engine because they hadn't even got into mid-engine but then of course uh, the engine was placed behind this has got the fantastic Ford Cosworth engine the Lotus 49 this was one of the most crucial connections that Lotus created with Ford Cosworth and uh, one of the, the two of the dry two of the guys behind the Cosworth uh, team Keith Duckworth, Mike Costin, they had already worked for Colin and he managed to get Ford involved in investing into the engine and my goodness that engine went on in Formula One with so much success. Yeah it did and we can we're so lucky to see cars were ranging from 1948 to, to 1982 and uh, we're going to be seeing them going out on the circuit very very shortly I think a little bit of recovery still going on. So Let's have a look uh, at just going back to another little chat that uh, Ed Foster had with another member of the Chapman family, Arthur Chapman. Arthur Chapman, we're surrounded by your grandfather's cars here, but there's no, you can't walk past this one, the gas turbine car. Um, it's not like driving any other car. Just talk us through it. Yeah, it's, it's quite a special car, so it's um, it, when, you're, when you're there, when you're sat steady, on the brake you're holding against the, the turbine power, and then as soon as you take it off, you go off with sort of 60, 70 brake horsepower, and then you go on the throttle and it just slowly builds and builds more. But the, um, the four-wheel drive means it's a nice, easy car to, to pick up and build and, and just keep on driving with. So it's a great, great one to drive and very, very good fun. And we were just talking before that the apple has not fallen far from the tree because you're an engineer at Mercedes. Yes, so I work at um, Brooksworth uh, in engine development. So uh, I've, I've followed along the, the F1 lines with my, with my family and uh, 
it's very different to what we do working on these when I was younger, but it, it's definitely very good fun and uh, a, a different experience. You've been surrounded by Lotus all your life, and you know that's you know, it was your grandfather. Um, but do you, when you have an event like this, does it sink home just how much he did? Yeah, it really does. Seeing all the cars that were done over the year and, and seeing how many cars were made in such a short span of time and then how some cars lasted, say the 72s which are here, for so many years is, is the, the, the pinnacle of, of uh, F1. That really is a, a special thing to see. And all of them going around the track together is a real treat to, to watch for the family in, in general. Well, enjoy it. Thank you very much. That is lovely, and uh, in fact, quite a lot of the family will be involved in driving uh, some of the cars over the course of this weekend, right from the very, very beginning. Uh, but also some of the stars here, like Johnny Herbert, are getting this opportunity to drive uh, a Formula One car of great period. And Corinne Chandok, I think, is going to be the first one out, by the looks of things. They're getting it all fired up with the Lotus 79 being pushed along and taking on its path so that this fantastic machine that Mario Andretti was able to take the championship in 1978. These huge bolt-on fiberglass side pods, but with a Venturi underneath. And it was the shaping underneath that really created the downforce. They would have had the skirts, of course, right down to, to the ground level. They were, got banned, and I don't think there are skirts that go down to the ground level on that car anymore. <laughs> No, as uh, Kuren gives us uh, a wave, patiently waiting. But as I said, we get to see great cars, great liveries, but we also get to hear some great, great sounds. So really looking forward as Kuren lights it up, fires are down there, uh, and now we'll, we'll lead the field round for, for the first lap of this fantastic parade. Yeah, and that's, that's really tremendous to see Johnny Herbert going out. There's a slightly later uh, of the F1 cars as well. That's the Lotus 91 uh, with the Nigel Mansell name on it, um, one of the ones just behind. We're on board with Karun again uh, on the Lotus 79 for this parade. Some of the cars that you're going to be seeing out there will be racing this weekend. This will not. This is very much a display of the Lotus 79. And the time, of course, in the late 1970s when this was winning in Formula 1 was a time where Goodwood was not actually racetrack, but they did allow testing. So they may well have come in testing. And then you've got cars from the late 60s, early 70s as well. And when Wings first came in to Formula 1, that's so fabulous to see, isn't it? Because at that time, it, it was an introduction of the aerodynamics, and they mounted these high wings straight to the suspension. It didn't last long because they broke off, caused all sorts of chaos. Yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine, but and how times have changed. But one thing that stands out for, for me, obviously not being able to remember this period at all because I wasn't born, but just <laughs> the size of the, the, the tires as well that they had on the, as you can see from the great shots here, incredible size of, of of tyres that have uh, then, of course, developed now. They're probably a little bit smaller now. So we've, uh, looks like we might have had an unfortunate spinner just being able to... It's one of the can -Am cars. Yeah, it's the Lotus 30. I don't quite know what's gone. Well, I think we'll actually be seeing that one racing later. Uh, Maybe they're just uh, testing the limits early on. Yeah, absolutely. Getting a feel. So, uh, yeah, so we'll see how the rest of this goes. But it is lovely to watch and see. Um, so this is uh, Chapman himself out in the car now. And we'll see how this, uh, all these different machines are going. Actually, I think um, Clive Chapman is, is driving in one of the older cars. Uh, and hopefully we can have a look at some of the very early cars that, were, that Colin Chapman created, somewhat different to the very stylish and fast single-seater racers that came along later. Sports cars were crucial in the early part of the Lotus campaign. There, over there on the far side, there is the, the Lotus 91, um, and that uh, that actually was a, a successful car on one occasion for Elio De Angelis, Nigel Mansell. Now that one, sorry, that one there is the Lotus 88B. That that is the twin chassis Lotus, and it's lovely to see that because that was the car that got banned from Formula One because they came up with a whole new idea of creating. Uh, how it would work because downforce the number 11 car you're looking at there because downforce makes the suspension so stiff they created a double chassis where the downforce went through very stiff suspension the driver was in a separate chassis effectively to give him a bit of a ride but they got banned so this 
though it appeared at a couple of races, did practice in never was allowed to race. Still incredible engineering, even though it was it was banned and what a view we're getting down the straight. But just looking at the history of Team Lotus when they raced in Formula One, as I said, they had 489 starts, Ben, but six drivers championships, seven constructors, 74 race victories, 165 podiums, 102 poles, and then 65 fastest laps and a lot produced by cars that you will see going round at some point now so the history is just incredible so we're so lucky to be able to witness uh, it and also get to, to see some of them go around now a lot of the cars you're looking at the middle uh, group you will see racing this weekend so some of them are formula junior cars some of them are former formula two cars sports racing cars as well uh frank Kitty, uh, out in the uh, one of them as well but we've also got some of the older cars and as we mentioned the mark one that has been recreated by uh clive chapman's uh, group at the factory um, we will be seeing that go around it's basically just a modified austin 7 very very early days and it disappeared sadly uh, relatively many many years ago but they have recreated this new version so we will see that going around a little bit more and it is going to be driven by chapman family uh, drivers over the course of the weekend now actually there's the mark three on the left that is clive chapman driving that one there's the mark one on the right so that's the recreated one so on the left you've got clive chapman uh, mark three and this was a, a crucial car that colin chapman developed but on the right the pk3493 that was that's a recreation of the first uh, trials car that Colin Chapman created and I was talking to Clive earlier and he said it's you know they've just got it done in time notice how it's got two spare wheels in the boot now that was one of Colin's clever ideas that you weren't allowed to move ballast around in a car but he said oh it's not ballast it's spare wheels I'm allowed to carry spare wheels so he created to be able to put those spare wheels in the back to give him more rear traction I mean Again, you could say that's great engineering, couldn't you? He was a, a stunning, brilliant engineer and then worked with many engineers. He kind of brought in, I think they were inspired by him. And, and so many of the great engineers that part of the team, they were inspired by his creation. Look at the front camber on the Mark II, that uh, rather <laughs> reddish that a car. Lot. Yeah, absolutely. This, is, this was based on an Austin. This is the original car. So based on another Austin 7 chassis, he fitted a Ford engine to it and uh, modified the rear axle in a very clever way and he got a ford 1172cc engine in it and the car became competitive he did his first race in it at silverstone in 1950 colin chapman and then he sold it to a, a chap called mike lawson but this was another key part of designing a car that would be fully competitive when you look at that you look at these austin 7 versions and then you look at what he created in the world of formula one incredible he almost had like the world was was endless he could just carry on creating and then that's what he certainly did when you look at the very early cars and you look at these cars that we're seeing on screen now to, to those that won races in in formula one it's just incredible it is yeah it is absolutely remarkable and uh oh i wonder if that car's all right proving it can go off, road well. off. <laughs> it was uh it would have been used for uh, different aspects of competition, of course, but uh, whether that was quite the plan, I'm not sure. I think it's got a, a little bit of a, an issue there. That's a shame. That's uh, Nigel Halliday's car. So there we are. I've got the older cars on the left. As I mentioned, the Mark III, that was uh, based on the, the 750cc Austin Championship Formula 750 Motor Club, which is still very much a part of British motor racing. There it is. And Colin Chapman saw the new rules, created a triangular tubular braced uh, chassis and he did what's what's called de siamesing the engine the austin 7 engine that was something where and what does that mean well it was basically de about the inlet it, the inlet air inlet um was dual into each cylinder it, it, it was it was how he changed the air inlet system basically it was an inlet manifold system he modified it and it made it very effective and more powerful than everybody else. In fact, that idea got banned at the end of the year. It was typical of Colin. He came up with an idea. He came up with great ideas, and it's because everyone else didn't think of them. They, yeah. uh, they banned them, did they? They did. And it had, and it had a good deal of success, this car. Um, he was helped by Nigel and Michael Allen, the brothers, uh, building the engine uh, as well. It was able of doing more than 90 miles an hour at Silverstone. And that, at that time, that was, you know, that was something really quite special. The chassis was special. 
It was what uh, Jaguar came up with the C type at about the same time, but he was he was around the same time with that. But a car stopped in the background, didn't we? Yeah, it looks like it. The driver has uh, raised their hand, so. That's the thing, these cars are so old and we've got so many in the fields. It's expected to, to see some of them, but it's just look at the difference and the difference of the body shapes for all different types of car, all specifically engineered and, and thought of by Colin. It's just amazing. Yeah, we go from some of these front engine sports cars to rear engine sports cars, same with Formula One, Formula uh, front engine Formula One to rear engine lower and lower and lower you see the number 18 that is the lotus 18 which was the formula one car that won the first ever grand prix in the hands of sterling moss i'm not sure it's that actual particular car but the lotus 18 was um the first grand prix winner monaco there you are the number 18 and that uh, so that was the first winning style of lotus quite square but very low it had that uh, rear engine design and it proved to be very successful. It certainly worked, suited for Sterling Moss. Went on to more good success in his Ireland, winning, uh, winning races as well. Created in 1960, the Lotus 18, with the Coventry Climax 2.5 litre engine initially. And then they had to move to 1500cc because the rules were changed. So they had to put the, uh, the smaller engine. And funnily enough, the first ever Lotus F1 win was here at Goodwood within his Ireland in the 1960 Glover Trophy, and he beat Sterling Moss in a Cooper. So, um, yeah. That was in the Lotus 18, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the Lotus 18. So that, that car was so much a part of Collins' Formula One winning future going ahead. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Well, there you are. That's, they'll uh, head round to the end of this parade. As we look at, uh, there you are, the lovely cars that came along a little bit later. The one with Nigel Mansell name on it as well. And of course he was, Colin Chapman actually did support drivers. Uh, surprised me, he was a great driver himself. Uh, his wife Hazel did race as well. Uh, that Mark III that Clive Chapman was out in, um, Clive was telling me she raced that a few times. She used to sit alongside him in trials racing as well. I wonder how that went down. Yeah, um, so that was key as well. But Colin, Colin actually did support quite a few drivers getting into Formula One. Um, and Nigel Mansell was one of those. He, he, he was um, given a few words that he thought that they thought he was good. And he was brought in as a third driver. And, um, and it really did come together for Nigel through his relationship with Colin. So he's good at spotting talent as well as engineering. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, he, he was a very talented driver himself, but he, he stopped racing fairly early on and let others get on with it. Concentrated on the engineering, building a company that has been so successful. And here we are celebrating 75 years of it. It's great that, uh, it's funny, isn't it? That, Lotus began the same year that Goodwood began. So with the post-war, it was all happening. Busy year, wasn't it? Very busy year. And, and I, as Nicky said, I just loved the fact that Colin built his first car in Hazel's garage in 1948. I just think uh, that just shows a fantastic team effort, essentially, and a, a lovely relationship those two clearly had to make such a, a fantastic brand of, of Lotus and fantastic cars as well. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the relationship between Colin and Hazel was was very, very important. She invested into his company, as you say, his, his cars were allowed in her, her dad's garage. Um, she was part of it from the very, very beginning, and they were always together. And uh, family, we're going to see lots of their family here this weekend, which is, which is great. And several of them will be driving some of these key cars over the weekend. Uh, Hazel and Colin's daughter, Jane, um, granddaughter Alice and great-granddaughter Martha uh, will be out this weekend as well. I don't think they're driving today, but I think they we will be seeing them driving tomorrow. So the family uh, situation for the Chapman family is, is wonderful. Of course, they're still building cars now. We, yeah. we have, I think it was the Amira, wasn't it, that was launched at the Festival of Speed in that fantastic Lotus display where, again, we got to see the very old cars and the up to the very current cars so it was it was great as that comes to an end now as they slowly bleed back into the paddock and you can of course go and check these cars out in the paddock there's so many different cars to see but make sure you do pop down and uh, check all of these cars out 
Yeah, aren't they beautiful? Lovely to see. And as I say, we will be seeing quite a few of them out in various racing groups um, as we go through the course of the weekend as well. So that's, uh, that's lovely. The Formula Junior battles, I think, are going to be very entertaining. You're going to see Alex Brundle out in a, a Formula Junior in a little while. So that's going to be entertaining. There's some quick guys to go up against as well. Uh, we've got the Can-Am style Lotuses playing as well. Um, much, much more, of course. And we'll see them all out on track in the various different competition elements of this weekend. So there we are. That's the Lotus Parade that has been done. Um, we've got the Levant Cup coming up shortly. And then the St. Mary's Trophy qualifying, followed by the Tribute to the Queen. That's a part of today that's uh, also important after uh, one year of losing Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, it will be an opportunity for us to celebrate her fantastic achievements and also her love of machinery and uh, certainly this part of the world, both horses and cars. Horses, of course, were her main love, but cars too were important to getting around. So let's just take a look back at that uh, Lotus tribute. And I think Karun uh, Chanduk thoroughly enjoyed himself going out in the Lotus 79. I think, I think if Karun is in a car, he's enjoying it. If he's going around a track, he's enjoying it. But uh, no, he left uh, some lovely 11s outside. We saw that uh, famous tall wing that, as you said, didn't last too long is that Chris Middlehurst I think is uh, maybe driving that car but it was just so lucky to be able to to witness from the very very beginning to then of course there's Johnny Herbert in the that famous John Player livery yeah that that, that livery as you say was such a great part nice little slide out that she came too Johnny showing he's still got it <laughs> yeah wonderful and uh, Grun always enjoying driving all sorts of different vehicles around here and we're going right back from the start of Colin Chapman's career of just modifying Austin 7s as we saw in this little group and there's his son Clive Chapman driving that Mark III, a very crucial first uh, winning competitive car as it then moved up all the way through Formula 1 and up to the highest levels. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. hear them start and then into a wonderful group and your friends or family we're friends. friends and do you guys come here every single year we do every year we about our 10th year right. is it something like that 10 years, yeah, of yeah, years of being yeah. here what keeps bringing you back just the um the fun and the outfits and the weather to this today well you're all looking amazing let's start with you talk us through the outfit uh, 1940s style um hopefully <laughs> quite 
comfortable shoes. <laughs> and, and yep, that's it. That is key though, isn't it? Yeah. Comfortable shoes. We've seen them, we've got the white trainers. How important is this? Comfortable feet all day? Definitely most important. I'm not sure it goes with the outfit, but I have the shoes. No, I think it works. But can we just talk about your sunglasses right now? These are fantastic. <laughs> I've lost my other sunglasses. These are the only ones I've got. <laughs> I think these are fantastic. They're amazing. This dress is also brilliant. Where did you get this from? Amazon. <laughs> That's the way to go yeah, sometimes, exactly. isn't it? We can't just talk. It's cold, so you're going to be hot. Um, let's just talk about the men, though. It's not all about the women. It is also about the men. And I tell you what, you guys have made a real effort here today. Well, we haven't really. There's the girls have made the effort. We yeah, just wear, we just put wear on our white border suits every year. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from our friend Bill here, who's, who's a member of a famous rowing club in London. Yeah, talk. Of, this is fantastic. This is London Rowing Club. Uh, which is my club and I wore this because it's about the coolest jacket <laughs> for a very hot day but it, it is a very hot day isn't it <laughs> sort of fits the occasion I think oh completely a hundred percent this is fantastic oh, as well you. where did you get this from Amazon <laughs> it's amazing what you can get there <laughs> it, uh, yeah but these these outfits we all put together and they were just paint coveralls and we they just stuck all the stuck all the stickers on them now now boys do the girls get the say in what you're wearing or do you get the choice of your own uh, we get the choice of our own fortunately yeah in fact i think if we wouldn't be in border suits if they chose what we were wearing to be honest something <laughs> tweed but it'd be too hot today yeah. what's the plan today well we just we took us a while to get here it took about nearly three hours so we just had breakfast we'll go and see some of the practicing wander around some of the um the, the paddock and then go back to do some shopping later. So the girls want to do some shop. There's loads of shops across the bridge. Well, listen, it's so brilliant to have you here. I hope you enjoy the day. Go and enjoy it. It really is getting busy right here. Well, I'm here with Rob Huff, bringing some colour to the revival. You're looking good. Well, you know, it's a summer's day at Goodwood. What, what could be better? Didn't go for the tweed suit this weekend. Definitely not, no. And that's the, you know, we only found out the weather was going to be like this a few days ago, let's say. And normally September, UK, you know, you want to stay warm, especially at Goodwood. Sometimes, you know, sideways rain coming across the airfield, normally about 10 degrees. So this weekend is obviously completely different and everyone, I think, is pretty much stuck for outfits. So I'm literally running to the change room, getting my race suit and then no one can say anything. So. And you said you got a little bit of a tan on the cricket match yesterday. Yeah, we played cricket yesterday. Um, I'm not sure we can call it real cricket, but we, we, we played a form of cricket, um, I think with the original 1723 rule book. Um, it was very entertaining, let's say that. Did you win? Uh, it's the first one I've ever lost, but obviously I'm not on my own, you know, I have a team of people. And um, yeah, there was some challenging, uh, some challenging running skills going on on the cricket. Was that uh, heat related or age related? A, a bit of both, I think. More age, but the heat definitely didn't help. No, I mean, normally the heat would loosen the, 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 the joints, but it didn't seem so yesterday. <laughs> Well, that was really the appetizer. Today is all about getting into the cars. What have you got planned for the weekend? I'm very excited this weekend. I've got uh, a Mark 1 Jaguar with Justin Law in the St Mary's Trophy, which, uh, as we know, is a, a fan favourite. Uh, and then, as always, with Richard Mines in the E-Type Jag uh, PV96. Uh, beautiful car and, uh, yeah, very fast. So looking forward to two very good week uh, races this weekend. Sound a bit sideways as well. As always, you know, I'm in two Jags and um, yeah, we like to put on a show. So uh, that's what this weekend's all about. Well, the crowd always love watching you drive. I think you're probably best off hanging out here in the air conditioning yeah. in the Drivers Club. But best of luck this afternoon, Cheers, mate. Thank you. Air conditioning. Oh, who needs it? Not when you've got these terrific cars out of the circuit. It is time now for practice for the Levant Cup. And this is going to be a very special running of the Levant Cup presented by Sky Cinema. Because, Bruce Jones, we have some truly iconic Ferraris out there from 1960 to 1966. Well, let's just lay down a soundtrack. The Ferrari V12 engine, not a note that people don't like. It is absolutely exquisite. And again, you see the evolution of the car. We've got the... Uh, 250 short wheelbase, 250 short wheelbase competizione, we've got a Drogo, we've got the bread van, we'll come onto those, they hit the screen. The Lavin Cup is an event that sort of rotates, it's been exclusively for MGBs in the past, uh, it's been many, many things, but now is the time for these V12 Ferraris, absolutely exquisite, but as you'll see, Alex, the relationship between road car, admittedly very high spec road car and race car, is very close indeed, you can see the bloodline crystal clear here. Okay, session time ticking down in the bottom right of your screen, and you 
you're quite right, Bruce. We've had Jaguar D-types. We have indeed had the MGBs out there, but this is going to be a very pricey field. There are so many Ferrari 250 GTs in this arrangement of cars that have left the pits. They're now on their opening tours of this 2.3 mile circuit and looking to put some names on the board. 12 competing in this race. And uh, certainly some of the machinery. Number seven there is uh, Vincent Gay's uh, 1960 car, so one of the earlier ones in this grouping. We have a 250 GTO, or more to the point, we've got a 330 GTO, which was a larger engine, a four-litre engine from the uh, uh, 400 Super America. Oh dear, one of the Ferrari 250 LNs cutting on the, on the exit of the Lavent Curve, going around Vincent Gay. But you'd expect the Le Mans racers here, they are so exquisite. One of my very first uh, Scale Electric cars was one of these, so I have a. It's funny how little childhood toys can oh, become things that are very, very special to you. Indelible, absolutely indelible. The 250 LM you're looking at at the moment, driven by Rob Hall from 1964 and resplendent as it goes down to turn one, Madrick Corner. And of course at the time this was a car that the Ford GT40 came in and it was desperate. Henry Ford had been trying to buy a Ferrari, they wouldn't have it, and so, so he thought, right, what have you been winning all the time? Yes, Le Mans, so I'm going to take you on, and it was the real battle, but the 250LM still looks perfect, but the numerically dominant car in the field is the 250 short wheelbase competition, only the uh, second of those two silver cars, car number 14, John Hugenholst, owned by Racing Team Holland, and Hugenholz has raced this for a mere 30-something years, and 156 is that man again, Karun Chandok, out of the Lotus 79, gosh, does he get the best cars, and he's in the 250 GTO, owned by the Pika Frio Group, but uh, this, to some people, is the ultimate racing car, absolutely phenomenal, and uh, I'm not entirely sure I want to talk to Karun this evening. He'll still be popping and fizzing and banging and bubbling, but because he knows the history of the sport so well, he knows how iconic this car is. And GT racing was really where it was at. Formula One was at a bit of a low ebb with a one and a half litre formula. And then these were just much sexier beasts, if I can use that term. I certainly think you can, given the sight, given the sound. And yeah, it will do you into a little bit of behind the scenes. We're talking to Karun Chandok when he spent any day at Goodwood. A smile a mile wide and a frankly disgusting array of wonderful machinery to tell you about. He's adding another one to his collection mere minutes after driving the Lotus 79. Well, he might be hot under the collar, but it's absolute desire to drive this car. And again, Karun is really pressing on. The fastest time set so far early in this session is car number 26. That's uh, Gary Pearson in one of those glorious uh, 250 LMs. That's the bright yellow one in the Curie franc -Cachon. And at the moment, 156, Karun Chantok coming around in fifth place. But let's see, this will be his second flying lap. And it should be appreciably faster than his first. Going across the finish line now. Does Karun advance or retreat? He's... Uh, He's improved his time, but stayed in fifth place. But at the moment, that's putting him nearly four seconds down on the time set by Gary Pearson in the 250 LM. Car number 26, fastest of the lot. Yeah, Pearson, then Hall, then Ames, then Piro. Uh, the top four, then Gay, then Chandok, now down to sixth. Uh, here comes Gary Pearson. Is he improving on this lap? Actually, no. So I think he probably had a little bit of traffic early on. He's coming up behind Martin O'Connell, who can pedal anything very quickly. Going past the 250 GT short wheelbase. Competizzi only the C part behind the, the slash is very important indeed. But uh, Martin O'Connell saw him coming. Top historic racer. And uh, knew exactly where he needed to be. Didn't want to ruin his own lap, but gave enough space for Gary Pearson to come through. Gary's middle sector hasn't been improvement. So, uh, oh dear, a little bit of uh, smoke coming out of the back under hard acceleration of the uh, bright, uh, bright light blue competition in the background. And let's see, Martin O'Connell down in 12th place, 17 cars have gone out to set a lap time so far. But poetry in motion with uh, Gary Pearson, neat, tidy through Madwick, a two-part corner. Yeah, that uh, the number six in the background, the competition of Martin O'Connell is smoking away, and now Gary Pearson slowed down. Did you think it was his smoke? I don't think so. Another car that's uh, just coming up in the background is the uh, really unusual car, the Brett Van, car number 16. Should be catching up with the bright yellow number LM. Here it is, coming in the background. But, uh, yeah, can we see anything coming out of that car? Anything untoward? Because Gary Pearson might have heard something. He thinks, you know what, I'm going to bring it in. Now, the bluff tail on the... Uh, oh, well, going out of shot was the Ferrari Brett Van. We'll talk about that later. Over the line now with number 59. And... Yeah. It's number 73, actually had two numbers on it, and it's oh, yes. Emanuele Piro. So we've got one enthusiastic, massively enthusiastic out front. In fact, it's not, there's a, a saltire upon it. 
So that is not Emanuele Pirro, unless he's got a different helmet this weekend. Maybe he's uh, swapped his Roman heritage for something north of Adrian's Wall. Now that, that's the bread van. In those days, the chopped off tail, the can tail, they worked out it was a real aerodynamic tr uh, treat. And this was built uh, for Scuderia Serenissima, which is uh, Count Volpi's team, converted by Bitserini, normally driven by Nicola Salusa, but this was just more aerodynamic, the 250 GTO underneath and uh, being worked very hard by Alexander Ames there. Oh dear, we've had a rotation. It's the Drogo, Christoph uh, Van Riet's car, not looking quite as it should. Yeah, off the road, but able to keep it going. Car number one, currently finding itself in ninth position in the standings. And uh, and crucially, it's just, ah. Yeah, there's a bit of body. to inspect the damage yeah. and, uh, yeah, on the left-hand side. Well, there's, okay, so Gary Pearson's made it back. Whatever made him think, oh, taking the bottom out of that mechanic there. Um, but uh, bear in mind the 250 Drogo was actually created because it was a 250 GTO that was crashed in period. So we're really going for historic authenticity here. So it was crashed, rebodied. And uh, by Pete Farina and uh, beautiful lines, sadly slightly crumpled, crumpled there. Crumpled, that's a new word. So Pearson back into the pits. He won't be the only one. It's most of the lap to go for Christoph Van Riet. He's staying off the track. You can see, you might say, you know, in Monty Python style, it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> but uh, a fair bit of scraping down the side. I'm not sure it's probably going to improve stuff driving around on the grass, but I think he's just trying to pull off somewhere safe. So, yeah, he's not going to continue back to the pits. Unlucky. Easily done. Wise stuff to pull off rather than uh, continue all the way back to the pits as we go back to the 526. We go back to the Ferrari 250 LM, driven by Rob Hall, currently second fastest in our classification on a 128.934 and working the wheel into the uh, final stage. It's just the chicane to go. Well, he's just a third of a second down. It's the two Ferrari 250 LMs that are fastest. You look down the entry list, that was always going to be the case. More modern the, than their rivals, made for purpose for Le Mans and all the other great races, including the road race around Sicily. They're, they're competing on Targa Florio, a mind-blowing event. No improvement for him this last time around, but Rob Hall, again, He'll be nursing the car, thinking about where he can get the speed. The speed is in Rob, and he's trying to transfer that into the car. This is looking a bit fleet as he comes out of the second part of the match. So 17 have gone out there and posted a time. We're showing you the top 10 on the left-hand side. And now making his way through Ford Water. Wonderful sound. Really is something. And again, that uh, rear shot, that's uh, presumably Christoph Van Riet walking home, having left uh, the slightly broken uh, Droger. Hopefully it's just, as I say, it won't be cheap, but uh, bodywork repairs on that. We could certainly see that front left bodywork uh, down on the tyres. So we did the right thing to not continue. So, fastest time, 1 minute 28.619. That may be reduced, because Rob Hall in second place just banged in the fastest first sector of anyone. And the, the pace he, we saw, the rear shots he's going through St Mary's now, he's coming through the lavender peak, he's got the run down to Woodcut, and then you'll see him balance the car. It's such a difficult double part corner, and then the chicane. But the good thing is, well done, the car in front pulled to one side, let him through. This could be the pole lap we're looking at here. Yeah, Max Werner getting out of the way. Wonderful drift making his way to the chicane which will appear right about now on this car from 1964 up through the gears across the line and is it good enough to take the best time in the session so far our answer is yes top of the timing page with a 128 one great lap which takes him four tenths clear of the field eight and a half minutes to go and his rival the driver he just toppled in the other 250 lm gary pearson still sitting in the pits he cannot respond from there but yeah just under half a second clear car number eight pressing on now looking to sorry pick up the pace car number two beg your pardon that's uh carlo vergler the 330 gto this is the larger engine the four liter engine uh popped into this one as it evolves Amazing. You know, the cars never stayed the same. I'm not just talking about a larger engine at certain events. There used to be on the 330 GTO uh, great big air inlets above the rear, rear, rear quarters, just above those rear wheels, but constantly tweaking and trying. Aerodynamics was still fairly rudimentary. A back in period, brilliant quote from um, Enzo Ferrari said, aerodynamics are only for people that can't make proper engines. <laughs> What a quote that is. What an enigmatic quote that is. That's the, the sort of thing you can only say when you've got quite a lot of silverware back at the factory. Yeah, back up the claims. Oh, he has. There we go. But again, back.
back in the time here, you had obviously the world, well, what's the world sports car champion that kept on changing his name, that championship. But of course, for Ferrari, that was where he sold most of his cars. So he needed to have a competitive GT car. And of course, it didn't hurt them this year coming back to the World Endurance Championship and winning the Le Mans 24 hours in the centenary. Quite a story there. And you know what? It makes people from one form of motorsport look at another. So a lot of new Ferrari fans, new Formula One fans, have suddenly discovered there is something else. And it's good to get that cross-pollination. Absolutely is. The wide world of motorsport. And this is a great celebration of it. As we're about to set the order then for the field. It's going to be one of our races tomorrow. One race today. Six minutes to go in the session. Yeah, and Emmanuel Piro pushing on very hard in number 73. I know from certain angles it has 59 on as well. He's fourth fastest at the moment. Down by 2.2 seconds, but he's improved in the first sector. He's improved waiting for the second, second sector time to come on board. No, he didn't improve in the first, but he has certainly done in the second. He's got a nice clean run. Flows it beautifully through the chicane. And now it's just the acceleration to the finish line. So he's about to cut the beam. Can he improve into the top three? That would be his aim across the line. No, he's improved, but he stays in fourth place. He's got to find a tenth of a second to go ahead of the number 16. Bread van of Alexander Ames, the 250 LMs, the first and second. Still Rob Hall, the top of the charts. And Rob's not hanging around. He's just picking up the pace a little more. He's set the fastest first sector of anyone. 1 minute 28.1 is his time so far. Fantastic sound. Ferrari 250 GT. The SWBC version that's in your picture at the moment. We've definitely confirmed it's not car 59. We've established that in the last uh, few moments of the session. Quite a lot of traffic, though. Well, that's not what Rob Paul wanted. He was uh, fastest through the first sector, fastest through the second sector. Even though he was very good and the drivers kept out of his way, they interrupted the flow because Woodcut, you're still turning right and tightening through the corner and unfortunately couldn't choose his line. But there is time on the clock. Five and a half minutes remain. He will go again, knowing that there is more time behind the wheel of that magnificent machine. And it's a 128-1, so can anyone get in the ballpark? Uh, the, aim, the aim for Ames in third will be just to get inside a second. Piro will just be aiming for the top three. And we rejoin Emanuele Piro, Formula 1 driver, the multiple winner of the long 24 hours. And so much success here at Goodwood, as such a fan of historic racing. Based himself in the UK uh, when he was racing in Formula 3000s, always had an affinity, quite a, an angular file, but the diversity of machinery is what he loves. And like so many, he's quite happy to get into a car he's never really known before, But because not all drivers are, hist are students of the sport, but he always has been, and he's ticking off cars on his wish list. What a lovely role to play. That's a decent life to live, isn't it? You do get, as you say, Bruce, some specialists who stick to the same car year in, year out. It's great to see them do that, but it's also see, great to have famous names trying their hands at cars we've not seen them in before. Yeah, and historic racing, of course, not so much these, but some of the other cars were on really narrow tyres, so you get to see these cars going slightly sideways. You don't see modern racing cars going sideways, and that's why people should go around the circuit at various points, like the rear shot as the cars go into St Mary's, you can see them going onto the walls of tyres and dropping over the dip, and um, really the very best find this fabulous flow. Now, unusual car, the 250 GT Lusso, and that's Nick Padmore, who knows how to drive any form of historic racing car around here very hard indeed. That's good for eighth place at the moment, six seconds off the ultimate pace, but with every lap, Nick Padmore is going faster and faster in that. Lusso, luxury, this was the first production version of that, so we have got some truly historic, historic cars, if you will. And over the line goes the 1961 built number 11 and Cousins behind the wheel taking it through the first corner on the circuit Madrid corner which goes on and on and on and on and he's taking it to the extremities of the white line on exit well Ben loads of racing experience frequently see him in uh, Jaguar C-type but uh, of course uh, this is what I love about this car it's only had two owners since new not too bad you know a lot of competition machinery moves around but this is one that's a keeper quite clearly it's terrific as well. Three minutes to go. Who is looking for an improvement? Well, if you are looking for an improvement, that's not the way to do it. Not what Alexander van der Loef wanted to see, but crucially keeping it going in the Levant Cup. This is to set the order for the field and just tried to catch it when it wasn't there to be caught. Well, that's a replica of a thousand other moments like that at Woodcut Corner. You're, you've nearly completed the lap and you just have that sense, I'm running a little wide, my options are being somewhat reduced, but he did the right thing. He took it around. At that point, he didn't have much choice, but it's about where you put the car at the end. Not in the middle of the track. That was the answer there. 
Yeah, he did well to maneuver himself back into position. Uh, no improvements out there inside the top 10 at the moment. Uh, last time around, Emmanuel Ipiro moved up into third place, so it's very tight between uh, the cars behind the LMs, but certainly Emmanuel, well, uh, we saw how hard he was working. Car 21 has recovered, that's Alexander Vandeloff. Trying not to do it again, but he's got he's sixth fastest, so he's in the mix there. His next target is the number seven car we saw right at the start of the session, the 250 GT short wheelbase competizione of Vincent Gay. That's his target. Vincent is in uh, fifth place. Alexander van der Luf has just got to put that behind him. Just pushed slightly too deep when he'd done 95% of the lap. The one lap pace is one thing. The races, as we see at the Revival, can be completely different stories. And this will be an entertaining one. 25-minute race. The cars from 1960 to 1966. 90 seconds to go near enough. Paul, Pearson, Pirro, the top three. Now, the value of these cars, I've stayed away from mentioning it, is stratospheric. 250 GTOs have become the sort of go-to car if you happen to have a spare. Lots of noughts and uh, an M at the end, a million, but uh, apparently some of these cars, this may be their last ever race because uh, some of the owners have now decided that they may park them up because the value is truly exorbitant it's just phenomenal and you can understand but right now let's just revel in the fact we're hearing these glorious v12 racing engines still got a minute to go in this official practice session which is qualifying but uh the fact we're seeing them now applaud it appreciate it because uh, we may not see them forever absolutely enjoy them while you can and we have been so far still cars out there on the circuit we're looking at a very busy pit lane there's still 45 seconds to go in the session there's still some Personal best being set outside of the uh, top 10. Yes, that's often the case. We've got drivers who race these cars a lot. They can put their times in earlier. They're accustomed to them. The Brent van still pressing on. That's Alexander Ames, fourth fastest at the moment. He's got to find half a second uh, to catch up and, and pass Emanuele Pirro uh, to try and start from third on the grid but uh, that wonderful tale and, and you know some people said a bread van did they really deliver bread no they didn't deliver bread in one of these it's uh, quite simple be rather be rather hot to a cross on when it arrived isn't it? it's a great nickname it is a great nickname and let's see whether the improvement is continuing chasing the time there he's tied half second behind Emanuele Pirro we we'll see him fighting to get the power on as quickly as possible checkered flag is waving it's Hall, Pearson, Hero, and then Ames, who you're looking at completing his last lap of the session. Many parked up in the pits, but he's chasing that last lap. Not sure it's going to be an improvement for him, though, but he's gunning to the last. Yeah, six of the field already in the pits. One of the cars we know pulled off at the side of the circuit. That was uh, Christoph Van Wijk's 250 Drogo. That's still each 10 cars out there trying to improve their time. Is there going to be a gain for Alexander Ames? Simple answer, unless he's done something special in Sector 3. No, there won't. He's close to his best time, but I think he'll be starting from four. Over the line, where he will be starting tomorrow. So many exciting races coming your way tomorrow, but brilliant to enjoy the, the push laps. And he takes the acknowledgement of a very warm crowd lining this circuit. And now, completing the last lap, Bruce. And one thing you were mentioning earlier, it's not just about the one lap, it's about getting consistency. I noticed Alexander Ames was within a tenth of a second of his best, so he, he improved, didn't improve in Sector 1 or Sector 2, did in Sector 3, knit them all together. But those LMs, they're out front as expected, but just revel in seeing such a number of 250 short wheelbase uh, competiciones. I just think that's a truly exquisite car. And Custer's coming around the final stages through the chicane. What a great sound. Fast. Mark of a Jubox here. And he'll be pleased with the session. Learning a lot, even if you're not finding the ultimate pace. Uh, you might be wondering about Karun Chandok, where he's placed it. He's put it in P7 at the end of that official practice and also qualifying session to set the field for our race tomorrow, which will run to 25 minutes. So, cool down, calm down. That engine, I think particularly when we heard Ben Cussons picked up by the TV cameras down the start finish straight, it just sounds brilliant. And Ben's car is, um, is one that, uh, as I said, two owners since new, they're the second owners, and this is unrestored, steel-bodied production cars. So, again, it's that crossover between production cars and the full racers. And the 250 LNs, as expected, newer than most of their rivals there, made for Le, for Le Mans and other sports car races, top of the table. And great, there's the car that uh, took pole position for Rob Paul. That's being uh, pushed back into the paddock. That'll be a hot little office down there. <laughs> it is a hive of activity down there. 
We saw some gents who were finding a clever way to call off on this uh, fantastic day at Goodwoods. And there's so much to see here, including over the road. Don't forget that as well. It's one of your first visits to the Revival, well worth seeing. So there was plenty of action for us to enjoy in this one, Bruce. With the sounds, with the sights, and then, just quite frankly, Rob Hall pressing on in 526, one of those 250 LMs. He knew the straight line was the quick line. Kicked up a bit of dust in going there. 156, that was Karun Shandok, I'm sure making no noise at all in the cockpit. Christoph Van Riet pushing very hard for 250 Drogo. More of that later on. And, and then number 10, Nick Padmore, the one and only Lusso in the race. And here's the other 250 LM. That was going very nicely in the hands of Gary Pearson as well. They were setting the pace. Gary Pearson looking great in the 26 in the 250 LM. The cars that we expected to see at the front, and it's turned out that way. He parked up pretty soon afterwards, though. That was the moment where he was like, OK, that's enough. Cleared some space. This is the most dramatic moment in the session where we saw Christoph Van Riet finding the wall, and he too parked up to yeah, make well, the long trudge back. Well, hopefully that bodywork can be repaired. Emanuele Piro was pressing on. He was trying to get onto the front row of the grid. He was in fourth, then he was in third at the end. Number two pressing on the 250 GTO of Carlo Vergler. What a car. Yeah, almost no one had any more to the pitches, but it's the 526 that has done the job. Fastest in the session. And Hall with a 127.0, 10 laps. And we did see another dramatic moment with Alexander Vandeloff going round, but no one had an answer to Hall. But one lap pace is one thing. The race, 25 minutes of it after the flag drops, quite enough. And certainly there, uh, Rob Hall being shown the very outside of the corner going to Madrid. He must be thinking, cut me a bit of slack. But anyhow, he kept it on the black stuff and looking at the balance through the chicane here, fingertip poise, an exquisite car. And this is what really cemented Ferrari's history at Le Mans. And that's why we have a very special place in our heart for these V12 Chargers. You're never too young to fall in love with classic cars. It's a passion that lasts a lifetime, and it's a passion we share. Backed by over 75 years of motoring experience, Goodwood Classic Solutions is a unique new way to ensure your pride and joy. Goodwood Classic Solutions. It's a passion we share. On we go to Goodwood Racecourse, perhaps the most picturesque in the country. And as usual, there's a full house for Stewart's Cup Day. With the blower in working order, the bookies are happily chalking up the odds. In the paddock, the 22 runners give the customers their last chance of a checker. The field's in line. And they're off, with six furlongs to go. Well, we always say lots of people come from all over the world to Goodwood Revival. And alongside me now, all the way from New York City, is Dandy Wellington. What a treat to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. How are you? I'm very good, thank yeah. you. How are you? This is your second time at Revival. What brought you back? I mean, listen, I had to come back. <laughs> you know, walking around here, it is a vision. It's so beautiful, the attention to detail, and everyone looks so fantastic. Everyone's so kind. Goodwood Revival is the place to be. Well, you're a jazz band leader as yeah. well. What yeah. got you into jazz? I mean, I grew up listening to jazz. It's part of my heritage, my culture. I'm from Harlem, New York City, where jazz had its adolescence. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just the music of life for me. You know, they're so beautiful. You always sort of bring vintage into the modern day world yeah. as well, which was so important nowadays. But what inspired you about the past to bring it into the future? Well, I mean, really, when we talk about jazz, what better inspiration is that? Some of the greatest artists 
of our time. The best inspiration, the best style happened during the Jazz Age. And being from Harlem, where I grew up uh, down the street from where Duke Ellington lived, where Fats Waller lived, people like Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, they're all there. And how could I not dress like my heroes? Do you dress like this all the time? Because a lot of us have dressed up for just for revival. Is this your style? I dress like this every day. It's always a mix of vintage and modern things. It's all about how you style it. What does it make you feel like to be dressing like this? Because I know today I feel amazing and I want right. to go back to the 60s and live <laughs> like this. This is great fun. What does it make you feel like I every day? I feel put together. I feel like I can approach the world with my head held high because my tie's on straight and I look good. I'm wearing a detachable collar. It's hot, but I'm okay. It's great. <laughs> it, it's warm. It's warm in a jacket. I'm glad I'm in a dress today. Yeah. Revival is just one of these places that we are saying you feel like you've stepped into a film set yes. as well. Why yeah. is it so special? I think it's special because everyone who puts this on really cares. They really care about the irrits, and, and there's something here for everyone, you know, so it has to be larger than life. Whether you're by the, you know, <laughs> by the races and seeing the cars go by, or you're over the road by the fun fair, or you're in the paddocks, the stalls, like, it's incredible. There's so much here. So it's just that attention to detail. It's special. It's the place to be, and you've come all the way from New York. Dandy, yes. thank you. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of fun and games to be had here at Goodwood, and it's not just about cars either, it's about music as well. There is a lot of music playing throughout the course of the Goodwood weekend, and it's lovely to see people enjoying it and making the most, even though it's getting pretty warm. That's impressive, isn't it, Alice? Yep, I'm expected to see you down there very shortly, <laughs> Ben, in your break and practicing some moves. I'm not sure I'm going to quite manage that, but it's lovely to watch. Let's go down to Ed Foster. Gary, I love chatting to people who haven't been at the Revival before, and what are grids you've chosen to race in? Um, quite a few sort of reasonably good amateurs around you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a really um, competitive field. Yeah, you look at the, the list of drivers in the race, it's going to be, uh, everyone's going to be pushing hard, but it's, it's great fun. It's great to be here. You know, I've wanted to, wanted to come here for many years, and my, my, my schedule hasn't allowed for it. So um, it's great to get the opportunity to come and drive the car, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Unlike a lot of drivers, you've actually tested, admittedly, in the wrong conditions. Yeah, I mean, I've never driven the car before, so when, when I got asked to do it, I said, uh, any chance of driving it? So we, we came here last week, actually, uh, around, around this track. Um, it was chucking it down, so it was very wet. Um, so, so it won't be exactly the same, but at least I've driven it recently, which is nice, yeah. I know it's hard to tell because you're in the wet, but it's, it must be a bit of a shock getting into something like this. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've not, I've not driven, driven anything really that, that's historic or a period car. So it is, uh, it is a shock. It is very different, but um, it's still a car. It's still got four, four wheels and a steering wheel. So yeah, it's, it's all good. When was the last time you changed gear with a gear stick? Uh, in, a, in a race car, uh, that would have been. I oh, know the, the DTM cars I had, we had gear sticks until, until. But the H pattern was back in Formula Three in 20, 2001, I think. So yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. It'll all come flooding back. Enjoy it. Thank you. Well, all part of uh, what is an amazing lineup of drivers about to head out in what we call the St. Mary's Trophy, which is actually about two races, uh, but not one race where uh, they split drivers in the one race. There are two races, two drivers will separate uh, in each of the cars. Uh, it's a star studded lineup in St. Mary's one, and then in St. Mary's two, you have predominantly the owner's entrance of the cars. They get their chance to play and have some fun as well. But I tell you what, uh, Alice, we've got some incredible drivers in this uh, St. Mary's One group, haven't we? Yeah, there's... Uh, I mean, you can't really pick one. Just for example, we've got the current BTCC champion, Tom Ingram. We've got Romain Dumas, who has uh, been very successful in this race. He has won this revival race, actually, for the last two years. We've got Jensen Button. That man, Karun, he's uh, car hopping once again. He just doesn't get enough. We've got Tom Christensen, Jimmy Johnson, Darren Turner, Rob Huff. And the list goes on and on, Ben. It really does. And uh, it's going to be fascinating to see some of these drivers out there having some fun and games. Uh, but of course, Goodwood is not just about cars. It's also about aircraft. And there are some wonderful uh, machines here this weekend. This was a World War II airfield. And earlier on today, we saw the Spitfires going up as part of the show. And we will be seeing some of this uh, throughout the course of the weekend. We get these absolutely stunning views. It is truly wonderful. 
it is. And actually, I ventured over and had a look at some of these planes yesterday. And wow, they are amazing. So you, if you do get a chance to, to wander over that side of, of the paddock near the aerodrome, I recommend having a look at some of these incredible planes. And also, not just look at the ground, but look up at, into the sky throughout the weekend as well. The iconic Supermarine Spitfires uh, here, part of this Goodwood weekend, the RAF West Hampton display aircraft. And uh, there is also the Freddie March Spirit of Aviation. And uh, well, they're looking at some of the vintage aircraft from all over the world. Right now, we're getting into the start of the St. Mary's Trophy qualifying. So this is a qualifying session for the first of the two races. And this one is with the star drivers. And I say star drivers, I mean, basically, drivers with incredible backgrounds. And what are they racing in? Well, they're racing in saloon cars from 1950 to 1959, so quite an early period in saloon cars, post-war, um, 59, by 1959, the British Saloon Car Championship was up and running, it didn't begin until 1958, they were racing before that, but they hadn't specifically created the British Saloon Car Championship, which is now, of course, the British Touring Car Championship, until the late 50s, but they were all running, and that car you're looking at is Rowan Atkinson's car, Rowan Atkinson out racing once again, lovely to see him racing here, good with this weekend and he's in that giant mark 7 jaguar um, which is a big big machine and you wouldn't think that they would have been a, a race car in its period there it is but actually it was and it was a successful race car too the mark 7 jaguars uh, they were successful in their period at silverstone at some of the big events and rowan atkinson this is going to be a tough one, Alice, because Rowan is going up against some of the greatest drivers. He is, but, you know, he's not afraid, clearly, in that car raced by Sterling Moss at several times during the modern era. And uh, in the number six car, we have Karun Chanduk. So he'll be, and we've got the onboard camera pleasure as well, as he's looking down, just trying to work out which <laughs> gear he wants to select as he's hopped from car to car. But he finally goes with one, and uh, you'll see a lot of playing on the wheel. These are big heavy cars you're going to see them sideways you can see even going in a straight line near enough Karunza making little adjustments but look at the concentration there on his face did you notice actually i noticed he was actually had to look down at his feet to make sure he's pressing the right pedal because they're slightly offset and it's something when you get into a different car especially saloon cars that if the pedals are offset you can easily come off the throttle and hit the clutch instead of the brake because they're offset yeah, so uh, he'll be hoping not to do that, as you can see, already getting fully sideways. But I just like how he's just so relaxed and chilled. Look. He, he, Great. It is wonderful. He is getting the chance to drive the most amazing machines. One moment he's driving a Lotus 79 that won the Formula One World Championship in 1978. And the next moment he's, he's driving a standard, uh, which is lovely to see him out in, actually. The, the standard Vanguard. It's the only one that's entered into this race. It's the standard Vanguard 6 of 1956 and a uh, lovely uh, one of the cars the standard uh, brand of course it disappeared sadly in the sort of late 60s it was a key brand pre-war and, and post-war initially they had some fantastic machines um, but then gradually got taken over by triumph and disappeared altogether I did say to her in the hotel, lobby, you can see the bonnet flapping around there. Hopefully that stays down. I said to him, I hope you've bought a load of race suits. It's a warm weekend, Corinne, and you're hopping from one to the other. He said, yeah, uh, so does he. But on our screen now is the car number three, which is at the hands of Gordon Shedden, of course, three times BTCC champion. And he's done some, some racing round. He actually qualified second last year, but uh, didn't actually start the race. So uh, we'll keep an eye on, on him and hoping that uh, he will qualify slightly better, maybe one better for him, and uh, he'll be lining up on the grid tomorrow. The Austin A40 was uh, a great car in period two. And in fact, um, the 1960 British Saloon Car Championship was won by the Austin A40, Doc Shepard, who was racing in those days. And uh, there was a rally car too, interesting. Oh, we've got a car off there, it's just come to a parking spot. So I think, unfortunately, it's just a mechanical, and that's actually Mark Blundell's uh, Ford Zodiac. So that's a shame, I don't think Mark's gonna get much running. No, and uh, I just noticed that I said tomorrow. The race is actually today, later on today, just before the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. So that will be around about 5.55 later on today. So we do get treated with two races later on, which uh, which is great stuff, Ben. A 
actually, I think it's I think it's the other drivers out playing, isn't it? Part two. I think it's the part two. Oh yeah, you're correct. Yeah, so we'll see the same cars, but with their owners, or or not always, but often it will be the owners, the entrance, won't it? So we'll get used to seeing these cars, but we might see different ones fastest. Uh, right now, we're watching Matt Neal. So another superstar from touring cars. Another three-time touring car champion, as he's at the wheel of the Ford Prefect, which is owned by Colin Sota. So he's charging up the, the straight now, but it's, it's hard to really pick who we expect to see standing on the, the top step of the podium tomorrow, because these are all very, very competitive drivers. We know what touring car drivers are like, and we've got quite a few of these on the grid, but Roman Damas will be hoping to, to continue his run of form, and you could say do the, the triple and hope to to stand on the top step, the step again, as we can see. Uh, Blundell. Yeah, we've seen, you know, he's taking the style there of Fernando Alonso. I was just thinking say, exactly that, yeah. It's a classic Fernando Alonso shot, isn't it, when he was in Brazil, sitting on a on a chair like that. Wonderful. And, and yeah, Mark's still got a smile on his face. But what a shame he's not doing more laps. No, is he still having a laugh? And as I said earlier, great job to the marshals. Oh, oh no. Smoky, smoky. That looks like it's a wheel that's come loose. You're right. There is a front. The wheels come loose, yes, and rubbing on the bodywork, absolutely. Right. So, oh, no. Oh, down it goes. He, I don't think he knew that that was what was coming. So that's actually Tom Christensen in that car. So Tom Christensen in the Austin A90. Um, you can see his uh, distinctive crash helmet as well. Um, Rob Huff has just gone fastest, by the way. Andy Wallace was quickest a moment ago, but he has now gone to Rob Huff. As we look uh, further down, that's Tom Ingram in... Uh... Red flag. Ah, OK. So, yes, looks as though the uh, session is going to be halted while they sort out that car and uh, get it out of the way, which is understandable, I have to say. So Rob Huff just going fastest. Number 41, Jaguar Mark 1. And uh, Dumas, who you mentioned, looking for this hat-trick of wins in the St. Mary's, he's second fastest already in that huge Ford Thunderbird. I'm a bit wondering in these high temperatures whether that Thunderbird will last a, a race here. It'll be quick over a lap, but whether it can last a whole race, I don't know. But this is such a shame to see Tom Christensen's car lose a front wheel. Yeah, not ideal. Luckily, he, he was going quite slowly, so the wheel didn't roll too far ahead. As you can see, really smoking there. He's kind of having a look down, a look to see what happened? A very experienced driver, of course, nine-time winner Le Mans. So he would have known straight away something to feel correct. And then you can see it's just about to fly off, disembark at a slow pace. <laughs> the way he glances. Up. I mean, he probably didn't know exactly what was going on from all the smoke and the feel. He would have felt a lot of rub on the steering, wouldn't he? And he's probably smelling a lot of rubber, I can imagine, <laughs> as well. Probably thinking, yeah, that smells a little bit like a tyre. Something to do with the tyre rubbing. But uh, that'll be one then to keep an eye on coming through the field tomorrow. I can't imagine there's too much damage there. And hopefully the, the, the team will be able to get it all fixed and sorted. But the clock has now stopped. 13 minutes. 37 seconds and it's uh, going to be very tight I think to, to fit all these cars in the pit lane Ben. It is yeah you're right uh, it's not a lot of space but it, uh, they'll manage to sort themselves out they can come in nice and steady just going through there you saw Roman Dumas in that huge white Ford Thunderbird um, who's gone second fastest and uh, of course early days of, for, uh, of the big American machines coming over to British saloon car racing, and they went on, of course, to do extremely well until they eventually got banned <laughs> for coming over here. But um, Ford Thunderbird, an early version, and it'll be interesting to see how it gets on. I would imagine even on the brakes, it might be a bit of a challenge once we get uh, further into the race, but it will be quick, as we've seen already, over a single lap. Andrew Jordan's quite well up on the list as well, up into fourth place, I notice. Yeah, and I notice as well that Jimmy Johnson, so a name from, ah, yes. from the States, he's popped up in uh, P6. So he, of course, is a seven-time NASCAR Cup Series champion, doing a little bit of NASCAR, not, not a full-time campaign at the moment, but uh, that's pretty impressive, 1.2 seconds off. But just to give you a rough idea of times, last year, Romain Damas qualified with a 128.9. So still, uh, everyone was still warming up, trying to, to pick up the pace ever so slowly with 13 minutes left. So we'll see if we get down to those times at near the end of the session. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we're a little bit off that at the moment, 136.4, aren't we? So we shall see how that goes. There's Karun just going through in the blue and white number six. 
Uh, so a lot of drivers are uh, having to sit there. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to catch up with them. Let's go to Ed Foster. Right, well, if you think it's hot out and about, it is even hotter in the pit lane. Um, I said, Jimmy Johnson's here uh, driving probably the smallest car he's ever raced. He's sort of slightly in the middle of things. Um, constant feedback. Do you know what? I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to do, do a Martin Brundle. I'm so sorry. Um, Jimmy, a bit different to what you're used to. <laughs> I have never been in anything like this. And what a blast. I mean, you just drive the guts out of this car and it corners so well. Uh, and how many times are you braking? Um, only a few with the straightaway speed that I have, but it's very deep and much different than the Cobra or the Galaxy I drove last year. Um, but really just maybe three times you touch the brake on the lap. Fantastic. Well, it's good to see you back. Cool. Thank you. Right. Stay with me. Um, here we go. We've got Andrew Jordan here. So as we were saying earlier, this is Andrew Jordan's grandfather's car. And it was finished by these fine men from JRT on Thursday evening. I'm sorry. Um, Andrew, uh, very sort of unlike you guys, you finished this car without any testing. It seems to be pretty quick. It feels all right, yeah. I don't, like you say, we don't like coming to events and, and finishing it, but it was so important to, to get the car here to race it. So it uh, feels pretty good. I just feel like I haven't scratched the surface with the car. I just wanted to get a feel for it. This is actually quite good. I can just chill out a little bit now. I was a little bit apprehensive before driving it just because of all the hard work it's got in to get it done and you know you have those questions what's it going to feel like and it feels pretty good to be fair out right, the box you've driven a lot of cars here but this one has a little bit of a sort of special meaning doesn't it yeah this was my my granddad's car in the 70s um so we raced it in the, the mid 70s and uh, my nan then used it as a, a daily drive so uh, it, it's really really special to see my granddad's name on the car and um yeah it, it's it's quite surreal really Andrew, cheers. I'm going to, I'm going to leave you because it's, it's very hot in here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> right, let's, uh, let's carry on down here. We've got, um, we've got Jensen in here in a similar... Why don't we just have a quick word with Jensen uh, in a similar car? Jensen, a, bit, a little bit different from the C-Type. Um, how's it feeling? It's, it's also just strange because it's, it's just slower. So, I mean, you, you can't really brake anywhere. You've got to keep speed up. So, just so different to everything else I've driven here. So, it's taking a bit of time, but... I'm enjoying it. Are you flat through Magic yet? I'm not flat anyway yet. I mean, I'm a, I'm a long way off, but no, it's um, it's all right. Hopefully, we get a good good amount of laps still. Got a lot to lot to improve on still. All right, cheers, Jensen. Yes. Um, if you uh, Scott, see if you can squeeze through here. Very lightweight doors on that car. Um, Benoit Trillier there. Um, we got um, Rob Huff here, uh, who I think is up. I'm sorry, guys. Can I? Uh, oh, hello. So a whole gluttony of Jaguar men. Um, Justin Law just there. Uh, Robert, car's quick. Uh, it wasn't on the first lap because the kill switch, you can see, is just here. And I changed a fourth out of the first corner and turned it off. <laughs> so I did about half a lap thinking I'd lost the engine, pulled off the track at St Mary's, realised Justin had told me about this problem before, turned it out, fired it up, and the next lap we're on pole at the moment. So yeah, I feel quite comfortable. But just not sure if I'm going to turn the engine off again. You're just lulling everyone into a full sense of security, aren't you? Tr trying. <laughs> trying badly, I think. No, we just, we got a fairly clear lap in and just learning the car. It's the first time I've driven it. So, um, but it's just lovely. Beautifully prepared by the Law family. And uh, it just, it just responds nicely, you know. It's just, just let the car do the work. Cheers, Rob. Uh, right, let's have a wee look. No, Marshalls are still looking very relaxed, which tends to mean we've got a bit more time. Um, I'm going to try and get a little bit further back and see if we can get to Roman Dibber. Here's Alex Brundle. Let's have, just have a quick chat. Alex, um, how's the car feeling? It's, I feel as though this is perhaps a little underpowered. We're making lots of noise. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's about it so far. Um, it's great fun, though. Two-stroke car, yeah? Two-stroke Saab. So, uh, yeah, it's the nuts. There's a bit of latency on the old rev on the old rev counter but i tell you what it's uh, we're not we're not chart topping on the times at the moment but i'm having a good time i tell you what if there was a two stroke class you'd be leading it well i'm winning the saab class <laughs> i've i've just been told the team are very excited so that's great cheers alex thanks mate right there's uh cars starting up but i don't think that's because we're necessarily going anywhere quite yet um it's odd to see those sort of modern fans being put in front of the radiators just to keep them, keep them cool. Um, we've got Max Chilton here, I think. Uh, I seem to be making a habit of just interrupting people. Anyone who's talking, I come and interrupt. Um, 
How does the car feel? Um, it's great fun, entertaining. Again, I've done two laps trying to learn a new car with other cars around, but it's good wood. I'm, I've got a smile on my face, whether I'm thinking what gear am I in next, but it's great fun. Um, plenty of time to find, but hopefully we get a bit more running in before, uh, before the end of the session. I thought with you professional drivers, you, you learnt a car in two laps. Well, all the pressure's on for this third lap then, let's see. <laughs> pressure's on, but um, yeah, lovely, great opportunity for Goodwood to give us a chance. And uh, the St Mary's is always so entertaining. You've got so many different types of cars, amazing drivers, um, and what a day, what an amazing audience as well. Cheers, Max. Thank you. Um, it is, I cannot tell you all how hot it is in these cars. It is absolutely extraordinary. Um, drivers obviously wearing Nomex underwear, Nomex race suits that are three-layered Nomex. Um, it is unbelievably hot, and having the door open like Roman Dumas here um, helps, but it doesn't mitigate against the heat. Would you like me to prop your door open for you? Yes, it's really, really hot, as you can see here. Yeah. Um, Two-time winner here, uh, back defending your crown, as it were. How does the Thunderbird feel? Well, OK, I mean, always quite big, as you can see. Uh, some issue with the brake. We have some leak on the pedal box, but the rest, uh, I mean, all okay. I mean, it's uh, you need some laps, you know, to readapt with this kind of big car, but it's so much fun already. A lot of wheel spin, a lot of slide, so perfect. Um, it's not really a problem you'd want in a car like this, is the brake, is it? No, no, not really. On top of that, with the weight of the car, you know, <laughs> it's not so easy to stop it, but uh, we will see. We just clean it and see what's going on. All right, enjoy it. Thank you. Um, now we're nearly at the back. Let's just um, carry on a little bit further down. Uh, who have we got here? The, the little BMW. Let's have a chat to Colin. Um, amazing little machine, this. Driven before by Andy Prio, but Colin's in it this weekend. Um, Colin, a little bit of a different model of BMW to you're used to. It's a bit, it's a bit of a tighter fit than, <laughs> than, than I'm used to. But uh, I thought you'd grown. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, the car handles really well. It's. Uh, I think our strength is uh, on the brakes and around the corners. Maybe lacks a little bit in a straight line, but uh, I plan to get a mega slipstream off somebody. <laughs> it's a case of just never lift. Yeah, very much so. Uh, but you know, this is obviously the first time I've, I've driven the, the, the BMW 700, but um, yeah, it just puts a bigger and bigger smile on your face with, with every lap. So uh, I've no idea where we're going to fall into the pack, but uh, I'll give it my best. That's the beauty of it. Enjoy it. Thank you. Um, right, I think we are pretty much there. Oh, I recognise that helmet. That looks like Jochen Mass. Is, uh, is he asleep? I think Jochen is actually asleep. This will be the first time I've ever woken anyone up in the pit lane. Jochen, um, I'm so sorry. You were having your afternoon kip. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you woke me up, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's all good. It's just uh, the car spun off and lost the wheel. But um, I don't know why it takes so long. But, uh... Has, uh, have you had people offering you money for your passenger seat? That's a good idea. We should do that. Do you want to come with? <laughs> uh, that's very kind. I'm, I'm okay, but the car feels all right. The car feels good, actually, but, um, you know, I mean, I've done one lap, really, because I came in immediately because my, my belts were open. So the, it wasn't clipped properly, so it opened. Anyway, I came in, and then the next lap, it was, clear, it was called off. So um, let's see. No, no, but the car is good. Theoretically, these cars have 160 plus horsepower, which is not bad, and it weighs only 850, something like that. Uh, it's my, so it should be at least from the, from the performance level, match uh, an Alpha GTA, and so on. So that's nice. That's what I, but you know, I'm a few years older now, but it's fun. It, uh, I, I, start again. I can hear I can hear the engine starting up. So thank you, Jürgen. We do that. Right, that is, we've, we've got a green flag waving, so we're back out on track. Thank you very much, Ed, and he did some great interviews there, as ever, uh, down at the pit lane, and the cars are coming back out. So let's just to remind you where we're at at the moment, as this session gets underway again with 13 minutes to go, it is Rob Huff who is currently fastest to the number 41 Jaguar Mark 1. On board here with Karun Chandok. Now, Karun is currently down in 13th place in the standard Vanguard, second fastest in the big, American Ford Thunderbird is Roman Dumas. Andy Wallace has been quick. He set the pace initially in another Jaguar Mark 1, currently third fastest. Then Andrew Jordan. We heard from Andrew down in the pit lane there with Ed in that uh, lovely Alfa Giulietta that his grandfather owned. 
And it's the first time they've actually run it here at Goodwood, which is a lovely story. And you just saw a quick glimpse of the little BMW going through as well that Colin Turkington is driving. Uh, here you're looking at Jochen Mass. We were speaking to him a moment ago. I'm glad he's awake uh, now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he is awake. Definitely on the case now. Yeah, no, it was great to hear for, for some of the drivers. And it would, I'm not surprised that Ed mentioned it several times, how hot it must be in those cars i can uh, shut my eyes and even imagine uh, we we have, we can't we have no right to complain this weekend of being warm in the commentary box we're sitting in those cars yeah. with a full race suit on and and the balaclava etc it's going to be absolutely roasting tiffany dell's just in front of this little group at the moment that's max chilton we saw max uh, in that little conversation as well in the red and yellow uh, little alpha julietta and just ahead of him tiffany dell is out in the uh, javelin and I, I did see Tiff briefly. He's doing various races. There it is. It's, it's that sort of greeny, silvery, greeny colour. Uh, that's Tiff. He said, I said, you're going to be quick in that one? He said, no. Nope. And as you can see, he's getting out of the way. Oh, at least he's uh, being polite and uh, moving out the way. Keep an eye out for Colin Turkin too. I'm going to keep an eye on him, see if he's trying to get that toe that he was talking about. <laughs> but we've got such a range of uh, engine capacities, haven't we, Ben, across this field from the one litre Ford Prefect to the seven litre, yes, seven litre Ford Thunderbird. So uh, absolutely incredible as it's roaring down the main straight. And you're going to hear it almost shakes the commentary box. Meanwhile, the Alpha going past the Mark 1 Jaguar, that's interesting. So uh, Max is going pretty quickly with the Alpha uh, Julietta at the moment. But as you say, the big four Thunderbird is in that group, at the back of that group. He needs needs to get a little bit of clearance, really, because uh, he's just going to have slow laps like this. Max has now slowed it, slowed it down a little bit. Now, we saw there was an incident a moment ago, Gordon Shedden. Gordon Shedden in his Austin A40, I think the door, yeah, the door's come loose. Well, that's one way to get air into into the car. It's probably not the most aerodynamic. Let's uh, almost swing, like it does, it swings shut perfectly and just in time for that last part of the chicane. That might be shut now. Do you think it's going to stay shut? It well, be. hopefully, he just needs to try and turn a little bit more aggressively. Let's have a look when he goes up the straight here. He's battling there with the number 34 car, which is Jensen Button, who slides down the inside. But it looks like uh, it's shut now. But he is pulling over to the side, so maybe there's another issue. Or is he... No, nope, he's... At yeah, he's going to come in. That's interesting. Is he? No, he's not. He's too far... Oh, no, he's made the pit entry. I thought he was going to go past the pit entry, but... Um, no, he's made it in. Maybe he got a message about the door. Oh, no, he's got more of a problem because he's not even stopping the pit, so... Oh, no. So he qualified seconds last year and had issues, didn't start the race. So hopefully he gets all of that sorted. But already, Rob Huff straight away going even faster. 135.9 now. Six tenths of a second quicker than Romain Damas, as there is... Uh, Andrew Jordan, who's I'm glad that he managed to get that car all finished and ready because he uh, is certainly going to be one to watch. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. But as you say, Rob Huff is flying along again. Number two there, Benoit Trudouille. He's going quite well. He's up to sixth. There's the, just saw the little BMW. And then uh, the Ford come. There's the Ford Thunderbird flying along as well. Trying to get a bit of clear air now, but it could be quick down the straights. Meanwhile, um, having a look at Tom Ingram in that uh, Austin Lancer. This is quite an unusual one. Series 2. It was a, a car um, created really in Australia. Um, they went for a slightly sort of bigger version of the Austins. Uh, uh, the, uh, it was a version of the Woolsey 1500, the Riley 1 1.5, um, and they made it a slightly longer, stiffer chassis. Uh, so you won't see many of these, but it's rather fun to see it here this weekend, and we'll see uh, how Tom Ingram, who's such a star, touring car champion, um, is going to get on with this. Currently number 39, where is he? He's down in 13th place at the moment. Yeah, so he last visited Revival in 2016, so it's great to see Tom Ingram come back. But there is the loud and noisy Thunderbird charging down the straight. We can certainly hear that when it goes past the commentary box. He's had a good first sector. This could be a better time, Alice. This, he's got a bit of clear air now, hasn't he? He was in such a group. Yeah, he was, and that's uh, that's one thing. Is trying to get a bit of traffic there. So he has, like you said, got some nice clear air. Not a great middle sector compared to Andrew Jordan, who's just pipped him now to go up into P2. But he's going to charge across the line. Let's see where he jumps up to now. So he takes retakes that second place. 
good effort. So uh, Roman Dumas looking for the hat trick of victories in the St Mary's. He's certainly up there in the game. It's not like he's down on the back. He's uh, in that lead group. As you look at Andrew Jordan, who's third fastest, ahead of Andy Wallace. Also going pretty well. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, the NASCAR star, he's currently running in fifth place. It's only the second time he's ever been to Goodwood. He made his debut here last year, the seven-time NASCAR champion. Lovely to have him back, and it was great hearing from him how much uh, he was entertained and how different it is to drive something like this. And I think, you know, for the drivers, star drivers, readapting themselves to cars from the 1950s, it's, it's such a different task, isn't it? It's totally different. Yeah, you've got to change all different aspects of your, your driving style, but at the same time, you've got to enjoy it. As Andrew Jordan's getting a little bit sideways, <laughs> It's a great shot that we're seeing, and he's going to feather it down into the chicane. Not, I don't think he's going to be fast enough to regain that second position there, Ben. He's still a little bit down in the first sector compared and in the middle sector. Well, let's see how it goes. Uh, we're watching uh, Rob now, Rob Huff, in the Jaguar. Storming last sector, actually. Sorry, Ben, for, for Andrew Jordan, so he does jump up uh, up ahead of uh, Dumas. Oh, that's good news. It's very much a part of it. Uh, so Huff and Jordan both uh, going well. You're watching Rob Huff at the moment. The man who has uh, had plenty of success here at Goodwood over the years um, and still races an MG pretty regularly as well, just to have fun. But of course, a World Touring Car champion, multiple winner in World Touring Cars. And he's, he's, he's got one of the longest professional careers in motorsport that I've come across. <laughs> Brass tracking as well can add to that now. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. But he's just come back into to touring cars, as, uh, British touring cars, should I say, uh, which was a great, definitely a fan favourite. I know the fans were uh, avid fans and the loyal fans to touring cars were really pleased to see Rob Huff come back and racing on British circuits in a, in a British touring car. But he's at the wheel of something slightly different, but he's doing a very good job. Yeah, he is absolutely doing a fine piece of work at the moment. And uh, Roman Dumas, who's uh, had those victories in the big Fords here in the St Mary's, he's often with the Shepherds, uh, Fred Shepherd and Bill Shepherd. Uh, I mean, that is the best camera angle I think we're going to get all weekend of just seeing how the cars go through Woodcut. It's so difficult because you're turning and braking at the same time. That's where Andrew Jordan is going through now. You can really use the, truck, the rear of the car trying to grab as much grip as possible. And then it's hard onto the brakes into the chicane to then get uh, that run up the straight. So not too much times changing at the top. But uh, Rob Huff has extended his lead at the top. Yeah, Marino Franchitti in that top ten, just below Karun Chandok as well. Uh, Marina Franchitti's in a 1958 Austin A35. So you've got a real mixture of the bigger cars, the Jaguars, Mark 1s, of course. They're big-ish, not as big as the Mark 7 of uh, Rowan Atkinson. Rowan is currently down in 21st position, uh, tucked in behind David Brabham, but ahead of Jochen Maas and Tiffany Dell. And, of course, Tom Christensen, who hasn't been able to do any more after a, that initial kind of run that, that he had in the car where the wheel fell off. Yeah, and I wonder if there's still uh, an issue with Alex Brundle's oh, yeah. two-stroke sub because that uh, hasn't really done much running. Well, it says he's done six laps, but his last lap was a uh, two minutes, seven seconds. So I don't know if they're uh, nursing a problem there. A good 26 seconds off the pace. But Alex, he's a lover, isn't he, of uh, the old school cars. He's been doing a lot at the Silverstone Festival. So, and you can often see on his Instagram channel that I think he calls it the br Brustang, something like that. He's probably going to have a go at me now for getting that wrong, but uh, he, uh, you can see him often posting great videos. Yeah, no, it's wonderful to see. And uh, I think that Saab is probably not likely to be very quick around here. That, that 750cc two stroke, but it's lovely seeing it here. Um, it, they did actually, uh, they did rally in with those Saabs, but they also entered them into, into sports car races as well. Uh, surprisingly, in a way, and uh, it worked very, very effectively. That, that the, the car he's out in is actually a replica of the Le Mans car of 1959, believe it or not. Um, anyway, we will see that later on. Looking there at the number 34 car, uh, that is Jensen Button. Jensen having fun, getting up to speed, isn't he? Up to fourth. Yeah, he's just chopped up to fourth, getting a little bit of traffic now between the, behind the one. 3-8 of Jimmy Johnson, so obviously there'll be pals 
<laughs> well, you could say Jimmy got out of the way from. I'd say he did. Didn't disturb Jensen's lap too much as he set personal best in the first sector. You could say, almost say two NASCAR races because Jensen's yes, been can. doing the NASCAR stuff, hasn't he? But I don't think he's got quite the NASCAR experience of Jimmy. No, definitely not. Certainly not. But uh, Jensen giving it a good go. And he put on a great display, didn't he? Going up the Goodwood uh, Festival Speed Hill. But it's purple now on our timing screen for that man, Roman Damas, who, who won and is looking for the, the hat trick on the previous two revivals here. But uh, Jensen Button is still charging up the hill as we wait to see what his middle sector is. Not a personal best, but still not too bad. OK, we'll have to watch that closely. We've only got uh, two, as you say, just over two minutes to go in this session. We'll see if there are any more improvements coming. Top ten. Nice to see Stuart Graham is in the top ten. He's currently seventh fastest in a, another of the Jaguar Mark 1s. Only 81 years old now, um, but uh, he's still up there in the top ten. Lovely to see. No, it's great to see. And there's the Thunderbird. Look at the rear of that car, Ben. And I can imagine all the corrections, yeah, that are going on behind that steering wheel. Dap on the brakes, sliding it in. They're getting stamping on that throttle. As he bleeds out straight, not a great middle sector, but let's have a look at this last sector to see if he can pull out a personal best to, to go up into first place. Not quite, so he'll be quite frustrated because that was a very handy first sector. Three tenths down on his previous best, wasn't he? So uh, it's still a good lap, but it didn't quite come, as you say, to take potential pole position. Rob Huff has the potential pole position with just a minute and a quarter to go. Uh, Dumas second, Andrew Jordan third, Jensen Button up there in fourth, Andy Wallace in fifth, Jimmy Johnson in sixth. I feel, I feel bizarre giving these names out, you know, it just feels so amazing to me to give out all these names. Huff, Dumas, Jordan, Button, Wallace, Jimmy Johnson, Stuart Graham, the older man but still competitive, Ben Watrun, Luie, Karen Chandok and Mari, Marino Franchitti. What a list of names and that's just the top ten. Exactly, and it's only at Goodwood will you be able to see a list of names racing around in incredible cars and obviously being very competitive against each other. So I think that's just adds to, to how special Goodwood events are. Oh, this, I tell you what, though, this Ford Thunderbird, it's going to be a quick car. We, we've seen him so quick in these big Fords already over the last few years. It really is, you know, it, that hat trick is a definitely an achievable thing to do this weekend, isn't it? We'll be watching closely. Yeah, and i am be interested if positions stay the way they are. Rob Huff obviously only has a 3.4 litre engine underneath him compared to the 7 litre of, uh, of Roman Dumas there. So I wonder how uh, Rob will play that at the start of the race tomorrow, which is 12.30. Uh, You'll be able to catch catch the race. And I'm, uh, you must not miss this because it will be <laughs> it'll be a good one. Checker flag is out. So it looks as though Rob Huff is going to be doing enough to hang on, still slithering around. Just watch him here, you can see quite a lot of correction, can't you, on the, on the steering. Yeah, here's a one person that I've just noticed has jumped up, is Colin Turkington, just outside the top ten, a tenth and a half off now of Marino Franchitti in the number 700, so that's a pretty good job for him. That's impressive, because that's a 700cc rear-engine BMW, and he's got it into 11th place, and he was looking excited when we saw him in the pit lane, but that, as you say, well spotted, because that's impressive, Colin up to 11th. There it is. Now look at this lovely little BMW. Rear end, the engine sits in the back. It's only 700 cc, well under one litre, and he's just gone into 11th place. Yeah, he's done an incredible job. He's taken the flag, so this will be uh, a lap to the pits for him, and there's not really, I would say, anyone around him that can can jump him. So a, a great effort from Colin Turk, who currently sits P4 in the British Touring Car Championship and has a long-standing history, obviously, with BMW. So you can tell he was very proud to be behind the, the wheel of, uh, of this car. Yeah, it's lovely to see. And uh, funnily enough, for all the bike fans who are also here this weekend, apparently the, the, the engine in this, based on a, on a bike engine originally, the, uh, it's a flat twin. 700 cc so you've got a bike engine in the back of a little bmw and he's colin's done a great job up to 11th place just outside the top 10. i think he's thoroughly going to enjoy another bmw ride this weekend yeah he certainly is but that's looking about it now i would say ben and it's uh, very close there at the front but it's rob huff there on your screen now that takes pole position 
Yeah, well done to Rob. I have to say, Alex Brundle was the slowest in the Saab. I think the Saab doesn't have much pace, sadly. Uh, it's still lovely to see it out there, but Alex ended up down in 44th. Uh, sorry, be giving it a good racing. go at the start tomorrow. Watch yeah. Alex Brundle off the line. Yeah, he'll always be quick off the line. But there's our man who's been quickest, Rob Huff, who's had lots of uh, good success here at Goodwood over the years, and he's uh, set the pace in qualifying in this rather lovely Jaguar Mark 1. And we will see these cars out later again today when uh, the cars, uh, mainly the car owners, will be out in them. So we'll see how that all goes. And they're just being joined in by Jensen Button, who's ended up third fastest. So we've got this uh, pretty impressive lineup uh, at the top end of the group. Well, it's all impressive. I can't really not be impressed by any of them out there, to be honest. But so you're going to have Huff and Dumas on the front row, Jensen Button and Andrew Jordan on the second row, Andy Wallace, Jimmy Johnson on row three, Stuart Graham, Benoit Trelouillet on row four, and then Karun Chandok and Marina Frankitti on row five. They'll all be having some wonderful battles. Wow, you do not want to miss this tomorrow. It's actually Jensen Button improved on that last lap to, to jump up into to third place. A really good lap by him. As you can see, Rob Puff now waving to the crowd. He's going to hang a right, pull into to the pit lane as some cars are being pushed back that uh, retired from the session early. Yeah, they're going back into the sort of gathering area just behind the pits now, so take them back in there. And uh, yeah, well, well done. And all the, most of the cars ran reliably. It was a little bit of a little bit of a shame to say Tom Christensen have the wheel fall off. Uh, and that might be something to watch in the race, though, because I don't think too much damage was done to the car. I think Tom will be able to start the race, but of course he will be starting way down the back. He's listed as 24th that lineup. Yeah, but that's uh, that won't stop him trying to come forward. We've seen some great displays from him but uh, here we go the cars were leaving the assembly area charging onto the track and <laughs> Grun Trandock trying to find out which uh, which gear to select a uh, number of cars he's racing in this weekend and getting sideways early on and the standard vanguard to the Ford Thunderbird a Ford Thunderbird that has won this St Mary's race a couple of years ago and with a driver who's looking for Patrick we saw Mark Blundell sadly out of his car early on in the session so he actually didn't even set a lap time so he will be right at the very back of the grid, but he had a relaxing time. I wonder time. if the marshal offered him a beer. <laughs> this was the issue for Tom Christensen when the front wheel just fell off. Hopefully they're going to be able to put it back on again and get him out there racing, but he will be coming from near the back. Yes, we had a short interruption due to the recovery of that car, but uh, then we could see the cars heading back out on track and all of them trying to get a good track position and also a bit of show off from the door there on Gordon Shedden's car. That's how you close your door. You chuck it through the right-hander and then chuck it through the left-hander and the door shuts. Just saw the Saab nipping through there as well. And we saw Jochen Mass having all sorts of fun. Richard Atwood, another very experienced driver. And there, uh, you could just see Rowan Atkinson going through. There he is. Lovely shot of him. Look at that wonderful shot. Well done, our super camera people all around the track. That was a lovely close-up shot of Rowan Atkinson's eyes as he was focusing going through the chicane. Yeah, and then it was back to, to the Thunderbird. Roman Dumas desperately trying to make sure that he got pole position. Not quite enough this time. One and a half tenths off, but you can see throwing it through the chicane. And is, how close is he going to get to the tyres? A little bit of room to get slightly closer. But it was that man there, Rob Huff, that uh, eventually took, took pole position, Ben. Lovely balance. Just beautifully done. And it's obviously a rapid car, this one. Uh, to Mark 1 Jaguar and it could well end up being the star of the show. We shall find out later on over the course of the weekend after seeing a brilliant qualifying session. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Lamont gearing in it and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s you've got time to think. In this car you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing.
Danny Phillips, who won the Great British Sewing Bee last year. Big fan. Tell us a little bit about your story. Where did this all come from? Um, so, as in how I got into this? Yeah. So, my grandma taught me when I was about eight how to sew. And from there, I've just been really, really into fashion. I've always worked in fashion. Um, and my mum was like, you need to go and sew and be, basically. <laughs> so that's what I did. And yeah, it's just such an incredible journey. I just, from there, it's just grown into this big, like, monster in my life that I'm like, yeah, really passionate about, which is amazing. And have you ever been to a revival? No, I haven't, but my dad goes every year. <laughs> So I know so much about it, but this year, because of the Revive and Thrive kind of aspect of it, I was like, I have to be there. He must be really proud of you then, if he's been here before and then suddenly you've got a whole <laughs> stall here as your first time here. No, he's going to come tomorrow, so I, I didn't, like, he's just going to be blown away by, like, the little craft shop, and I think for him it's, yeah, it's going to be like a really circle, circular moment, which is, which is great. Talk us through the collection then, because this is your first ever collection, yeah. it's brand new. What's it inspired by? So, as I said, my grandma taught me to sew, so it's inspired by her. Um, she's West African and it's just such a big part of her culture. So the prints are all inspired by West African prints. Um, it's all organic cotton with like upcycled parts to it. So yeah, that's what it's inspired. And that's really important. Let's just have a little look down the line then at some of these dresses because this one you were saying is particularly special to you as well and the print and you really wanted this one to be perfect. Yes, this one is um, actually inspired by one of my grandma's dresses that she always used to wear like around the house and it's just such a nostalgic memory for me so the print is really like derived from that memory that I have um, and as I said like it was the one that was like my passion my my really personal passionate one which I was like it has to be absolutely right because it just it's called the Monica dress after her so yeah that's really special well listen it's lovely to have you here and in terms of sustainability what does that mean to you Sustainability to me is something that's long lasting. Um, it's about encouraging your kind of traits and how you shop um, and just reanalyzing re how much you're buying and what you're buying for and how long you're going to wear something for, which is just change, changing your mindset back to how we used to shop, which is what it's all about. Absolutely. Well, listen, it's great to have you here. It's wonderful thank to see your you. new collection as well and celebrate your success as uh, on the Great British Sewing Bee. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, so now we are just about to get ready for a tribute uh, to Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away exactly one year ago today. And in the background, uh, you can see some of the vehicles that have been a key part for the royal family from Land Rover. Let's go down to the Duke of Richmond. As we all gather today on this glorious afternoon, it is one year to the day since we learnt the devastating news of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. With the passage of time, the initial shock we felt has begun to fade, replaced by sadness, but also overwhelming admiration and appreciation. Hers was a life dedicated to the selfless service of her subjects. Throughout her 70-year reign, she had a profound effect on so many lives, both in this country and overseas. It is in the nature of monarchy to look forward rather than back. King Charles II is now on the throne, and he has already begun to make his own mark in his own way. But Her late majesty was more than just a queen. She was part of our collective identity, the steadfast mother of the nation. Perhaps because of this, a faint sense of disbelief remains. It still requires a conscious effort to sing queen instead of queen, instead of king instead of queen during the national anthem. She pulled off the impossible of being all things to all people, and in turn, we should all be proud to call ourselves children of the new Elizabethan age. The cars in front of me on the grid are all estate vehicles that belong to Her Majesty, provided by our partners at Jaguar Land Rover. 
These are vehicles that played an integral part in the row and outdoor pursuits that were such a great passion of her life. As we see them drive around the circuit, please join me in remembering a truly extraordinary life, the like of which we will never see again. Thank you. Uh, look forward to this tribute to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and the, these cars that are, that are coming out to play. And uh, of course, when you look at the royal family's involvement uh, and of course often going off into areas where both on show, uh, so some of these vehicles are built to be able to stand in the back, but also they were very personal vehicles, some of these, because they were just going off-road a lot. Yes, and you think um, to get uh, guests on the Balmoral Estate, around the Balmoral Estate, that's exactly what they needed, and uh, a lot of these were adapted for that particular purpose. But then, of course, you've got the state vehicles, the ones in which uh, the Queen and uh, Prince Philip drove around in or were driven around in so many times. Such diversity, but also that faithful mark, Land Rover going into Range Rover, stayed true. Absolutely. Interesting, the Duke of Richmond is going out in, I think that's the Series 1 pre-production prototype. Um, and so that was the, one of the very, very earlies. That was before they started uh, building Land Rovers regularly. This is the Series 1, chassis R32. And this is where it all really began. It was just post-war when Land Rover created this wonderful machine. And of course, it has gone on to great success in all sorts of ways and with the more modern Defenders and Range Rovers. And we've got some of the more modern vehicles up behind. But that's kind of how it all started. Yes, and the fact is that uh, one of these very early prototypes, uh, well, a group of them were sent to the uh, National Institute of Agriculture and Engineering. It was quite clear where their focus was in the early years. Of course, they sort of took over from the Willis Jeep. There were many of those left over after, after the war. But uh, it was a vehicle that's evolved. And uh, anywhere you go in the world where the terrain is rugged, you are more than likely to find Land Rovers doing the job, one of the many jobs for which they were made. And certainly if you want to drive up a dune in Namibia, the vehicle to do it in is a, is a Land Rover of any form. Absolutely right, yes. And I was lucky enough to grow up, grow up with a, uh, a Series 2A Land Rover that my mum used to drive. So very much a part of what it is. And I know it can be uh, a little bumpy and uh, you, know, uh, you don't actually have soft suspension, but you do have the ability to go absolutely anywhere. And it used to amaze me how we could get through very wet fields uh, even then. And nowadays, of course, the technology is, is so impressive, they can go almost anywhere, up anything. Entirely so, but it's amazing how many motoring journalists have them as a Mark IIs in particular as their favourite vehicle. They may be one weekend testing a Ferrari or an Aston Martin, but they go back home and uh, they get out their, their Series 2 Land Rovers. But uh, again, looking at the Range Rovers as well, you can see made for purpose of uh, with the little sort of half seat in the background so that those standing up can have a little bit of support as they move around. Don't forget one hand waving to the crowds. They... They're using uh, what some of these are called the state review uh, type uh, Range Rovers. These are the ones, as you say, where you've got the space in the back. There's another one there just coming down the back. They call them the state review Range Rovers, and they were very much for ceremonial events, weren't they? Yes, as you can see, and, and, and taken all around the world for, for, for the purpose of, of that very thing. And you can imagine a little bit of air conditioning as well would have been sort of uh, vents down low to put a bit of uh, cool air uh, to those standing in the back. But uh, these, these vehicles, when you strip them away from the scenes in which they have normally been seen, there have been such an array of events that are sort of absolutely phenomenal, like the celebration of uh, D-Day, the vehicles were there with the Queen and Prince Philip. So there we are, there's that, uh, that lovely yeah, Series 1, the Duke of Richmond. Now we've got some wonderful pictures as well. Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh, open-top Land Rover in Newcastle in 1954. And this is a Mark 1 Land Rover at the Tour of Nigeria in 1956. And then looking on as Prince Edward was playing on the roof of the Land Rover at the Windsor Horse Trials in 1972. This one from 1977, uh, the Silver Jubilee celebration, that's in Antigua. And then... Uh, Queen Elizabeth and Duke of Edinburgh down the mall in the open top Range Rover. That was in honor of her 90th birthday. And uh, then there she is studying the inside of a Range Rover. And she loved driving these machines. She didn't want to be driven around by someone else. She would always sort of take them on and uh, go wherever. 
Uh, they were always a key part. To, of course, she loved her horses as well. And so going out to areas where the horses were perhaps being trained or doing other things, the Land Rover was the perfect thing to do that. It certainly was, and in so many ways, an escape, a chance to just be on your own and go and do what you really love. And the Land Rover was such an integral part of that for Her Majesty. But it's brilliant to see the vehicles. A lot of these, of course, modified for purpose, length and chassis and so on. But they did start on that really short 86-inch chassis and then gradually grew and grew. But, of course, this very early one, which the Duke of Richmond is being driven around, I'm sure he's uh, clocked up a few miles in Land Rovers, but uh, super early. But you can see... Yeah. Short, short wheelbase. 86 went to 88 very quickly, didn't it? But you're right, yes, the 86 does look very, very short wheelbase. There's another uh, early uh, Series 2A station wagon uh, we saw just, yeah, you could just see JYV, I think that's the one. Um, that was uh, one of the early um, of the 109s, the 109 inch, the long wheelbase as we call them, of course, going from 88 to 109 inch. Uh, that was with a, a six cylinder. It was one of the first to have the six cylinder power unit at that time. Um, so that was uh, often they would end up with the obviously the very earliest versions of Land Rovers and Range Rovers that have then become much more popular uh, to other people as well. Uh, so it's been a good display for Jaguar Land Rover over the years that they've had this connection. And I noticed that um, they still are being commissioned nowadays, one or two of them, for restoration by the royal family to, to keep them on board. Yes, the, the king spotted one that had been in the family for 40 years, then not in the family for 40 years, and that was uh, sold to a garage owner up near Balmoral, and that has been brought back into the fleet, so it's lovely to have that continuity, and uh, for a lot of people here at Goodwood and people around the world, at some point a Land Rover or possibly a Range Rover would have crossed their paths, and uh, so many people who have a Land Rover background keep a Land Rover background. Yes, definitely. There's that, uh, there's that rather lovely um, long wheelbase station wagon. Uh, which gave them plenty of opportunity to put the stuff inside and get it shifted along. And uh, they're all running along nice and slowly. This is just the parade to celebrate Queen Elizabeth II. And it's a nice way of doing it, using some of the machinery. Of course, Land Rovers and Range Rovers weren't the only machines that they used. We saw them out in Rolls Royces and all sorts of uh, other top level machinery. But these were key to them uh, for many of their, uh, not only their ceremonies, but also their own work. Yes, exactly so. I think it's the fact that uh, this display, the vehicles are almost divided down the middle between state vehicles for state display purposes and those fabulous parades and the ceremonies and then the family stuff on the estates and uh, just moving around and going to do what they want to do in their time. But you can see how much very clever modification work has gone into these vehicles, but uh, waving the flag very proudly indeed. So great to see these out on display here at Goodwood. Yes, and very unique. And as you say, the way they've lifted the roof off and raised the height of some of those Range Rovers and given it that sort of open top, it's a very unique version. You wouldn't see that anywhere else. Who else is going to need something like that unless you're on display? No, entirely so, and certainly over the years, I remember working on the estate one summer, and they had a Range Rover that had a, an extra middle section, and uh, people could stand out uh, of the top and uh, look to see what they could possibly shoot. Ah, oh, yes, I can imagine that. Yes, a key part of it. And I'm sure everybody who's out in these uh, vehicles is enjoying this nice little ride around, as we also get some, yeah, some shots being taken, some nice camera shots, and I hope for all of you who are watching... Uh, sideline here at Goodwood or watching online with us that you got some good memories yourselves of Range Rovers, Land Rovers and of course good memories of Queen Elizabeth II because that's what this is really all about our own memories of as uh, the Duke of Richmond was saying with growing up in her uh, period really and uh, of course we, we all miss her but she was remarkable did a fantastic job and uh, is much appreciated uh, a sentiment all of us will truly echo around and uh, people all around the world because she was a global figure and for many people maybe the first time they saw her in the flesh would have been riding in one of these state vehicles as we saw in that amazing array of photographs put up a short while ago they, they appeared in all corners of the globe indeed and it's nice to see the Duke of Richmond giving everybody a nice wave as they all come through and uh, Give your opportunity, if you are here at Goodwood, to, to give the Duke a, a wave back as well. He has created this remarkable revival, 25 years. I know we're going to keep mentioning this. I'm not going to go away from it, Bruce, because 25 years since this really all kicked off again at the circuit. The Festival of Speed, of course, had already begun, but, but getting this going as well was such a key issue. 
absolutely astonishing and it's brought so many people here from around the world they've watched it on on the screens at home or on their computers and decided they want to come but i would love to do a back-to-back -back with the scene set in 1998 versus now every single facet of the revival has grown and grown the stage setting and people understand the event now the, the machinery that comes the drivers the riders who come from around the world and when you walk around outside english is not the only language being spoken in in the grandstands in the paddock it's a global uh, coverage of this event and the queue of drivers and riders and car owners and bike owners who want their vehicles to be here goes from here to eternity no yeah, I, I agree with you absolutely it has become such an international festival in many ways now of the history of of motorsport and and bringing in as you say drivers from all over the world and there's superstar drivers from different aspects of motorsport uh, who loved being here at goodwood now and are really enjoying driving these the, uh, some of the older cars it's all part and parcel of it and it's it's lovely to see so the duke of richmond has recreated all this of course, after Goodwood stopped providing racing back in the mid-1960s, having been a very key part of British motorsport up until that time. But then it all just got a bit too heavy, a bit too loud, a bit too fast, and they didn't feel this was the right place. But now we can enjoy seeing some of those older machines back and enjoying a period, of course, that was uh, ruled by Queen Elizabeth II. And lovely to see, see the spectators here today dressed beautifully, albeit in the, the lighter gear required for these hotter temperatures, but just enjoying and really appreciating what the Duke of Richmond has assembled. So waving as uh, the Land Rovers come through the chicane at a abated pace, but uh, this is how most of these would have been driven, of course, on state displays uh, around the world. So Land Rovers, Range Rovers, all made for purpose, whether it's driving around the estate in Balmoral or driving... Somewhere very grand indeed uh, at uh, regimental demonstrations and celebrations and uh, obviously royal duty knows no bounds. One of the Range Rovers was one that used to carry the Labrador mascot, but they've taken it off, I gather, because they don't want it getting removed by someone else. So, uh, but it used to carry the, the Labrador mascot that was very much a part of the Queen. She used it very much in the later, parts, later years of her reign and um, yeah, it was very key to her. So the vehicle's now turning off the circuit and uh, great to see them, great to see them in clear line of sight, I think, so often surrounded by well, trees, if it's at Balmoral, or, or by yeah. just enormous crowds going to see obviously, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. So lovely to see in a great way to make the tribute to the Queen and the Duke of Richmond uh, will be heading out in just a moment. And uh, we've got plenty more to come here, coming along this afternoon, of course, uh, other events. Here was a lovely, rather nice slow-mo of the Duke of Richmond having his passenger run. And you look at that very, very early Series 1 Land Rover. Wind blowing across. I think it's a nice opportunity to get a little bit of air flow on a hot day like today, actually, unlike some of the... Uh, cars that we've got out there today which are just getting hotter and hotter inside without any airflow <laughs> yes any moment static on the grid not appreciated for the drivers they just want to get out and get on with it so plenty more practice today and of course we will end the friday here at goodwood with uh, the first race of the meeting we will that's uh, something to look forward to so let's uh, let's go back to nikki and david well, what a fitting tribute there to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And what I love is just the fact that at any opportunity, the Queen wanted to get behind the wheel. She didn't want to be driven, although more often than not, she was. And that relationship that she had with JLR, with the Land Rovers and then later the Range Rovers, which one would you pick? Well, I just actually <laughs> question. love the colours and the cars out there. We yeah. saw the great greens of some of the early Land Rovers there and the, the Defenders, and then that sort of bronze green of the Defender, which I loved, and the claret, of course, the royal colour. But it's just a really fitting tribute, a lovely speech by the Duke of Richmond and uh, a lovely tribute to Her Majesty. That was fantastic. Yeah, we do miss her, and it was a very special moment to, to reflect on all of the years and so many memories, the attachment that she's had with um, cars and obviously JLR is just oh, really showcased here today at the Goodwood Revival. Now, we're going to go and find out what is going on with the Revive and Thrive area. Let's go down to Rosie. 
Oh, what a special moment that was. And I bumped into two lovely ladies to talk about Her Late Majesty the Queen. We are celebrating a year today since she died. Just tell us what she meant to you. Um, everything, really, because she'd always been there in my life. She'd always been there. And um, I thought she was a brilliant queen, very inspirational and a good mother as well. So, yeah. She was very, very special. She was a real constant as well yes. in our lives, yes. wasn't she? Yes, I do think so. And I think of the years of giving of her life in service to so many others and all the things that she did that were untold, unspoken, and having such an impact in people all around the world, really. Absolutely. Well, thank you for chatting to us. Thank Pleasure. you and enjoy your day. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you very much. Well, excellent sights and sounds all around the circuit here. Make sure that if you've uh, not made the journey yet, you remember to go over the road as well. Plenty to see there. But now we, after a, we're a couple of minutes delayed after that red flag uh, in a couple of sessions earlier on, but we are now building up ready for the Rudge Whitworth Cup and the practice session that will set the order for the race that we're all looking forward to. Now this is uh, quite a sizable one. It's a 36 minute race later in the weekend. Two drivers uh, racing Le Mans cars from the 1920s. So some big beasts coming your way in the uh, next couple of moments. Give us a wave if you see yourself on the big screen because why not? It's Friday, it's the revival. It's time to have fun. And this is the way into the circuit. This is how Alice Powell got here this morning. I wish, I wish. <laughs> Alice, first time we're in the commentary box today. How are you? How are you enjoying the revival? Love it. My first revival and your first revival too. Absolutely. The revival newbies. And I have to say, walking in here this morning, everyone's probably going, yes, we know, because we've all been here before. But it's like walking back in time. And I'm never usually one for, for dressing up. I was really excited this morning getting up and, uh, and putting my fancy dress on. So uh, I'm happy to be here, Alex. And, and what an event and what amazing cars we're going to see on track now. Yeah, we really are. This is the Roger Whitworth Cup cars being unleashed onto the circuit. Green flag flying on the main street. They'll have their first lap out. And you really, I mean, all of the fantastic machines that we've seen out on track today, you have to put quite a lot of effort in behind the wheel. Sometimes it's finger tipping through the final sector, for example. But here, well, there is some fantastic big piece on show. And we're immediately into it then. That is car 27, unfortunately, pulling off. That's the Bentley. And uh, the four and a half litre it's not quite there has yeah, pulled not, to the side of the road from 1927. I was just about to say, it's not quite stopped, but now uh, now he has stopped. So, disappointed. So I wonder if we will see quite an early red flag. It's not that it's not really near a marshal post to, to push it back. Don't, so mean, don't encourage them to get I'm the red sorry. flag out, Alice. <laughs> already had that earlier on. We've only got 23 minutes. A wonderful amount of track action out there already. Now, is this... Uh, is this car 27? Is this the Bentley? I believe it might be. We're zooming out, and it is indeed. So parked up. Uh, just trying to rectify the situation, trying to get a bit of momentum or a weight instruction, but he's not abandoned it at the moment, Alice. No, obviously extremely old cars. This Bentley from... 1927 and I'm guess that's picturing up with the race number number 27 one of my favorite numbers must be said uh, as we've got oh there we go there we go there I called the red flag early he's uh he was just giving us a teaser wasn't he keep your red flags down around the circuit uh, I'm glad he's found the solution uh, normally behind the microphone we'd say control or delete and off he goes again but it doesn't quite apply to a car of this era he has found for momentum though, very important. As we look at some of the other wonderful beasts out there, that's Bentley three litre from 1925 that just went through our picture, car number 10. Making our way through, driven by William Medcalf. And it is a two driver entry, so they might swap uh, throughout the session. Great sound as they all get up to speed, green flag flying 
around. So 21 minutes for them out on the circuit. And it is a 36-minute two-driver race for Le Mans cars from the 1920s, this one. So not the fastest times that we'll see all weekend, but very impressive all the same. They are all still required to run the numbers, of course, so you can easily identify them with your race card, which is available with the program if you've not got one already. That was the, uh, that was the sunbeam that we saw a moment ago. And they're all fighting their own part of the circuit at the moment. If we go on now, it's about finding your own part of the racetrack, Alice, and trying to see if there's any performance behind the wheel. It's exactly that, as we see the number four there. It's a 3.4 litre Marine Dietrich. Oh, yeah, not very good with my uh, German. I've got the suit to go with it, a 24 hour Le Mans suit there. We get behind that wheel. I'm not sure that might be Derek Bell that's behind that at, uh, at the moment. He's certainly going to be racing that this weekend. You've probably got better eyesight than me. Alex, closer to the TV screen there. All right, trundling along at the moment and checking. Well, you don't need to check the mirrors. You can just have a large old look yourself, can't you, when you're propped up that high? Amazing that these cars competed at the Grand Prix of Endurance, the 24 hours of Le Mans. Some wonderful examples out there. We've got Bugattis out there. We've got Vauxhalls out there. We've got Bentleys, Alfa Romeos as well. This is the Rain Dietrich that we saw earlier on. The B3 Six Sport, part of the uh, Le Mans collection. So where does the Ridgeworth Cup come from then, Alex? Do you know? It's not a test, because I do know. Well, I'm, I'm waiting for you to tell <laughs> us all. On so even then. the first Le Mans trophy was sponsored by British wheelmaker Rid Rudge Whitworth, but it was not raised above any heads until 1925, when it was awarded to the car that had, the, had best exceeded its lap target in the first three 24-hour races in aggregate. So the annual prize for overall distance was not introduced until 1928. So that's why we're celebrating uh, Le Mans cars here this weekend. We can see it's all getting a little bit crowded going through Woodcook Corners. They're all trying to sort out and find their space and filtering through the chicane there. Look at the they're great size. There's no other place you would see this, is there? No, such is the joy of it. And we're celebrating 25 years of the Goodwood revival since the rather canny decision was taken to bring racing back to this circuit. And you're looking First through the corner of the Invicta, the high chassis, 1929, made its way through. The Alfa Romeo there, the 8C, the 2300 LM version, as you would expect, it all adds up so far, 1931. And uh, it's Bond and Baxter who have their times at the top at the moment. James Baxter and Jack Bond in the Chrysler Model 72. Hence the number, number 72, gap of pretty much seven tenths of a second at the moment. But we've got a few cars starting to dot some purples on our timing screen. Alex, and that number one car, that's there in P2 at the moment. And as I said it, they just jumped to the top of the times and then they switched around again. Yeah, good final sector there from Bond, who has put the car at the very top. So excellent lap there from 72. And then it is uh, Cowan and Fiskin, then it is uh, Getley and Getley, then it's Bailey and Fabry, then it's McKinnon and McFadden completing the top five. And on our screen there, Ben Collins, well known around here at Goodwood, finished P3 in SF Edge Trophy at the members' meeting this year in a 1909 Bl Blitz and Ben. So he's, he's used to driving, you could say, cars of that era. And his son Archie actually also raced in the SF Edge Trophy. So Ben will be one to, to watch out for, that's for sure. 1925 Bentley three litre Le Mans entry from William Medcalf had just put it into sixth position. Everyone else sharing the car. He's on his own out there. And uh, time eight seconds off the pace at the moment. Two tenths of a second between uh, pole position and the car alongside. We're looking at the resplendent car number one. This is from 1924, the Vauxhall 3098. It is a Brooklyn special. There's a 4.5 litre engine underneath that. 
as well. We can see some of them may be looking to, to get a tow, or are they not? No, I probably wouldn't say that much in here as they go through Woodcook Corner. Seriously, got the lead going on through there. And actually, the SF Edge Trophy was one of my favourite races uh, of the of the members meeting here, just because of whole, how old the cars and how difficult the challenge it is for these drivers to, to drive these cars around. And the, and the leaves, most of them don't even have seat belts. So you, I can imagine you're hanging on for dear life uh, as, you, as you're going through, through, the, through these corners. Very few gears as well. It looks like someone's glove has come off on the main straight, uh, such as the effort being exerted behind the wheel. 60 minutes to go. It is Bond at the head of the field, then Cowens, then we've got Bailey, then we've got Collins, then we've got Getley, the top five at the moment. Good sector times being posted, though, by Collins. Yeah, as I said, he'll be one to watch. Got a lot of experience in these cars and around this circuit. So he's done a very, very good first sector. And a purple again in the second sector as well. So on an absolute charge as he's going to enter the last, well, he's entered the last sector now. And there he is on your screen as he comes through. Smoke coming out the back of there. He's going to change down. No, he, oh, he is yet. Feathers it through, just getting a little bit sideways, using as much as the road as he can. So I'm expecting Alex, him to jump to the top of the times, unless he had a poor last sector. Let's have a little bit of a look. Crosses the line now, and yet 2.5 seconds quicker than anybody else. Time to be found out there. Excellent lap to take car number seven, the Bentley Speed model from 1925, piloted by Benton Collins to the top of the times at the moment. Still 15 minutes to go, though. Uh, Derek Bell, behind the wheel of that distinctive Lorraine Dietrich, was, uh, was just holding on to the windscreen as he went across the line. So that's what I think he'd be holding on more to the windscreen. That's for sure. Go, there you go. There he is, is in the in the number four and just being told to go around. I wonder if he's got an issue with the windscreen, unless he is just out holding on for dear life. When you've won that many Le Mans, I don't think anything, not even <laughs> from the 1920s, would give no. him pause for thought. But uh, not able to go at the full pace at the moment, and uh, does find himself. At the, uh, at the back of the timing page. So a slight issue there for our number four entry. As Cowens and Fisker, they've got a little bit closer to Ben Collins. Uh, they've jumped up. 1.7 seconds is still the, the difference, but we still have 14 minutes left on the clock. So they'll be looking to make move forward in that Vauxhall Brooklyn's special. This is back to the Bentley Speed model that is currently top of the timing page. Making your way through. Dot around, show you as many of the cars as possible. Plenty of uh, thrilling backstory as well for many of them. Making their way past the uh, sunbeam there. As you said, these aren't going to be the fastest times we're going, to, we're going to see all weekend, but it's certainly going to be close and interesting to watch them off the line. Again, the SF Edge Trophy that we saw sort of cars actually older than this go off the line. It was certainly close and exciting. And still people are setting personal bests out there, but not, not anything as yet to, to trouble Ben at the top of the times. No, good time last time around. Uh, for, for Cowens to go up to, uh, well, to put a 154.3 in and uh, find ourselves in second place. Got to remember the race aspect of this as well. You're learning a lot about how consistently you can run the pace. Uh, last time around, for example, Ben Collins uh, putting a 155.9 on the board and uh, Cowens going quicker with a 154.3 of the five laps that they've been able to run on the board. Overall, though, Collins, fantastic time. At the limit, at the limit of that car from the 1920s, 1.7 seconds ahead of the rest of the field at the moment. You can see that on the top left-hand side of your screen. Signals being given that a car might just have to wait there. Certainly more orderly than we saw at the Formula One in Monza last week. <laughs> Definitely, and actually back to the start. 
of this race. We're going to see a traditional Le Mans running start. Oh, I love it. Fantastic. Yeah, where they will have to run and sprint to their cars uh, on the side of the track, and uh, they'll begin then the green flag lap. So I wonder if any of these have been doing a little bit of sprinting practice uh, <laughs> before heading out onto track before this weekend, just to make sure they're in good shape. Or some, I wonder if we'll see any of them lumbering up before the, the start of the race. So. Great to see they're keeping the traditions. The number 27 is uh, back into the pits, has is several of the other uh, cars. Number 27, Clarkham Bramhall, currently sitting in 12th place, 14.5 seconds off the pace. You can see a driver change happening there, the mechanic hitting down. Let's say you have to hit them with a hammer just to make sure that the tyres are done. And I would say that's a pretty decent pit stop there. Some of those faster than some of those we've seen uh, in, in Formula One, I would say. Don't mention a team. Don't do it. Don't no, mention I'm not a mentioning team. that team. We can all guess. <laughs> so back out there after the driver change. Uh, good for both drivers to get some time behind the wheel. It is a two-driver race, or is meant to be a two-driver race. If you can find someone to pilot the car uh, with you. 36 minutes. Uh, which is a huge amount of laps of this circuit if you consider it's a, a 152, which is currently our, our benchmark. Back to the distinctive number four. Distinctive number four has been getting a lot of time on the big screen. Certainly stands out in its colour, doesn't it? It's a 3.4 litre engine, 100 brake horsepower. Alex, and a very nice, nice standout blue, but unfortunately they're at the bottom of the times at the moment. I'm not sure if they had, had, have had, sorry, any issues. Yeah, in the French racing blue, colours used in this era. More sponsorship came in many decades later. And ticking through those, just checking for track position at the moment. Uh, oh, we look, we're looking for any improvement in sector time out there. Uh, fourth place, looking good to improve things. Uh, Bailey and Fabry posting a good first sector. And uh, McKinnon and Fadden had done last time around. But no improvements on the board at the moment. A lot of drivers have uh, changed around. Big alterations being thrown at the steering wheel there. In the 1928 Model 72 Chrysler. That is a fantastic looking car. And this car on the inside, Madrid Corner, begins the lap, 3.2 miles. It's pretty busy now, isn't it, Ralph? It must be a good gathering place as we've got a oh, little race down the straight three abreast. And uh, having a look down the inside, I can't work out quite work out which car that one. I think I'm back with a 44 car currently sitting in fourth place, trying to get a good track position. But it was getting very busy going down there into Ford Wars. It was getting me a little bit worried. Yeah, there's 24 of them out there at the moment. So plenty of laps being logged and learning being completed. Oh, it's looking a handful. Car 44, that's a Bugatti uh, from 1929. And a really squirreling under braking. A detail that you can see at the front there, throwing it in, working the wheel like it's about to come off in your hands. Wonderful pictures. This car was actually, the, the Bugatti 44 was of the type modified to race in this period at Le Mans 24 hour. And it's certainly being put through its paces with the amount of corrections that are going on behind the wheel. As we see some more drivers moving out the way for each other, just about. Here you can see the number eight car coming through in the background there, which is Turner behind the wheels in 22nd place. And we're back to the Bugatti, who's getting so so. I, I actually, I don't think, I think it's very rare to see a car go through not going sideways through Woodcote yes. Corner, even in a car of the age of these that are ranging from 1922 up to, of course, the early 1930s. Monroe and Hubbard's entry in the 98 Vauxhall from 1925, which is broken into the top 10, which is demoted down uh, to 10th position, thanks to a good time from Davidson and Overington, who have uh, just 
posted in the fifth fastest time uh, in car number five. Nice and helpful for us. That's in the uh, the Bentley four and a half litre blower is the nickname given to the car there. Yeah, no one making two. So we've got the new drivers coming out now. Not too many people making uh, making improvements. Car number five has gone slightly quicker in the the first sector. That's Martin Overington and, and James Davidson behind the wheel of the Bentley four and a half litre blower. You see that there on your screen now. Getting the lean into the corner. Plenty of corrections, of course going on so personal best in the first sector Actually, the last lap was their personal best as well so looking to to make their way forward Alex up the order yeah getting a good run of uh, laps this is one of the drivers uh, that have uh, one of the cars that have switched drivers and making their way through oh and that doesn't look healthy that doesn't look good. Bit of smoke. That is the, that's the pole position car there. And it was smoking earlier on, wasn't it? Ben Collins still obviously sat behind the wheel of that car. Where, so where, where would we put that on the on the smoke scale? More than earlier? Less than earlier? It's definitely more than earlier. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, so, uh, <laughs> it's a worrying amount coming from the uh, car that is currently fastest. Wow, the direction change, the, the, the shift, the almost convulsion that the car experiences when you go through a quick direction change. Fantastic that these cars raced the 24 hours of Le Mans, but not so fantastic that you've got the telltale line of smoke that will surely drag our fastest driver on the evidence that's, so far back to the pits. That's smoking even more now, isn't it? And uh, I would expect that the team will be hanging over the pit wall, um, waving him to, to come into the pits quite frantically. Is he having a little look down? He's definitely slowed down. But the Overington and Davison car has just gone purple. So much to Ben Collins is adding to his problems, should I say. Just gone purple in the first sector, Alex, with a 35.1. So getting to grips. They did briefly pop up into P4. Then, uh, then were jumped again by the number 44. So there we go. We're following them now. On, on screen so let's see as they're going to come now out of the second sector so we'll have a look to see if they're going to make improvements with just over four minutes remaining good luck from swift and Apthorpe. they've gone up into the top 10 eighth position for them uh, so that's a good improvement 1931 Bentley Birkin blower that has broken into the top 10 but we are understandably interested in the progress of car number five out there who had set the fastest first sector of anyone so far interesting to see whether Davis can take that Davidson uh, I should say it can take that all the way to the line uh, ordinary little sector by the looks of things but let's see then yeah, not a great middle sector as we wait for them to come over the line, but it's popped him up into P3. So only didn't do any personal bet, but the Bailey and Fabry car and the 44 that you've just seen ragging it round through Woodcut and in the chicane has popped up, Alex, into P2, but still 1.3 seconds off the lead. Yeah, good final sector of the lap, and uh, this is very interesting. Bit of right, looking very wide open compared to some of the domination that we've seen in the other qualifying set, uh, sessions so far. Oh, a great direction change for the 18. Bentley Birkin blower. This was regularly raced at international events. Extensively raced in historics in the 1980s and in the Le Mans centenary celebration as well. So Davis has gone purple again in that first set, so he just needs to try and string it up, don't they? Through the middle and last sector, because they didn't even set personal bests that lap. So they'll be looking in another, of course, Bentley, four and a half litre in the blower. They'll be looking to try and string it together. Seven tenths off Fiskin and Cowns in P3 in the number one car which is the Vauxhall Brooklyn Special. As we see, oh, a bit of avoidance oh. going on. They make contact. Careful now. Way too expensive. 
to be taking liberties like that. Oh, no. And actually, that was a better middle sector as well by the number five. Well, I can see why they were taking the risk, because they were trying to turn fourth into a better position. But that was mighty close. Yeah, you can see he's the having, final sector. It was very close. You can see him having a look over the sides, Alex. Is that going to pop him any further up? No, it doesn't, because that was a, a, a slower last sector. But the the car you mentioned earlier on, Alex, the Swift and Apthorpe car has just gone purple in the first sector. Let's have a look at the replay. So that it was the number 30 that drifted ever so slightly onto the to the racing line. Didn't quite see uh, Davison and Overington's car come through. This is the shot that we saw. Great avoiding action, and they did they make did touch. ever so slight contact. I think they would have both got away with it. I'm hoping they both got away with it. So we'll have a look to see what his... Has he taken? Looks like, is he going slower? No, doesn't. Well, he's, he's a few seconds off in that first sector. So I wonder if he's going to bleed into the pits just to get a double checked over, or he's just having a breather before giving it one last push. It was the Chenard and the Walker Sport T3, which was the other car involved in that one from 1924, along with the car still on your screen at the moment. Number five, four and a half litre blower, owned by Martin Overington. Now, the number 44 car has just set a personal best in the first sector and they were making gains weren't they they were chasing down the leader they were chasing down collins who is no longer out there due to that issue and he's just gone even better in the middle sector as we're looking now deep into the distance to trial he's got some traffic going into Woodcook corner he's also smoking as yet they're coming into the bit is he going to be able to go around the outside of the chicane no that's disaster for the number 44 who's come up with traffic in that final part of the lap because i'm i'm sure that would have definitely been a much better lap to move them even closer to ben collins but it wasn't a personal best this time round but luckily he gets another go because he crossed the line just before the checkered flag come out one last try then, smoking away. Not the only car that's doing that at the moment. Checker flag is flying on the start finish line. It is Collins and Graham that are top of the pile at the moment. Then it's Bailey and Fabry. Then the third place entry of Cohen's and Friskin. But can a Bailey and Fabry car do anything about the fastest time on the last tour of this session, which has flown by? Roger Whitworth Cup for cars from the 1920s era of the Le Mans 24 hours. Yeah, he's half a second off his personal best in that last, in that first sector, sorry. But he's still got two more sectors left to go. So you can see he's definitely still trying, definitely he's trying to push the car to the limit, running all the way out wide. He's got a little bit of traffic in front of him. Can he feather his way through? Yes, he does, as they're going down the straight now. Go up slightly uphill. Yeah, he's got quite a bit of traffic in front of him. Who's that? Just in front is that the number four car? Can't quite see. But he goes down the inside. You see the marshal's doing a great job waving the blue flag. But he's, he's down in that middle sector as well. So Ben Collins will be breathing a big, Alex, a very big sigh of relief because that was going to be a close finish if the number 44 was able to, to, to not get traffic in that last part of the last lap. Completing the tour all the same, coming across the line, having given it everything and secured the second fastest time across the board. It is Collins and Graham, Bailey and Fabry, Cohens and Fiskin, Davidson and Overington, and then Bond and Baxter. The top five after a entertaining session. There's the checkered flag waving. They will all bring it around one more time and send it back to the paddock, a very busy paddock, but uh, worth your time if you can get a vantage point. And uh, entertaining stuff out there, Alice. And a good battle for pole position in the end. Yeah, very good. I think it could have been even closer, but it's Ben Collins in the Bentley Speed 
I said he'd be up there. Uh, 1.3 seconds was the gap, but I don't think that's the true reading from from the number 44 in the Bugatti Type 44. Would have been a lot closer. So we've got a nice different match of cards there in the top three, Alex. So that will be uh, interesting tomorrow. It's, who's going to be the best sprinter of them all? Maybe have we got TSL to judge that? <laughs> They're going to have to show a quick turn of base to get to the car and then we go on to it. None of the uh, dangerous stuff that we saw in yesteryear with drivers leaving with uh, doors that weren't shut or the such like but a uh, warm reception for everyone heading back now to the pits having completed their qualifying session to set the order for the race tomorrow plenty of races a reminder there is a race uh, later on today we do kick things off at the end today with the freddie march memorial trophy that is your race on track to conclude the friday at the uh, revival so don't miss that as uh, we see these fantastic cars of the 1920s brought back to the paddock. Job done. Everyone got out there. Everyone set a time. And uh, I can't believe we even saw some contact as well. <laughs> no, it was getting a bit bit close, too close for comfort, for, certainly for me at least. But we can see you all having a great time in the grandstand. It is very hot out there. Make sure you're keeping hydrated, of course. Any. Any fluid would do, some will say. What type of hydration, Alice? Well, I would go for water. OK, OK. <laughs> Let's have a look at the action that we've seen. A lot of it in that session with some uh, great cars as well. And let's review it then. Back from the very start, they took their positions that they will they will run to these cars for the race. But uh, plenty of great names all the way through here. Uh, Bentleys, Talbots. Uh, we've got the Bentley Blur out there. Sunbeams as well. The Alfa Romeo was showing its stuff from 1931. We had a Bugatti as well. And the Brooklyn Special Vauxhall. But how good was it to see Derek Bell behind the wheel? of the Lorraine Dietrich, which was out there, the B36 Sport version. Yeah, and it'll be a rolling start for these cars tomorrow, and you can see all the action. You can see the race start at 15.20 tomorrow. And there was the number 27 of Bram Hall and Clark. Really, really nice slow-mo shots. And you, a nice, probably neutral seating position, I would say. There, no, not too much lean going on from the driver behind the wheel. Unlike Ben, as we've seen, nearly uh, leaning out. That's Plugged your pole in. sitter for tomorrow. <laughs> Plugged in and finding a way by. Could have seen some faster laps out there. Thumbs up, job done. Excellent stuff for the number seven. takes two drivers to win that race over half an hour behind the wheel of one of these just under a two minute lap for these cars around the 2.3 miles it's an iconic racetrack you're seeing plenty of action again and again and again out there and some close close contact as well so here's the replay here's the moment oh and it, we were squirming in our seats weren't we alex just watching that unfold but luckily nothing no too bad damage, I don't think. No, not at all. That's your lot. Great entertainment. Well, it's a glorious day at Goodwoods. The sun is shining and the action is unrelenting. Cars heading out onto the circuit now. We move from the Roger Whitworth Cup to the Ford Water Trophy. And this is going to be some sight. We're going to have a change up in the commentary box. We thank Alice Powell for all of her insights a few moments ago. And we will welcome Bruce Jones back to the microphone in a few moments' time. Once he's got himself set, once he's got himself comfortable, there's no need to rush on a day like today. Cover for me, cover for me, Alex. <laughs> right in position. So, yes, the two-litre cup for Porsche is a classic case of historic motor racing growing and growing all the time. They had their own championship that runs all around Europe and uh, a lot of those competitors here today. A field full of 911s apart from three, which are 901s. And that was uh, the original name for these cars. But then Peugeot said any three-digit 
number with the zero in the middle is patented. They are ours. You think of Peugeot 404s, 403s, etc., etc. So the 911 it became, but 901s, three of them among the pack here. But the key to this, Alex, short wheelbase makes these very early Porsches very dynamic. So mid 1960s, and the colour schemes, the liveries of some of these cars very much echo the period as well. And look out for the one in which. Uh, Duke of Richmond's son, Charlie, marches in. It looks like Paul Smith of the Fashion House uh, has designed that one. Absolutely <laughs> multicolored. Looks fabulous. Got some great names in this uh, edition as we have the green flag out there and the install lap being completed before we'll get some times to tell you about. In a few moments, we've got Tom Christensen, who is in the number 23 car. Uh, and we've also got Mark Webber making his debut at the Revival man who's associated with Porsche and he's going to be in the 116 entry uh, from 1965 so they're all from 1964 or 1965 and uh, it is the practice and qualifying session for a 45 minute two driver race and as you said Bruce the short wheelbase means they're going to look terrifically animated around the circuit they were the beauty about these is not just how they look how they sound is how they're driven and these drivers because they race them constantly just have a great feel for the car it's not a practice session if someone isn't smoking a little bit and unfortunately uh, <clears throat> number 69 peeling off the side that uh, Lars Kern and Max Morris Lars a works uh, Porsche test driver so he's not going to get much further than St Mary's but he did the right thing pulled off the side of the circle Oh, such a beautiful car. It's a shame we're not going to see it out on track for much longer by the looks of things. Uh, further in the order, this is uh, one from 1965, owned by Sam Tordoff. Well, Sam Tordoff running with the family 600 number. Of course, that's been their number through touring car racing for a very long time, ECT 600. But you really pick your, pick your colour scheme however you like it. But just going back to Mark Webber, the last time he raced the car was 2016 when he climbed out at the end of his Formula 1 career. He's got such a background with Porsche, of course, raced for them in the World Endurance Championship. And someone asked him, he went, oh, go on then. So it's great to have him on board. Yeah, excellent. Really looking forward to seeing Mark out there. He is behind the wheel of the 116 out there. Yeah, easy to, well, one of uh, quite a few cars that are white with a stripe. So his is white with a blue stripe, the 116. Let's look out for that. He's at the moment, the first flying laps going on the board and it's uh, Seb Perez, who's the championship leader, top of the table by seven tenths of a second. That's car number 77. Pick that one out. That's a sort of mid blue color scheme. Car 600, look at the tore off, tore off and it tumbles down to eight plates, but still only a dozen cars have put their times on the board yet. But what's going to be a benchmark time? So we've got a 1 minute 34.8. That's not going to be the top. It's top for now, but we've got, what, plenty of time. 25 minutes remaining. This is the Ford Water Trophy. Here's our leaderboard on the left-hand side. Perez top at the moment. Now we're checking in with the uh, Mark Webber entry for this uh, exciting Ford Water Trophy. Now, St. Mary's corner, get the car balanced. You can see the one in front, the Tordoff car is moving around a little bit on the track because you're not just turning, you're going over a crest and then into a compression. So if your tail, which is an element of a Porsche that you have to keep under control, starts to wag, you've got to work very hard in that office. Yeah, looking serene at the moment. Bonamy Grimes, the other driver that will be sharing the cockpit with Mark Webber. Oh, two off. Not what we want to see at all. Well, the 44 car is the James Turner Charlie March car, as mentioned, with that amazing uh, race livery there. And 69 is the one that's already pulled off. So they haven't been involved. They've both just pulled off at the same point just before St. Mary's. Thank goodness. Thank goodness for that. Far too pretty a car to be involved in contact. And the red flag flies. At Goodwood Circuit, two cars pulled off at the same place. Very unusual to see that. Synchronized parking and not the sort that we wanted to see. Red flag is out and Perez is the fastest driver out there on a 134.859. And all of them were just winding up for their second flying lap to see what can do. I do like the number plate for the 2 litre cup, 2 LCR. It's the attention to detail that counts and um, certainly for James Turner, he was, the, he was the person who basically got the 2 litre cup up and running. And uh, he, he also runs the series for Peter Auto, but so popular. Um, and uh, champions so far, Ollie Bryant and Andrew Smith have won the title twice. That's 2022 and the first year 2018. Mark Sumter won it 2019. Richard Cook and Harvey Stanley, they won it 2020. And Xavier Dejo 
won it in 2021. But leading the way this year, it's Seb Perez. Really, really strong driver lineup uh, with uh, teammate George Gamble as well. So this is worth pointing out again. It's it's a 45 minute two driver race. So you've got to get a good combination. Yeah, you can't go streaking off into the distance and then not be backed up by your teammate. Sometimes we do see that certainly in the parts one and two and occasionally we will see that in races across the weekend. So watch out for that teammate dynamic. Uh, unfortunately, two beautiful cars parked up. And again, just talking about liveries, car number 23. You need to look out for that one. It's, it's shared by um, nine-time Le Mans winner Tom Christensen uh, with Adam Smalley, who's been such a star in the Porsche Cup in the UK and also yes. at the Festival of Speed on the hill climb. He was terrific. He, he was absolutely fantastic. But the car, it comes from um, the Porsche Museum, GOH, but it's in that wonderful race livery of the Porsche Salzburg, the first Porsche to win outright at Le Mans 1970. On the drivers is here this weekend, Richard Atwood. It's red with the white stripes up the side. Charlie March there just getting out of car number 44, so he obviously realised something was awry, something was amiss, and he, he's very wisely pulled up. The smoke, I'm pleased to see, hopefully it was actually just steam, has uh, wafted away. So those cars ought to be taken away quite quickly by the Everyman Garage Land Rovers. So slight pause in proceedings whilst we recover those two cars. It's a, uh, well, I can't think of a sentence other than unbelievably busy pit lane down there. Well, when they're two by two, when they're one by one, it's pretty narrow down the pit lane. Careful where you open that door. And we're just waiting behind the red flag. And as we do wait behind the red flag, there's so much going on here that we can now check in with Rosie, who's been getting her dancing shoes on. Well, the atmosphere is really hotting up down here. And alongside me are Mark and Sue. This is fantastic. Amazing. It's a party yeah. atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely fabulous. We do this every year. Uh, we look forward. It's the highlight of our year. We're a local dance group. And uh, yeah, it's the highlight of the year. We look forward to it very much every year. So. Sue, how many years have you been doing this for? Um, we were trying to work it out. We think we've been doing this about 11 or 12 years. So, and it really is. It's the thing we look forward to. You can see how many people just start smiling when we're dancing. Uh, and it just gives us so much fun. It is so much fun. And being at Revival, what is that like for you guys? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just a fabulous event. The, the whole place. Because it, it's, it's not just the dancing, obviously, where we focus here because we're here to dance. But there's so much going on around the, the Revival. You know, there's something for everybody here it's just such a great event but besides the racing of course which is the main reason for most people coming but uh, no there's something for everybody I think that's why it's so popular well listen you said to me earlier that you do bring in some dancers but everyone can have a go so I everybody think I should get on to this should yeah, we dance absolutely. Mark yeah. let's dance We've got a red flag in the uh, practice session unfolding before your eyes, which means we can catch up with some of the drivers behind the wheels uh, who are downstairs in the pit lane with Ed. Right, well, where best to start? They're with Seb Perez, who's currently looking at his phone. He's, I'm sorry, guys, I'm just going to squeeze in. Um, it's uh, an amazingly small pit lane, this one. Try not to dent the um, Seb, you're looking at the TSL timing. You've uh, got to be fairly pleased with that. Yeah, it's, uh, so I'm George. Seb's out next, but... Um, yeah, good start. Um, it's a shame about the red flag there. We, we was on a really good lap just to the line, but um, I don't think it's allowed it because of the red flag, obviously. So, um, no, great start. Hopefully we can carry it on for the rest of the session. And what's the heat like with these tyres? Does it make any difference? Yeah, the, um, they're quite a tall tread block. You know, it's obviously an old tyre, so they move around a lot. The blocks get hot and um, they, they just tend to drift more and more, the cars. So uh, it definitely makes a good watch, but it's a bit bit sort of lively on a track like this uh, sideways around the lap right well enjoy it thank you cheers okay so let's um tell you what if you reverse up scott desperately not uh, wanting to dent any doors here we've got adam smalley here so let's have a look so adam um we had a chat to adam in the assembly area um adam uh, literally a couple of laps but how does it feel oh it feels so good um it definitely loses fast, as I said. Um, you're sideways all the time. But uh, what, what an amazing privilege this is. Being on, car, on track with so many other cars the same. Yeah, it's so cool to be out there. And uh, judging by the sweat on your face, your weight loss program's going all right. It's going great, yeah. I've lost about two kilos so far. Um, but uh, it's so hot in these things. Obviously, it's hot outside, so it's going to be hard in the race. Um, 
But yeah, it's such a cool race to be a part of. So many big names in it. Um, yeah, what a race. Enjoy it. Thank you very much. Okay, let's. Um, we saw. Where have, you, where have you gone, Scott? Here we go. Right, I saw Mark Weber wondering about it earlier. Um, let's just crack on down here. Um, we've got uh, Gordon Shedden sat here. Gordon trying to cut a low profile <laughs> to put, put, the, put the phone away. Um, where's, which, which car are you in? Um, a Porsche. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Which, Same as everybody else's. <laughs> Have you driven it before? Uh, I did about 10 minutes in it at a test day here a couple of weeks ago, yeah. So thorough testing programme. Absolutely, yeah. Left no stone unturned. <laughs> and it's going well? Uh, well, it was, but we've got a little bit of a technical issue at the minute, so uh, that's going to put us out of this qualifying session, but I'm sure we can get it fixed overnight. It just means it's going to be an exciting race for us as we hopefully come through the pack as the day goes on tomorrow. You'll we'll feel like a hero. Um, maybe not quite go that far, but if we can get on the grid, that would make us, uh, that would make us feel like a hero, that's for sure. All right, cheers, Gordon. Thanks. Uh, follow me, we've got... Uh, that, who have we got? I can't quite see under the helmet. I think that's Andrew Jordan. Andrew, <laughs> how are we doing? Just... Uh, Trying to get in the right mindset, and then comes someone sticks a microphone in your face. Um, car seems to be going well. Yeah, I think I'm in match third or fourth at the minute. So uh, he, he asked about swapping over there, and I said, no, go and do a couple more laps, and, uh, and then I'll jump in and have a slide round. So they're quite tricky to drive, these two-litre Porsche style. Um, we do a lot with them in Europe, and uh, obviously always limiting oversteer with the amount of weight we have out the back. So, uh, yeah, but great, great uh, spectacle with all these cars. Eh? Are they easy to get to, to go quickly, but then very hard to drive on the limit? Yeah, yeah, they're tricky. We, we've had people that have done a lot of other stuff and come to a, a short wheelbase 911, and they're tricky to drive. Um, quite, they're really, really easy to overdrive. You have to just bring yourself back and keep it neat and tidy is uh, sometimes easier said than done there. Yeah. No one likes being neat and tidy. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> right, uh, follow me. Let's um, carry on down here and see who we could find. I did see Mark walking about. Um, the, uh, it's very usefully, these cars actually are all different colours, because you do find with one make races, you get all the cars a similar colour. Um, that is actually, that is all the cars starting up. I can see a green flag, so Mark will have to wait for next time. Oh, we'll hear from Mark Weber at some point, I am sure. Thank you, Ed, thank you for expertly filling that red flag and allowing me to get some lunch in as well. Terrific. We learned about dancing too. It's a, a fun pack program, but right now the focus for these drivers 24 minutes of this session remaining. The vast majority had done one flying lap. So, Seb Perez, car number 77, we heard him being interviewed, but this pack is going to be shuffled. But again, to me, it's indicative. Championship leader, totally on top of his car, was able to nail it with that first flying lap. A lot of others, they've got to get a good one in. With so many cars, 30 cars, well, actually 29 went out to play, as Gordon Shedden mentioned. His one car, 52, did not get out. But as you can see, traffic, traffic, traffic. Yeah, plenty out there, including a uh, car for Mark Webber, a car for Jensen Button as well. And plenty from the world of touring cars out there uh, taking part as well. Uh, wonderful to hear the uh, idiosyncratic challenge of adapting, even if you're mighty behind the wheel of other cars. Everyone in the same one, and, uh, and the short wheelbase meaning that they're quite the hand. OK, one we need to really look for. We talked about Seb Perez, championship leader. That's car 77, top of the time charts. Car second has got a couple of drivers who've won the championship twice. In the inaugural se season, that was 2018 and uh, 2022. It's Ollie Bryant and Andrew Smith. So their car, car number 64, Silver, be out there putting its craft in. Car 65, one of uh, many trying to get a good lap time down on board that's uh, shared by Mark Bates and Jay Button, Jensen Button, who is a very, very busy person indeed here, hopping from one car to another. And, and there is Jensen on board, looking to get that to stretch its legs. He's got the bug, hasn't he? He's got the historic racing bug. Came here a few years ago and has enjoyed it back once again. And the 2009 world champion is out there on the racetrack at the same time as nine-time Grand Prix winner Mark Webber who is also pushing on. We'll see what they can do behind the wheel of these cars. And this, this is what's great about it. You've got, car, you've got drivers who are household names. You've got drivers who are racing it week in, week out. And we're going to find out who meets in the middle, who puts it at the top of the timing page. Yeah, so with that first flying lap before the red flag came out, Jensen Button was good for eighth overall, but needs to find a mere 5.7 seconds. But uh, we've seen what he can do here in an E-type, being absolutely phenomenal. Everything he gets in, he's quick. But we heard from uh, Andrew Jordan there about how tricky they are, these cars. You can really overdrive them. The tail definitely wants to wag the dog. 
the quick light times will come in this next time around but certainly the first half dozen car went past as though it was in a race they were one two three four five six and covered by a second going on to their lap they will trip each other up Perez and Gamble's entry along with Smith and Bryan have just set their uh, personal best in the first sector of the lap Perez has set a scorching time out there uh, 29-2 as they push on, 21 minutes to go, long way to go, still in the session, uh, but the top two going faster still. Yeah, and driver really started to hang the tail out to his uh, car at number 411, and uh, that's Vizoilin and, uh, sorry, at the moment, just outside the top 10, just trying to spot him now, down, down in 16, and Bucher sharing that car. Car number 12, and that trying to find its space out on the circuit. And that's uh, Ellie Cogan and Chris Harris. Of course, Chris Harris, the famous, uh, well, driving everything he possibly can get his hands on at Goodwood, but also, of course, for appearing on television quite a bit. Absolutely. Uh, it looks like it's Chris on board. It has that sort of press on demeanour as well, and he, he really has had some great, great results here at Goodwood. Yeah, this car winning the two litre championship in 2019. Originally from 1965, uh, improvements across the board. I think our top 10 is going to alter dramatically uh, with drivers getting more comfortable behind the wheel. Enormous roar outside. Oh, oh, well, I, I, I fear that with Jackson Button missing a gear change. It sounded like it, didn't it? Not one you can hide from your crew when they were about two metres away on the other side of the pit wall, but anyhow, pressing on. But at the moment, Jensen's car hasn't worked its way to the front. It's gained one position. Was eighth, is seventh. But this next time around is when the really quick times are going to come in. And now we have a new car at the top. Car number 99, James Thorpe and Phil Quaife. One minute 34.5, a third of a second to the good. And Mark Webber's put it into fifth position. Uh, 1.2 seconds of the pace. Ah, car 54, ah, not quite at the angle it should be. And that is the car shared by Tim Papas and Jeroen Blakemolen. Of course, they've raced together in the States for so many years in IMSA GTD. And uh, certainly, Tim, so, so true to the Porsche mark. But uh, yeah, right, uh, sorry, left rear tyre, not enough for them it. So out there at the moment, we've got over 20 cars out on track this stage and it feels like it, it feels busy out there and due to the fact that we're we're going at a decent speed here we've gone from the old Le Mans cars of the 20s a few moments ago now we're on a 134.5 and gone now, I was just going to say what's really important is Seb Perez has just got through that half dozen cars car number 77 it was fast just he's a third of a second down there it is 77 looking actually incredibly standard nice number plate Seb 77 on the door 77 Seb on the papers, uh, oh, on the plates at the back. That is how you drive a short wheelbase Porsche. It's not something you learn overnight. Experience, experience, and Seth has got that by the handful. Absolutely wonderful driving. Coming through Madrid corner and on the exit, drifting to perfection. Really, really spectacular stuff. And when it's fast as well, well that's even better. Oh, this is, this is a masterclass. It really is, and you can just see what the drivers are trying to attain. He didn't want to get as sideways as that. That was a going into the compression out of St Mary's. But did he lift? Did he hang? Another car that's going very well is car 27. Matt Neal uh, on board that one with Steve Edwards. I don't know who's uh, doing the driving at the moment. That's fifth fastest. The first of the big improvers uh, since the red flag. Uh, could tail the session for a while, but Seb Perez, I mean, he takes the prize for bravery, but just never say die. Yeah, wonderful to watch from the trackside cameras. Thanks to all the camera operators for bringing us all the pictures we can. Now, it's personal best stuff uh, for the driver behind, Smith and Bryant. And despite all the effort, that moment on the grass means there's no personal best. On the what he will have next time around is plenty of track in front of him. Now, car 27, just gone up from fifth to third. Is that tall enough to be Matt Neal? He'll have thrown the, the seat out of the door to get on board. Yeah, I think it's the mat. And of course, he, famously, when he's been racing a mini here, he sits in the back. You know, he's, he's a, a man of enormous height and also huge speed and uh, great passion. But a new name at the top, you picked it out, car 64, picking up the pace. Andrew Smith, Ollie Bryant, 34.0 seconds on top by 0.146 of a second from Perez and Gamble. A great final sector as well. Fantastic speed through this part of the racetrack as we're going to go back now and focus on uh, Mark Webber in the blue and white car. Uh, 
uh, chasing down the 88. Which was the, the 88 entry, was the winner of the 2022 Spa Six Hour Class uh, Champion in that running of the race. So uh, it's got pedigree. Yeah, actually, that's a good point you just raised there. We have the sort of elite class, if you will. We have a, a combination class, a bit like a pro-am class. You've got elite with gentlemen, then we've got the gentleman class for those that don't have a pro on board. But again, with so many of these championships, it just provides other entities, other things to aim for. It brings more people into the mix, which is exactly what you want when you run a series like this. Up the road goes the 53. Slight more than slightly crimped all the way down. The towels abated the pace of the car. The wheeler are being pushed back. I don't know if that's Christian Collingland or, or Johnny Modem aboard, but uh, well, that is the full lock up. Start praying, take the bump, does what it needs to do. So just pushing a little too deep into the corner there. It was past the point of no return. A lot of attention required on the panels, but at least they were to get it going once more and that was a car that was eight fastest up to that point so that was a car in the mix talking of the mix said Perez's car 77 is now down into the one minute 33 so a quarter of a second of the good over Smith and Bryant Quaif and Thorpe they've been at the top before they're at the top again because 99 <laughs> right on cue goes uh, fastest by 0.16 of a second you talked about how some practice sessions have had quite spread times yes this is not the case no it isn't and it is thrillingly so great battle for pole position between Quaid and Thorpe's entry of the 99 and Perez and Gamble's entry of the 77 all the time but you've got Jensen Button uh, circulating out there with his Formula One World Championship under his arm you've got Mark Webber celebrate uh, circulating with these nine Grand Prix wins and his World Endurance Championship under his arm. And they're being shown how to do it in this machinery by the two at the front of the field. 99 and 77, putting on a show out front. Yeah, the Ford Water Trophy, it changes its mix from year to year. And I think they've hit a very rich seam here with these two-litre cup Porsches from the mid-1960s. The key is not just that it's a 911, it's a 911 with a short wheelbase. Car 99 is the car that's fastest. A bit of a bit of traffic there. The Quaife Thorpe car, 0.163 of a second to the good, but this lap being curtailed, which but the best lap so far set by 99. One minute 33.667 seconds. So what he does there, backs off, tries to buy a bit of a space. No, he's coming into the pits. We have, of course, both drivers have to go out and set a qualifying time in this session, pretty much around the midpoint. For the 53 car that Christian Collingland brought in, that needs bodywork repair, but for the others, it's a straight driver change. So Quaife Thorpe, Perez, Gamble, the top two, Smith, Bryant, third, Jordan Holm in fourth, Neil and Edwards complete the top five at the moment, uh, Mark Webber and uh, Grimes in seventh, and then you've got Jensen Button uh, down there with Bates in 12th position. Anyone else we need to highlight, Bruce? Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is the Andrew Smith, Ollie Bryant car. I think it's Andrew climbing aboard and Ollie having clambered out. And that is the car that is, they've won two titles in this car. It's, it's Andrew on board at the moment. Car 64, third fastest, four tenths of a second down. Let's see. But of course, with the two driver race, it's the balance, the quality, the sort of uh, average time across the two drivers, the average pace that is likely to dictate who wins this race. So everyone getting a go. And uh, getting time. <laughs> I'm loving that. I'm loving the pass on top to be released into the fast. Well, it's a very, very busy place. Pleased to see the car, the 53 car, that got a little bit of crumple, has come in, made the driver change, and is going back out. There it is, it's yellow, white, black, and red. Very Germanic race livery there. Up the inside on the grass, was that what the doctor ordered? Car number treble seven, that's uh, Ollie Webb, I think, and uh, Zeiser. Let me just flip it over, Guy yep. Zeiser and uh, Ollie Webb, and that was uh, pressing on. I would suggest that's uh, Mr. Webb aboard, perhaps. Uh, never say die, but down the inside into Madrid, got away with it. He did get away with it, and it was spe spectacular to see as well. Um, we've got a new time at the top of the page. Uh, Jordan and Holm have gone to the very top. Car number nine, P1. Yeah, well, there is car number nine. That was just outside. The, the, it was about fourth or fifth position, but the car that was top, I noticed the Quave Thorpe 99 car, has got a, a signal on our screen, a symbol that suggests it's pulled off at the side of the circuit. So that was the one that set the time, 1 minute 33.6, but now the best time, Jordan and home, that's 1 minute 33.2. I would suggest that's Andrew Jordan who's now taking it over. Andrew Jordan giving us a really great technical insight down earlier on, it is indeed, uh, in the pits. Well, 
He was saying they're tricky to drive. He was saying what was required. And he knows what's required because there's been a spectacular lap of thrilling sideways attacking driving. And it's quick once again. He's fastest of anyone so far through sector one. Absolutely flying. And what glory for Andrew Jordan. He's got clear track ahead of him. You can't be sure of that for all the remaining laps, but you take it when you can. So sweeping into Woodcut about the balance. We've seen cars getting it a little bit wrong. And it's a several park corner. And again, that brilliant shot from high up on the on the on the crane looking down. Perfect for a 911 short wheelbase to just show us how sideways they are, not just out of the chicane, but drifting it through Woodcut, the marvel of historic racing. Fastest in the first sector, fastest in the second sector, add it all up, it's fastest overall by over a second, and it was delightful to watch as well. Brilliant lap. It was, and it was absolutely delivered on his first flying lap out of the pit, so there's a driver completely in tune with his car. Where is the challenge going to come from? As you pointed out there, Alex, a second to the good over the 99 of Quaven Thorpe, and I'm glad to see that uh, symbol has been removed suggesting all is not well with 99 so back onto the track and I would think that, that was Phil Quaife to start and James Thorpe to follow but let's find out. This is Mark Weather. we're on board with Mark Weather. Uh, a few uh, throughout the coverage of the Ford Water Trophy we were on board with him a few moments ago driver who's currently in fifth place last time around personal best for him 1.6 seconds off the very fastest but a 134.3 the Australian driver who's into the back of another car. There's the locker. Well, that and he takes avoiding action. Well, no, he clipped him. I'm fairly sure. 116, which is Mark Webber. Bonomi Grimes had started that car. Caught out by the car in front of him. Marshall Bailey, Tim Bailey's number 21. I think it breaks yeah. a little harder than he thought going into uh, what could maybe a bit of hesitation. And Mark was caught out. Thank goodness he seemed to gl have a glancing blow and go around the outside. But oh, dearie me. But good save, I must say. Straight back to the pits. Not long to wait to inspect the garret, uh, the damage down there, and the uh, team go to work. Well, I suggest they're just going to try and pull the bodywork off that front right-hand corner, and we'll go out as soon as they can. They want to make sure the bodywork doesn't go down and cause Mark to have a puncture when he's out there. Oh, gosh, out of nothing, something can happen. Yeah, a lot of cars out there. A lot of cars out there, a lot of cars tripping over each other. We do have a, a dramatic field spread of over 10 seconds here. Yeah, and just point out at the moment, uh, the 116 of Bonamy Grimes and Mark Webber just before that moment in eighth place. But we, some of the second drivers might be faster than the, the, the first drivers in qualifying. So the order could change. They will have to hope they're going to start in the top 10. Uh, the Butcher and Paul entry for car 73. It's just gone up to fourth position with a 133.904. The Tordos now, the car 600. Across the line, we've had a red flag earlier on after a couple of cars broke down. We're inside 10 minutes to set the grid for the Ford World Water Trophy race. And it's currently Jordan and Hong at the top of the timing page. And I think the, the way it's being driven, it's it's the second of the Tordos in the car. I know that for starters, but it's Sam Tordoff, I think, on board. So look for the 600 to come up the order. It's nearly six seconds down on the ultimate pace, but uh, now it's 5.1. Yes, it is Sam who's taking it over. Now, let's take a look at the replay. Mark Webber probably on his first flying lap, and then suddenly locks up, catches the tail end of the 21 entry, and uh, gives it a bit of a clout right on board. This is going to be dramatic. Let's listen in. Well, there's the bump. Thankfully, no more than uh, than the damage that we've seen down in the pits, but it was fairly dramatic. Well, it certainly was. The closing speed was huge, because certainly uh, whoever just settled into the number 21, whether it was Marshall Bailey or Tim Bailey, uh, led to the car getting the damage has been repaired. Good old gaffer tape. But uh, <laughs> certainly Mark was expecting to carry a bit more speed into the corner and uh, was left with very, very few options. Yeah, not much he could do there. Uh, and Jordan and Holm have gone over the line once again and they've improved things once again last time around. So they've bettered their time. And uh, Butcher and Paul are now up to second position, climbing three with that lap. Yeah, but the treble seven, definitely we saw it cutting on the grass into Madrid just after the sort of driver changes. He's up into fourth place. I think it's Ollie Webb on board, certainly tr being driven with a lot of attack. And his best lap was last time around it, so yeah. If you take away the car that's on pole by 1.1 seconds, the Jordan home car, the rest, the next lot, are incredibly close. The next four cars covered by half a second. Oh, terrific direction change from the 73, wringing the neck, and then some. That's the Rory Butcher car and the William Paul car there. Uh, of course, in the uh, we've only got three 901s out there. There were about 200-odd 901s before Peugeot 
came over all grumpy, started pointing to their IP, and we were given the 911. Well, of course, when Eddie Jordan launched the Jordan first Formula One car, that was a 911 until a deal was done, and I do believe you got a road car from a certain German manufacturer <laughs> to go away. Sounds like Eddie to me. <laughs> no premeditation whatsoever. So, let's reiterate, Jordan and home, car number nine, fastest, 132.4. Seb Perez and Gamble have just gone up into second place, and that means Rory Butcher, who is cruising in in 73, was second, is now third, could lose more places. So, last time around, the top three all setting personal best. There are four thousandths of a second between Butcher and Paul's third place car and the entry of 77 that's just gone into p2 and how it went into p2 look at this as andrew jordan 911 expert second generation of nine of 911 expert in the jordan family said you've got to keep him in a straight line not oh never mind it works for said perez fantastic great action replay there we're back to the 77 p2 trying to change that you know what, that, that rear shot, the super slow-mo of Seb Perez's car, probably with George Campbell on board now. That is why I love historic racing. Great looking cars, but to see a car and see how dynamic it is. They, and you talked about the very rapid change of direction we saw from Rory Butcher a short while ago. That's why you need to get trackside, you need to get up in these cars, but full marks the camera crews for catching the cars, doing what they're supposed to do. This is one of the more intense battles to start at the front of the field that we've seen all day long. Some brilliant drivers on track from 9 a.m. onwards all the way to the close today. We do close today with a race. It is worth saying that we will bring you a race out on track today. The Freddie March Memorial Trophy takes place to conclude things. But this is one of the most intense battles for pole position today that we have seen. Now, the good thing is we saw 73 going a little bit slowly. Rory Butcher on board. He was just hanging back. Now he's attacking again, but he's right in behind. I think it's 133. But anyhow, he needs to sort of get around it before he gets to match with it. He's going to go 154. In fact, there's a car in front of him. That's Gabby Von Hunt, Oppenheim. And it may be Vanina Ricks, daughter of uh, six-time Le Mans winner, Jackie, who stays on the pit wall side and uh, certainly but Rory Butcher needs to get past to be on the wide line going into Madgwick. He's got car number 15 just sitting in front. That's David Denlog and Patrick Long, great American Porsche racer who may be at the wheel of that at the moment. But no time for niceties for Rory Butcher. Has to sweep around the outside, does sweep around the outside. Checking the mirror to see where everyone is. Last time around, uh, Jordan and home uh, getting to a 132.476. A great pace at the front. Uh, last time around, Butcher and Paul with a personal best, but it's eight tenths of a second back. And Sam Tordoff didn't improve last time around, very close to his best, but that car was outside the top 20, is now in tenth place, car number 600, you can see being driven with um, what we call a plomb around these quarters. And actually, just uh, if you look on board, that's an unusual 911 or a 901 because it has the driver on the right-hand side. Yeah. But again, the Porsche, as soon as it uh, was created, has a, a long, long waiting list in the UK, so that would be one of the right-hand drivers. <laughs> Great sweep through. Car directly in front of the Tordorf's Porsche. It's both Sam and John racing tomorrow. Uh, but being slightly curtailed at the pace through here. With, uh, the number 12 directly ahead. And 600 clearly desperate to get past. Make use of the final three minutes of the session. Now, a toe is a good thing to have, but as long as you're sufficiently fast to get past before the next corner, which looks as though will be the case for Sam Tordoff, or will it? Because look, that is late breaking, late breaking. Oh my gosh, you're on my piece of tarmac. Thank you very much. I'm coming through. Yeah, wise, wisely dealt with for the pair of them. Okay, another chance to run a lap. And you're on to a pace. It's not a bad shot there, is no, it? No, very good. I saw you flinching. <laughs> I flinched because you flinched. <laughs> I flinched first. Uh, excellent stuff as we come across the line. Right, who's got a lap left in the car? Who's got a chance to improve things? Um, and it's going to be a melee on the opening lap. It always is, but... And you give yourself a chance of running in the top 10. That's the aim for the majority uh, in the in the top 15, I'd say. They're all fighting amongst themselves. A real masterclass out front from the top three. They've really shown us how to do it. Car travel seven into the chicane. This is on for an improvement. It's fifth fastest for Ollie Webb at the moment. Uh, the dark green car 
going to get this lap on the board one further and one beyond so he's got time to keep on improving but i think this lap should move him up no it doesn't he goes faster but still stays fifth another 13 thousandths and he'd have been fourth keep going ollie yeah, he's looking for it it's the man who about a foot out there and uh, this is the running repairs to the 116 entry uh, mark with having the contact with the back of the car and uh, bonamy grimes now at the wheel waiting, going past the point of the crime, and I think the car they hit, number 21, was the car that was actually just being uh, flashed past there, so just adjusting, constantly tweaking, looking. Great to be able to see what's required. Cranky on the lock. Who's improving out there? No one. It's all around the ninth place mark. Um, but it was a an effort from there's quite a few from seventh downwards who look like they could improve things yeah i mean that traditionally happens when you get the drivers who are really experienced oh my word that's a massive off-road moment come on bring it back to terra firma but heart in mouth that was car number 100 that's uh juan pablo Oruela and nelson cali one of the three um, 901s the very early 911s if you will before they became 911s but uh, the improvements here yeah, they traditionally at the end of a session the experts get their laps done very early on they know where they're going the others build up and certainly if you haven't raced a goodwood before it's a circuit that requires confidence to carry the flow around the lap car 99 at the moment that's been at the top of the charts occasionally quaif and thought but uh, is there going to be any improvement well no they've just gone backwards because webb has improved on the next lap to go from to fourth place in the treble seven 99 down to fifth not much more time, flag comes out, check a flag in 20 seconds or so. So these drivers going to the chicane, they'll get this lap. Very encouraging for Jordan and home at the front, at the middle of the lap last time around, even though we're at the end, fastest middle sector of anyone so far. So not only do they have the benchmark time and a gap of over eight tenths of a second over the rest of the field, but they have the consistency to deliver faster middle sectors than anyone else has done in the session at the end of the session and we're not seeing much in the way of improvement well it's good we're looking at the jordan home car oh, just what a shot go they might actually go drift a little bit wide at the first part of st mary's second part this is where you really don't want to be drifting wide precision one wheel just over the white line at the side of the circuit and you know what you don't need to tell the drivers here about track limits they understand the consequences if you get it wrong you're going farming certainly on the exit of St Mary's yeah there is a lot of runoff <laughs> but some of them pushing it to at least put two wheels on the grass as a result a checkered flag is out session interrupted session with a red flag as well is being completed Cars flashing past our commentary box position. And hold on to your hats because the best lap so far, 1 minute 32.476 for car number 9. The car we're looking at now coming down to the for the final time. Purple in the first sector, fastest from anyone. Second sector, exactly the same. If better than anyone else has managed, surely an improvement. Will we go down to the very low 1 minute 32s? Fabulous lap from the Jordan home car. That was brilliant to watch. Across the line we go, and it's the best lap at the very end. Taking the chequered flag, the Jordan home car comes across the line with the benchmark in the session of a 132.091 and Quaif and Thorpe had got the gap down at one stage to seven tenths. They took it personally and they finished 1.1 seconds ahead of the field. Frankly, it's just showing off Andrew. Andrew Jordan, superstar in that car. The family uh, run many, many 911s, but that was uh, exquisite. And don't forget that uh, out at St. Mary's, the exit of St. Mary's, the right rear wheel over the right line, kicking up the dirt, almost on the grass, but uh, the confidence to keep the foot planted and carry that momentum into lap. Well, you don't really slow down that much. And that's the key. It's keeping that momentum going. But, uh, well, that was a really fantastic qualifying session. And the top, let's see, six cars covered by two seconds. And that's only because, of course, the fastest car was nearly 1.2 seconds clear. So analyse those figures. The next five are very, very close indeed. But Andrew Jordan, I doff my hat. Yeah, that was wonderful driving. That was some of the best that we've seen all day long. And an expert behind the wheel delivering us some great action, whether you're watching on the live stream, whether you're watching at any point of this fabulous circuit. That was some of the best stuff that we've seen all day. Can't wait to see them race. It's going to be an excellent competition in the Ford Water Trophy, which we will run tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Well, there were plenty of highlights to show you. Let's talk you through what we saw out there, starting 
with waves to uh, loved ones at the side of the road. Army Grimes in the 116. Well, it was always going to be tough. 30 cars of identi identical specification going out these two-litre short wheel bait Porsches. And boy, were they very, very twitchy indeed. The very best drivers very quickly getting to whack the tail just as much as they wanted to. But unfortunately, a couple of cars out very early on, including the Duke of Richmond's son, Charlie March, pulling up just before St Mary's. He spotted the fact that something was smoking and steaming out the back. The red flag came out. Those two cars, including Lars Kern's 911, were taken away from St Mary's. And then it was traffic wherever you you looked as drivers tried to cut the chicane as tight as they possibly could, removing one of the panels there, but some brilliant shots there. It was like a race, and this was just practice. Rearranging the furniture of the final chicane. All of these cars running on 100% sustainable fuel as well, but the 54 was running on a puncher. Yeah, not 100% air in that tyre, but the very best drivers. Said Perez early on, really hanging the tail out onto 77. That was top of the charts for a very long time, and eventually ended up down in fourth place. So quickly did those changes come. But the view of these cars being put sideways out of the chicane, fabulous to see. What wasn't so good to see was Christian Cole England uh, going off in the car, he says, with... Uh, uh, Johnny Molum. It was tattered, it was battered, but it came back out to compete in the qualifying session. And then we got the laps being completed faster and faster and faster still. And uh, Perez and Gamble put on some interesting moments. Not as interesting as this, though, when Mark Webber was surprised to find another car directly into his path. Yeah, one Porsche with a white livery and a blue stripe hit another. It was the Bailey family car that was given a clout there. The, the repairs were affected. The car went back out and uh, qualified very well indeed. But at the end of the day, it was Andrew Jordan who put his car top by 1.176 seconds. So pole for him and for home. get into one of my cars, you get in the win. <laughs> Good morning, hello and welcome to Goodwood 2023. This is the Action Sports Arena. Well, Mr. Brendel, it's worth keeping your suit on by the looks of things. You're going to be busy all weekend. Yeah, I just turn up, take, take one suit off, put another suit on, and then get after it. But I like to stay fireproof because you never know. And uh, you've already been out in the Freddie March this morning. How was the sea type? I had a little bit of a misfire on the sea type. I'd, I'd never driven one. Um, but actually, they're, they're quite, you know, they're quite chilled behind the steering wheel. Probably will be one of the oldest cars I've ever driven, actually. Uh, I heard uh, Alex Buncombe going out saying, oh, you'll find the grip straight away in that car. But I thought that was a little bit, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, he must have been hiding it round in St. Mary's somewhere. But um, no, it's a good it's a good car. Yeah, we just had a bit of a misfire, which has put us further down the field than we'd like. Uh, but a good experience and uh, plenty more cars to go out uh, through the rest of the day. 
It's a one-hour race, so you've got plenty of time to get to the front. Yeah, exactly that. Uh, sharing with the able hands of Gary Pearson as well, who will be uh, plug leads at dawn, no doubt, uh, sorting it out. So that'll be good. And, of course, that's not going to be the only car you're in this weekend. Nope. I'm in a Cobra with the Snake Eyes with Bobby Verdon Row. I'm in a Lotus 27 uh, with Classic Team Lotus. And I'm in a Miles Poulter's Saab uh, two-stroke freewheeler. So uh, that might not be the most competitive thing in this St. Mary's, but it's definitely going to be the loudest. So that's good. Quite the mix. I mean, I don't even know how you get your head around it, jumping in out of one and into the other. With much gnashing of teeth, uh, generally. But um, I've tested the, I've tested the Cobra at length with Bobby. Very competitive, Bobby. I've tested the 27. Thank you to them. Um, so the other two are only voyages of discovery. But I know the track now. So as long as you're turning right, most of them are right-handers, aren't you? So you just turn right, and stay flat, and you're fine, aren't you? Most of the time. Good plan, good plan. And, and the hot topic of this weekend, obviously, which is going to be the warmest of those cars? Oh, uh, yeah, that's definitely so. Those Cobras are really, really warm. Um, Bobby's got both the windows taken out of his. But what's the... What, I tell you, the, the, the guys I... The GT40s, there must be GT40s this weekend. Those, uh, those GT40s are super, super hot. So I think that's... They're going to get the... Uh, they're going to get the, the, the sweatiness award uh, at the end of their event. Well, we look forward to seeing you fly through the pack later on in the Freddie March and uh, best of luck this weekend. Thanks a lot. Let's hope so. Well, you might think that we are at a beach right now and we're not a good revival, but I can assure you that we really are still here. And I've got my girls with me. <laughs> Lovely to have you. Tell us what you're doing here. So we're kind of cheeky girls and we're here. We're going to play some volleyball later. We're dancing as well and we're having a couple of cocktails, but don't tell the boss. <laughs> How much are you enjoying Revival? Oh, it's so good. The sun's out for us. We're just sitting here sunbathing, getting a tan on. It's like being back in America. <laughs> and have you come all the way from America? Yeah, so we're kind of like North California based, just on, kind of more towards uh, the country, not the coast. Amazing. This place is really cool, this whole beach area, because there is a bar as well. So if we just have a look round, because there is a bar round the back there, and that is the Tiki Bar as well. So we've got cocktails and actually thanks to the sun we actually it feels like we're on a beach yeah yeah literally uh, what's your favorite cocktail oh now oh, oh. i think a tequila sunrise oh i'm a tequila gosh. girl what about yeah. you no absolutely 100 percent. we call it a mexican 1000 but that grenadine oh <laughs> it's amazing we've got this lovely car here as well what's your favorite thing about revival um, well, all the amazing cars earlier, they were revving and it was so loud. It was really impressive. And my ears, God, I can know what to do with myself. <laughs> you are right next to the track as yeah. well. You can't see the racing, but you can really feel it around everywhere, can't you? Yeah, there's like a, there's a really wonderful energy and there's like a vibration that's literally through everyone that you meet. So yeah, it's incredible. Well, this is the coolest place to be. I might just hang with the girls all day, if I'm honest, because the beach is the place to be. <laughs> Johnny Herbert, we see you lots at Goodwood, which is fantastic, but we haven't seen you race for a long time. And I've just asked you how, when was the last time you raced, you're not 100% sure. No, I'm not 100%, no, it was either 11 or 12, that was an Italian touring car series I did. So yeah, so it's been a while, I've got a go-kart, which I race, or not race, actually just got a bit, bit of testing, but Chris Dinnage, who's uh, looking after the classic Lotus uh, cars, sort of said, well, why not, why not have a go at this? In this uh, Lotus 30, so yeah, and why not come, you know, to Goodwood, where, you know, we have a lot of fun. We're in the car, but also the crowd loves seeing us, you know, throw the cars around. So yeah, it's nice to be back. And a, and a nice, easy car to just ease yourself back in. Uh, it's quite <laughs> loose, shall we say? Um, I've only driven it a Hethel, so so it's going to be quite interesting to see what it's going to be like here. But I am expecting to be quite a, a lot of drifting going on if it's going to be exactly on purpose uh, i'm not sure but i shall try and survive it get through it uh but i've got a bit of competition haven't i with these uh, gt forties i'm up against so yeah so it's going to be fun fun's the main thing none of them have dealt with johnny herbert on form though so you'll be you'll be fine yeah on form yeah that was a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> cheers johnny cheers So we are getting ready for the Whitson Trophy, qualifying to get underway uh, the race for unlimited sports prototypes. So up to 1966, these are uh, effectively the fastest cars of the weekend here because they were the last top-line sports cars to be racing here at Goodwood when 
Goodwood uh, gave up in 1966. And so, Alice, we have some absolutely stunning sports machinery like the Ford GT40s, the McLaren uh, Can-Am cars, very, very rapid. Yeah, and we would have seen some of these cars in the hands of, I would probably say, legends of, of our sport, like Jim Clark, Bruce McLaren, John Surtees. So no wonder everyone is uh, getting a, a picture, getting a film of these leaving the assembly area, because these are very, very special cars that are heading out on track now. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be fun to see how it goes. Last year, Oliver Bryant uh, took the victory in one of the Lola Chevy T70s. And uh, that was a good win for him from Stuart Hall. Rob Hall was quick as well. He was uh, third. Phil Keane, a former winner in the, one of the Lotus 30s. The Lotus 30 is a, a Lotus sort of Can-Am car. Actually, in its day, it wasn't fully, fully competitive. Um, there was some discussion that the chassis wasn't quite stiff enough, but modern days, they've managed to obviously make it work at some of the events. So uh, Phil Keane took a good victory uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, we've got a nice variation. We already saw Johnny Herbert's there sat with his Lotus Ford that he described as going to be a bit of a handful for us. And we'll get a taste of how much of a handful uh, when we see it uh, batting round very shortly in the Ford GT40s. You've got some Lola Chevrolets, got McLaren Chevrolet M M1B. We've got Shelby Cobras. Oh, There's door nice. open, door open on the number 16 GT40. I don't think that's quite according to plan, is it? No, it didn't look like it, but we've got a nice variety and even some doors open. But uh, let's <laughs> have a look. We've, that's not the first time today. No, absolutely. We saw one earlier in the St Mary's going Gordon through. Gordon Shedden, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, with the door open. So, uh, oh, it's on the driver's side. Surely either got to slam it shut or coming to, he's coming to the pits anyway. So that is Ludovic Caron in one of the GT40s. I'm sure for many, many people here, whether you're watching us uh, at Goodwood today or watching online, the Ford GT40 is a dream machine for many, many people. Yeah, it certainly is a beautiful car as well. I know certainly I would love to have the chance to get behind the wheel of one of them. Is the door all sorted and fixed? I mean, the car's not going anywhere. Uh, toolbox has come out on the side there, so clearly still got some issues with that, but that doesn't stop everybody else charging down into turn one. And already there's some of them getting, getting ultra sideways into the first corner, which is Madwix. There we are looking at one of the Lola T70s just uh, heading down towards Fort Ford Water, the absolutely flat out right hander. This is Julian Draper in a 1965 car. And in fact, this car was really one of the very, very first of the Lotus um, T70s. And interestingly, the man who created this, Eric Broadley, who created the Lola company, he had been involved in the design of the Ford GT40 originally, but that sort of went wrong quite early on. So he thought, well, they don't want me to make the GT40, I'm going to create my own. So he cre created what was effectively the Lola Mark 7, but they just moved, so it became a 70. It became the T70, and it went on to quite a lot of success, actually, in, especially in the sort of sprint races and stuff. It was very, very successful. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. Now, that's not so good. That is Max Werner. Actually, he's an addition to the entry list, I think. And, um, oh, dear, that's come to a halt. So that hasn't lasted very well for Max. That's a bit of an awkward one. Yeah, looks like he's pulled out uh, in a very good spot, to be honest. So he should be, but yeah, he's clambering out. So no no way unable to carry on for him, but he's pulled out in a good place. I doubt we'll see the, the red flag, but that's very, very unfortunate for him. And the Lotus 430, 64. Yep, well, we'll see how that, uh, hopefully they can get it fixed for the race itself. When well, that all gets underway. And uh, we've got some lap times coming in. You're looking at the number 10 car. That's the uh, Bizzarini Chevy. That's a bit of an unusual one. Um, a similar car to raced at Le Mans in 1966. So a time when the GT40s were trying to uh, beat Ferrari and actually managed uh, to do so at last. But, uh, of course, a Ford versus Ferrari battle was big. Now, let's have a look here. Oh. This, this is Ian Simmons, actually, in one, one of the other Lola Chevys bounced around and got going again. Yeah, a little trip on the grass, just exploring the limits very early on. All OK by the looks of things, so that's good news. There's another one of the Lolas. 
uh, sorry, Lotus uh, T30s. That's that's actually Katsuaki Kubota, Katsu, who races here regularly at uh, at Goodwood. Big rival to the GT40s. This car, though, has been a winner at Goodwood before, and so it has got competitive pace around this track. But fastest at the moment, we've got number 96, John Spears, in one of the McLaren Chevrolets. And uh, that is obviously something fun to see. It is a celebration anniversary year of McLaren, of course, 60 years since uh, they began as a, as a team. And we'll have to see how that goes. So we've got a McLaren fastest who's still looking here at the moment at the uh, Lotus 30. There's one of the other GT40s in the background, lovely colours, and that is Sean Lynn's car. This competed in period in the UK as well. And we were saying earlier, Alice, actually being, being in an open top in this temperature, a bit easier than being in a closed top. Yeah, we heard Alex Brundle, didn't we, say that uh, those four GT 40s get pretty toasty, and it's safe to say we've got a few of those on the grid here. One that we've just seen there, we can see it again on our screen. So <laughs> expect them to be roasting inside, but I, I doubt, very much doubt that's going to slow them down. <laughs> no, that's right. Remember, the engine sits just behind the driver's head on these. And actually, when I was looking at the McLaren M1s as well, the Can-Am cars in the, in the paddock area, the carburetor inlets are literally just behind the driver's head. You can see it in, in this kind of shot here. See how close the, the inlets, those sort of pipes you can see, those are the inlets to the carburetors behind the driver's head. And that's how close they are to the engine. It's amazing, really. So close. And actually, this is this car here, Davidson on board, is just set purple, purple, and then jumps to the top of the times ahead of Spears with a 119.9 pole position last year was. Oliver Bryant, who's currently sitting, whereabouts is he, sitting in sixth place, and he did a 118.5, so times better, edging slowly towards the, the qualifying time of last year. 12 minutes still remaining. Yeah, that's a good time, though, no doubt about it, and uh, it's a decent margin at the moment. Nick Padmore's up into third place now, the number 55 uh, Hamill Chevrolet. That was a, an unusual um, car. So that's going well, but this McLaren M1 is is beautifully driven at the moment. We'll see if they can hang on. There's still just under 12 minutes of this qualifying session to go. Yeah, there is a little bit of traffic ahead for the number four. And it just steams up behind. I'm not entirely sure who that is. Number 13, number 15, number 15 car. That is... Tony Sellier behind the wheel, Lola Chevrolet. He's going to try and go down the inside, no, not quite. And still, that is the number 16. Has that still got the door open? Still looks like he's struggling to uh, get that door shut. And it was away from Davison as he went, went past the uh, Lola Chevrolet down the straight. With 11 minutes left to go on the clock. Davison, Bryant and Spears. And we're going to have a little look at a replay now. Oh, there's a couple of cars. Oh, was there any contact? Well, not sure if we get an earlier. That's a number 99 car. Matthew were in that one. Yeah, that's uh, that's a Crosley. That's a slightly less usual one. Smaller, slightly smaller car. Hopefully they all got away without actual damage. Yeah, let's hope so. It was hard to see, wasn't it, Ben? We didn't quite get an earlier shot. Number 54, that's a Hall currently sitting in P4 at the moment. You see, raced here last year. Yeah, Stuart Hall always competitive here. So it was a big spin. OK, and then maybe it was uh, a little bit of avoidance. That's uh, Ewan Sergison, actually. He, he's been added into the uh, list as well. Classic Hill helmet there as well. Yeah, that's very much a, a Damon or Graham Hill helmet, isn't it? It certainly is. Yeah, lovely design. So, survived the spin and back out there, and now trying to pick up the pace just a little bit more. A little bit of a signal to the pits as well. Down in seventh place at the moment, but an opportunity to pick up. So, Johnny Herbert currently running in eighth place. Tony Sinclair, ninth. He's a very regular competitor here at Goodwood. Uh, had a podium here a couple of years ago with his Lola Chevy. 
So uh, Oliver Bryant now, he's stepping it up. It's the pole sitter from last year and race winner as well. Oh, 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 that's all gone horribly wrong uh, for John Spears. And he is one of the fastest out there. He's third fastest at the moment and he has hit the chicane. And well, the damage may just be bodywork damage because of the way that that chicane yeah. is all set up. So it is bodywork damage. I think suspension, etc., should be okay. Should be, as long as driver is okay as well. He did raise his hands quite quickly. I don't know if that was a sign to say I'm okay or a sign to say, hang on, I'm sat here in the middle of the chicane. But that was a really nasty hit, wasn't it, Ben? But as you said, those tie barriers, they, they look aggressive, but they are actually fairly soft. Thankfully. Gonna, yeah, thankfully. Uh, Once upon a time, they used to be concrete. <laughs> you yes. can do a lot of damage. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have another look. Alice, talk us through what went wrong. So it's got, I'm guessing there's going to be a lock of the rears at some point just there. And then it all goes horribly wrong, as you can just see how it mostly looks like foam in those tyres just dissipates everywhere, spins round and probably just going to tap ever so slightly. No, escapes making contact with the rear of the car, but that was just a pure lock of the rear tyres. Wow, that was, as you say, it was a very install. Yeah, it did touch the back in the end, just moved the barrier a little bit. Oh, we've got the on, we've got this the camera's gonna know static camera. Alive. Oh, I'm glad to tell you that is a static camera without a camera person yeah. behind it. <laughs> Um, but that, yes, that's There we go, just hit. turning in now, and yeah, lock the rears out. Oh, it does look. It's aggressive, but I think he's hands device on, of course, so you have to run these. So he will be okay, thankfully. A little bit of debris to be picked up, and they've got to resort that, um, that barrier as well. So it's going to take a few minutes, although it's something the marshals down in that area are not unfamiliar with doing and the marshals here at Goodwood as ever marshals across the globe doing a fabulous job but here at Goodwood they really are superb and uh, they will get that repaired pretty quickly in the meantime of course we're getting all the cars into the pits yeah marshals already out on circuit as some cars are coming slowly round through Woodcook corner into the chicane marshals already with the brooms out sweeping so doing a great job. Cars are being directed just for the safety of the marshals and to avoid any debris that might be about. But already, as you said, Ben, marshals doing a fantastic job as always. And hopefully we'll be getting this session underway very soon as they're working very quickly to uh, to move the barriers. And you can see there's a little bit of, I guess that's some, some water down there. I'm not sure because he drove on the grass, didn't he? So maybe that's just a little bit that was in the, in the barriers. Okay. Well, they're sweeping it away quickly and trying to get it sorted out, and the uh, session will get underway fairly soon, I'm sure. There's still nine and a half minutes to go, but we'll just have to see uh, how it all goes. Let's go down to uh, the pits, and uh, let's hear from Marino Franchitti. Fresh out of the Drivers Club, we have managed to get a quick word with Goodwood Royalty, Marino Franchitti. Now, I don't even want to know because it's going to make me very envious. How many cars are you driving? What are you driving? Uh, just the three this weekend. Um, just, just the three. Just, yeah, sure. Um, A35 in the St. Mary's, which is always fun sharing that with my, my friend Chris Harris. Uh, 250F uh, Maserati, an old Grand Prix car. And the Richmond and Gordon, and then uh, sharing with Ollie Bryant and his TT and the, and the Cobra and the TT. So, yeah. Spoiled. Absolutely spoiled. <laughs> Absolutely spoiled. And then my son's in the uh, the Sessington Cup for, I think it's probably going to be his last time, so he's not going to fit soon. But uh, that's the most important event of the weekend. I remember when Luca was first in the Sessington Cup, and he's, uh, he's done a phenomenal job. But just give us a bit of perspective for us mere mortals that don't, we get to experience watching these incredible pieces of machinery come back to life. What is it like being behind? the wheel I think it's a for me it's always been the driving's one part of it it's going around the paddock and seeing cars I'd only ever seen in pictures or read about or not even maybe seen a picture of it's being in the drivers club with your heroes being on track with your heroes it's racing cars that heroes who are no longer with us raced and kind of taken following their footsteps to a degree you know not driving it to the degree they did but getting a chance to, to live out your your fantasies of, of being in a race car in that period. And it's uh, something that I, I, I truly, it's an honor to be able to do it. And it's so much fun being out there. 
So it actually must be such an inspiration for the next generation as well to be able to come and see and experience what it was like and hopefully give them aspirations for the future. I hope so, because it's so important that we keep these cars alive and moving. They're so beautiful, so many of them. But being able to, to almost step onto a movie set like it is here and step, step back in time and every detail is so impressive here. We just got to keep all of that going, not just the cars, but everything that you see here is so, so, so special. I mean, for me, it's uh, as mentioned earlier to you that I met my wife here in 2005 at the ball on the Saturday night and, you know, she races here most years and it's such a special place for me and my, my whole family. Now, the ball, this is a, a pretty monumental part of the weekend, isn't it? There must have been some brilliant moments. Obviously, you met your wife, Holly Frankiti, um, and anything else that you can share with us from those special nights? The Not the special nights with your wife, to be clear. <laughs> The ball is one of those things where if you've got to race early on the Sunday, you've got to kind of throttle back. But you can see the people who aren't racing till Sunday afternoon, and it really it is such a fantastic party. And there's so many, especially Tom Christensen always has the best outfits. So many times he's walked up to me, and I'm like, oh my God, it's Tom. And he just stands there uncomfortably next to you. You're like, who is this weirdo? It's, it's the outfits are fantastic. I think early on I would just wear a black tie, and very quickly I was like, you just can't do that. You've got to get you've got to get involved. Brilliant. Well, we cannot wait to see your outfits for this weekend. Um, uh, good, good luck for the racing. I'm sure you'll be up there. Thank you very much. As always. Now, there are a few more intimidating places to be than at the front of the Whitson Trophy grid. Uh, so strap yourselves in and let's go talk to some drivers. Um, everything's relatively calm here. Uh, I can see Nicholas Padmore. Always smiling, is Nicholas. Uh, Nick, I saw you came into the pits there. Is everything all right? Yeah, I just need to check the car. It's so sideways, and uh, especially out there, the chicane on that last lap. It's had a big old, um, big old slide, but just you just can't underestimate these cars. They're so lively and just great fun to drive. So, yeah, the, the tyres have gone a, a bit too hot. So, yeah. If you're too sideways, is, is that not driver setup? Say that again. Is that not driver setup that you're going too sideways? Yeah. No, it was, uh, Ed, you would have been proud. Oh, my white gloves are so busy going through uh, St Mary's. But, um, and then when I went back out, someone had dropped a load of uh, like fluid or fuel through the, the first corner. I thought, oh, no, that's going to be a challenge. And then, unfortunately, someone's kissed the, uh, the chicane quite badly. So it's, uh, we're just chilling for a bit, aren't we? Well, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Um, the man, man himself, Roy Gilligan. Roy, how are we doing? Is, is the driver behaving himself? I think he's uh, quite average at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think he's going quite well, I think, but uh, I think we're a little bit soft on the back, so we might do something about that in a minute and uh, see what uh, we can do. Don't give away all your secrets, Roy. <laughs> right, uh, follow me. Let's go down the middle of the cars because there's a little bit more space here. We've got Ollie Bryant. Ollie, um, always so quick in this race, but it looks quite slippy out there. Yeah, it was. I think there was a car dropping oil for a couple of laps. So it made it very slippy towards the end, and I think that's what caught the McLaren out at the chicane, I guess. Yeah, it looked like there's some locked rears going in. Um, are you struggling with tyres in this heat? Um, in a short run like this, I think it would be OK, but over the race distance, it'll certainly be something to, uh, to be mindful of. Right, well, best of luck. Cheers. Thanks. Right, that's uh, beautiful GT40 soft top. It's always... Um, it comes here lots. It's just what a, what a car that is. Um, let's see if I can get a little bit further back. I want to, um, sorry, mind the nose of that. I can see Johnny Herbert's smiling face. I think he's smiling. Um, we obviously chatted to Johnny in the assembly area, and uh, it was all smiles then. We're going to see if it's, I'm so sorry, can I squeeze in? Um, Johnny, I was just saying it was all smiles in the assembly area. Is it still all smiles? Uh, no, it's frustration. <laughs> at the moment. I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm pushing the clutch not far enough. I'm getting a lot of no downshifting with a lot of... <laughs> in the, so I did learn, actually, on that inlet, if I push that clutch, surprise, surprise, a little bit further, surprise, surprise, it goes in gear. <laughs> so there you go. I've, uh, I think I've fixed my issue. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? A racing driver, you're saying you haven't raced for sort of 10, 11 years, but you're still trying to find performance. Oh, that's, that's always the case, that's the thing. Even when I do my little bit of karting, I just wanted to do it as fun. But I can't get rid of my competitiveness and that just keep banging out, banging out at me to try and sort of improve things. So, yeah, you're right. It never goes away. And in many respects, I'm glad it hasn't. Um, 
now you've learned to use the clutch, what have we got? Another five seconds off your lap time? Well, that's, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah, well, I hope there's uh, quite a few seconds in that one, but uh, well, well, we're going to have to wait and see, aren't we? Yes, I was sort of quite... Uh, oh, uh, 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 right. Now, I will just enjoy it, do the best I can where I feel comfortable, and then hopefully uh, within that fun period, uh, five seconds will just sort of appear. They always do, Johnny. Enjoy it. Yeah, they don't always appear. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's... Uh, uh, okay, let's cruise on down here. Um, we want I wonder if John has actually made it back to the pit lane because um, it looks like the car um, was uh, not too badly damaged. Uh, got Mr. Shepherd here. Um, now we are live, so I, I, you're the only man here that I say that to. But how's the car going? Uh, it was a little bit squirrely. Uh, the oil made it very scary. Right, look, that's all the cars starting up. And we've got a green flag at the front of the pit lane. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ed. Yes, the volume has suddenly gone up. The, these are some of the loudest cars we have here this weekend, aren't they, Alice? Yeah, they certainly are. I, I, when they first went out, we were both fiddling with our controls to try and turn up the volume in our ears. But they certainly are. Commentary box not quite shaking as yet. But I wonder if Johnny just needs to to grow a little bit. He's stick him in a grow bag uh, so he can grow his legs a little bit longer to reach that clutch. So let's see if that's just a typical rating driver excuse. I'm sure it's not from, from Johnny. But let's see if he moves further forward. Yeah, and keep an eye on that number three car on the right there with the Cambridge colouring. That's uh, Ollie Bryant, who is already second fastest so far in this session. Half second off at the moment off uh, James Davison, but very impressive nonetheless. So, and Ollie is being a winner uh, here in the past as well. Sorry, that's Marshall Bailey, number three. Yeah, Ollie Bryant's number two. So we'll keep out on our eye for number two. So that's Marshall Bailey, number three. Um, we'll watch out for Ollie Bryant as well. He's in another of the Lola Chevy T70s. But yeah, that's Marshall Bailey, my mistake. Um, this one, a car that has uh, been successful in New Zealand in the past, actually. And it has also won the Whitson Trophy here. This particular car has won the Whitson Trophy at this uh, Goodwood event in the past. So uh, we'll see how it gets on. At the moment, it's a bit further down the list in terms of pace, but we shall see how that goes in the final part. We will have just over nine minutes still to go. Yeah, we do. We can see now the cars are leaving the pit lane. I have to say, it's very brave from that marshal standing in the middle. Now I would like to be, be standing there. Obviously, trust all the drivers on the grid as the green flag is flying high, being waved, and finally, with just over nine minutes left on the clock, we get underway. Yeah, we get that lovely roar of uh, Chevy uh, V8s, a lot of Chevy V8s, that's for sure. Uh, some other V8s as well, Fords, of course, from the GT40s. Uh, a lot of power out there, and a lot of noise, but it's wonderful to be able to watch it. And you've got that uh, red and green machine just heading down. Tony Sinclair, who's had some good success here in the past. Another of the Lola T70s and the rest of the field, another beautiful GT40. We certainly love watching the GT40s here at Goodwood. That's the number 16, Ludovic Caron, who had that uh, issue with the door that we watched earlier. Seems to be all solved by now. Yeah, let's hope so. It looks like for now the, the door is firmly shut and the driver will be able to, to continue. So we're not going to get many laps around here, Ben, just because now halfway around the track we are eight minutes left to go so expecting about five laps roughly maybe six of their lucky depending on where you were coming out of the pit lane but we've got our number one car davison still in the pits and our number three car of spears as well still in the pits so uh, i wonder if they're just sat waiting to clear a little bit of traffic because it's going to get busy. Everybody's going to want to set a lap time. No one's happy, especially Johnny Herbert, with his pace. So they'll be looking to, to get a clear piece of track uh, and set the lap times as the, the first leading of the cars come. Yeah, let's see if they can keep it tidy and uh, get it underway. So there you can see that uh, Marshall Bailey actually just trying to get out of the way a little bit as uh, coming past him, Keith Arners, in the... Cooper Ford, that's a fairly unusual uh, Pan Am style car as well, the T61 with the 4.7 litre V8 engine in it. And uh, Keith Arler's a, a great historic racer, often here at Goodwood in all sorts of different vehicles. Yeah, so already, so I wonder if that oil had, a, had an effect. We're just starting to clear, Ben. We're already seeing 
green, which is personal best sectors, popping up on the timing screen from uh, cars surrounding the top six and some a little bit further down as well. So this is really crunch time now as uh, the number three car of Marshall still trying to get out of the way, but doing a great job of uh, making sure to stay out of everyone's way. And purple sector from Hall. So this is where the times are going to start to tumble. Yeah, Stuart Hall in the McLaren M1B, another of the rapid McLaren Can-Am cars, of which we uh, saw McLaren, of course, testing here uh, many years in the late 60s. Tragically, it's where Bruce McLaren was killed in a McLaren Can-Am car as well. Um, but, of course, the success of the team has continued. You're looking there at uh, Stuart. So he is fastest at the moment, as you say. We are seeing improvement. Stuart Hall has gone top, and that's a lovely bit of control. Stuart Hall qualified third here last year, finished P2 in the race. So we're already jumped up, but his, his will get challenged at some point. As Honestly, at the moment, they're looking at the timing screen. There are so many different colours popping up on the screen. A number 54 car there of Hall coming through the final part of St Mary's. They're heading up the hill to Levant Corner. Still pushing and another good sector, Purple, which is fastest overall of anybody in the first sector. Yeah, so flying along, Stuart Hall is doing a, a fabulous job so far. Let's see whether he's going to keep it up. This M1B, it was uh, the McLaren Chevrolet early years, but it was um, a modified version of their first Can-Am car, Robin Hurd, who uh, went on to great stardom as a, a designer and engineer in Formula One, all forms of uh, motorsport, really. He and Martin Turner, they did some of the adaption on the M1B and uh, made it into a, a very successful car. 5.7 litre V8. Let's see what the lap time is. 19.7 is uh, his previous best. And 19.3 now, so that was another good improvement. Yeah, but Oliver Bryant, winner here last time, is a... Uh chopping down a good first sector an even better fast overall middle sector he's going to jump up but he lost a lot of time ben six tenths of a second to horn in that last sector so i'm not sure he had an issue he didn't even set personal best i was calling this one wrong sorry earlier this is this is uh ollie bryant i was mentioning him earlier oh, this is ollie bryant's car um, so this is the uh, the lowest sherry and the, as you say he's second quickest two tenths down so Ollie Bryant is actually flying along. It's just slightly confusing because of the numbers on the car. They've, they've crossed out the number nine on it. It is number two. I uh, just didn't read that properly. Yeah, but there's a lot of traffic jam. Wouldn't want to be in this dam and date oh, traffic. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> My goodness, I thought there was going to be contact there. It's our P3 sitter. Davidson trying to feather his way through the traffic. So that certainly have hampered his lap time. A, a very slow and as expected first sector. But Bryant is um, still setting pace. He's just done a personal best in the first sector, but slightly off, a tenth and a half off his best in the middle sector. Let's see if he gets it together for the last sector. It's two, just over two tenths off. Nicely and nice, neat and tidy through that final chicane. Foot to the floor. He's going to cross the line, patiently wait as he crosses the time and screen. Is it going to be any faster? Well, it's a personal best, oh, but not fast enough. We've got a car off. Marcus Black has made contact. You can see the damage. We've got red flag again. And with three minutes to go, three and a half minutes to go, will this be restarted? Coming down into the chicane. Oh, it's, it's oh. gone the other way. So the back locked up, as we saw on the other car earlier. But this time, it's the back that slams into the tyre wall on the outside. Yeah, you can see he knew it was coming. He braced himself. Had his head slightly further forward. So luckily he will be okay. Car not so much. Hopefully it's more just bodywork damage. So red flag is out with just over three and a half minutes left to go. So you know what that's gonna mean, Ben. Oh it's not, so the session will not restart. Yeah. No, they, we've just had that come up on our signal, which um, so there would have been time in a theory for them to go out. But of course, they've got to get through a lot more action on track. And we've still got that final event, which is our first race of the weekend, due to start at 6.30 p.m. So they've decided 
that session is over. So they didn't get as many laps in. We could make for an interesting race, Alice, because we will see people who perhaps felt they could have done quicker laps not actually achieving it, but maybe able to do it in the race. Yeah, exactly. Brian, I'm sure, will be one of those that will say, I just strung it together. Yeah. Maybe I would have got that pole position. So half a second separates our top three. But it is that car there, Hall, Stuart Hall, who has set the pace. Uh, 119.3, so not quite as fast as last year. Maybe that wheel still uh, around on the circuit somewhere, but he'll bleed it back into the pits. So that's going to be a competitive race we've got there tomorrow. But it's like you said, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a rejig of last year because they actually finished first and second last year. So Bryant won it, Hall was second. <laughs> now so Hall's Hall, out for revenge. Hall's on pole and Bryant's on the front row with him. So we, we won for a really good battle, I think, between those two. Yeah. Um, having said that, James Davison, the Aussie, um, who's come into this, um, he was, I think, a fairly late entry, actually, in the car that he's in. Uh, James Davison, he's in another McLaren Chevy, and, and he, he's not far off. So he was only, what, five-tenths off pole? So that we could have a real three-way play, I think, for the, for the victory here, which, was, which is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, so it was, it was meant to be uh, Bradley Hoyt in the Davison car, but Davison's subbed in. I think it is Brad that owns the car, so maybe he thought uh, he wanted someone else to, to jump in the car, and a, a good choice there. As uh, we get the highlights now, the, where the car's coming out of the assembly area. Oh, Johnny Herbert, did he move any further forward? Sixth, so maybe slightly happy with that. I'm sure he will say he still had more pace, but this is the door that, uh, the second door of the day that was refusing to close. Yep, thankfully it got sorted nice and quickly in the pit lane and they were able to get him back out again, so got some decent laps in. And we saw these big V8 powered, most of the mid-engined, late 1960s, uh, sort of mid to late 1960s cars, very rapid. Unfortunately, we did see Max Werner have to get out of his car right at the beginning, so didn't even, yeah, you could see the frustration there. He didn't even really get a, I don't think he even got a lap in. Um, so that's a bit of a shame. Going to be down towards the back. Regular Goodwood runner, Katsu Kubota, and his beautiful yellow Lotus. Very distinctive machine, but very rapid. And James Davison, the uh, Aussie racer who's done historic racing a bit over the years, but also races NASCAR Xfinity. He's done a lot of sports car racing. We didn't uh, quite get the start of that, even no. so, did we? Difficult to see how that began, wasn't it? Yeah, we saw a few spins. Thankfully, not too many damages. But then we did see an incident at the chicane. It's, uh, it doesn't get any better, does it, when, we, when you watch that? But luckily, driver all OK. And then the session got back underway again. Marshall coming out of the pits, leading the field. Having a good check over the shoulder. Yeah. There we go. It was Bryant going through the chicane, not quite enough, setting purple sectors, but not being able to string it together, which sets us up perfectly for a great race tomorrow. Yeah, it does certainly set things up beautifully well. We've got a very close battle up front uh, between three drivers in the McLaren M1s. And I think that then we saw this incident. This is what has caused the session to come to a slightly early completion. Hopefully, again, damage won't be too bad. It has damaged the rear bodywork somewhat, but I think hopefully chassis-wise, uh, otherwise, it should be OK, and the car will be back out. But the fastest of all, Stuart Hall by just over two-tenths of a second, taking pole position. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood Members Meeting, the 80th Members Meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. As the official luxury cruise partner of Goodwood Revival, visit our spacious cruise ship at Gate 2A as we celebrate the romance and glamour of luxury travel. We'll capture you looking your very best. You can chat with the crew and enter to win an unrivalled VIP experience with Regent Seven Seas Cruises aboard the world's most luxurious fleet.
Come on board and discover why Regent is the best luxury cruise experience on the seven seas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the greatest show on earth! We have two magnificent acts for you this afternoon. Coming up later is a fire eater! Ooh. But first, on the greatest show on earth, ladies and gentlemen, we have Bendini, the Sword Swallower! <laughs> John, what an entrance that is! I thank tell you, you the ringmaster John with us. Thank you, thank you. Oh, this is amazing! It's How's amazing. It well, it's the greatest show on earth, folks. We've scoured the country all over the world for the greatest act. We've got Bendini, the Sword Swallower. We've got the Fire Eater. We've got clowns. We've got jugglers, acrobats, all on the greatest show on earth. This is just amazing. We're down here at the circles. The atmosphere is absolutely flying. Fantastic. So many Look at people all these around here. People. And here he goes. Well, well, let's see him. Let's see what he yes, does. Let's come and see. See the greatest show. I'm just very pleased to report there is no sword swallowing up in the commentary box, not as yet. The meeting is yet young. So Only practice bright. for the Chichester Cup. Alex has already got the swords lined up at the back. Rear engine, disc brake, Formula Juniors. These were the junior racing cars. Effectively, they, they priced themselves out of the market by the end of 1963 and Formula 3 followed. But they were baby Formula 1 cars. And uh, many of the manufacturers who were trying to sell enough production cars to make their Formula 1 team work found this a very rich seam to mine. Lotus and Brabham spring to mind. And Cooper as well. This is going to be really exciting. There's plenty down in the paddock who think this is going to be one of the more competitive races of the entire weekend. Cars out there on the circuit once again. 2.3 miles for the drivers to negotiate. And uh, very light, very low. Not much in the way of uh, performance engines, but because of the lightness, very, very quick. Yeah, but also because of the lack of horsepower, only 1,100cc, largely Ford engine cars here. Yes, they were breathed upon to be a little bit faster, but you lose momentum and you're going to go tumbling down the order. And the very best Formula Junior drivers, they have a lot of racing through the course of the year. Know that absolutely they have to keep them in a straight line wherever possible. So getting straight on with it, terrific sap as they punch their way down the main straight once more. We have a lot of Lotus Ford 27s in the field, a couple of 22s as well. There's a Brabham BT2 uh, and there's a Cooper in the mix as well. There's a, there's a nice variation, including some uh, more exotic names who, uh, who might be, let's whisper it, towards the back. Yeah, exactly so, but really by... This was the final iteration of Formula Junior. We started with the engines in the front, then they went to the back and went from drum brakes to disc brakes. But this is where the genius or the likes of uh, 
Colin Chapman of Lotus, we had these in the celebration of 75 years, just started to refine the product. And of course, they were so similar to the Formula One cars. A lot of cross-pollination. Andrew Hibbard leading the way around car number four. Lotus 22, which is the one from 1962. The following year, it went to the 27. Constant evolution. But what that means is prices started climbing. And that started to price a few people out, unless they were with the works teams. As ever with Junior Motor Racing, you want to know who the quick drivers are as they climb the ladder, and so a reset came afterwards. 15 minutes to go then. Uh, some of the sessions have been slightly shortened after that lengthy red flag rearranged the furniture at the last chicane. We've got one element of it left, at least. And uh, there we go. They've managed to rescue some of it and plonk it on the apex. Good to see. As we make our way through, this is uh, number 50, another Lotus 27. We'll be saying that a lot in the next 14 minutes or so. And as you can see, they are trying to slipstream these cars. Very small, very low. Fastest time so far, 175. Chris Goodwin, a driver who was a junior single-seater racer, did a bit of touring cars, moved away from it, came back again in historic cars. His father used to race back in the 60s when he was a doctor out in the Far East, racing in the street circuits of Singapore, of all places. Uh, but Chris was top, but he's been deposed. Car 53, Sam Wilson, Lotus, Cooper Ford. Sorry, uh, Sam Wilson, start that one again. Cooper Ford, T59, uh, goes to the top of the charts. He's going to be very, very tight. That said, Wilson is clear by one entire second. Wow. Yeah, early on. Uh, so 18 minutes this session duration for everyone to get out there to set the order and as you say Bruce the slipstreaming effect pretty intense at the moment they're choosing to run in the pack the opposite of what we've basically seen all day so it's Wilson then Goodwin and then Buhoffer ahead of Richards, Fitzsimon, Hibbert, Fennell, uh, Roach, Woodhouse and Russell the top 10 there are 30 cars in this field. Do you recognise the helmet in car number five? It's a Brundle helmet. He's, uh, he was uh, a lap behind the others coming out of pits. He's uh, driving a Lotus 427 in the inimitable green and yellow livery that uh, Lotus used uh, from his Norfolk base all that time ago. Slowest of all because he hasn't put a flying lap on the board, but uh, we'll look out for Alex. But again, sort of new to single seaters, if you will, after so, so long racing other things. Yeah, taking part in the World Endurance Championship. Commentated a lot with Alex Brundle, never commentated on Alex Brundle before. So excited to see what he can do behind the wheel. Let's hope he can hook up all those apexes. But we might have to have many, many replays. Ah, oh, the need to pillory. Strong ethic here in the commentary box. We're, we're above that, aren't we, Alex? Uh, maybe, we'll find okay. out. Wilson has set a terrific time. The gap has come way down, though. Hibbert has got it down to 16 thousandths of a second. Then it's six tenths of a second back with uh, Richard's P3 at the moment. And it's, it's frantic to get, your, to get your place here. In a 30-car field, you absolutely want to be inside the top 10 here. Too good to end. Alex Brundle's first flying lap does put him inside the top 10. But the little batch of cars here, kind of a four-second fastest, Andrew Hibbert. The cars behind, very, very similar pace. Chris Gordon was fastest. He's in 175 with that orange helmet. They're running together for a purpose. They're trying to drag each other up the field. At the moment, top four cars down to Horatio Fitzsimon in fourth place, car number 68, uh, covered by three quarters of a second. Anybody running solo, not interrupted by the others, but no toe, it's going to hurt. Yeah, it is certainly around a circuit like this. You're looking at the 29 there. Another Lotus 27, Nick Fennel behind the wheel. Yeah, that's running in the blue of a Curie Ford France, uh, a livery that Joe Slesser uh, had on his cars quite a lot, uh, won a race at Nagaro, but Nick Fennell, fabulous in Glover Trophy races and uh, fabulous in, in, in Formula Junior as well, almost always seems to be a Lotus man. So Fennell up to fourth, and then you've got Richards, Goodwin, Brundle, Buhoffer, Child and Woodhouse at the top of the field. It's Wilson in first position now on a 1-25-0. How close is it? It's 44 thousandths of a second. Horatio Fitzsimon had just moved up to second place behind Wilson. Andrew Hibbard's fallen down to third, but those three cars covered by four tenths of a second. Sam Wilson with the green and blue helmet has been a major star the past decade in all sorts of vehicles, but small single-seaters there's bread and butter here at Goodwood. Taking so much speed visibly through this section where it does give you a good illustration. Who's feeling brave? That grass has been plenty trimmed on the outside today. And I think because these cars are so nimble and they can change direction so quickly, you can really see with the eye 
when someone's going in fast and certainly the momentum Sam Wilson carried through the first part of St Mary's into the second bit was phenomenal but that's a driver confident with the with the car and certainly that Cooper is working brilliantly in his hands but his margin is only 44 thousandths of a second may well stretch it a little bit this lap the noise of these machines is absolutely terrific and it helps as well when you put them th 30 of them on track uh, we've got all but one only russell is in the pits the 122 entry currently finds themselves back in the pit lane that's a lotus 22 currently in the pits just looking how stiff the suspension is in the car you can see the nose and the bodywork shaking on sam wilson's cooper just improved he's now gone gone below one minute 25 he's clear by 0.158 of a second car number three uh, being pushed on by Marco Werner, yes, three-time Le Mans winner with Audi. And uh, certainly he's probably been encouraged to come here by Emanuele Pirro, who won two of those victories with Emanuele. And of course, he's such a, an ambassador for this. But uh, Max Werner, sorry, Marco Werner started racing in Historics a handful of years ago. Monaco, historic, but great to see him here and going so well at the moment. Number three is sixth fastest, two seconds off the pace, but clearly picking up speed as he goes. So Wilson, Fitzsimon, Hibbert, then Fennell, Richards, Werner now up to sixth. Roach in a seventh place, then it's Goodwin, Brundle and Buhoffer uh, completing the top ten. This is car number uh, 69, this is the Alexis Ford, the Mark IV, and that is Roach who just gone in to seventh place with his last lap. Yeah, Stuart Roach, a fantastic peddler. What's the change? Someone's just flashed to the top. And car number 194, Richards. Clive Richards, we knew he was going to be one of the stars. He goes third, fastest now. Four tenths of a second, five tenths of a second, half a second. Top four cars. Very, very tight at the very front of the field. And with so many cars out on track, it's going to be difficult to have an entirely clean lap. They do seem to be working together nicely, though, out on circuit, Bruce playing nicely we could say but the interesting thing to me is the fact the first sector of every lap the fastest driver which is sam wilson is about is about but well, he's appreciably faster than the others in fact just saying that harry issue fit simon find it but relative to those behind him he was so much quicker but the end of the lap maybe not so good but then again different cars different approach to the circuit but we're dealing with wonderfully small sectors of time i feel like we pressed fast forward because they are so light You've got that thing where even though they're not that much faster than what we've been watching in the last couple of hours or so, because they are so low, they are so light and they are so nimble, it really feels like we've pressed fast forward a little bit from the trackside cameras. Yeah, good description. So Clive Richards pressing on 194, going through the chicane there, one of the Lotus 22s. And uh, then suddenly slowing and moving out of the way, maybe goes, I want your toe. But suddenly number 66 comes past and uh, looks like he's standing still and that's uh, Peter Petter Hughes in the Focus, very unusual car. Fitzsimon hits the front of the field. Fitzsimon with a 124.7, personal best in the final sector and uh, what belongs to Wilson, so this battle is not done at the moment, but Fitzsimon 24-7 takes him to the front of the field as they work together. But eventually, of course, you've got to get your elbows out. You've got to get the job done. Fitzsimon Wilson, then Richards, Hibbard, Goodwin, uh, Brundle, Fennel, Roach and Werner. Yeah, just looking at Chris Goodwin that time around the number 175, Lotus 22, he gained about a second. So he made his space in the traffic and used all that experience and his natural speed. He's on the best of the rest. The top four cars covered by now nearly six tenths of a second. Then another entire second back to Chris Goodwin. But he's got himself, you know, up a few steps. And that's what you're going to need to do in this field. Fabulous slipstreaming it is. I mean, no to tell is uh, it's a very small nose and a very small tail, but they're very close together. They are, and they're spacing it nicely, giving each other the room. And six minutes to go. So still a chance for plenty out there. As making his way through now as part of the pack. You can see number five, uh, Alex Brundle giving chase there, trying to close in. And there is the 68, the very impressive 68 of Horatio Fitzsimon, who is currently top and uh, top in his Lotus Ford 22, originally from 1962. Strange lap for Horatio. He dropped about four seconds. He sort of tried to get out of this pack. Hasn't quite worked. So he goes, all oh, right, I'll speed up again. I'm going to move forward. Alex Brundle trying to hang on his tail, but 
Alex at the moment is 1.8 seconds down, so he can't. But, you know, Alex hasn't raced these cars before, so he'll be learning by as he goes. He'll be sure he'll get a little bit of expert recommendation from around the Kings Lynn area from Brundle Senior. And you can see how much Fitzsimon has caught up in these corners. Five Richards, the next car up the line. And he's raced this Lotus 22 for the last three years. Ah, oh, Petter Hughes, the uh, one and only focus in this race, is not in the session anymore. He's uh, pulled up. So unfortunately, that's the focus, a Swedish built car. Uh, for someone who was a friend of Ronnie Peterson's, a guy who raced it was called Orian Atterberg. But uh, this car hasn't been used since uh, 1965, so you can forgive a little bit of mechanical failure. Absolutely. Great, great to see a different name in the field as well. And uh, we're disappointed it can't get to the very end. It's pulled off to the side of the road, so I don't think we'll need the intervention of a red flag. Up to second place goes Hibbert. Uh, with a personal best in all three sectors of the lap. But while he was doing that, Horatio Fitzsimon dropped back the previous lap and then went for it on clear track, has lowered the mark. He's now 1.2 seconds clear. That's car 68, tucked in behind, trying to get a toe is Clive Richards. Maybe they're mates, maybe they're helping each other, but they're certainly getting as close as they possibly can. So Fitzsimon, now Wilson in second, then Hibbert, Goodwin and Richards, the top five with four minutes to go. You might think for all of these drivers, how can in the space of a lap can you find half a second? You know, you normally deal in tenths of a second, but that's what they're doing. That's why Sam Wilson, number 53, the Cooper, is suddenly back in the mix. He found just over half a second. He needs to find three quarters of a second to try and topple Horatio Fitzsimon. A lot of the drivers, Alex, be rather cursing. They've lost two minutes off their session, but we've had to shorten the practice sessions so that we can complete the day. The first race, the meeting, on time. Yeah, looking forward to that. We need to sort the order for the grid for the Chichester Trophy out there at the moment. Fitzsimon, Wilson, Hibbard, then Goodwin, then Richards. You're looking at car number two at the moment, which is Jeff Underwood, who's in the Bradman BT2. Yeah, he's down in 23rd position, seven and a bit seconds down on the ultimate pace, but the pace is very, very quick indeed at the top of the field Alex Brundle slashing past Sam Wilson in 53 in the Cooper at the back of that pack he's going to try and find space where space is not to be found and just managed to get some retardation in there little bit of a preview of what we're going to bring you when we go racing for this one it will be a 25 minute race for Formula Junior cars with disc brakes up to 1963 is what you're watching on track at the moment and we've seen plenty of side by side action in qualifying for it, the race is going to be something else. Yeah, we haven't talked too much. We've talked about Lotuses, Brabham's, Coopers, but Lola are in the mix as well. And uh, just there, some of the front runners saw a little bit too much of the number 55, uh, Robin Longdon, Lola into the chicane. But they've got clear. But look, we've got two and a half minutes remaining in this session. So time for this lap or one more. Who's going to be on pole? But at the moment, three quarters of a second. Huge margin in this category for Horatio Fitzsimon. Top of the park, car number 68. Goodwin has a personal best through the first sector. Hibbard has a personal best through the first sector. Uh, Goodwin's first sector is one to keep an eye on. Well, the important thing is Chris Goodwin. Here he is, car number 175. Great looking uh, little Lotus there. He's got a bit of a gap between him and the group ahead. They shouldn't trip him up. He should get, oh, he's getting almost too close. He's getting close enough for a toe, but maybe in turn close enough to be tripped up. Minutes and 44 seconds to go. Track placement as important here. Might have to fight his way through. And he's fighting his way through. Yeah, got a little bit chopped at the end of the lap there. He's four tenths down on his best time. He's in third position. Fitzsimon, Wilson, Goodwin are the top three, covered by nine tenths of a second. Clive Richards in 194 is in the mix as well. That's the uh, Red Lotus has been in the pack almost the entire time with other cars, getting a tow but getting tripped up. You know, which way do you need to go? I was looking out of the commentary box window for Wilson begin, beginning his lap in the 53, and he was all over the curve with intent, knowing that this is his last chance to improve. He's looking to find an enormous amount of time, but if you time it right and you get a tow, you never know. Yeah, and I'm afraid I think Chris Goodwin has got a little too much traffic going through the second part of Laban. As long as he can get it down that King's run to Woodcut, he might be OK. But when you're really working towards the end of the session, is that the Ford France car? No, it's a darker shade of uh, mid-blue. 
that's in their way. And of course, the chequered flag will be out. Actually, they should have time to do one further lap after this. They'll squeak through, but only just. So 30 seconds remain in this practice session to set the grid for the Chichester Trophy. And we have Fitzsimons ahead of Wilson, ahead of Goodwin. Can you get a clear piece of the racetrack to ascend your car for an attacking lap around the 2.3 miles and put it on the front row for tomorrow? Well, Chris Goodwin got to start an extra lap with 15 seconds to spare. That's fine if you get half a second to spare before the chequered flag falls. Uh, you're allowed that lap to go and play. And I would suggest he's got fairly clear track. So here we are, final lap of qualifying. It's still Horatio Fitzsimon by three quarters of a second. Didn't I say three quarters? It's now down to 0.15 of a second because Sam Wilson don't think he got to start the final lap But he's slashed through gone into second place, but well, he stayed in second place He's got so much closer improved his time and there was a well That's real encouragement for everyone out there because Wilson He showed his intent when he was coming out of the final corner to start that lap as Woodhouse goes to eighth position Oh spin there in the middle of the pack and well, trying that, to find, I think that's Peter Strauss who's gone round. Car 126, good spot, ex Denny Holm car, but that was coming out of Ford Water. That one will be large in his memory as he puts his head on the pillow tonight. But the one to watch at the moment is Chris Goodwin, car 175, halfway around this lap. He's put in almost the very fastest first sector. Let's see what his second, oh, he's down a little bit on the second sector time, but every lap is uh, all made up of three sectors. If he's got no traffic in front of him, he may just improve enough. But the first two, Horatio Fitzsimon, Sam Wilson, coming by what next to nothing another three quarters of second back is Chris Goodwin car number 175 glorious little Lotus can Chris improve he may improve his time but not his position let's find out now he comes across the line and there's no improvement for Goodwin he was looking for it at the end this is the moment this is the uh, this is the 53 entry and this are we gonna get to the spin in a second what are we gonna see here well I thought for a second his exhaust pipe looks like it's coming a little bit loose. Need to take a closer look, but it was a spin in front of him. And uh, so, yes, taking to the grass, leaving the circuit, Peter Strauss. They didn't uh, work out who was the other one involved there, but it could be the uh, one, the Ford France livery car uh, that went off. But uh, no damage done, just the heart rate was uh, raised a little bit. Well, frantic stuff all the way through. And the spin the only interruption of the slipstreaming but in the end it's Horatio Fitzsimon who's put it at the front of the field and it is car 68 that will lead the line when the flag drops for the Chichester Cup and that well it leads so much promise for the race because that was really entertaining and it was only pushing to find the lap time in the end separated by under a tenth and a half Fitzsimon ahead of Wilson. Yeah, so the car owner of that Lotus 422, number 68, George, Georgios Papadopoulos, will be very happy indeed. But it's, uh, it's only bragging rights for now. It's pole position uh, for the, the race. And uh, that will be on Saturday, first thing, sorry, Sunday, first thing in the morning, 9.40. So plenty of time to consider life. But a lot of the drivers got a little bit caught out in traffic because it was a 30 car field, because it was really, really competitive between the front runners. Do you go for a tow or do you go not to be interrupted? It's hard to know which way was the best. Fitzsimon ahead of Wilson, then it was Goodwin, Richards, Hibbard, uh, Alex Brundle put it into sixth position and a car that he's had limited time behind the wheel of, and then it was Fennel, Woodhouse, Roach and Buhofer who finds himself in 10th uh, in position in the 50, and there you go, another session in the books. And don't those cars look just the best fun to drive? You always hear that if I, if I ever go out on the banking when I'm not commentating on the Formula Junior, everyone goes, I would love to race one of those. But to race them as well as the front runners, you need to be on top of your game big time. Doesn't happen overnight. No, not at all. And a great view of the pits in the paddock there. And let's have a look at, well, a session that definitely was worth getting a couple of snaps of. And that we got the idea early on, Bruce, that they were going to be working together in the pack, at least initially. Yeah, and some of the front runners very quickly setting the pace. Andrew Hibbard, number four Lotus, uh, straight on the money. Car 36, uh, Danny Baker, another Lotus, that was a 27. And it was about making the space in the traffic. It was about carrying momentum. You put these cars slightly sideways. They don't have the horsepower to hook up and get going. But one driver who largely did it on his own, Sam Wilson, the number 53 Cooper, was super quick. And his attack was so clear. And the 
because they were so light, so fast, we really did get the appearance of speed from plenty out there, including Sam Wilson, who you're continuing to look at in the Cooper. But it, go on, Brent. Then I was going to say car 194 was often in the mix, and that was uh, Clive Richards. We had effectively five car group, but they kept just chopping and changing. Session slightly interrupted. We had spinners, but nothing untoward. But it was about finding that moment out on the track. Car 68, Horatio Fitzsimon just working harder and harder in his Lotus Ford 22. He eventually was the one on the money. And in the end, it was down to 0.147 of a second. It was so, so competitive. It was. There's the uh, message being hung out. Loving the uh, pit boards that the drivers have to make use of. The pits ever changing down there. And this was picking your way through the traffic. We did see a spin late on as well for Strauss. Very nearly got another one in that moment. Yeah, that was Sam Wilson knowing when to pull the nose back in, wind it back in. But again, you had to not lose momentum, keep it travelling, and then a spin out of Ford Water. No, thank you. Oh, we'll have one then. Anyone. So, anyway, so 126, Peter Strauss, round he went. There was no damage, but at the end of the session, it was Horatio Fitzsimon, Lotus number 68, king of the pile. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood Members Meeting, the 80th Members Meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Lamont gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. Good gut health affects every single aspect of your body, from your brain wiring, to your energy output, to your hormone regulation, to how clever your immune system is. Everybody benefits from better gut health because it makes your body work better. I would thoroughly recommend Goodwood Gut Health Program. It's been quite life-changing, really. Wow, what a day it's been. We really have been treated to some spectacular action on track. So much nostalgia. It brings us so much joy. If only we could bottle it all up and take it home with us for next year. Um, but today, and over the course of the weekend, we are celebrating Carol Shelby. Today, well, maybe not today, this year would have been his 100th birthday. Um, David, tell us, I mean, Carol Shelby, a legend in motorsport. Well, a character, a legend, and you know, a tale of two parts of his life, really. A driver, of course, and then a constructor. And you see his history behind us here. We've got him there in his cars. When he first started his career, he started driving quite late, but then he started driving for Aston Martin and won Le Mans in 1959. Incredible achievement as a driver. After that, he, he kept winning. He was here in the TT. At Goodwood, and then of course moved on. You see him there with the Shelby Series One, the first car he built from the ground up, and of course the Shelby Mustang, great sales car for Mustang. And here in the assembly area, we have some great cars there. That number one car there, uh, Bruce Myers driving that. He's the chairman, founder of the Peterson Museum, good friend of Carol's, and we've got his grandson there, Aaron Shelby, driving the MGTC, the first car that Carol Shelby ever drove. 
Anyways. Wow. I love how at Good Wood Revival it just passes through the generations. Um, and so to have a Shelby actually in the car is just a very special moment. And over 50 cars together in this celebration. Uh, what have you got your eye on? I mean, for me, oh, GT40s. It's well, just phenomenal. These, these cars are beasts. I mean, this car in it is a real special car. The number one car, as I said, first production Cobra, driven by Bruce Meyer, and then the MG we talked about there, Aaron Shelby. Careful not to run over our cameraman. But these cars now, you see the modern drivers get into these cars, and they still love to drive them because they're a handful. They're hard to drive. They're very fast. And of course, a GT40 there. That is the Le Mans winning car. A lovely car, rev of the engine as they go past. And of course, that Golf livery. Such an iconic look, the blue and the orange. I mean, it just means so much to see them going out all on track together. And you know, that's an incredible feat in itself, to have 50 Shelby cars all in one place. Another GT40 going out on track. So many AC Cobras as well. A very, very special moment. What would Carol Shelby make of this? He would have loved it. He was a maverick. He pushed against, you know, all the Ford and Ford. Of course, we saw him in that film, you know, Le Mans 66, Ford versus Ferrari, as it was called, the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, the guy was a maverick. He wouldn't have existed now, but he would have loved this celebration of his life. Absolutely. And the good thing is we get to enjoy it several times over the course of the weekend. But this is the first time the 50 cars are taking to the track for the Carroll Shelby celebration. Let's go to Ben Edwards. Well, thank you very much. It's Bruce Jones and Alex Jakes talking you through this one. But Carroll Shelby was a man who could tell a, a many a story. Sometimes they were tall, sometimes they were short. He was tall, but the stories were absolutely on the money. And to be involved and to create the AC Cobra, effectively to save the AC company by giving them something that was a landmark car, and to be involved in the development of the Ford GT40, taking it away from when it was being developed in the UK to go over to the States. I mean, two things like that. Oh, and he won Le Mans 1959 for, Lotus, uh, for Aston Martin, and he raced in Formula One for Aston Martin. Not bad for a chicken farmer from Texas. Yeah, not bad at all for a man whose life was changed when one of his old war buddies pulled up with an MG. Uh, he went racing in that MG, he kept winning in that MG, and as you say, Bruce, he got on the radar of Aston Martin, who selected well, and he became the second American to win, to win the Le Mans 24 hours. So this is, uh, as mentioned, this is the MGTC, the first car he uh, raced with uh, grandson Aaron Shelby, enjoying his time around the circuit. And, you know, you look at the history of some of the great drivers, most of them, particularly starting in the 50s, started small. Bruce McLaren in that tiny little Austin down beach racing. But what, look, the Bib and Tucker, as, uh, yes. as of course, Carol wore at Le Mans when he was a works driver from Aston Martin. And, uh, you know, onboard cameras can add so much, and it's just the grace, the family look there, but I love that Texan touch. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. The uh, the overalls, the signature of him in the early days, because he didn't have time to change, having come from the farm uh, uh, before he got to the races, or so the legend went, it meant that he was very, very noticeable at a racetrack. Yeah, I mean, Carroll wasn't just American, he was Texan, or was it the other way around? But uh, certainly very proud and uh, effectively had to stop his racing career because of uh, heart problems that, that dogged him, but he lived to a, a ripe age. And in fact, I had the absolute luxury one time of uh, having to take him out to dinner. Adam Brooks had arranged a special dinner and the cast of thousands included Sterling Moss, Tony Brooks, Roy Salvadori. And the best thing of all was uh, people trying to sort of see who tell the biggest story. And it really was between Salvadori <laughs> and Shelby. My God, and trying to run them in a Formula One team. That was never going to work. Oh, he didn't. It was the Aston Martin Formula One team behind the curve. But to celebrate Shelby is a phenomenal thing. He would have been 100 this year had he lived, lived on to this age. He would still have been telling stories. But what a record he laid down. The AC Ace became the Cobra with the big American Ford engines. 4.7 litres to start with, 7 litres. Later on, they grew more and more. But that was the car that made Ford realise they could take on Ferrari as well. A little more. And then, of course, he was involved in the second stage, the stage that made the GT40 successful into 1966.
Yeah, many credit him from making the American automobile suddenly at the uh, competitive level from a big machine and refining it and refining it and refining it and eventually refining it to victory at the Grand Prix of Endurance. Uh, a fabled tale all these years, part of Hollywood movie legend as well and uh, captured in that fantastic film where you saw Ford versus Ferrari. But uh, 100 years on from his birth, absolutely worthy of terrific celebration and pause to recognize one of the uh, great American racers and uh, automobilists' history. And down in the paddock, just to walk past the, the row of awnings that uh, contain this collection. In fact, they're so big with 50-odd cars, they can't be contained uh, all to see. That's the, the Burden Row family, AC Cobra. Of course, uh, they, they needed hard tops when they were at Le Mans to be more aerodynamic. And, of course, the body shape kept on changing. Maserati birdcage in the background, looking tiny behind one of the... Uh, AC Cobras and a, and a Maserati uh, moving around the back of the shot. Sorry, I beg your pardon, the 300S, the background of the shot. So you forget that a lot of American racers drove Italian Exotica. And there is Bruce Meyer, car number one, the man who founded the amazing Peterson collection, automotive collection in the States. Uh, a man who has exquisite taste in machinery. The car guy is car guy, he's been dubbed. And I'm not surprised everyone wants a video but also to take in the sound because it's that unmistakable roar of an AC Cobra. You don't need to see it to know it's gone past. No, of course, uh, Carroll Shelby wasn't the first person to put an American engine in a light British sports car, but by far the most successful. And as the car went on, it stopped looking like an ace. The wings became bigger, the wheels became wider. But just to sit on one when they accelerated in a straight line, Phenomenal, quite frightening when you went round a corner. No, no, very frightening when you went round a corner. So this moment of celebration, 100 years on from Carroll Shelby's birth and assembling 50 cars with links to him and the uh, GT40 you can see there in the, in the famous livery, the golf colours uh, and recognisable for motor racing fans the world over in the light blue and the orange. But one of the glories you think you know about a racing driver's career, and if it's as long and as illustrious as Carroll Shelby, you still think it's encapsulated in two or three or four cars. But the fact in the background was the Maserati 300S. Behind that was a Jaguar C-Type, which he raced in the 50s. They drove a lot of things. And that, that is the glory. All shapes and sizes. One of the best-looking cars to my eye is the... Uh, Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe, Coupe number four, 12 just went through the shot. That was all in search of uh, aerodynamics to make this brute of a car, the AC Cobra, work at the Mall. Yeah, winning its class in, in many years as well, before then taking on the task handed to him by the Ford Motor Company to go and beat Ferrari after they tried to acquire Ferrari, failed, and then went and beat them on their own patch. Uh, Ferrari didn't go back for a long while after that. And when they did, it was uh, it was this year that they finally returned to the top step. And how did it go? It went very well. Right, Ford needs to come back as well. Take them on all over again. I don't mind history repeating itself. But again, even looking at the Ford GT40s coming through, there's a road-going version in the background, the Mark Ford, just in front, that's the one in the deep claret color. And then cars with grooves, that's one we're describing them. But the AC Cobra needed to be more aerodynamic. Not a special one, not just because it's metallic, uh, pinky purple, the... Uh, Cobra Dragon Snake. God, they did rather well in uh, Trackster Race. Completing that round, uh, we go with the uh, 50 out there. First, a huge assembly of cars linked to, to Carroll Shelby. And one of the great things about the revival is that in between the frenetic qualifying that we've brought you all day long, uh, we also take a moment to pause and show you some heritage at slightly slower speed. Exactly so, and uh, the Cobra was a car that just kept AC Cobra, AC down, uh, also carriers of uh, Thames Ditton, going rather well indeed. But uh, there, there's one of the earlier ones, of course, without the great big bulging arches. That would have been a 4.7 litre, the 289 Ford engine that uh, was rather, rather successful. And often there was a big question, and it was the same with the GT40s. Better with the 4.7 or the big brute of the 7 litre, which came with more heat, more weight, but of course more power. So they're snaking their way back to uh, finish in formation. See them out of the commentary box window now, approaching the final corner, Woodcote, uh, before they head through the chicane on this lap of honour. 
to pay tribute to Carol Shelby. And we've got the American flag and the Texan flag in the bunting on the main straight. Another nice touch as well. And just in, in among that, the one single-seater out there was the Aston Martin DBR4, the car that they tried to take on the World Championship in 1960, but the game had moved on. Engines needed not to be in front of the driver, but behind as Cooper and Lotus were starting to show the way on that count. But, of course, uh, certainly for Aston Martin, their focus after many years of it not working was to try and win the Le Mans 24 hours. And until that focus was achieved in 1959 uh, with Carroll Shelby, they, they, they didn't get the cars onto the World Championship grid in time. And a little story that Carol told me at that uh, wonderful dinner was that uh, he noticed the Aston Martin boss, David Brown, had gone, always an immaculate man, had gone to change into a summer suit so he could be in the photos. And Carol delighted and saying, hop in next to me in the car, we'll drive up the pit lane, knowing it was full. <laughs> this white suit was going to get very oily <laughs> indeed. So a sense of humour as well. That's great. That's excellent stuff. As, isn't that a pretty car park at the... Chicane just before we line up and send all of those cars back to the paddock where you can have a look. There's a huge assembly of them, but well worth your time to have a gander at the, uh, behind the main pits building at everything that we've sent round there. Uh, so many iconic names, multiple AC Cobras. We also had uh, multiple Ford GT40s out there, the Shelby Mustang, uh, which really got the racing program up and running a first evidence for Ford that he could run things incredibly effectively. Uh, and, and just so many cars to look at, we couldn't, I was waiting to catch the car, the 63 class winner at Le Mans, that's the car 39PH, because it had Edsel Ford, part of, part of the, the magical Ford family. Uh, they tended to alternate Henry Edsel, Henry Edsel, uh, <laughs> on board that car, and that was a car that won its class, Ninian Sardis and Peter Bolton, 1963, and a lovely little note, team manager of that woman racing car was one Sterling Moss. Could it be the same man? Of course, he wasn't racing anymore uh, then, after his accident here in 1962, but uh, so much history out there, so much horsepower. Yeah, fantastic. Iconic sights and sounds, especially the sound. Terrific there. And great to see. That was a, a lovely touch around the circuit. And they are pulling back into the paddock now. Uh, new technology, old outfit. I like it, sir. Nicely done. Uh, with a great vantage point. And let's take you through the last of them parking up down there. Well, you, you had Coopers, you had Maseratis, you had MGs. Where was this one going? Of course, it was the Carroll Shelby tribute. Such an illustrious history. First as a racing driver, a Le Mans winner, but then a man who was deeply involved in the sorting of the Ford GT40 and, of course, the car that really made the name of AC. When the Ace got the Ford engine in and became the AC Cobra, and there were plenty of those. If you like a dragon snake, that's out there too. What an array of cars. What an array of fans and cars. It's a superb event. To hear them start and then... gut health affects every single aspect of your body from your brain wiring to your energy output to your hormone regulation to how clever your immune system is everybody benefits from better gut health because it makes your body work better i would thoroughly recommend goodwood gut health program it's been quite life-changing really
Well, we always say that people come from all around the world just for Goodwood Revival, and these guys are no different. Where have you come from today? We're coming from Belgium, from Antwerp, Belgium. And do you come every year? We come every year for the last 10 years, I think, yes. No, no excusable. Every year we're here. Let's yes. just have a look at your hat then, because you've got some badges, and are these yes. for over the last few years? Uh, the, most of from the last few years, and uh, there are badges from the 500 Owners Club. I have a, a Formula of, uh, 3 from the 1955, which won Le Mans. Uh, and so we, yeah, we're petrol heads, so we oh, come here. I was going to say, you are petrol year, heads then. Once, yes, yes, devoted to the cause, the good cause. Quite right, the Goodwood <laughs> cause, indeed. Ladies, you look absolutely stunning today as well. You've got matching hats yeah, and dresses. Yeah, Is this, are you sisters? No, 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 we are, we are good friends. Oh, good amazing. friends. And have you purposely dressed like this? This was spoken about. <laughs> yes, we bought it especially for today. Oh, amazing. And how much do you enjoy Goodwood? We love Terribly, it. we love it. Amazing. Yeah. And you look stunning as well. I love yeah. this red hat yeah. on you. Is, are you a petrol head as well? Well, it's more my, my husband who is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But I'll always join him here. And uh, I always say for him it's Christmas, New Year, Santa Claus, uh, everything like together. And his birthday. If I would ever say, no, you're not going anymore, I think I... <laughs> He would kill me. <laughs> you know, what? it just is the place to come. Ever, everyone loves it so much. And apart from you know being a petrol head and loving the cars, what else do you love about it? Well, the races are amazing. Whatever happens, everybody's dressed. Everybody's in good vibe. The food is good. The drinks are good. So you know, it's it's the, the total ambiance is, is is perfect. Well, listen, so, it's the yeah. place for me. I might just hang out with these guys the rest of the day. They seem to know exactly what's going on. <laughs> you may, you may. Always a party when the Belgians are in town. Or so I've found through the years. It's time to send more cars on to the circuit it is time to move to the Richmond and Gordon trophies it is 2.5 litre Grand Prix cars from 1954 to 1960 and uh, this is going to be once again fascinating to see how competitive it is wonderful roar as they leave the paddock onto their install lap before they start setting the pace by just taking a look at this field as they come down to Madrid to start their lap their out lap you can see it's a time of change of course motor racing is always a time of change but uh, the eagle-eyed among you will have spotted some have engines at the front and some have them at the back the smaller ones the British ones the, the Coopers and the Lotuses the Maseratis uh, even the Aston Martin DBR4 were still with the engine up ahead of the driver, but you know, motor racing was changing and uh, it was a chance for the, the outsiders. The Cooper family, Colin Chapman with Lotus, to challenge the thinking and go, you know, we can do this differently. And uh, it was a wonderful time, but any field that has Maserati 250Fs uh, in it is brilliant as far as I'm concerned. One coming down here, the unusual Monaco racing livery. Andre Testu's car white with the red flashes on the side, but to me, a 250F should really be in a deep, deep red. Completely right, completely right. So another couple of minutes of the, uh, of the duration of the session, which was meant to be 20, 18 instead now, and immediately to work. No messing around, we're just 16 minutes on the clock. You've got to find out what you've got underneath you if you're Andrew Willis, and this is a BRM P48 uh, from 1960. Yeah, pressing on very impressively. Uh, Charles McCabe making that fly, locking up a little bit. But you know, oh, no, it's his own, own bit of a, just a bit of overfill there. But uh, you know, confident with the car, absolutely attacking from the outset. But always for drivers at Revival when they get out on their first lap, just how much oil has gone down. So some go for sighters, others just go for it. <laughs> yes, you're quite right. There's uh, drivers that ease their way into a session, and then force of opposite lock there we'll see if that's the same type of uh, expression behind the wheel as we check in with car number six which is the lotus 18. sorry i just need to correct myself of course it's andy willis driving the brm number it's charles mccabe's car that number two we were looking at to start with so waiting for the first flying lap to come on the board it looks as though the driver will be fast this is andy willis giving me another chance to correct myself in brm number two and the little lotuses as well out there will be at the front end of the field. More fields. That's uh, Katsuaki Kubota, he of the Digger family from um, in Japan, who's just such a lotus aficionado. We saw him out in the Lotus 30 in the Whitson Rumble session uh, just a short while ago. And another car that's puffing a little bit of overfill out of its tail. So waiting for the time to set that. One minute, 24.9 seconds. That's Wolfgang Friedrichs uh, at the top of the charts. Car number 12. 
So out there at the moment, 27 cars. We have 14 minutes to go. Second correction, Rudy Friedrichs. I didn't think it was Wolfgang Friedrichs. Ah, let's distract everybody from my mistake with uh, Nick Topless having gone round. That's unusual. Car number 77, one of the, the low-line Coopers, one of the T53s, ex-Rob Walker racing team car. He gets it back onto terra firma. Yeah, just with the arm out to say, give me some room to come back onto the circuit. And he got it in the end uh, in the very sleek Cooper there as he finds his way back on. Uh, so this will be a 25 minute race for 2.5 litre engine cars from 1954 to 1960. And we're checking in now with uh, number two once again, that is the BRM. Willis behind the wheel. Yeah, this is the car that was driven by uh, Graham Hill, Tony Brooks, Dan Gurney. That's illustrious for you. And of course, this was after Graham Hill had moved away from Lotus, uh, joined BRM. And of course, that was the, the mark with which he got his first World Championship title in 1962. It's Fredericks ahead of Willis, then Shaw, then Nuttall, then Grivis, Spears, McCarthy, Baker, Williams, and Daniel. Top 10, confirmed for you now on the left-hand side. So Rudy Friedrichs, uh, fastest of all. Now on the many Lotuses in the field, car 49, Andrew Beaumont, another Lotus aficionado like Katsuaki Kabuta, any sort of Lotus, he'll want to drive it. And uh, Andrew drives, this is X UDT laced all Formula One team car. And uh, Andrew getting to grips with that. Previously owned by Andrew Bailey for many, many years feeling his way in. A lot of these drivers going for it from the outset, others feeling their way in. And now Miles Griffiths goes top. There he is, car number one. And so, uh, well, for a nanosecond, then suddenly Will Nuttall tucked in behind, car number 100. Uh, Giorgio Marquis, uh, low-line Cooper, tucked in behind the Lotus. It's Philip Walker's car, number one, being driven by Miles Griffiths. That's another X Graham Hill car. So we go from an X Graham Hill BRM to an X BRM X Graham Hill Lotus. And currently fastest, Nuttall's Car 100 and the Cooper Climax, the T53 low line being driven here. It's a McLaren car from uh, 1960. And supporting uh, Brabham's championship winning year, the four McLaren will go on to develop their own machinery. Marino Franchitti has just put it into seventh position. The driver in car number seven has taken his 250F to uh, the top 10 with that lap. And off the road goes 43. And some of these magnificent old cars, including this Cooper Climax, uh, of course, so old, these cars. And unfortunately, that one has come to a halt. Well, they raced in heat in period, but so the perpetual heat this weekend won't be helping a lot of these cars, but uh, pulled off as well as he could. Let's hope that uh, could be... I'd like that to be moved just a little bit, but uh, it is what it is, and it is where it is. But uh, certainly right now, top... Well, the top two cars are covered by just over a tenth of a second. Then there's a really big spread. You mentioned Marino Franchitti. He's, he's 11 and a half seconds off the pace in yes. seventh. But that's because they haven't laid down serious flying laps. These two most certainly have. Fastest of all, now Miles Griffiths back ahead of Will Nuttall by how much? 0.139 of a second. So it's Cooper against Lotus. Something historic about that. <laughs> it sounds just about right, doesn't it? Uh, and they continue around at the moment. Only 10 minutes to go. Uh, we've had one car pull to the side of the track, but one car in the pits, and everyone else is out there trying to improve, like we've just seen with uh, Falcon Cochran managing uh, to get up to seventh position there. I love the shape of uh, the number one Lotus, the Lotus Climb at 16. Someone described it uh, like a lot of cars in the period as being like a cigar tube, but behind the driver, of course, you got that. It's not a dorsal fin, it's a dorsal hump if you will, just provided a bit more stability. But with the, with the little Cooper we were looking at there, it's about going low. Now, the uh, Maserati 250F was raced for many years. This one eventually raced by Andre Testu in the Monaco Grand Prix 58 and 59. It's in Monegasque colours, because he was based there. But that was John Bearer's works car. But cars had 
many different things involved, you know, many different owners, many different teams. They can pass from team to team from year to year. And Andre Testu didn't have any success whatsoever, but that car is still fabulous. Red flag is out after that car has made contact with what remains of the barrier of the first part of the chicane, which has taken an absolute battering across today. Of course, when these cars would have been racing here in period, that was a, a concrete wall or a brick wall. And Jean Bera found out uh, to his displeasure and pain because he broke his nose as he clattered into it. But the drivers are just made to think it's a brick wall still. Of course, it isn't. Probably a wise move that it isn't as we just take a pause in proceedings. Uh, how long do we have left? Ten minutes left on the clock uh, with Griffiths ahead of Nuttall. And they've been trading times all the way through the session. Uh, Less than two tenths of a second in the battle for uh, pole position. And then Fredericks ahead of Willis, Shaw, and Spears. This is the moment that sent round the 250F. And maybe braking early to try and avoid the car ahead of Jeffrey O'Neill on another 250F. Round it goes into the uh, first barrier on the apex of the chicane and he was able to reverse and continue but not before we've had the yellow flag uh, the, and then up upgraded to the red flag and that is where everyone finds themselves and if you're on camera you've got to give us a wave that's just the rule that's just how it works on revival friday so the cars trickling down the pit lane most will be forming up towards the exit they'll have 10 minutes and one second to go cars still coming into pit lane but I don't think there should be too long a clear-up of, of the ex-Andre Testu Maserati. Uh, and that's uh, a car that went off at the chicane. OK, we're uh, just taking a pause. Everyone is, uh, is coming back to the pits. Gives us a chance to, uh, to just pause. And Nikki has found a very special guest who she caught up with earlier on. The beautiful thing about Goodwood Revival is that it attracts stars from all walks of life, including superstar tennis players. I'm delighted to say that joining me now is Greg Rodetsky. Greg, what are you doing here? We literally just found you wandering around, enjoying the sights, the smells. Um, tell us, is it your first time at Revival or are you a bit of a fanatic? No, it's my first time at Revival. I have my friends who have invited us for the day. It's been a great day out, loving the old cars, especially the Porsches. We're seeing a lot of 911s, a lot of the Ferraris, and seeing all the racing, so it's been a fabulous day. Have you been to an event anywhere else on the planet like this one? It's the biggest fancy dress party in the world, isn't it? <laughs> 1940s, 1950s, 1960s outfit. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's a great day out. It's such a traditional thing, and it's great to see so many people here bringing their cars from all around the world and just racing them on the track. And you're a bit of a petrol head yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah, you well, like uh, adrenaline fueled driving. I do, but I also like classics. So I used to have an old 356 Speedster Porsche. So uh, that was my pride and joy. A little convertible, a little silver with a red interior. Been looking at a few cars as well, a few cars on auction this week. So I'm uh, looking at a Mercedes 190. Uh, you know, they had the 300, but the 300 is a little bit more pricey. So I might go for the 190. All right, well, Greg, we won't interrupt your day anymore. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and saying hello to everyone. Um, have a fantastic weekend at your first Good Revival. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg Rodetsky, everyone. The Richmond and Gordon trophies are all about front engine and rear engine cars. Now, the rear engine cars came later, and that is the layout the Formula One still uses today because it is faster. Unless, of course, you are Miles Griffiths here, um, who's currently sitting on pole position. Uh, I'm going to try not to burn my uh, suit on the exhaust. Miles, I'm sorry to uh, dive in here. I've just been saying that the rear engine cars are faster unless Miles is driving. <laughs> yeah, th you know, generally they do have a bit more grip than we've got. But to be honest, this is just such a fantastic car that, you know, it's a pleasure to drive. Um, so we'll see how we can do. And uh, Will's pushing you pretty close. It's going to be like that all the way through the weekend, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, me and Will have uh, been good friends for a long time, so it's really nice to be sliding around Goodwood together. Enjoy it. Thanks, cheers. Uh, speaking of Will, he's right here. <laughs> I, just, I, d I don't know whether that was an inward sigh as you saw me come towards you. Um, Will is pretty close with Miles at the moment. Um, it's, I was just saying to him it's going to be like that all weekend. Yeah, let's hope so. We hope we have a good race and uh, put on a show for everybody. But these look like such fun cars to drive, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I can't think of anything better to be doing right now. Well, me neither. Enjoy it. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, OK, just while I break the microphone on the windscreen, let's uh, crack on down here. The Lotus 18, which um, Moss made so famous by winning uh, in Monaco with the uh, sides removed for a bit of extra air cooling. Um, the famous Accorio Cos nose bands. You've got Ewan Sergison, which um, has a great Graham Hill helmet and the best moustache of the weekend. <laughs> Ewan, um, always a delight. How's, how's the car going? Yeah, she's beautiful. It's a little bit different to the Lola T70, but it's, it's such a cracking car. It's awesome. And I always see you walking around with a pipe, but I, I see you've discarded it for the, for the actual driving part. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, apparently it's not good for my lungs. I'm not sure the fumes off this thing would be very good. Oh, no, it's beautiful. It's, 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 it's like perfume. It's lovely. I've just seen your oil temperature and pressure is on the side of the chassis there. Um, Scott, I don't know if you can go in and, and see. Uh, from grim experience, it's very hard to look at your gauges when you're busy. How on earth can you see those? Uh, well, I, I, I don't like looking forward because it's quite scary, so I've usually got my head down. So you can usually have a quick look. But don't look that way, that's scary. All the scary stuff's over there. And when you see the smoke, look at the dials. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, I, it's, it's been quite fun out there. A lot of people, I, th I think they're using the mirrors for decoration. Um, but the, it, it was fun. I had a couple of uh, offs on the grass getting past people, but it's, it's, it's all right. She, she likes grass. She's... Good luck. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Bye. Right, Scott, follow me. Um, there's some heat they get in these tyres. Even though these cars are pretty light, uh, they um, certainly get some heat in them in this weather. Going to cruise, cruise in here, that old faithful smile. Marino, um, you drive so many cars, but every time I see you in this, you've always got a much bigger grin than the other ones. Uh, yeah, it is, it is the best. I think if there was one tank of fuel left, this was this would definitely be what I would I would drive. And um, it's it wasn't around last year because it was in Italy um, in the new Michael Mann Ferrari movie, which is sort of all around the, the circuit on the Sky poster. So. Um, I thought I was going to drive it and that. I ended up being uh, Eugenio Castellotti, but this stars in the movie with uh, Derek Hill driving it as Jean Berra, so it's, it's nice to have it back and it's nice to be back out in it. Um, I must say, if anyone hasn't seen it, go onto social media, Instagram, have a look at your profile, because you as Castellotti is wonderful and the photos are brilliant. I mean, you look great with hair. <laughs> it's a real pain though, you know, get, they have a great makeup and hair team. Uh, Michael Mann was. And when he asked me to do it, I'm like, like can you grow hair? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the whistle going. Uh, best of luck. That's all the cars starting up, and we've got a green flag. So no hair growth, but plenty of action down there in the pit lane. I do love the way that the second the engines rev and the flag drop is when Ed ends the interview. You're, talk, you're dealing with professionals here. Yeah, no messing about. Well, he knows that he wouldn't get many more words out of Marino anyway. Good to hear from him. And uh, doing driving for the Ferrari film that is getting quite a lot of uh, buzz around it. And if you do make a biopic of the most enigmatic car manufacturer ever in motor racing, it better be up to a standard, otherwise you're going to get a lot of very disappointed people leaving the cinema. Uh, exactly so, and there have been some duds in the past. Right, Marino Franchitti, you can see him just leaving the pits, car number seven, what a deep red Maserati 250F from his father's father-in-law's car collection. His father-in-law, of course, Nick Mason of, well, from my point of view, from 10 tenths, which is his car division, but of <laughs> course, his side business with Pink Floyd has done him quite well over the decades. Yeah, not bad of royalties, that, that side hustle, not bad at all. Uh, everyone who can exit the pits has exited the pits. I'm uh, just seeing that uh, just the one car listed there is uh, still mired in the pit lane. Car number five belonging to Shaw. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, car number 99. Uh, that's oh, sorry, yeah, that, that's the Scarab. Uh, the Scarab. Blue and white American car with the Offenhauser engine up the front in that long, long nose. And that's a car that's absolutely flown here over the years with Julian Bronson at the wheel. So let's hope that can get going. But everyone else out on the track, and unfortunately, alongside the track, or we saw in the number 43 Cooper, Eddie Williams pull off uh, before the red flag came out. Yeah, so still plenty operating out there uh, including this most famous of cars the uh, 49 continuing to operate uh, the lotus the 18 from uh, 1961 
Yeah, the key there was uh, we saw the Lotus 16 that's fastest. That was 1959 with the engine at the front and Miles Griffiths in the cockpit. Just two years later, the cars that were really, well, in fact, just one year later, it was the Lotus 18 starting to make strides and then uh, the customer teams got it, which is, of course, what Colin Chapman wanted to sell as many Lotus racing cars as he could alongside the road going cars. But Miles Griffiths first to leave the pit lane. He's fastest by what, 0.139 of a second, so not very much, but the clock is counting down. Seven minutes remain. He's got clear track and the driver who's second fastest is behind. They have got no excuses. Will Nuttall pushing on very, very hard indeed and saying, what would I rather be doing? Couldn't think of an answer to that one, so he's absolutely flying that low-line Cooper T53. Front engine versus rear engine, and Nuttall going very nicely. Sector one and sector two, it looked neat and tidy. Let's see if it adds up when you put it on the timing page, and he goes across the line, and he goes up to provisional pole position with uh, car number 100 in P1, thanks to Nuttall. By 14 thousandths of a second, Andrew Beaumont catching sight of his Lotus 18 again, UDT lace door car. He will work his way up the order a little bit, but so many people were interrupted by that red flag. But at the moment, it's not all now ahead of Griffiths, but it's this next time around that's really going to count. But neither of them have got any excuses about the traffic. They're in clear air. They are indeed, and the terrific roar around the circuit continues. If you have just pressed play, or you have just got a new vantage point, maybe you've been uh, indulging yourself in a, a late afternoon snack. This is going, this is qualifying for the 25-minute race, and there's a bit of a mess out of the zone. We're nearly into the long stuff out there. Car number four, which is the 250F of Jeffrey O'Neill, was involved in that. Well, there we are. That's why, uh, if you're at the circuit. Do you ever think it might be a good idea to go watch the St Mary's? Well, I can tell you it is because it's a corner where stuff happens. But even if it's not having cars going off the track, it's where you can see the drivers really, really working their cars to take the two-part corner over their eyes down in the dip. But Will Nuttall is the man who's flying. He's uh, on pole at the moment, provisional pole by 14 thousandths. But I think he's going to stretch his margin of advantage. But actually, his middle sector wasn't that good. Will he improve on 1 minute 22.2? No, he doesn't. Across the line, no improvement, a lot of potential in that first sector that ebbed away as he, and you can see from the rear stepping out, immediately goes back to work to try and extend his advantage at the front of the field. Yeah, in fact, uh, doing the maths on that one, I would reckon he had to lift with the yellow flags being shown at St Mary's with those two cars going for a spin, and that's why the middle sector was so poor, but he has pace aplenty in that number 100, Cooper low line, the T53. Little changes year on year, but of course, as we keep saying, engines behind the drivers were starting to be the way to go in 1955 when Jack Brabham had his first attempt at a Cooper with an engine at the back. It didn't, how do you say, set the world on fire. <laughs> yes, kind of way of putting it. So amidst a gear change on the uh, on the main straight, and we got a huge spike in revs as, uh, as they went past. And four and a half minutes to go. It's a personal best in the middle sector for Griffiths, who is looking to try and improve by uh, 15 thousandths of a second and take position of provisional pole. He's got a good clear track as well, Nuttall, to try and hang on to that advantage. You know what, even though he's got clear track, I think Will Nuttall on this one is doing a, a quick, quick, slow routine. I think this is the, he's, he's in the fallow year at the moment, but uh, Miles Griffiths, Lotus 16, car number one, sweeps into the first corner through Madrick, and it's a two-part corner right out to the edge, and importantly, not beyond. I wonder if he came across traffic there in that final sector because it, it wasn't an improvement and you would expect, given how well he went in the middle part of the track, things to go a lot better for him. He's still searching for that perfect lap to take him to the front of the field. Uh, Frankiti is trying to improve to the top 10. His last effort put him in 11th position. He's just done a personal best sector one as well, the driver we heard from in the pits during the red flag. When you look at this crisp Lotus Works livery, don't you think Formula One should introduce bright yellow wheels to some of the teams? I think they look absolutely exquisite. You were talking earlier, Alex, about, of course, cars were running in there, largely in their national liveries uh, until sponsorship. Uh, well, it didn't hit Formula One until the start of 1968, it hit other series uh, beforehand. But certain purity applied to this car, not just by its shape, but by its race. Uh, race livery there, the dark green, the British racing green, but uh, the Norfolk racing colours with the yellow. And for Willis in fourth position, uh, a personal best in sector one, but an enormously slow sector two. So I wonder if he's had a moment 
uh, in the middle part of the track that's uh, just brought his lap to a halt because he did a 57 0. I think I have an idea on this one. We had the two cars spinning at St Mary's. I think there might be oil down there because nobody is getting a really good middle sector of their lap. And in fact, just then coming in, second fastest, uh, Miles Griffiths was looking around. Maybe he doesn't feel there's any grip. Who else in the pitch? Car, car 19, that's uh, Joaquin Falk Rossignol down in front of the camera. That's uh, another early Lotus. That's a Lotus uh, 16, in fact, just like Miles Griffiths. Will Nutt all in as well. So clearly they don't think the pace is still in the track. We've still got two minutes left on the clock, but they're good enough to understand when grip goes missing. So continuing to move on with two minutes to go. And the Maserati 250F, driven by John Spears, leads this group. And then you move back to the Lotus, the 49 in your picture once again. Yeah, well, Andrew Bowman's going well in that. He's just, uh, the previous time round, he improved. He's up into seventh place. Paul Crossinol, who's in sixth, can't, re can't react because he's sitting in the pit lane. Uh, and who else is making the moves? In fact, an improvement last time round for the driver in third place. Oh, another dreadful misgear just going past our commentary box. Easy for me to say. But so Rudy Friedrichs in third place, improving his time, but not his position. He's driving another of the Cooper Climax low lines, car number 12, and there it is. Looks like he's out in a private test session, no one else to be seen. He's done well to do that on a circuit which uh, has had 28 take to the track in this session. He's timed that really nicely. Well, in fact, it's, it's, he's super fortunate. Bear in mind, they were all bunched up in the pits during that uh, brief red flag period. But right now, you take what you can. And that uh, green and white Cooper, very neat, very tidy. Is there going to be an improvement on his previous lap? I think possibly not, but he's still... No, he's not. Middle sector, again, is slow. Bit of a theme appearing here. Yeah. It's, uh, there's not a lot of grip in the middle part of the lap. Ever since we saw the spin uh, a couple of minutes ago in the session, uh, lots of improvement in sector one. There is an improvement from Beaumont in the middle part of the lap this time around. Pedigree is uh, often very important in racing. Oh dear, there's, a there's been a bit of a clatter there through uh, oh, me, rear suspension collapsing there. Yes, and, uh, spring. Andrew Beaumont uh, worked that one out pretty quickly. Yeah. You know what? When you have a, a left rear wheel coming off your car, I don't think you could have parked it any better than Andrew parked it there. So he, he's almost got it off the racing line, just going into Magic into the first turn. Will they let the fight? Well, we've only got 10 seconds left yeah. on the checkered flag. That will be that. He did well to hang on to it as it was detonating at the back of the car there. But just before that, I was talking about pedigree, and it's worth mentioning that uh, Cooper Climax, uh, the low line that uh, is third fastest, uh, only won one, two, three, five races for Jack Brabham in his title year in 1960. So that is top pedigree for the Friedrichs family there. But hand up, and uh, gosh, it's not delamination, it's just total failure at the back, and vibration is not your friend. That is just phenomenal uh, camera footage, and that spring say, is about to overtake the car. It's gone like Zebedee out of the top of the screen. I was going to say, I've never, ever seen a suspension falling apart in high motion like that before. That spring making a bid for freedom. Put a hand up to warn the other drivers. I wonder if he wanted to put the hand straight back down to try and grip the wheel as he eventually turned into the slide that ended the session. And that is it. We have ticked down to zero and Nuttall is at the head of the field, ahead of Griffiths, and then Friedrich, and then Willis, and then McCarthy, and that was excellent. That was a really excellent session. Pole position decided in the end by 14 thousandths of a second. And for Andrew Beaumont there, I don't know if he tapped the exit of the chicane as he was going through the second part, to, or if it was just a simple collapse on its own, but uh, thank goodness that was in a straight line, so he managed to keep it on the straight and narrow. And car 100 down there is the fastest car, Will Nuttall's little low-line Cooper T53, sitting behind the much, much larger French engine Scarab in the pits. It's the last few cars just come through to take that checkered flag. And uh, the, the car that's taken pole was, uh, we've just been talking about Wolfgang, uh, Rudy Friedrichs uh, Cooper in third, but that was uh, the, the car, the, the sister, the sister car for Bruce McLaren to drive in 1960. That's the car that's taken pole in the hands of Will Nuttall. So not only does he love racing these early Grand Prix cars from uh, the late 1950s, but he does it very, very well indeed. And uh, good to see that the crowds are remaining. There's still plenty to go. And of course, we've got the first race of the meeting starting at 6.30 or thereabouts this evening. will take us into when I thought it might be a, a blazing sunset, but a little more cloud today than we've had recently. But it's still going to be magical. Yeah, really looking forward to the first race of the meeting. It's 25-year anniversary celebration of the revival. 
and the return to racing at this circuit. And it was pretty frenetic out there from the word go as we review the best of the action. There's so many great cars out there, so much to enjoy. Just to let you know that uh, it is uh, 6.30, as Bruce says, for the first race of the meet. Well, Rudy Friedrichs working very, very hard there. So, Coopers, we've just seen the key, so much uh, manufacturer variety, Connaughts, Coopers, uh, BRMs, Aston Martins, unusual rotation there from a driver who doesn't normally do that, Nick Topless, but he rejoined the circuit and it was about getting clear lap. We think a little bit of oil went down halfway through the session, which certainly led to some great, great excitement and overtaking on the grass. Well, it's not really what's recommended, but if that's what tickles your fancy, the BRM, the ex-Graham Hill car there with uh, Andy Willis just going up the inside. Off the road went the 43 uh, with the Cooper Climax T43. Pulling to the side of the road. And this was rearranging the furniture once again. Braking to avoid the other car. Around it went and in to the barrier on the apex for the 250F and a red flag came out. Yeah, that was Brad Baker doing it wrong, but I'm rather glad that he hit the chicane rather than the back of the other 250F Wise. Maserati. So we went out again, 10 minutes to play. And again, it was action for Andy Willis. What's the session for the BRM driver? Two cars going for a spin, or he went just for a very, very wide moment out of St. Mary's. But Miles Griffiths going better and better. He was always dicing for the lead for provisional pole in that Lotus 16. But at the end, it was Will Nuttall came, came through. But this was a drive shaft breaking. Uh, which forms the top link on a Lotus 18. Of course, when that goes, it takes everything with it. So you can see the drive shaft shaft still flailing around, but that right rear, left rear wheel coming off. What a great bit of parking by Andrew Beaumont. It was Nuttall who was fastest at the end of the qualifying session. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. Good morning, hello, and welcome to Goodwood 2023. This is the Action Sports Arena. one of our hairstylists. God, this is very busy. Has it been this busy all day? All day, every year, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's absolutely amazing. Let's have a little walk through because this is just how the salons would have been back in the day. What's it like working in here? It's absolutely amazing. The atmosphere is just fabulous. Everyone comes in in the best spirits, generally with the most amazing outfit on, and we have a little chat with them, help them decide what style they're going to have, and they just walk out with a massive smile on their face. I'm going to put you on the spot here. How many ladies have you styled today? Personally, 
seven, eight, ten? I honestly couldn't tell you. But I know, I know over the weekend we have thousands, hundreds, thousands, just loads. And what requests are you getting most? Is it for the beehive? Is it for the curls? What requests are you getting? With the heat this year, definitely the beehives. An updo, get the hair off the back of the neck. Absolutely, that's been the massive request this year. Normally it's the lovely vintage waves, but this year everyone's just saying, get it up. That's and how many years have you done this? This is my ninth year. So you know exactly, the beehive is your absolute go-to. I think I could do them in my sleep. Yeah. Well listen, let's have a little look, because we've got one lovely lady who looks like she's just finishing off the hairstyle down here. So I'll come over to you. This is looking beautiful. Did you want the, be are you pleased with the beehive? Yeah, I love it. It looks incredible. It's done a very good job. What's it like to be here at Betty's? Yeah, it's a lovely atmosphere and it's nice seeing everyone getting their hair done. And the service is really fun, isn't it, to be able to come here. It's almost like you've come out of Goodwood Revival for a minute, isn't it? Yeah, come out, got my hair done and go back out. <laughs> Amazing. Well, this is fantastic. And you've been styling her as well. How many ladies have you styled today, do you think? I think I've done about 12, 15 people. Yeah. And how long does each style take? We've got about between 30 and 45 minutes for each person. So that's pretty quick, actually, isn't it? And what's it like working at Betty's Salon? Does it take you back and, you know, you're thinking you've walked into a film set? Yeah, well, I work in TV and film anyway, so this is just what we do every day. So it's just an absolute joy. Um, and it's nice to share our talents with the general public, so it's lovely. Listen, it's wonderful to have you here because actually none of us would look any good without you guys being here. It really is the finishing touch a look for the hair, isn't it? You can put the outfit on, you can put the shoes on. There's something about a hairstyle, particularly going back to the 40s, 50s and 60s. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the absolute icing on the cake, especially the fact that the styles were so romantic, so much detail, and we're very lucky that we get to use hot tools and we don't have to do fabric sets every day. Well, listen, we're very lucky to have you here. It's really brilliant and it's so busy down here. I really do feel like I'm just in a hair salon. Tom, hopefully this year is like all other years with a revival. You've arrived having not tested anything. Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. But this year, actually, I will be in a car I'd driven before. So uh, that's news, uh, and uh, I look very much forward uh, to be back with Fred Wakeman with uh, with a Lister, Lister Coupe Jaguar. This looks like, a, well, it's a very fast car, but it looks great fun, but quite tricky on the edge. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it was last time I drove it. Um, it's also efficient. It seems it's it's good over the distance. In that sense, uh, it's an original car from 1963. Uh, so it has been preserved very well, developed and uh, done good things. So I look forward to, hopefully I can find uh, the rhythm again and uh, we can have a, a jolly good weekend here at Goodwood. We're looking forward to it. Enjoy. Thank you. I'm here with Melissa and Faye, and um, I suppose when in doubt, wear the same thing. Are you, are you uh, twins, sisters? Know, it was a mistake, and we um, turned up in the same outfit today, um, not realising each other had the same dress. So What a genuine coincidence. And, and yeah, and petticoats, and it's very, very hot under here. Very hot under here. Well, it looks good. You're, you're pulling it off, I have to say. <laughs> it's a bit like wearing an oven under here, actually. <laughs> and, and so how come it became the, the same outfit? You both uh, obviously have the same taste. Uh, well, we actually went to the Goodwood uh, Vintage Fair and we had a look around and we came away and ended up buying the same one online later on from the same supplier. So. And matching red sunglasses. And matching red sunglasses, yes. Yeah. Apart from the fact that I needed the hat for some shade. <laughs> it's definitely hot today, it's definitely hot. So I'm guessing it's not your first revival. No, but the last few times we've been here, the weather's been very different and I've been wearing a fur stole and, you know, I think quite a thick knitted suit. So this is very different. So. Well, it's me, this is my first time. 
what to expect. And you're enjoying it? It's amazing, it really is. Being around all the old vintage cars, it's just absolutely amazing. And before you say champagne, what else brings you to uh, Revival this weekend? Um, just love the whole atmosphere, actually. You know, actually, in, and looking at the cars, they're quite amazing. Um, you know, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, and looking at everybody else, people watching, um, and everything that goes with that. And despite the heat, we're still enjoying it? Still enjoying it, but waiting for a glass of bubbles to cool us off. That will do the trick. Well, I won't keep you any longer. Lovely to speak to you both. And it looks like you've done it on purpose. And I think it works very well. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're never too young to fall in love with classic cars. It's a passion that lasts a lifetime. And it's a passion we share. <laughs> Backed by over 75 years of motoring experience, Goodwood Classic Solutions is a unique new way to ensure your pride and joy. Goodwood Classic Solutions. It's a passion we share. On we go to Goodwood Racecourse, perhaps the most picturesque in the country. And as usual, there's a full house for Stewart's Cup Day. With the blower in working order, the bookies are happily chalking up the odds. In the paddock, the 22 runners give the customers their last chance of a checker. Fields in line, and they're off, with six furlongs to go. Good to revival, it attracts all sorts of characters. And look who I found, <laughs> Tiff Nadell, of course. Uh, a bit of a personality in the motorsport world. And also, you are, yeah, is that, do you like that? Yeah, I like that. You like, like personality? personality? Good, good. Um, but you're also racing here this weekend. Tiff, tell us about this gorgeous Jaguar E-Type. Just one of three. This is the oh, tourist trophy. Oh, showing off now. Yeah, I know. I've just qualified in the St Mary's, the Jowett Javelin. I am now the holder of the fastest lap round Goodwood in a Jowett Javelin. Well done. There's only, there's only one of them, the races, and I'm only eight seconds off pole position, but I am in a... The fastest, and yet then also the slowest, if there only is one. And there aren't any others, you see, so... An E-Type and Tourist Trophy, and a, and a list um, accosted in the Sussex Trophy. And it's a lovely, actually, book ending, because I raced the very first Goodwood Revival in a list of Nobly. I've done every one of the, this is my 25th, I haven't missed a single revival, and I'm now racing a list of cost in, in the 25th. So I've got an in-between, has been Jaguars and Cobras, and so I'm just living, I always had my dream. This is where I grew up as a little kid, you know, watching Sterling Moss, dreaming of being a racing driver, and now thanks to the Duke, I'm racing round this circuit. So it's just so special for me. You are absolutely incredibly lucky, so enjoy every moment, and you know, share with us, the little boys and the little girls watching, what is it like to actually get behind the wheel of one of these incredible pieces of machinery and, and race round Goodwood full throttle? I don't, I don't know. I've got to come up with some clever answer to that. Pressure. No pressure on that. It's just... Pressure not to crash. The thing is, I'd mention the Jowett Javelin or the E-Type, but whatever I drive, any car, when you take it to the edge of its limit, which could be 30 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, and the whole thing about racing is a big being on that edge and they're noisy they're very noisy as well racing cars sorry what they're very what? noisy i mean you cannot get better than this take a look we have one of the other jaguar e-types going out the roar of that engine is just magnificent you cannot beat it uh tiff i feel like you're probably better get in the car Good luck, and we'll see you later. There we are, ladies and gentlemen, Tiff Nadell. All right, glad to say that was actually a few moments ago. It's not like Tiff, <laughs> hopefully, isn't going to be out in uh, in practice for this. Welcome uh, to the RAC TT celebration. Closed cockpit GT cars and prototypes in the spirit of the RACT in, in the uh, 1960s. It went back 
further than that. Uh, but these, this celebrates the final two years of the RAC TT at Goodwood. Saw some of the finest drivers of the day and fabulous machinery. Uh, Graham Hill took victory in the final two years for Ferrari. And uh, that was a, a great finish for them. Uh, we're going to see a lovely mixture of machinery, as I say. Alice is alongside me and uh, some wonderful noises, as we as we heard from the others. Yeah, exactly. I've just had to turn my headphones up to try and uh, hear you, uh, hear you, Ben. But yeah, we've got some great cars. We've also got some great drivers. So a lot of these drivers you're seeing out in this session now will also be taking part in the St. Mary's and various other races. Karun Trandok, yes, he is definitely one of them. So this is the first official practice session. They will have another practice session tomorrow at around about 11 o'clock. Uh, this session has been shortened to 20 minutes, so we've had nearly three of those minutes already. This is an interesting car. Well, in fact, we're looking at lots of interesting cars. We just saw the Pizzarini, which looks a bit like a Ferrari, but actually it was uh, put together by a man who worked for Alfa Romeo, then Ferrari, and then created his own team. But then also we've got uh, a lovely machine here and uh, a very potentially quick one too. This is the Bobby Bergamo Alex Brundle AC Cobra. And uh, we have seen them both do very well here at Goodwood over the years. This is the Snake Eyes raced uh, in the USA when it was in its uh, main period. It comes from 1964. It's got the 4.7 litre engine that Cobras uh, enjoyed. Front engine, of course, the Cobra. And very, very powerful and rapid. And it's great to see it out there. Yeah, Martin Brundle was the teammate with this car in 2021 as well. So they've stuck with the Brundle, just a, a little bit of a younger one. Yeah, that's rather fun, isn't it? That Alex is, is racing it this weekend as opposed to Martin. Um, and Bobby Burton Rowe, very experienced driver. I remember him from the beginning years when he was a Formula Renault champion back in 1991. It's Brundle. <laughs> Oh, I'm not sure, actually. I'm thinking it's Bundle in the car right no, now. No, it doesn't, think doesn't it, look no. like Alex. I think it's actually Bobby. So, Bobby, uh, yeah, and he, uh, he's been a winner of the RAC TT before in uh, 2008, actually. Um, he won the RAC TT. So, definitely want to keep an eye on this Cobra. Could be one of the quick cars. Although, immediately, we're seeing some lap times coming in. In what is a, a slightly shorter session than was originally planned. So. In fact, we're only just over 15 minutes to go. Uh, so they've got to get on with it this session, haven't they? Yeah, they certainly have. And not hanging back is the duo Damas and Shepard. They actually qualified in P1 here last year with a 124.35. They've just crossed the line and done a 126.5. So, of course, it's very early days in the session time to come. But I would say already it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty competitive lap time. Yep, absolutely. Oh dear, that's not looking so good for the number seven Cobra. That's the uh, Saif Hassan Gordon Shedden car that uh, they are sharing. And that's uh, another lovely Cobra, Coupe. And he's trying to get a bit of uh, support from the marshals. I don't know how hard that's actually gone in. It may not have been. It looks uh, like it's. Oh no! Oh, this is bad news. There's a fire developing at the back. Oh. I hope they get that sorted out quickly. They may need to see the flags coming out pretty quickly. Yeah, red flags just come out. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, so that looked like it did hard hit. It looked like it might have escaped, but then we didn't. We, we just saw some flames. It didn't look like it was Gordon's helmet. Uh, so I don't think he's behind the wheel, but Gordon's not had some luck, has he, so far this season? Uh, yeah, Saif weekend. actually is in the car now, isn't it? Um, Saif Hassan, who's... He's got back in. So it may just have been the exhaust. It may just have been in the exhaust flame that uh, was coming out because oh, there's the damage. OK, we can see it now. But that was a bit frightening when we saw a bit of flame from the rear, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It has had quite a big hit on on that side. The bodywork, as you can see there, quite clearly caved in. So he's going to try and obviously edge it forward. I would say the marshal was trying to encourage him to, to get it to go forward. Well, you obviously can't see the damage the other side. But the marshals have told him to get back in, so they clearly think that it's all right to, to be pushed out, unless they're just going to tow it out. You can see the tow linkage there on the, the front of the car. But the red flag is out. There are 29 cars on this grid, so looking out the commentary box window, and there we go, he has got it moving. So actually, you're right, Ben, I think it was the exhaust. Look at the right-hand side of the cut rear of the car there, the exhaust 
hanging down. That'll be just about scraping on the floor, but a very busy pit lane out of our window. Yeah, they're going to have a bit of work to do. Whether they're going to be able to get that car to run again with the damage on the back, I'm not sure, but it, at least he is being able to drive it back without any rubbing going on on that rear tyre, which is surprising, really, with the amount of uh, bent bodywork that is around it, and, as you say, that bent exhaust, but it does seem to actually run OK. So it may be that they can just release it all a bit more and let them at least do a few laps to get a qualifying time in. They may not be able to do the full session, but as we said, it's quite a short session anyway now. Yeah, it is. And it didn't look like there was too much damage to to the barriers, just obviously the strip that keeps the, keeps the banking in just needs plonking back in. But I'm, I'm guessing it's not going to be too long before we see, uh, see the cars go back out. But looking there, Ben, there looks like number 86 car has stopped just on the entry to the pit lane. Uh, that is the Johnny Herbert car. So is that Johnny that's in the car? It's hard. It doesn't look like his helmet, so... No. No, you're right. I don't think that is. I think that's Tilbech Tolemeyer, who uh, is the other driver in the Tejera Buick. Very pretty little car, the Tejera, 1962. Um, raced at Le Mans in, back in 1962. And set some lap records, and uh, then they, they fitted a Buick engine. Originally it had a, a, a Coventry Climax engine, but then it went to the Buick 3.5 litre. It's a rather lovely machine, but whether it's working properly, I don't know. No, it doesn't quite look like it. We can see it just out of our commentary box window. Going to have to get a bit of a push, and Marshall's wandering back down there. Again, a big shout out to all the Marshalls that continue to do a great job around the circuit. Without them, we wouldn't be seeing any cars on track, and it's a very hot day. So, congratulations to the Marshalls for sticking it out in uh, in those full overalls in these hot conditions. Nice to see the Jackie Stewart name on it because it was uh, it was driven by Jackie, so it has good history. So. Um, Pit lane is now a bit busy and we've got some tyre wall damage. So they won't be going out just yet. So let's go down to Ed Foster in the pits. So most of the drivers have got out of their cars and they've swapped drivers already. So in the, here in the number nine car in the Corvette, um, Tom Ingram's got him. So I'm not going to talk to him because uh, he's never driven it and we'll have no idea what the car's like. So let's go find his co-driver, Craig. How are we doing? I'm sorry, I'm doorstepping you. Um, a very, very short stint, but car going all right? Car feels fantastic, Ed. Thanks very much. Yeah, so we're hoping to get Tom the first time in the car, and um, I'm sure he's going to have a lot of fun. I bumped into him in the assembly area, yeah. and he told me that you'd given some of the facts and figures about the speed here, yeah. and he was quite wide-eyed. Yeah, it, it, it's a quick car, as you you know. You love American cars, Ed, don't we? We know what they go like, so... But um, I'm sure he's going to get his head round it. He's got a nice, clear track for him to go out now. Excellent. Well, look, I, don't know, I don't know how you can't like American cars. So uh, let's uh, crack on through here. We have a photographer who had nearly had a massive shunt. Thank you very much. Um, probably more expensive, that camera, than uh, some of the machinery in here. Let's just carry on down, because uh, one of the cars I d we haven't sort of talked about is this Chevrolet Cheetah, uh, owned by Duncan Pittaway. Stuart Graham's just got in it. I'm not going to talk to Stuart yet. Um, but the problem with this car, this is one of the original chassis, it, at 90 miles an hour, it like lifting off the ground. So I spoke to Duncan, and apparently what he's done to sort that is he's put a number plate on, and he's put a bit more rake on the car. So. He said the only way it's going to lift off the ground is if the entire thing comes off, um, which is uh, both reassuring and good news for Stuart Graham. Um, I'm, th there seems to be sort of quite important talks going on. Give it a couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. Look, I'll leave them to it. Um, so, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, uh, how is it? You're, you're still alive? It's all good? It's fantastic. We know, no, it's absolutely fabulous. I mean, it's a bit warm, a little bit tad warm, but no, it's really good. It's really lovely. I mean, it's not... The nice thing is this, for Stuart is we've done a fair bit of testing with it, so it's not trying to kill you now. So it's not too bad, so it could be worse. I mean, it looks like you've lost about three stone. You're a shadow of your former self. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's really good. I enjoy that. I've done more on it. We need to get Stuart some seat time now. So it's one that it's got a lot of issues, like yourself, has a lot of issues. <laughs> but, you know, your wife has to cope with them. Then Stuart has to cope with these issues as well. So, yeah. And everyone's happy. Well, look, enjoy it, guys. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, crack on for uh, he um, uh, takes, takes the mickey out of me anymore. Uh, let's, get, let's crack on down here. We've got um, Andrew Jordan in this car. Why don't we just have a quick chat with, uh, with Mike, his dad? I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Mike, I'm going to I'm going to jut you. I'm just going to have a quick chat with you. It's um, 
I don't know, you've been a racing dad for a long time, but isn't, is it worse watching Andrew or you racing? Uh, no, I'm pretty relaxed. I used to be a bit nervous when he started off, but not now. He knows what he's doing, so we all, uh, we all work together and uh, take a sensible approach. Calm as ever, Mike. Right, let's uh, carry on down here. They're getting drivers in cars, but that doesn't mean we're out of the game yet. Um, <clears throat> it is horrendously hot in that bit of I was speaking to Andrew before he left the assembly area. Um, Matt Neal in here. Uh, let's just see if we can get a little bit further down um, and see if we can chat to, oh, Richard Atwood. 1970 Le Mans winner. We can't pass up an opportunity to talk to you. Richard, um, you've been out uh, probably the shortest stint of your career, but um, car feel all right? It does. Uh, it's like an old Porsche, and it handles very nicely so far. Um, but I'm only doing two or three laps because my co-driver has never been here before. And I know that's a disaster, so he's got to try and learn the circuit. And I shall give him a lot of tomorrow's practice as well. But I did the same with Ludovic uh, Carroll in 2004 or five. And he'd never been here, and he, he didn't know where he was in qualifying. As soon as the start, race started, he followed everybody, and then he knew the lines. But before that, he didn't know anything. <laughs> well, Richard, uh, I'll let you get on with it. I'm not going to interrupt your, your coaching. I know. Right, OK, well, look. Well done. Looking as, looking as good as ever. Let's crack on down here. There was a whistle, but uh, let's just keep going until I'm either told to stop or uh, get run over by a moving car. Um, I can recognise Jack Tetley's helmet there. Um, you've got Bill Shepard, Romain Dumas in the car. I think Bill went out first. Uh, Bill, have you, have you just been out? Yeah, uh, very briefly, yes. Uh, it's extremely slippy out there, uh, very squirrely and uh, quite unpleasant, actually. Uh, apparently, the accelerator's not an on-off switch would help. I believe it is, actually. <laughs> Uh, it seemed, felt like it to me. I, I was just pressing on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Cheers, Bill. Um, right, let's, uh, if we carry on down here, we'll, we'll hopefully slowly get... Is that David? Uh, I haven't actually sp spoken to David yet. David, lovely to see you. Um, another revival. Uh, it's, have you, you haven't been out yet. You just got in the car. I've literally just got in the car, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to driving this beautiful Cobra. Have you ever driven it before? Uh, yeah, I actually was able to test here, which is very unusual Ooh. for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I have driven it, so at least I know what to expect. That seems very professional. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, I even surprised myself when I got the call to say, hey, let's go testing. It's like, brilliant. But, uh, yeah, I mean, some beautiful cars here, isn't there? Just so uh, I don't know where we're going to be in terms of pace, but we'll just have fun. Yeah, well, enjoy it. Thank you. Um, David Brabham there, uh, son of Jack Brabham, obviously. We got, uh, we've got, I'll tell you what. Um, Scott, if you get around the front of this car, the Snake Eyes Cobra that ran this livery in period. Um, Alex here. Alex, um, you've, I think you've, have you just hopped in? Yep, just hopped in uh, from, the, uh, from the pit wall now. So, yep. Right, that, that's, that's cars starting. I'll let them get on. We've got a green flag. That is very noisy. Back to the commentary box. Thank you, Ed. Great stuff, as ever. And, uh, yeah, quick word with Alex as he's about to come out in that lovely AC Cobra. But uh, always wonderful to hear from some of the drivers. I tell you what, having a red flag and getting a chance to chat to some of the drivers with Ed is always a real addition to these sessions, isn't it? Yeah, no, I really enjoy it. But it looks like it's that Tom Ingram car, the number nine being pushed out the way. Tom had just hopped into that car. It looks like they're going to give it a good go at push dying in the number 100 as well, getting pushed out the way. So quite a few cars. Uh, or a couple of cars, should I say, just struggling to get out of the pits, Ben. Yeah, I think Craig Davis has got in to try and check out what's going on. We're trying to start it. Hopefully they will be able to get it going. Meanwhile, several of the AC Cobras are coming out. And uh, a real mix of... Oh, they've got it fired up. Look, it's going. That's good news. Yeah, that's great news. Still got the... He's still got the window open, getting in a little bit of air, because it does get super, super hot in these cars. And there's... Alex Brundle that's popped off the pit wall into the, the snake-eyed Cobra. And there as well is the number 23 with six minutes now. The session has been shortened, so there's six minutes remaining just over of this session. Uh, this could be quite a frantic part, I have to say, because we've got a lot of quick drivers jumping in the cars now. Um, who are just going to go for it absolutely as much as possible. But it's busy as well. Of course, they've all gone out in a stack. Um, normally, if you've got part through uh, qualifying and then they do their pit stops at different times, you end up with a different space. But now they're all together. So this could make life a little tricky. Um, we will keep an eye on it all. Uh, the, uh, the 
the car number 80 there, that is the car that Richard Atwood was talking about and how Yukinoro Suzuki, who's driving it, is having his first run at Goodwood. You can see he's taking it quite steady. I think that's a good idea for your first time round Goodwood. I'm sure he's been taking many advice from, from those drivers. It is always a very friendly atmosphere here at Goodwood, whether you're at members' meeting or the revival. So I'm sure they've been giving him plenty of advice. But as expected, Ben, like you said, the traffic is pretty busy out there. There is 29 cars lined up to race here this weekend. Of course, we're missing one or two of them, but still it makes for a busy, very, very busy racetrack. This is a good mix of coverage. That number 17 is a beautiful, beautiful car with a great driver on board as well. Tom Christensen, there is Tom Christensen, the nighttime Le Mans winner, driving the Lister Jaguar Coupe. This was a, a bodywork done by Frank Costin, who did a lot for Lotus, of course. Um, it raced at Le Mans in 1963 and 19... Uh, 64 it raced at the Nürburgring, 1,000 kilometers, and uh, that is an absolutely stunning car with Tom Christensen in it. Could be a potential for some pretty rapid lap times. We'll have to wait and see, but he, he's always so amazing around Goodwood. Yeah, he is. I'm just looking at the timing screen, and Rob Huff, I'm guessing it will be behind the wheel, uh, as he does right on cue, jumps to the top of the times, the number 22 in the 63 Jaguar E-Type, so he pops up to the top of the times, but there's uh, the sector times are coming down as the former pole sitter, the Dumas and Shepard duo, purple in the first sector. Yeah, and it's, it is Roman Dumas in that car now, isn't it? Because we saw uh, Phil Shepard getting out of the AC Cobra. So, uh, and funnily enough, Roman Dumas, who's had so much success here at Goodwood, oof, he's not always been lucky in the RAC TT in recent years. He's been a front runner, but it hasn't quite gone to victory for him. I see the uh, 48, the Karun Tandok car, is up into second place now, so that's impressive. That's the uh, lightweight, low-drag Jaguar E-Type. And the Gordon Shedden car that did have a bash into the wall that ended up causing the, the red flag. There's clearly no damage to that car, gone purple. So fastest overall of anyone in that middle sector. So I'm guessing that is now Gordon behind the wheel. So we'll see where they pop up to. And they go up to P4, half a second off. The times are pretty close, Ben. Yeah, so Gordon Shedden's up to fourth. And as you say, Alex Brundle's just done a good job too. He's gone up to third. So you'll see, oh, a bit of a lock up there, but uh, sorting it out. It's a pretty exciting time, as we thought it would be out there. Rob Huff, you're looking at number 22, the black E-type there. And Rob is fastest still on a 125.119. That lap, despite a bit of traffic around, Rob has set another new pace. Yeah, he has, but again, purple in the first sector. Roman Damas and Bill Shepard car. They must have had a little bit of traffic in that middle sector. As we can see, there's quite a lot of traffic on the screen, and you can see them now on your screen. He's gone through that traffic. Oh, we've got a spinner. Is that the number 26 car? Looks like it is. That's the uh, John Spears Tiffany Dell. I think that is Tiff, isn't it, in the car? Just gone for a little road trip somewhere off in the grass, but he's got it going again. We're going to see a replay now. Is it through Woodgook Corner? Oh. There we go, having a spin. Manages to get it up. That's how you get it done. That's how you get it stopped, avoiding the tyre barriers. So he did a great job there. Got it going again. So good fun to watch. Meanwhile, this is a, a big push by Roman Dumas to see whether he can get this car further up the order. Certainly looking reasonably rapid, but is it going to be enough? I'm not sure it is. No, it's just that middle sector again. I'm not sure if he had that. We caught him through the traffic. I wonder if that was him that had just left the traffic, but he's very handy and, and again goes fastest if, of anyone overall in that first sector. The Bright and Frank Kitty car has now popped up into P2, so Damas doesn't look like he's got much traffic ahead of him, and you can see so many corrections yeah, ben, behind the it's wheel. It's lovely to watch, isn't it? The it's steering great wheel. to watch. There's the damaged car you mentioned that is going well. Um, so it's Gordon Shedden in it now. There you are. Um, we saw it uh, just tap into the back of a tyre barrier earlier on, but Gordon's going quickly. Yeah, he certainly is. He's uh, obviously the exhaust there is now no longer. They've oh, yes. pulled it off at some point. It was dragging on the floor, wasn't it, when it hit the tyre barrier. So Dumas now has clearly not got any traffic in front of him whatsoever, has set an absolutely lightning middle sector overall, or have I just jinxed it? Is that him coming in the distance? No. 
Well, there we go. Let's see where he pops up. Yeah, let's see how this goes. Yes, fastest. Roman Dumas does a 124.472. Good advantage. Yeah, six tenths of a second, six and a half tenths of a second, and half now. They pop up uh, into P2. That just loses. That is Shedden. So Shedden goes up four tenths of a second off, but he's catching a little bit of traffic with only around about 30 seconds left to go. So this will be Gordon's final lap. So not ideal catching the traffic at the wrong time. You want to have a clear last lap as Dumas again. No one, nothing stopping him, is there? He's purple in the first sector once again. Yeah, but Rob Huff's just gone to second, and he's got a clear track in front of him, I think, as opposed to the others that we're looking at. They all seem to be a bit boxed up. I don't know if that's going to work for Rob, um, but he's only four tenths, less than four tenths, three and a half tenths off that fastest pace. Checker flag will be coming out in just a few seconds' time, but this is proving to be an, an exciting time. Andrew Jordan just trying to uh, get a little bit more pace out of this car as well. Yeah, they're currently sitting down in sixth place, 1.4 seconds, but he has done two personal bests, not quite the fastest in that middle sector, losing about seven tenths to the overall. So have a little look where he might pop up. Yeah, he's gone fourth, so he's gained. Uh, so 47 is across the line. Roman Dumas is fastest. But we've just got to see it. What do you reckon on the times we're seeing? Is anybody going to put him under threat, do you think? I wouldn't say so, Ben. I wouldn't say so. Huff's losing about nearly seven tenths to, to Roman Dumas in that first sector. So we might have a bit of swapping places behind it, but I think it's safe for Dumas and Chef of Duo. Yeah, you're right, Gordon Chef. Uh, across the line in third place, Rob Huff in second at the moment. It looks as though it is Roman Dumas who has taken the pole position with Bill Shepard. Uh, this is the first practice session of the weekend. It's a big race coming up later, of course, in the weekend itself. But that was a very impressive run by uh, Dumas. And Shepard had got the car right up there. It was right near the top. This car actually began as a road car and was converted to racing a bit later on, back in uh, 1988. So we've got the hard top, the Mont spec, and it's going beautifully quickly. And the, but the steering control was absolutely fabulous, wasn't it? Oh, that's an interesting. He's actually, I think he's experimenting there just to see on the, the brake balance. Yeah, possibly. Just having a little play. Obviously, like you said, Ben, they do get another practice session tomorrow, but I'm guessing they might see whether, well, hopefully there's no more delay. There'll be no delays, should I say, tomorrow. They might see if they can give the second driver a little bit of a longer run because they, what, did they get maybe two laps maximum? Yeah, good point. Although the temperature might be a little cooler now, I suppose, than it will be tomorrow. We'll see. But it was fascinating to see. And I, I think we're going to be in for a wonderful race. That's ultimately what we're looking forward to because there's some good close times between rapid machinery from these uh, uh, sort of early 1960s great sports cars. Yeah, and I would say this is regarded Revival's probably most prestigious race, and it's always a highlight of the weekend, and that just shows a great practice session already. But also adding to that is just the fantastic driver lineup. We've got Dumas, Huff, Shedden, Jordan, Christensen, and the list goes on and on and on. That is just within the top four or five. So yeah. something to really look forward to. They've got another practice session tomorrow. That one's around about 11 o'clock. Great stuff. Well, well done to everybody for getting around, and well done also to Gordon Shedden getting into third place despite a bit of damage to the car. Let's have a look at some of the highlights from the RAC TT celebration with these many wonderful uh, AC Cobras out there, some being Tigers, Jaguar E-types, uh, a couple of Porsches, TBRs as well, and then the Bitserini, which is a rare machine indeed, uh, designed by a man who did work for Ferrari that then decided to go off and do his own thing. Um, but the AC Cobra, of course, Carol Shelby, who developed that nice little front wheel flying that is through the brilliant. air. brilliant, flexing through. I think I'm, that's Woodcut Corner there. But then Andrew Jordan eventually got behind the wheel, didn't he, of the number three. And there, there's a famous snake dive Cobra, but not being driven there by Alex Brundle. Whereabouts did they end up? We'll have a little look as we're seeing a replay of Gordon Shedden's car in the wall. Yeah, that was earlier on when Saif Hassan unfortunately went off, but thankfully it was in a good enough state to come back out again. And uh, they did get a decent third fastest. So this was uh, after the red flag. We saw the cars coming back out. A little bit of a challenge to uh, 
to get going for Tom Ingram in the end. They did get it going out of the pit lane, a little further down the order, but it was this car that ended up fastest. Yeah, it was, and everyone will be chasing them down tomorrow in the Brundle Snake Eyed car ended up ninth. So Alex, we're hoping to drag more pace out of that car tomorrow. As we see Tiff Nadell going a good demonstration of how to spin and keep it out of the barrier. Yeah, good control, real Top Gear style, his old style, <laughs> going sideways, showing off to the cameras, but still keeping the car out of trouble. So that worked well. So here we go then, we're going to be enjoying more from the RACCTT tomorrow. But we saw some good efforts there. Number 22, second fastest, that was Rob Huff. The difference just uh, half a second from this car with Romain Dumas setting the outright pace, the double winner of Le Mans, and uh, a man who's just lost winning this race a couple of times in recent years. Well, maybe he's going to get a better chance in 2023. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. Good morning, hello, and welcome to Goodwood 2023. This is the Action Sports Arena. It's Alex Jakes and Bruce Jones in the commentary box, and there is a green flag waving on the main straight, which means it's time for another exciting, slightly shortened, so ever more frenetic session. And we have made our way to the Glover Trophy. And the Glover Trophy is a on race day. It's going to be a 25 minute race for 1.5 litre Grand Prix cars that take us to the end of when this track was used for Formula One. Yeah, this formula, one and a half litres, the engine size was reduced to one and a half litres from 1961, ran through to the end of 1965, and of course the, that took us to the year before, actually, the circuit closed for racing, 1966, when suddenly it was doubled and we had the three litre for Formula One, but right now, these cars, small, low, clean, sleek, little less power, but some of the racing in the early 1960s was phenomenal. Check out some of those races with uh, Jim Clark, John Searcy, Jackie Stewart, Italian Grand Prix, the slipstreaming, just phenomenal, place changing. But much like the Formula Junior cars, Alex, it's about keeping your momentum going. You haven't got the horses, you've got to have the finesse. They're going to be, it'll be interesting to see whether they try to work in formation like we saw earlier on. Uh, only 13 minutes, so there's not a lot of lap time out here. Uh, we're trying to keep the schedule so that we can bring you the first race of the meeting at half past six. But now, who is able to step forward uh, with this latest iteration that you will see on track for the entire weekend of uh, Grand Prix machinery? 
Yep, so the first car is just roaring past the pits, trying to set some times down. And car 25 is about to pick it out. The Lotus 25, the first monocoque car in Formula One. And that was a car, of course, just absolutely flew in the hands of Jim Clark. Everything flew in the hands of Jim Clark. But Andy Middlehurst has been driving this car for years. Almost a Jim Clark replica helmet, the dark blue with the white band across the top of the visor. And he has had some epic runs in this event. This is a car owned by John Bowers. And it was the car that won the world title with Jay Clark aboard in 1963. And it really, when those cars turned up, a lot of the rival teams had bought Lotus 24, thinking that was the car to have. And then suddenly noticed when they looked in, there wasn't a space frame inside. There's no tube in a frame. They've only got a made a monocoque. And that gave the Lotus 25 all the rigidity that all drivers uh, absolutely desire. The handling of the car just went off the scale. Colin Clark's, Colin Chapman's smart. Oh, I think so. Give it to Jim Clark. He'll win. Yes, he did. Yeah, in outstanding fashion as well for many people. Cars that you're looking at on track of the, of the pure version of Formula One before we added all the wings uh, in later years. But they're just beautiful cars out there at the moment. Uh, they're fighting for the space. We're going to get some lap times in a, in a few moments' time and see who uh, who's going to be troubling the front of the field. Well, expect uh, Andy Middlehurst. We saw him car number 25, the Lotus 25, to be setting the pace on his first flying lap. He is rocketing clear of the field. But, of course, that was sort of midway through this one-and-a-half-litre formula. But the cars that hit the ground running in 1961 were those shark nose Ferraris, the Dino 146s. They had an engine very well sorted. So basically, a Formula 2 engine uh, put aboard these cars. They were ready. The British uh, teams were rather hoping that the, the formula wouldn't happen. So they didn't quite invest as much uh, development work beforehand and were caught with their pants down. But not for long, because uh, 61 was Ferrari's year. Thereafter, it was the British teams coming through. Until 64, when Ferrari won all over again. So the cars visually didn't change much, but by golly, they started sorting their technology. So we've got Lotus, we've got a Lotus out there, we've got BRMs, uh, we've got Lolas as well. Uh, from 1964 to give you a flavour of what's out there. The Brabham from 1963 is on circuit at the moment as well as some Cooper Climaxes that are circulating. And that's a bound of summation of uh, what's out there. Yep, and the Derrington Francis as well. We'll come on to that later, but uh, car number five, one of the BRMs, Philip Duke, Buhoff, X Graham Hill car. That's from 1964. Uh, and he's just tucked in behind number 15, which is Patrick Chaman's little Lola. Uh, that's an ex-Wilmont racing car, so a lot, of the, a lot of the privateer teams had their set liveries. Red with the white stripes up over the nose, and the top of the car was very much uh, the Wilmot team. A livery that was seen in sports car racing, touring car, well, saloon car racing, and, and of course in Formula 1. So diversity was king. It's a winner of this race previously, back in 2007, when it was Barry Williams at the wheel. So it's got heritage on the Grand Prix circuit, it's got heritage on this circuit as Morton sticks it up to fifth place. And Fennel goes into P2. 25 years ago, we had the first uh, revival meeting, and it seemed that at least the first 15 of those were peppered with Wizzo Williams, just such an inimitable character, winning as much, and just taking part and just being the world's most enthusiastic racing driver. So we do miss him enormously. Right, Patrick Jamain in the Wilmot Racing Lola, not at the very sharp end of the field, because as predicted, it's Andy Middlehurst, the number 25, Lotus 25, fastest by two seconds. He knows this car forward, backwards and sideways. And as we said, the drivers who really know their cars, who've got the pace, happy to lay it down very early on. But uh, two seconds clear of Nick Fennell in another Lotus 25. Bit of a theme, I think I'm spotting it. <laughs> what, a, what a privilege to be behind the wheel of a Lotus 25. Just a great sentence to be said in a commentary box at any time. Uh, we're continuing to focus on the car that won the trophy uh, back in uh, 2007 and then uh, now on to car 29 out there and it's the Lotus Climax 25 Nick Fennell who is racing a car that debuted at the Dutch Grand Prix Zandvoort 1962 the longer version the higher speed version than the uh, track that you would have seen Formula 1 race on in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, fewer banked corners, in fact, there were none. Slight, slight thing at Shave Lap, but of course the, the circuit was emasculated. And uh, it's just a relief we still have racing at Zandvoort. It so nearly got folded and uh, put consigned to history. But uh, again, the Dutch fans so, so enthusiastic. And uh, Zandvoort, pretty happy hunting ground for Jim Clark and Lotus, of course, the first race with the Ford Cosworth DFV. When we moved up from 1500cc engines like these ones have, 
to three litres in 1967, rewrote the record books, and that was the start of a phenomenal uh, career for Lotus and the Ford Cosmos BFB. But right now we're focusing on the one and a half litre cars. Andy Middlehurst, fastest, but from Marshall, but by only 52 yeah. thousandths of a second. So it's really a question of how you like uh, your Lotus 25s to be, but of course Mark Shaw is pushing on an earlier car, the Lotus Climax 21, spitting the two 25s. So Middlehurst is fastest, Fennel in the second Lotus 25 is third, but in between that brilliant lap just now from 99, and Mark Shaw really going great, great guns in the ex another ex Jim Clark car, of course, a car that did really well in South Africa. A lot of non championship Grand Prix uh, of all Formula One races back then. Prize money is king for a lot of the drivers back then. Yeah, a lot of talk about the number of Grand Prix that we have these days, but the drivers that you're mentioning were racing every single week that they could back in this era. Uh, it's Middlehurst, Shaw and Fennel, the top three. They're the ones in contention. Middlehurst and Shaw putting on a great battle for pole at the moment. They're on their sixth tour of the circuit, seven minutes to go. I don't think we've seen the last of Nick Fennell as well. Car number 29, the second of the uh, Lotus. 25s, there he is, with, they're really helping us, green cars, we drive with the blue helmets, but we'll do our best, but Nick Fennell again, uh, you know, has had a lot of history with Lotus, there's a lot of history in the Glover Trophy race here at Goodwood, getting great flow there, so imperative, when suddenly you're down from two and a half litres to just one and a half litres, you go, where did the horses go, who didn't close the stable door, <laughs> they're just having to tuck in, uh, I haven't quite seen the car yet that he is, I'm not sure we've seen that on camera yet, the car that he's tucked behind at the moment. It's great to be able to show you as many cars as possible. Well, one I'd like to, I'd like to pick out is car number, 50, uh, number 17, uh, Ben Mitchell, superstar uh, in a, a LDS. What's an LDS? It's uh, the Doug Sururia car from South Africa, a rare one, but the, again, there was quite a Formula One racing scene out in South Africa, and uh, Ben Mitchell started and has done great things in Formula Historic Formula Ford and stepping forward and just making it look very, very easy. Now he's third fastest. So the first three cars covered by 0.356 of a second. Let's close it up, guys and girls. Five and a half minutes remain in this session. This car in your picture at the moment, number 17. The LDS has been used in several Glover trophies. It scored a podium previously in this competition. And there's an improvement there for Morton who's just gone inside the top six with a lap timed at 1.27.8.03. Well, in fact, Alex Morton in a Lotus 21. Again, a South African theme that was raced a lot out there by Neville uh, Ladurl and a lot of South African drivers managed to come across and do the odd handful of Formula One races. They had their own Grand Prix, but they had enough races on home ground for a lot of the teams to sell their cars down there for people to then keep on racing in South Africa and a lot of the drivers weren't averse having a bit of summer sunshine uh, well uh, northern European uh, winter but go down south win some prize money win some races and certainly the scene was very good indeed but really being pushed hard by Ben Mitchell there just a 0 0.332 of a second down on the fastest time on the board uh, but Mark Shaw still in second place 52 thousandths of a second down but Andy Middlehurst out front the Lotus 25 number 25 that's one that helps the commentators 1 minute 24.152 seconds still at the top of the table but very very close indeed oh off goes car number five and Ruhofer uh, recovers to the circuit they're really pushing it in the final stages of qualifying here he's gone off in your picture and we also had Andy Willis off at the uh, final chicane. Yeah, and uh, a problem for number two, which is the Lotus BRM, one of the Reg Parnell racing cars, Parnell racing cars, ex Eamon and Gregory car, hand aloft from driver Federico Baratti. Has he dropped some oil? He's certainly coming in slowly. That could well, well be why we had the moment out at St Mary's. So he's trundling back to the pits. The benchmark time is a 124-152. They're on their eighth tour of this qualifying segment only 15 minutes that's a practice session but it also sets the grid as well and Andy Middlehurst has woken up his previous lap was about seven seconds off the pace he's made a space in traffic bang fastest first sector of anyone the Lotus 25 it really was a quantum leap from the outside looked precious you know hardly any difference to the Lotus 24 but inside was the magic was the monocoque no longer the the tube frame that had been used with light clad metal on the outside for so many years and this really moved everything on but as I say that Andy Middlehurst backs it off and we disappointed with that because it was a really strong first sector Shaw had done a personal best Mitchell had done a personal best both over two tenths of a second slower than what Middlehurst had managed to do 
but he didn't continue it. Right, but Mark Shaw is pushing this lap right to the end. Car number 99, the Lotus at 21. Traffic, will it interrupt him into the chicane? No, he's not taking no for an answer there. Goes past the UDG race door car and uh, accelerates. Will he be able to go to the top? He only has to find 52 thousandths of a second. It's going to be very tight, but Andy Middlehurst has just dropped back, but wait for the time to come. It's taking an eternity to get to the screens. No, he was marginally slower. I think just at the end, going to Chicane, he just had to back yeah. off a little bit because of traffic. He was off the racing line and he couldn't find the time he needed off the road. Have a Lola. It's the Wilman Racing livery aboard that one. Let's have another look at how this moment unfolded. Oh, I'm a grasser. Long time, and then, oh, it's trying to hang on to it. Rejoins. There's Patrick Jamin, who will remember that moment for quite some while, of the dust still coming out from where the car has bottomed out. It was the Lola 4T55, and then the next time he hauled on the anchors, he went round. And compose oneself and continue on the way. So we're still still going with uh, just under two minutes remaining in this Glover Trophy practice. Anybody going to challenge Andy Middlehurst? I just fancy he's done a couple of slow laps. Has he got a problem with the car? He's sitting on a tiny margin of 52 thousandths per second. There has been liquid on the circuit. It's still there. And that was probably put down by Patrick Jaman after that grassy moment. The rodeo ride, if you like, coming out of the Lavent King. But it's just about off the racing line. Carry on with that. There we are. We zoom out, show you the full corner. Oh, there we go. And there's... Oh, he's gone round in one of the Lotuses there. They're all basically green and yellow. That's the 29 car. Well, it's one of our front runners. That's uh, Nick, Nick Fennell, yeah. who's actually famous. Remember, he got right to the top of the charts, and that, that moment wasn't what dropped him down to fifth. It was other drivers going faster, including Mark Shaw up into second place in the, the number 99. Uh, Lotus 21, Ben Mitchell constantly increasing his pace and Andy Willis, number 7, the uh, BRM was quick from the very outset, ex-Richard Atwood car but he's managed to get himself clear of the traffic, work his way up we're into the final minute, is anybody else going to do anything? But Andy Middlehurst, car 25, the Lotus 25, still on top but he hasn't strung together a fast lap for some time is there an intermittent problem or is he going, I've got the pace, I just need the clear track but right now, he does not have the pace and he won't get round to the chequered flag uh, before it falls, so he has shot his bolt, but can anyone top of him? Just saw going through uh, the Lotus Climax, the 21 there of Alex Morton went through your picture, and the red flag is flying. The red flag is being waved outside of our commentary box window. I'm just wondering if it's for that liquid on the circuit. They think, well, is there any point having any risk? More people spinning, putting us further down at the, the back. There wasn't any improvement on, really on the timing page. Who was improving? Uh, drive down in 21st was improving and as a result I think they've gone that'll do for the qualifying session and it's the 25 the Lotus 25 also number 25 in your picture Middlehurst takes it by 52 thousandths of a second then Shaw then Mitchell then Willis then Fennell the top five very entertaining session again and uh, more to come I think from Middlehurst with the Lotus yeah, so Lotus, Lotus, LDS. I didn't uh, make that one up. Uh, Doug Sororia's team uh, in third place. That was a good run from Ben Mitchell. Andy Willis in the best of the BRMs in fourth. And another Lotus, Nick Fennell. Didn't quite string it all together, but the pace is there. And look out for him in the race. But Andy Middlehurst, despite whatever the problem was that was causing him to have several slow laps, remains on top. And with that red flag coming out, the session will not be restarted. So at least we know the identity of the drivers at the front of the grid. And it's car 20. 25, driver 25, that's Andy Middlehurst in that Lotus 25, who takes pole position. It was close, it was tight, but I wonder what he could have done if he didn't have whatever problem with slowing that car. A car used to win the Formula One World Championship in 1963 will go for the Glover Trophy in 2023 in the hands of Middlehurst, who has taken pole position, then it's sure, then Mitchell, Willis, Fennel, Puhofer, who we saw off the road at St Mary's, then Morton, but, uh, uh, then uh, Harrison and Jamin completing the top 10.
Well, great mix of cars. The Wilmette Racing Lola pressing on very early on with Patrick Germain. The excitement for that would come later in the session when it took to the grass, the bouncing. But uh, super smooth run from the Lotus 25. 63 World Championship winning car for Jim Clark with Andy Middlehurst at the wheel. Also pushing on was Mark Shaw, the blue and white helmet, the Lotus 21, the earlier model. Now riding the kerbs. More to come still from Patrick Germain later in the session. Certainly was. And great shots at the final chicane as the Lola T55 and negotiated its way to a fine tenth place despite some hair raising moments. Yeah, Nick Rigg, you had a couple of seconds. Nick Fennell started to go in the number 29, which is at the second of the two Lotus 25s, but uh, the older car of Mark Shaw was going better and better and moved up into second place and got closer and closer to the time of Andy Middlehurst. 52 thousandths of a second behind with a few minutes to go. Would it come? And the car driven in period by... Ne uh, in South Africa, particularly, the LDS going very, very well in the hands of Ben Mitchell. And uh, certainly Doug Saruria's car looking good, but there's quite a few cars were taking to the grass, but somehow managing to get it back onto terra firma. Yeah, excellent stuff as they made their way to the end there. And Glover Trophy with these Grand Prix cars up to 1965 and one of the stars of the show. Chapman going round, but keeping momentum, but it's Middlehurst on top. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Neumann gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. we go to Goodwood Racecourse, perhaps the most picturesque in the country. And as usual, there's a full house for Stewart's Cup Day. With the blower in working order, the bookies are happily chalking up the odds. In the paddock, the 22 runners give the customers their last chance of a checker. The field's in line. And they're off, with six furlongs to go. I think we're all going to be a bit jealous of this transport around Goodwood Revival here. Guy, yeah. tell us about this car. Um, well, it's, a, it's supposed to be roughly a 32 Ford or Ford Model A body. It's a bit of a mix. Um, I picked the body up a few years ago and then left it waiting, as we always do with projects. Um, and then last year, I, I found a sheet of aluminium in the shed. And I thought to myself, that's not big enough to make a, make a bomber seat for me, but that would be big enough to make a bomber seat for the car. Uh, so I did. So I made the bomber seat. And then I was like, well, now I've, I've already started. And it progressed from there. Um, so you're very on trend, though. Revive and thrive. You know, we are doing that with this car. Your son here, Finn, is having a great time. Like you said, he's quite tired now. Yes. What a way around for you. It's better than a buggy. He's having great fun and gets lots of attention. Yeah. You, you know, everyone, is, everyone asks... Anywhere we take it, people offer to buy it. They ask if we sell them. Um, everyone loves it. It always gets a smile and a look. And a little yawn for Finn Finn there. He's definitely getting tired. Finn, have you had a good day here today? Yeah. What have you enjoyed the most? Have you enjoyed seeing the cars? 
Yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And you look amazing. You were wearing the same as your dad before, but he's had to change because it's quite hot. Yes, yeah, <laughs> definitely. A bit warm in a, a set of overalls in this heat. And do you go to car shows together quite a lot? Yeah, whenever we can. Yeah, we like doing those, don't we, buddy? Yeah. Do you like doing your car shows? Yeah. It's good fun, isn't it? Well, you look amazing and have fun in your car. Guy, thank you so much for chatting to us. And what a creation. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you beat the horn? There we go. <laughs> yeah. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the greatest show. But what makes Goodwood Revival different is, of course, dressing up. And you see all sorts of outfits. And I have to say, this bunch stands out. <laughs> Afternoon, ladies. Afternoon. Did you all get together and decide on a bit of a theme? What did we, how did we do this today? Yeah, we had a little group chat, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. And we were like, what should we be? And Vintage circus. circus. Yeah. Vintage. I was trying to work it out. Yeah. So, um, so and, and your role is? I'm a trapeze artist. I'm the tattooed lady. Snake Charmer. Of course, I should have guessed. The Ringmaster, I think. Oh. <laughs> right? I'm a palm reader. I'm a strong man. <laughs> How long did it take you to grow the moustache? Only a week. Only a week. Has it got in the way of anything today? Have you been. Pints, pints of beer. Pints of beer. <laughs> it needs mopping. Well, you're making that thousand pound look uh, very easy there. Is it your first time at Revival? Uh, no, not for me and Freya, but the others, it's yeah. their first time, yeah. Enjoying it? Yeah, we are, thank you. Yeah. Weather helps. Yeah. It does, you're not too hot. You've, you've dressed well for the occasion. Boiler. Tried to be appropriate, haven't we? <laughs> we've dressed less. Yeah. We went for less. <laughs> and what's caught your eye this today? What have we seen? We've kind of been a bit of everywhere, haven't we? The cars, yeah. and we went inside um, the motor circuit area, and this one got dragged up on stage and yeah. was centre of the show, which yeah. was amazing. And what did you do on stage? I had to dance. <laughs> well, I'm sure you've been attracting quite a lot of attention. It's a really good team effort, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day at Revival. Thank you, Thank you very much. Nice to meet Lovely. you. <laughs> And we have more action on track immediately. It's all happening very quickly here. We've got the Sussex Trophy coming out for qualifying now. So we've got some slightly earlier World Championship sports and production cars. This from the period 1955 to 1960. So predominantly, of course, uh, front engine sports racing cars and some beautiful machinery as ever. D-Type here, the long nose D-Type. Gary Pearson that we're looking at, number 70. And a Jaguar D-Type was such a key part of Jaguar's tremendous successful time. Started off with the C-Type and then the Jaguar D-Type, creating a huge amount of success and really uh, making Jaguar into a top racing uh, manufacturer, if you like. Uh, that was one of the first sort of full race cars that they built. The C-Type was more of a modified road car kind of version. Oh, and they're off the track already. Jeff O'Neill in the... Maserati Tipo 61 birdcage, uh, thankfully, without any contact. So, Alice, we've got some more fun cars to look at. I, I do think, though, I'm still wondering if there's a bit of oil on the track, because we're seeing an awful lot of slips and slides, aren't we? Yeah, and some of the drivers, when we had Ed down there in, in pit lane, have said it's pretty slippy out there. And we saw in the previous uh, session that was on track, the Glover Trophy, that they uh, flagged it early due to the, some oil that was spilled, and you could just see it there on your screen now. So that is down at Wooker, and that is a tough corner without oil. So with added oil, water, etc., it makes it even tougher. So some drivers will be uh, taking it maybe a little bit steady. Is that even a thing for racing drivers? <laughs> I know, that's a good question. Um, you're just seeing shooting through there was number one. That's Ollie Bryant again. So we saw Oliver Bryant going really quickly in uh, one of the Can-Am cars earlier. There he is, number one. Ollie Bryant's now out in a Lotus Climax 15, the two-litre. And, of course, Ollie is a front-runner at Goodwood uh, for many, many years. The Lotus Climax 15 was... Um, uh, an early sort of sports car, sports racing car, uh, very much a sport built as a racing car, not as a, a road sports car. Later on, that would be the case, but a, a racing sports car. Uh, Colin Chapman designed the bodywork and um, reduced the frontal area and height. You can see it's very low at the front, even though it's front-engined. 
because they put the engine pretty much on the side, the Climax engine. We've got another car stopped off, whether that's had a spin or what. See, they start, got car issues, maybe. Looks like they're just, oh, they went quite far off. Is that out of uh, St. Mary's, the final part of St. Mary's? Went exploring into the long grass there, so we'll have a little look, and it Whoa. is. <laughs> Ooh, went left, went right, disappeared. I think they're going to have uh, some some flowers some ex and etc. Whatever is in that overgrowth is probably scattered all inside the car now. Do they go? They don't go too far in. So maybe he's uh, escaped, coming back with all sorts in the car. As Mark Donner in his Lister Jag, you are uh, costing. Um, this is a car that's actually won here, the Sussex Trophy at Goodwood with uh, Chris Ward back in 2016. But uh, there is another of these rather striking uh, Lotus 50, uh, yeah, the Climax 15s, which are uh, such beautiful machines. This was one that actually went to the United States. But Miles Griffiths, oh, another spinner. I tell you what, I'm There's sure There's definitely they're... something down. Yeah. So that's Tiff, isn't it? I think that's... Tiff's car, yes, yep. it is, you can see on the side of the helmet. So he demonstrates once again uh, great, <laughs> you could say, is it great car control or is it just a, a talent of keeping it out of the barrier? So is he looking to go down the inside of someone here? No. Takes a slightly different line. Yeah. Uh, there, there's got to be something. If, if there is that oil there, then that car has obviously in the previous session come back onto the track and uh, dropped a little bit of oil. So I think you're definitely right, Ben, that there certainly is some oil down as Tiff now, I can see out of our window, has, uh, has come into the pits. Yeah, it's definitely making life a bit difficult for everybody. They're all sliding around. They're probably coming into the pits and saying, I can't deal with the handling of this car. And it's probably because the surface is not quite what they're expecting. Uh, Tiff is sort of shaking his hand, saying, oh, something doesn't feel right. Oh, there's oil down, one of the two. But someone that's not slowing down is Oliver Bryant, one second ahead of the field, and crosses the line, doesn't go faster again, but he's on the top of the tyres at the 127.5. He's certainly on the case, isn't he? Um, he's really on it today, Ollie Bryant. Fastest 25-5, as you say. But, uh, yeah, that's just a good effort by Roger Wills in another Lotus Climax. He's second fastest. Roger has uh, good experience here at Goodwood as well and uh, has always gone well at the track, so we'll see how he does. Sam Hancock is currently running third in the Ferrari, the Ferrari 246 Dino, one of only two builds. And yet yeah, they're still racing in 2023. It's lovely to see. There we've got um, a Tejero Jaguar, which is rather lovely as well. Slightly less common of those. Not so many of them. We've got a few Tejeros, but not very many that are part of the Sussex Trophy this weekend as well. But the yeah. times are still tipping away, aren't they? Yeah, Sam Hancock actually won last year, or I shouldn't say one, he uh, qualified on pole position last year in the Ferrari with a 124.8, but sadly DNF'd in the race. So hopefully he will finish the race that we will have on Sunday, 4.50 on Sunday. So you won't see this session out tomorrow. You'll have to wait a little bit longer and you'll see them go around on Sunday. But another spinner, the number 61. Again. Again, has... Uh, Spun around, trying to see where it is. I think that might be Woodcut Corner again, going into Woodcut. No, it isn't. Oof. Yeah, it's, uh, he, he had a moment earlier on as well, oh. Jeffrey O'Neill. It's very rare to see this number of spins from people who, who know what they're doing reasonably well. Uh, it really does indicate to us, he's shaking his head, the track is in difficult demands. And I do hope that doesn't affect the race that we're going to get a little bit later on, hopefully. It will clean up a little bit. There's certainly plenty of cars out there trying to clean it at the moment. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah, 28 cars circulating at the moment, all on track. None of them in the pits as it stands. But uh, he's back going in, O'Neill, so that's great to see. Down in 24th place at the moment. He just set a personal best for sector until that spin, but we've got six minutes left now. Just being chased up by the silver Sadler Chevrolet uh, just behind. A car that's very much an original spec, but it looks rather lovely uh, as it is. So, um, yeah, that's just trying to close in. That's Julian Madrup. It was built by Bill Sadler and created with Chevy Power. And it was actually raced here in Goodwood at the time. Now, this is the Ferrari I mentioned that's going pretty well. Third fastest at the moment, Sam Hancock in the 2.4-litre car. 
Um, and this has had plenty of wins at the Revival over the years. This, uh, this and three times it has won the Sussex Trophy, and even he's getting sideways. Wow. Yeah. Very, very sideways. Let's have a look. Sectors haven't come up on our timing screens for some reason, so we'll have to wait patiently as he comes up to the line now, getting all sideways. Maybe not. We've seen others a bit more sideways going out of there, but he has set a personal best as he crosses the line. Two tenths off the fastest time at the moment, but he's set a 125.6 as he's got a little bit of traffic ahead, but still plenty of time to clear it as he's got quite a bit of traffic a bit further up the road. But that's another thing with there's so many cars. We've got so, so many classes with a lot of cars in it, and that's one added element to, to racing around this very fast circuit with lots of different types of cars is you've got to try and deal with the traffic. And he's backed off, hasn't he? I yeah. thought he was going to keep on it, but actually he's just backed off. So maybe, with, as you said, with a bit of traffic up ahead, he's thought that ah, there's no point in going flat out. Let's back off, find us some space. Yeah. Um, he's got very good pace with this Ferrari. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and he's got a big gap behind him, hasn't he, Ben? Or is that just yeah. a car? Oh, who's that that's just peeled off? It's the number 11. That is Frederick Waitman in a Cooper, a Cooper Jaguar. Um, and that's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, it looks like there was an opportunity to pull in there, so I'm not sure if he's going to try and fire it back up again. Because um, you would have thought... Oh, oh, yes, there we go. So I don't know if he's had a spin or an off somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it looks like he, he did that woodcut, isn't it? So that's the where that oil has dropped down. So he's probably had a little bit of a spin. Uh, made it look like... Uh, he, actually, if he has pulled off to try and restart the car, it's good, but he's bleeding into the pits. We'll see if we can get a replay. That was very sensible, wasn't it? He, he waited very carefully. Didn't launch himself out because of traffic coming past. He didn't try and rush back in. Very nice to see that kind of behaviour. You don't always see it when racing drivers get a bit carried away when they've gone off and they're desperate to get back on track. Yeah, I feel that Goodwood in general, especially the revival, is uh, a different feel. There's a bit more respect out there if it was competitive racing. We're back looking at the Sam Hancock car. His sectors aren't coming up on the screen, so that uh, makes us have a surprise when he crosses the line. He's got a little bit of traffic in front of him. So let's see if he bleeds in to the first part of St. Mary. Oh, that's, that's a bad place to catch somebody, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, because you've got that long straight that bleeds into, well, say long straight. It's an uphill straight, then into Levant Corner, and then you've got a long straight over to, to yeah. Woodcut but he's not been able to get past, so he would have lost time at St. Mary's and he's lost time at the back, and it looks like he's decided to back off again. Yeah, yeah, that was just about one of the worst places to catch a car if you're trying to put in a quick lap, so he's backed it off, as you say. Uh, maybe there's still time. What have we got? Three minutes, just over three minutes to go um, on this session, so he may still be able to get another big sideways moment. You can see how slippery it is out there. And, um, it's the number six car. Yeah, that's Harvey, that's Harvey Stanley in another Tijero. That was a change of driver from the original entry list, actually. James Cottingham was uh, due to be driving that car, but it uh, got changed to Harvey Stanley, who's driving that one. It really kind of floats around. It's funny looking car, isn't it? The front end of it. But uh, it's a pretty rapid machine. Harvey is currently fourth fastest, so he just jumped up on that lap. That was a good lap. And he's pushing on, even though he's coping with a fair bit of oversteer. And we're seeing a few people doing that, sliding around generously, but managing to get away with it. Back with Miles Griffiths, who is currently sixth fastest. The engine singing away at high revs. It's a lovely sound, isn't it? Yeah. Nice and early on the power. Let's see how the chicane goes. How tidy is it? Pretty tidy. Ooh, oh, just a little bit. I spoke too soon. Commentator's <laughs> curse dropped in there as he comes up to the timing screen. Let's have a look. Is any improvement? Yes, it is. So pops up into P4, still one second off. And actually, it was a personal best over in the final sector there in sector three. So we'll have a look. Just missed a little bit. Could have got slightly closer, but it's a long nose, isn't it, on uh, on that car? It is. And he just ran slightly wide. No, make, didn't really make much contact with the grass, so probably wouldn't have lost that much of time. And the view for the driver, too, as you say, it's a long nose, but you've got that height, especially Sam here. He's got, you know, good height, 
uh, looking forward. It must be quite a different sort of perspective than he has in many other kinds of race cars. Yeah, totally different to what he's used to racing, that's for sure. But that's not stopping him from getting it sideways uh, and popping in a competitive time, but saying that he's just dropped down now as Newey pops up into P4 and he's there on your screen. Harrison New, of course, this car was winner. Uh, oh, sorry, was a winner of the Sterling Moss Trophy in 2011, so he's had success at this circuit as well, the Lister Jaguar. Yeah, no, that's good news. But uh, you can see Hancock's taking it pretty steady again at the moment. So whether he's going to get another flying lap in, because he's only got 30 seconds, 35 seconds to get to the line, that's a bit tight. I'm not sure he's going to get another lap in, that's, but maybe just. That's going to be tight, you yeah. would see. It's not, well, as I said, his sectors aren't even working, unfortunately. But the final sector is around about 22 seconds. As Bryant now has really stretched his legs. I was just about to say how close it was for the top. It was four thousandths of a second between Hancock and Bryant. But Bryant dipped into the 124.7, so it's beat Sam Hancock's pole time of last year with a, a lightning middle and final sector. So let's have a little look if anyone else could challenge that. Checker flag's just going out and uh, the Ferrari hasn't come past us yet, so I don't think we're going to see Sam Hancock being able to put in another run. You're watching the number 24 car here, Roger Wills. That's pretty well up. Yeah, third place for Roger. So this is a, a good performance again from Roger in another of the Lotus Climax 15s. And, as you say, also just behind Harrison Newey in that list of Jaguars gone fourth faster, so that's impressive. Yeah, he's taken the chequer flag, hasn't he? Yeah, so it doesn't look as though we're going to see many more improvements. Well, saying that, yeah. Ryan's on a flyer in sector one. I think he's lost a little bit of time, I think, yeah. Mm, not so much, actually. Uh, matching his best near enough in that middle sector. So we see how tidy he was, fairly tidy, out of the final corner, foot to the floor. Is he going to make the gap even bigger at the top of the times? Yes, he does. Wow, 1.1 seconds. It's number 15 car there, Ben. Yeah, that's uh, Michael Gans. That contact. Is that a wheel? Oh, yeah, you're right. So did he hit the other side? Or, well, we don't know. We've got no idea. He looks OK in the car, uh, but... Unfortunately, that looks as though we may have some serious damage. It may even look, it looks as though, yeah, there's a pile of suspension maybe, or I don't know, can't quite tell on that wheel, but it um, doesn't look like a wheel by itself. So there's definitely been some more serious damage. Yeah. Whether well, they're going to be able to fix it for the race tomorrow. There's a spring yeah. there, so either that's failed. We saw that in one of the earlier classes, uh, not obviously single seater, but um, I think it was a Lotus actually that. Uh, that had the, the the failure earlier on. So I wonder if he has made contact. It doesn't look like there's any spinning marks, but Michael Gans is out of the car. He ended up 14th in that session and actually just set first or best in the first sector. So that's a big shame. Oh, what a pity. Well, he's OK, but uh, is that car going to be running in the race itself? That's another question, I'm afraid. Um, we shall have to wait and see. But Ollie Bryant has definitely set the pace in qualifying for the Sussex Trophy. That has been an impressive run in his Lotus Climax, the two-litre, and uh, front-runner at Goodwood since 2007. Ollie's been coming here, so many, many years in some stunning machinery. Um, much of it uh, part of the family, but Ollie is a very, very composed driver, and we've seen him quick in a couple of the other sessions already today, but he's certainly fastest in this one. Sam Hancock didn't really get a, a clear lap in the last couple of runs. Clearly the track was a bit over more slippery than they were expecting. We saw a lot of spins, a lot of slides. Um, whether that uh, bit of oil that's no doubt on track is now cleaning up a bit more, we'll, we'll have to wait and see as we get a few more cars out there in a moment. Uh, and then our first race of the weekend. That's coming up too in a little while. Let's have a look at some of the highlights then from the Sussex Trophy with these early to mid 1950s sports cars. And uh, we did see a number of people going off. Yeah, we did, saying how slippy the circuit is. It certainly didn't slow down Ollie Bryant, did he? Because he actually went half a second quicker of the pole time last year. But yeah, we saw some car control and then some not too much car control but doing a good job again tiff from keeping out of the barrier 
Yeah, no, that's great stuff. But uh, this was the man we were watching who was setting the pace pretty much throughout the number one car. More spins. That was the second spin for the number 61 car. And a bit of frustration, I think, you could see for Jeffrey O'Neill. He's a shake of his head, but got away with it. Hasn't done any damage. And Sam Hancock really pushed on in the Ferrari, but didn't seem to get clear laps towards the end. And then he backed off at the end, uh, just before the chequered flag came out. So that car's got pace, there's no doubt about it. It's been a multiple winner of the Sussex Trophy in the past. Sam's a very experienced driver. It could be a big battle between him and Ollie Bryant. We've got some others who did a great job too. Yeah, we have this Griffiths there in the number 37. Just gonna kiss a little with the grass, just keeping out. No, he kicks up a nice bit of dust there. But as you said, Ben, we've got a very competitive race on our hands on Sunday. Yeah, looking forward to that as they all now head back towards the paddock area and the Sussex Trophy coming up later on the weekend. watching the Goodwood Revival show, but we have transported ourselves uh, to the Galapagos Islands. I mean, talk about an incredible set here at the Revival. And the attention to detail has really gone one step further. Um, and we have some, we've got some new friends. Diana, who is the star of the show right now? Um, this is Tango, and he is a corn snake, which they come from South America. Um, he's about 11 years old now. Okay, and alongside um, Tango, we've got... This is Terence, Terence. and he is a blue-tongued skink. Wow, but I have never seen a creature like that, a blue-tongued skink. Skink, okay. yes. Say that quickly. Um, <laughs> and, and who's our lovely chap, or chapess on the end? Chapess. Yeah. Um, this, that's Fanta, and yeah. she is another corn snake. Okay, uh, do we follow the fizzy drink theme? Have you got other snakes named Pepsi and Coca-Cola? We have Cherry is the oh, other okay. corn snake. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I'm not quite sure why I'm going to agree to this, but does, does Tango want to make a new friend? Of course he does. Okay, here we go. Right, I'll give you the mic. So, nice flat hands. Flat Keep him hands. supported, okay. and he'll be quite happy. This is not something I thought I would be doing. I haven't got my hand flat. Whoa, panicking! You're fine. <laughs> um, oh, gosh, I can't see the face. Oh, I thought I'd actually be quite good at this. I'm not. <laughs> oh, it was slithering up my arm. Okay, play it cool. Play it cool. Uh, this is not what I imagined uh, I would be doing here today at Goodwood Revival. When we're talking about uh, adrenaline rush, normally... I've got a noisy engine behind me, but instead I've got a snake that wants to go in my top. Oh! <laughs> and at that point, Diana steps in. <laughs> oh! Okay, it's getting a little hot here. Yeah, fine. So should we go back to the racing? Diana, thank you so much. Just remind me the name of your company. It's Animal Encounters. Animal Encounters. Uh, the stars of the show here at the Galapagos Island. Thank you. Back to the racing action. Chris, you do choose the sort of least competitive grids, don't you? The Porsche race and now the Samaritan's Trophy. Yeah, I like to make life difficult for myself, but this is a little bundle of joy, 10 tenths car. Um, Marino has qualified it, I think, 10th, which is well beyond where it should be. Uh, I have to say it's the most... Uh, difficult car I've driven at Goodwood. It's really tricky to understand it because it's a short wheelbase. It's got quite a lot of power for the weight, but it, it, when it wants to move, it, it makes you a bit, it makes scary moves on you, I have to say. It's, it's quite tricky. But you've driven it before, so you've got an advantage over a lot of these guys. I've, te I've tested it, yes. I came testing in it, so I'm, I'm really, really pleased that I did that. I think to go into this green, yeah, you'd make a, a wally of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, no one's watching here, though, so it's okay. No, no, no one at all, no. Uh, it's, um, it's a wonderful little car. I think the St Mary's, I've never done the St Mary's at, at this far up the grid before. The appeal of the St Mary's is the shapes, the shapes and the sizes, and the idea that it sets up very obvious David versus Goliath situations. So we see great big American stuff with an A35 in the middle. I think it, it, may, it gets the most oohs and ahs from the crowd, doesn't it, where they go, ooh, ah, ooh, that shouldn't be there. So I'm, I'm yeah, honoured to be part of it. And from the drivers. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> the whole time. Well, uh, good luck. Thank you. Lovely to hear from Chris Harris, uh, great journalist and driver, great racer as well, and uh, looking forward to his coming out to play. The St Mary's Trophy, we have seen these cars already today, but a different lineup of drivers. A lot of the entrants are in command of the cars this time. Not all of them, but uh, mostly. Uh, so we are looking forward to them coming out. Ned has definitely been looking around, trying to find out who's doing what, and we're looking forward to seeing some rapid machines. We saw them all uh, out in that uh, stint earlier with some very, very famous drivers, of course, um, and we saw some impressive runs uh, from all sorts of people. We'll just have to wait and see how it works out. It was a bit disappointing to see Tom Christensen's car break down. It'll be interesting to see if the number 70 car is out OK. Harry Naismith will be driving it this time. He didn't. Uh, Tom didn't get a chance to do a, a proper lap in it, so... Hopefully, it was just a wheel off, and uh, they will be able to get that car out, and it will therefore give them a bit of knowledge as to what's going on. Um, let's go back down to Ed, who's chatting to some other drivers. So, yeah, usually when you put a professional driver in the car, it comes back with no brakes and no tyres, but this all looks in pretty good shape. I mean, Gary Parfit is not Mark Blundell. <laughs> also, I've got to say, he never delivered his car back. The other Zodiac's got an engine out at the moment, but Gary assures me the car is in perfect working order, and the only limitations of this car is the talent of the driver. I was going to say, you're, you're not giving yourself many excuses with that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I, I don't need to. I know my skill set. <laughs> I mean, it's a busy grid, this one, isn't it? It's incredibly busy, but what great event to come to. I mean, of all the events to make time for, it's this one. Well, look, Theo, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at the Goodwood circuit, largely unchanged since its heyday back in the 1960s. 2.36 miles of an unforgiving circuit. The grass banks are close, the grass verges are even closer. Heading off the start, you head first towards Madgwick, an off-camber, tricky right-hander with a bump at the apex. It is so, so important to get the line right and get a good exit as you charge up towards Fordwater. A daunting right-hander, again off camber, slightly dropping downhill at the exit as well. It is incredibly high speed. Up towards St. Mary's, first goes right, then go left. Don't be too greedy with a curb on the left-hand side, and that'll put you offline. The track drops slightly downhill and then back up again towards a double right-hander of Lavin. Getting a good exit and traction out of here is hugely important because that leads you onto the fastest part of the track. Through the little kink, heading towards Woodcut. A long, long right-hander with the apex seems to take an age to get to. The back of the car always edgy. And then you get hard on the brakes for the chicane. We've seen many an incident there with drivers getting just a bit too greedy with the curb and the walls of the inside line. Get all of this right and you will be the winner across the line. Dickie, um, you always look a little bit apprehensive before you go out, but then you go out and sort of put it on the front row. Uh, how's everything looking? Ah, uh, I'm feeling a bit rusty, if I'm honest. That's my first racing driver's excuse. Um, it's been a little while. Actually, it was the last time I raced here a couple of years ago. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. Jeff, the owner of the car, is very kind to invite me back. Um, it's very cool showing the car Jensen button as well. So that's an added dimension, a little bit more pressure. But um, I love it. Good Goodwood's just such a great place to drive. So very much looking forward to it. It would be an awful situation, wouldn't it, if you shared a car with a professional driver and they went out first just to show you what it could do? Well, <laughs> funny you should say that. There is a timesheet with a time... No, Jensen did really, really well, which is not surprising, but these cars must feel so alien to someone that's used to precise, powerful, high-grip cars that he's just jumping from one to the other to the other. Um, I think he enjoyed it. We had some quite amusing conversations 
about throttle response and that he'd put his foot flat down and nothing appeared to happen. But um, I think he's maybe recalibrated a little bit now. So he did very, very well in qualifying. He's quickest four-cylinder car, third on the grid, I think, for his race. So he did, yeah, he did brilliantly well. Putting your foot down and nothing happening is what's supposed to happen in a 50-cylinder car, I well, think. Well, yeah, I hate to break that to him, but I had mentioned throttle response and how great it was in this car, and I think he thought it was possibly broken. But... Have you done any testing? Uh, no. Well, we, we shook it down earlier in the week, but no, no testing. Um, so, yeah, in at the deep end, really. But And it's great fun that the Jordans have got their alpha going now. So hopefully we can continue our, our, epic, uh, our epic battle from 2017, if we're lucky. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we mentioned Mike Jordan there. Why don't we go and find Mike? Uh, Scott, if you reverse up. Um, we've got the Jordan car over here. Uh, it's Mike in... Well, uh, Andrew's grandfather's car. We're kind of trying to get this right now, Mike. And your mother-in-law's car, is that right? Yeah, this was my mother-in-law's car. She used to take my wife Judith to, to school in this when she was about eight. So um, my father-in-law turned it into a race car for classic saloon car racing in 1972. And it's been a race car ever since. So uh, John Dooley owned it for a while, raced it a lot in Europe, was super successful with it. Then Gavin Watson's had it, raced it at Goodwood for probably 10 years. Um, so we needed to buy it back at some point, and here it is. It's fantastic to see, and I think we got the whistle for cars getting started, so I'll leave you to it. Best of luck, Mike. Thanks very much. Right, that is uh, engine starting. We have action, so let's go to the commentators. Excellent. Thank you, Ed. And uh, we're looking forward to these cars coming out to play. So uh, many of us have seen them on track already earlier today with the star driver list, but I have to say there's a lot of stars out there now, which is lovely. Um, and Mike Jordan, uh, father of Andrew Jordan, but Mike, a very, very successful driver himself uh, before then uh, running his son, Andrew. And uh, I saw Mike win many, many races in my uh, early career in motorsport. And it's lovely that they work together so well. Now with a, with a, 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 a team, a, a business that prepares historic cars and does very, very well at it as well. So onto the track they come, St. Mary's Trophy. This is part two for the, uh, mainly the drivers who are the entrants as opposed to the sort of guest drivers for the weekend. So these drivers will tend to know the cars reasonably well. Not all, as we, as we heard, uh, Dick Meaden, he's in the number 34 Alfa Giulietta have been having a good conversation with Jensen Button, who drove the car earlier on today. And it must be fun for all of these guys who are sharing with some real superstar names who get the opportunity to drive their cars, just to, to learn from them a little bit too and get their feedback about them. Yeah, it's soon. And then also shows them what the car can do. We, we saw lots of the very fast-paced drivers, as you've mentioned, uh, in the, the field of the St Mary's Part 1 but they will have a session it's slightly shortened, unfortunately, only down to 15 minutes. But that won't stop them, of course, trying to get themselves acclimatised and on the pace. We have seen, though, a few cars in, in probably a lot of the previous sessions, most recently anyway, going off. Um, so I do wonder if that oil is still down ever so slightly, but hopefully that won't hinder any of these. Well, there we are looking at uh, the number seven car that Rowan Atkinson was driving earlier. So it's Duncan Pitaway who is now driving the car this, uh, in this session. And the Mark, the Mark 7 was a luxury car, but it, uh, it was a, a competitive machine in its time as well. It, it actually, they actually won the Monte Carlo Rally, believe it or not, in 1956. And, uh, and it took lots of touring car events at Silverstone success as well. So that was... That was impressive. We're now on board the standard Vanguard. We were on board with Karun earlier on today, um, but it's a, obviously a change of drivers for this one. This is James Colburn, who is now driving the standard Vanguard. This is uh, from 1956 originally, but the engine was a more updated engine because it went to a, a two and a half liter. Um, so in the uh, early years, it would have been a slightly smaller engine. and the standard car company which existed from 1903 to 1968 uh, they produce some wonderful machines this this car has actually been successful here at Goodwood in the past um, at the members meeting it won the Sopwith Cup at the members meeting last year so there you are there's Mike Jordan getting up to speed nobody uh, completing a full timed lap and as we've seen in these recent sessions there really isn't a great deal of time 
to get on with it because as you can see the clock ticking away and we've only got some 12 minutes to go so they've really got to get on with it and get the best they can out of these cars as quickly as possible yeah they certainly have as you see another on board there and I, I love seeing these on boards to be honest Ben because it just shows different perspective of the different types of cars there you can see just going through <laughs> very sideways woodcut corner very rarely do you go through there without being sideways feathering it through the chicane and sideways on the throttle as well to bring it up across the line Tiro pops it up to second to second place yeah Dick Neaton up to second that's good that's impressive so the car that uh, he is sharing with Jensen Button this weekend and immediately up into second place and currently up at the top that's not a big surprise Justin Law uh, Justin always rapid it's a car he's sharing with Rob Huff and we saw Rob Huff going quickly earlier on today so that is currently the fastest car there it is the number 41 Mark 1 Jaguar so very quick on the hands of Rob Huff but Justin Law is also very very talented and driver and particularly at all the Goodwood events yeah and you can definitely tell by looking at this these shots right here as it gets ever so close to the grass and actually I was wandering back to the to our compound Ben and I saw this car just uh, stopping and getting some fuel and it was full of people so uh, it was a proper <laughs> it's a, a race car on track and then it almost seems to be a family car around the paddock yeah, he's actually he's actually taken victory in the St Mary's Trophy, in, I think in the same Mark 1 Jaguar, that was back in 2013, he's a four times fastest runner up the Festival of Speed, so Justin Law, no great surprise with a car we know is quick, in the hands of Rob Huff earlier, he's, he's setting the initial pace, ooh, somebody looked as though they might be going to a funny direction behind, hopefully, uh, I think they're just trying to keep out of the way of the other cars actually. Oh, ah. Oh. Was, you couldn't fit a piece of paper through how close he got to that left-hand tyre wall there. And uh, extends the gap, does he? No, not quite, but did set a good middle sector, but not at personal best first or last sector. And you could look at that, great shots, I love it. Headlights now ablaze, it is starting to, well, we've got tinted windows here in the commentary box, but it does look like uh, it, we can tell we're heading towards the end of the day. Indeed. It's a lovely balanced car, though, isn't it? Because although the back end steps out, let's see how close he was to the barrow you mentioned. I would say that is close enough. Oh, oh I'm touch. kissing it. I mean, that is precision driving, isn't it? Perfect, because he hasn't done any damage to the car or the barrier. And uh, just a touch of oversteer, but that's a beautifully balanced car. Really, uh, to watch, is stunning. It doesn't get too sideways, but it's got that sort of balanced control. Not see. even a scratch, look. Look at that, sideways, but it doesn't snap. It's, it's, it's all elegant, the way it moves. It, from looking at it, you would say that it shouldn't look very nice to drive, could it? And that a snap would turn into a big spin, but, but actually being demonstrated not just by Rob Huff, but uh, Laura as well, that uh, it's quite the opposite. We've just seen uh, another car go fastest, though. It's the number 25 of Chris Ward. He's also another very, very experienced and talented uh, historic racer. And he's in another Jaguar Mark 1, uh, the number 25 car. The car shared with Andy Wallace. Um, and there you are. So that Mark 1 has now gone even slightly faster. And actually, it's over a second and a half quicker than Justin. So that must have been a really good lap by Chris Ward. Let's watch his car. Yeah, that yeah. looks nicely balanced too. <laughs> Through the first part oh. of St Mary's. Bit of a correction heading towards the grass. <laughs> it creeps on you quickly and there we go. But this this Jaguar here, that is being driven by Chris Ward. Has raced here in the past. Certainly between the years of 1958 and 1960. So many years ago. So it's a really good machine, this, and it's uh, working well. So we shall see how it works out. Um, the moment he's got the fastest time, uh, first Going fastest fast. at this stage, is uh, Thomas Butterfield in another Jaguar Mark 1, actually. So we've got uh, the Mark 1 Jags are flying along. Oh, look at that. That is just fantastic. That is the way to go through Woodcut Corner perfectly displayed by Chris Ward. He's gone purple in the first sector, purple in the second sector, bringing it across the line now. I'm expecting him to go even faster. And he does 2.2 seconds wow. ahead of Law and dipped into the 132s. 
gosh, that's impressive indeed, isn't it? Mike Jordan is currently in fourth place in the Alpha uh, that we were, saw him in coming out earlier on. Dick Meaton now down to sixth position. There's the uh, pretty Saab, which is not the fastest. It's right down towards the back. Alex Brundle was driving it earlier. It's got a, a little 750cc two-stroke engine in it, and uh, it really doesn't have straight-line speed, but it's still a pretty car. Lovely to see it here at Goodwood. And that's part of the fun of Goodwood is you get the, the rapid machines, but you also get something a little different, like the Saab out there. And there's the Alpha um, of Mike Jordan. The front, uh, the, the bonnet's flapping a little bit, but thankfully, the straps are holding it down safely. Yeah, looks like it's uh, pretty much holding its own. As you can see, Andrew, jo uh, sorry, Mike Jordan, get excited. He's sat very low in that car. Um, you can imagine he, I can't imagine that he could see much uh, over the top of that bonnet, but there we go. It's certainly not holding him back as he's sitting now, still in fourth place. But here we go, we've got a lot of traffic that uh, our onboard camera driver is trying to feather their way through, stamping on the brakes. It's Meaden just going through the first part of St Mary's, then to the second part as well. And a lovely sound too, then. <laughs> Let's see how it looks into this slower corner. You've got to get the entry right, and you've got to get on the power early because you're going on such a long straight. Yeah, you are, and that's not going to help him at all. It's then you've got to trust the driver. Do they know that you're there? If so, which side are they going to stick to? If they don't know that you're there, which way are they going to go? I think he managed to keep his foot hard on it there. I don't think he had to lift. There was just enough space. Well, exactly. That is the worst place, really, to, to catch somebody, as we're going to hopefully stay on board going into... Oh, no, we didn't. Going into a good corner and see how sideways uh, Meaden was going to get it. Just seen Fred Shepard uh, go up to fourth. So now that's the fourth Thunderbird that was so quick in the earlier session. Uh, there it is. Um, the car that we saw being taken to uh, a great effect by Roman Dumas, and who's always had so much success here. Fred Shepard, part of the Shepard family, of course, uh, son of Bill, we see Bill out there. I did think that Bill was originally going to be driving this, but I think Fred is driving it for this one. And uh, yeah, he's up in that mix now, isn't he? Yeah, he is seven litres <laughs> underneath that bonnet, seven litre engine, and he's just done a personal best first sector. It's Still a second off that was set by Ward, who's actually in the pits now. We saw a, a clip of him in the pits as going through Woodcook Corner. Your steering wheel's never going to be straight. As uh, he'll... Well, that was Woodcut. That was uh, the back corner. Now he's coming up the straight into to Woodcut. The sound is so unique. It's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And that look at that big grill on the on this Thunderbird, such an American device, huge and a very distinctive look and shape. And something that, uh, of course, many people absolutely adore and very much got into the big American V8 style. Um, and it went well in uh, in British saloon car racing for a while until they sort of got back. How's it going to be? How's the lap looking? So not a personal best in the middle sector, but he does improve ever so slightly, but that doesn't change his position. OK, so he stays fourth for now, back on board with Dick Meader. And uh, let's have a look, in eighth place currently. Always oh, seems to be stuck in traffic when we go on board with him, but let's see how close he gets to the barriers on the inside. Very close, he's going to get a little bit of a tow from the car in front. But as long as he can get clear run into the, the first corner. Oh, I don't think, and this is going to be brave on the brakes and send one down the inside. Oh, just... I was just going to say, as the driver to his left, seen him. Well, I think he was going through anyway, wasn't he? Lovely on-board view, though, and you can see the bit of correction through the first part of Woodcut. Now, flat out through the next right-hand kick. Listen in. There shouldn't be a lift through here. Oh, we're out of the car, <laughs> briefly. It's a flat-out section. Then it gets a bit more complicated into St Mary's. Yep, so you go slightly downhill, as you can see from this shot there. Then you go slightly uphill into the first part of St. Mary's. Really try and maintain your speed through here. And this is where we see quite a few cars dip a wheel and kick up some grass. You could just see just there, slight damage to the grass. And it's a short run into Levant Corner. And usually you will apex just after that crest there. And this is the long, long run up the straight now into Woodcut. So uh, this is a 
good potential lap for Fred Shepard. Let's just see, uh, he's on a better lap than he's done before. Is this going to move Fred up from fourth place? Across the line, yeah, puts him into third. So that does best lap so far. It's still not managing to beat uh, Chris Ward and Justin Law in the Mark 1 Jaguars. They have still got the outright pace, especially Chris Ward. But we are seeing one or two drivers still being able to improve on their lap times. Uh, Dick Meaden, I don't think, did improve, did he? No, he did a 38-0 just then. So it didn't quite get a, as far as he... Um, what I do enjoy also about this St Mary's group is, you, yeah, you've got the Jaguar Mark 1, you've got the 4 Thunderbird, a huge, great machine, but you've got Austin A35s and Austin A40s as well, which are really quite tiny uh, little saloon cars from that period. So you've got a big, big difference in, in space and, uh, and, and the way they behave. Yeah, you've got a whole range as well of uh, engines under the bonnet. As uh, There's just a lot of traffic, isn't there, out there about? But we've got, for example, the BMW number 700, 700cc as well, so it goes with the number. And then ranging up to the Ford, Ford, Ford Thunderbird that we've seen Shepard putting through his paces with seven litres. So we've got a, a big variety of cars, and all of them have their sort of unique driving style. Uh, as well as different capabilities out on track. Yeah, no, it's fun. As you say, that uh, the BMW, um, which Colin Turkington was very impressive in, um, it's, it's doing all right, not quite so far up. It's down in 18th place at the moment. He got just outside the top 10 in the earlier stint, but um, it is not going to be a rapid car, but it's a fun little car, the BMW. Uh, unusual to see it here. Uh, and we're back on board the standard Vanguard as well, just the single standard in this one. And James Colburn, it is, who's doing the driving at the moment. Yeah. He's up there, he's up reasonably near the top, isn't he? Yeah, he is an experienced racing driver, actually, as they had great success uh, many years ago. Not so much now doing too much racing, more the historic side of things, but in the Renault Clio Cup series that existed, that they used to support the British Touring cars. Dick Meaden's just jumped up one. He's just gotten uh, up into fifth place ahead of Mike Jordan. Yeah, as we see the checkered flag come out now. As James brings it in to the final corner. Great on board shot. A little bit of understeer oh. in the corner. Then on the throttle, because you know you've got to get that on the gas to go slightly uphill the start line. Any quicker for him? No. Nope. He's going to stick for now in, uh, in fifth place. He's obviously caught the checker flag and probably got a little glimpse of the TV screen as he gave us a cheeky wave as well. Yeah, that actually was a good lap, Mike. That was a good lap. Um, uh, uh, particularly, actually, a good lap for um, Ben Colburn in the Austin as well, because Ben Colburn, fifth fastest there in the Austin, so that's a good effort. But the session now coming to its conclusion, and there's nobody who has been able to manage to match Chris Ward. I mean, that is a big, big advantage. He's got over two seconds. Uh, faster than anybody else in his Mark 1 Jaguar. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be a tough one for everyone else to find a way to beat him, I think. Yeah, I think so. Meaden's actually the only one in the top eight that's improving ever so slightly on this lap, saying that just come through the second sector there, and he hasn't set a personal best, but he definitely went better in the first sector as he comes through to, to close the lap now. He should be all right with the traffic in front. Might get a tiny bit of a toe heading up the straight. Is this going to boost him any further up the grid? No, he doesn't. He does improve his lap time, but unfortunately not quite enough. It's interesting that the lap times are much quicker than we saw earlier on. So Rob Huff was fastest in St Mary's 1 on a 135.3, and we've now got a 132.7 out of Chris Ward. And where's that pace come from? Well, yeah, we were talking about how there might be oil down. Well, that clears to have definitely cleared up yeah um track maybe is it is improving it's certainly cooler isn't it it's definitely yes. cooler yes i out think that there. might be part so of it yeah you're right fred shepherd for example third fastest he's done a 35.3 uh, roman dumas in that car did a 35.5 so he's actually gone a bit quicker than dumas and yet he's he's ended up uh, third for his race roman will be second for his one yeah, so it does, does seem to indicate the track's got a bit quicker now. Uh, it went through a very slippery phase, but now with the cooler temperatures, it's beginning to come back. Yeah, and uh, obviously the St Mary's Part 1 way were out quite early this morning as well. But it, saying that when I arrived, it was still quite warm, but the track would have been fairly green. So the track's rubbed in. OK, there's been uh, oil down at various points throughout the day. 
foot. It seems like the track is, in, is improved as we're going to see some highlights now as the cars start the session all coming out on track on board there with James Colburn. Yeah, it was a lovely session, wasn't it, to see some of this mixture of 1950s saloon cars that are going to be competing in a couple of races uh, for the St Mary's. And we saw a lot of the uh, drivers who may not have quite the star names of the drivers who will be in St Mary's 1, uh, Formula 1 drivers, Le Mans winners, etc. But some of these drivers just as quick, which is lovely to see. The number 17 car, Ewan Sergison in the Studebaker. Nice to see that out there. Not a particularly rapid car. He ended up really down at the bottom of the order, um, only just uh, only just ahead of the Saab. Actually, they were the last two on the grid. But it's fun to see those different cars. But it was the Mark 1 Jaguars that you could see. And this lovely Alpha Giulietta, Dick Meaden giving some great onboards. The car that he's sharing with Jensen Button this weekend and uh, very much enjoying it. But the Mark 1 Jaguar of Chris Ward. Wow, very, very impressive. So that's the qualifying for the second uh, St. Mary's race. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood members meeting, the 80th members meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Le Mans gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. So this is the moment we have been waiting for today. Moments before the first race of the weekend is about to get started. And I just heard the early signs of a revving engine. It is, of course, the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. Uh, now, earlier on in the day, it was Jensen Button who has put it on pole position, uh, which is going to make for a rather exciting race because he's only been here a couple of times before. Well, he's driving the car he owns for the first time. I've just had a look down there. He's not in the car. It's Alan Spunkham in the car, who's a very good driver. So let's hope he hands over the car. I'm sure uh, Jensen will be hoping he gets handed the car in the lead. But it's a gorgeous looking thing, that bronze C-type Jaguar down there. And then um, we've got some other drivers out there, of course, to look out for, especially those pro drivers who are taking the second stint coming through the field so great race great way to start the revival taking us into the sunset yeah it is such a beautiful time of day to race it's it really does completely change doesn't it the start of the race we're in daylight and we'll have a beautiful sunset hopefully maybe uh, a little bit of a sunset anyway uh, to take us towards the end of today um these cars they're between 52 and 55 any particular highlights that we should be looking out for david 
Well, as I just said, that bronze C-type for me. <laughs> ex Manuel Fangio car. I mean, it doesn't get much better, better than that. And then owned by the 2009 Formula One world champion. So that's a decent car to start Bit with. Bit of history But you there. look all the way down the grid, and it's fantastic. Some great Jaguars down there to look for as well. And uh, there's the whistle. I think they're getting on track. Right. That means it is almost showtime to get underway. I'm going to keep my eye out for Manuele Piro. He's in the Ferrari 250, Mila Milia. And, uh, well, he is a, a Goodwood legend, isn't he? Five-time Le Mans winner. But this is it, guys. Let's get started. And over to commentary. Thank you very much. What fun it is to look forward to the first true race of this Goodwood Revival weekend now. And the Freddie March Memorial Trophy, these sports cars that uh, are due to be coming out. Now, the Duke of Richmond himself is about to drive out a car with good history, the Pycross Special Jaguar SS100. Uh, this is celebrating 75 years of Goodwood, as this car won the very first race at Goodwood in 1948, isn't that fun to see? Uh, won by Pycroft. Uh, funnily enough, Sterling Moss won at that very first meeting in another race, in the 500 race. But there you are, the car that took victory for the first time ever uh, here at Goodwood. There it is, and it's being driven by the Duke of Richmond. It's being followed by an Aston Martin DB3S um, that won the nine-hour race here at Goodwood in 1953, so that's 70 years ago. Uh, and it's the Aston Martin DB3S. In fact, Aston Martin had a wonderful time of winning those uh, races here, the nine-hour races here at Goodwood. But it's lovely that we've got uh, we've got one out there. That it was won that year by Reg Parnell and Eric Thompson. And uh, but this one, the first ever, and it's in such gorgeous order, isn't it? It's lovely to see it out there. And the Duke of Richmond actually taking it as a round before we get the race cars coming out onto the circuit. Now it's uh, basically it's a uh, a full duration race that we're planning to, to have, a one-hour race. Uh, we shall see how that goes. They've got a pit stop, of course, to swap between drivers. Uh, it's up to them to decide up to a stage. They, there's a limit of how early and how late you can stop uh, for your pit stop, but it is a two-driver race. You both have to put in a decent um, element of the race itself, and we shall see how that all works out in a little while. We're just getting a list of some of the drivers that will be starting. It looks as though many of the star drivers are actually going to be second on the list, although there are some rapid drivers who will be starting. So that is going to be interesting, and we will get onto that in just a little, in a little while. The pole position car is the Jensen Button Alan Buncombe car. Uh, Jensen is not starting. He's going to take over in the C-Type Jaguar after Alex does the initial part of the race and that they're both uh, Alex is quick as well as Jensen so they're in a very very good starting position um, funnily enough the man we saw outright driving in qualifying just now in a different category Chris Ward the car he's racing will start second from the grid but it's actually Nigel Webb who will be starting that car and it'll be Richard Wilson who starts from the front row as well and we'll look at that in a bit more detail once the cars are ready to go. But for now, we're just enjoying this uh, initial parade out there to celebrate 75 years of racing here at Goodwood with the car that took the first chequered flag here at this circuit after the war when they actually decided and found a way to turn it into a race circuit, an airfield that had been used during the war, turning it into a racetrack. Of course, it's not the only airfield that uh, became a race circuit post-war. There are plenty of others, and Silverstone, of course, has gone on to be the, the biggest, most famous of the re airfields that uh, has become a racetrack. But there are various other ones as well, Sneston, of course, as well. But Goodwood was fundamental in getting motor racing back into the UK with the end of Brooklyn's race circuit. That couldn't happen after the war. There had been too much change to it. Um, too many factories built around the track during the war. They could not um, get that circuit rebuilt. So Goodwood was one of the key starters for the whole industry. And for example, with the fact that we're celebrating Colin Chapman this weekend, um, it also gave him opp many opportunities to deliver what was uh, all about winning races. So there you go, lovely little demo lap from the Duke of Richmond himself. They're coming back in in a moment. Well, in fact, they may well, yes, they're going up to the top of the grid. 
the, uh, we shall see how that goes. And the Duke of Richmond's son is actually driving the Aston Martin that was a winner here back in 1953. So the family that have been such a part of all of the drama, the action, and the glory of Goodwood, having an opportunity to drive. As behind them, you're now seeing the cars for the race beginning to line up. And there on the left, the number 66 C-Type Jaguar, that is the car that Alex Buncombe is going to be starting, but that Jensen Button will hopefully be taking over, as long as it all works, because Jensen hasn't always had good luck in quick cars around here. No, he's hoping that his luck certainly going to change and due to change on pole position by seven tenths of a second from the number 55 and I understand Nigel Webb will be the one starting that car in, in P2 yeah that's right so uh, we've got some we've got some rapid drivers Darren Turner is going to be starting from the third row I notice so Darren's going to be starting early. Nigel Greensill is another one, very rapid driver. He's starting from the fourth row of the grid. Nigel's the sort of guy who might well jump through uh, the order a little bit in the early stages. We'll just have to wait and see. He's in one of the older cars, the Allard, the uh, 1952 Allard J2X. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. But there the car's beginning to line up, and it is a, an absolutely glorious, glorious uh, display, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. It's so exciting that we uh, are treated to those of you that have stayed, those of you watching at home. We finally get to see a race, and it will be a close one of that for, sh for sure. We've got two Jaguar C-types lining up at the front of the field, and there you can see a fast combination, the Buncom and Button combination, and then the Ward and Webb combination there, two lovely C-types, and then, of course, Number 78, the Bradley and Wilson Maserati, patiently waiting to, to get underway. Yes, that's right. Uh, this lovely mixture of machines and uh, the, fl the, the whistles are blowing already. So it looks like we're going to see them uh, getting ready soon. Richard Wilson starting in that uh, Alpha. Uh, sorry, the Maserati, that's the Maserati 250S. Um, that was pretty quick in qualifying the Maserati, so that's done a good job. So the uh, parade car is now getting out of the way and the grid being cleared as we prepare for the first race of the weekend, the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. Freddie March, of course, referring to the man who created this Goodwood, the Duke back then, post-war, who created this circuit and made it all happen. And that's why we've got the Freddie March Memorial Trophy about to happen here. And uh, we it was shall a nine-hour race, wasn't it? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we're only having an hour, don't worry. We're not going <laughs> to have to stay here for another nine hours. No, it used to go to midnight. So we would have had a... Yeah, it started at 3 p.m. and would finish at midnight. So they made sure it was in darkness. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to be too dark, but uh, it's still going to be lovely to see the cars going out to play. And there we are, lining up some lovely noise coming through as well. And we are going to see who's going to come out on top. There's Alex Buncombe then from the pole position. See whether he's going to be able to combine a victory with Jensen Button. That will be fascinating if they can manage to do it in a car uh, that is, uh, was driven by Juan Manuel Fangio in the, uh, in the days. Great history to it, but also a great modern side to it with a Formula One world champion ready to compete here this weekend. We did see a bit of damage on one of the cars. I noticed it has been uh, put back together quite well for the start of the race. We're all set for race one, the warm-up lap to take place of the Freddie March Memorial Trophy, celebrating the Goodwood nine-hour races between 1952 and 1955, and away they go. So now, get into race mode, not qualifying mode, and they've got to get these tyres up to temperature and be thinking, how do I get off the line? <laughs> exactly, that almost looked like a race start. Wasn't it how those front, front three try to, to practice the start coming off the line. So that's going to be so interesting heading down into turn one as everyone sorts themselves out. And it is, I can finally say, or we can finally say, can't we, Ben, that it is race time. So this is the green flag map. And uh, not really, well, a slight opportunity maybe for those to just try and have a little look at the track conditions. But of course the pace will be taken around by Bunker and we get the pleasure of uh, having the onboard camera on that car as well. Yeah, so there you are. Let's have a little look at the lineup on the grid. 
And on the uh, the front row, um, we've got the Jaguar C-Type. Alex Buncombe will be starting that. Another C-Type alongside Nigel Webb starting, Richard Wilson starting in the Maserati. Then we've got two HWM Jaguars on the second row. The Allard uh, of uh, Jarvis and Trelouille in the third row uh, with the Aston Martin DB3S, a car that's been so successful over the years here at Goodwood. Then the Cooper, another Aston Martin and Allard back on the fifth row. Nigel Greenstall starting in car number 29. Watch out for him from the beginning. He's likely to be rapid. As we go back down the field, we've got a mixture of cars, Ferraris, Coopers, the Jaguars again. Another C-Type, the Gary Pearson Alex Brundle car, further down than we expected. That's down in 14th position. So we're going to have to wait and see how that one goes. Uh, but all the way down to the Maserati, the Fraser Nash back there on the 10th row of the grid. But plenty more to come. You've got a big, big grid for the Freddie March uh, Memorial. One or two cars haven't made it into the race that we're hoping to do so. So we've got a couple of gaps, but we are looking forward to a race that will develop all the way through. And of course, with pit stops, and sometimes if there's an incident and you get uh, yellow flags, then of course that can make a difference to timing of your pit stop. So we'll just have to watch out for all of that and see how this goes. But we are on for some tremendous racing about to happen. And for all of you who've decided to stick around here this evening, uh, I do hope you can enjoy the show. Joe, for those of you with us online, uh, it's another opportunity to see fabulous cars being driven to the very limit. I tell you what, these drivers do not hold back. They certainly won't. Whether you could class it as the pro driver or the second driver starting, it's going to be very exciting. This is where the heart rate will start to rise, as well as the revs in a moment's time. But I'm certainly very excited for this one because it's going to be so competitive come the end of this race and it's going to be key to try and make sure that you have a very clean start to the race it's one hour long there's a long way ahead to go so trying to make sure you keep out of trouble but of course as we know that's much easier said than done <laughs> well let's see alex Buncombe it is on pole position in the car that he'll be sharing with jensen button We've got a big battle on our hands. Nigel Webb and Richard Wilson alongside him on that front row of the grid as the final car moves into place. The Freddie March Memorial Trophy. We are celebrating 75 years here racing at Goodwood. It's underway, and it's a good start from the pole man, Alex Buncombe, who really gets off the line extremely well. That's perfect. That's how you want it to be. The number 66 car launches into the lead. Everybody now chasing time to find a spot that they can go through. Yeah, it's all nice and clean. Everyone got away nicely, Ben, which is great to see. But look at the lead that Buncombe's got already. He's streaming down the back straight through Ford Water, down to St. Mary's. Several cars jostling, put position, but he's gone. He's not even the second place car is in sight, and that is the Wilson Bradley car that's yeah. managed to get past the Webb and Ward. That's right. So the outside of the front row worked well for Richard Wilson. He's got up into to second place and then you've got the the battles going on further back and Nigel Webb is trying to defend busily he started second but he's actually under a lot of pressure in uh, further yet yeah, third place under two cars who are trying to get past him there the number 74 that's Martin Hunt in the HWM Jaguar and in between them you've got the 56 car of Gregor Fiskin the car he's sharing with Jake Hill and Gregor was very quick in qualifying too and Gregor Fiskin move on to the inside, the number 56, the pale green, HWM Jaguar, can he make the move? Whoa, not quite yet. No, the door's firmly closed, shall be very brave, he's having a little look, is he going to get the switch back? Yeah, fantastic job getting it sideways, so Jake Hill will be very pleased with that, and he's pulled a slight gap already going into this final game. Oh, are they going to both run? No, number 74 having a little look, Hunt having a little look down the inside, but thought better of it, which I think was the right decision. But as you said, it was a great start by Alex Buncombe, who's got a comfortable lead over Richard Wilson. Then Gregor Fiskin sharing the car with Jake Hill. Gregor's gone up into third position in the HWM. There you are looking at the number 29 car, that is Nigel Greensill, as I mentioned. I thought he might be able to make a few places. He's not actually made a lot of ground. I think he's actually where he started from. He's still in ninth position currently in that little battle group. And we shall see as it goes. We know that Jake Hill is going to be taking over from Gregor Fiskin later on in this race. But as you said, he will be happy to have seen what Gregor has managed to do on that opening lap to get up into third position.
Yeah, he'll go, phew, that helps my job a little bit better. And that's what you want, you're the driver that starts the race to keep it clean and try and make amends move forward up the road, which he certainly has. We've got some big movers further down. We've got the number 82 car, Reading and Brigade, that have made four spots. Wow. They've up into 14th place at the moment. And the number 11 car as well has made seven places. Right, now we've been told it is a 50-minute race. It has been shortened a little bit, so it's not a full hour, but it's still a decent distance. But that, yeah, the Gary Pearson Alex Brundle car has definitely uh, made some good progress. Uh, the number four car, as we're looking at a, another little battle, this is for seventh position, actually, um, as they're coming through. I think, I think it's actually got ahead of these guys. So dropping back a little bit now is Nigel Webb, who started from the front row, the number 55 car, but definitely losing a bit of time. He's down into fifth place and being chased hard by the number 520 as well. That's a Gary Harmon in the Cooper Jaguars through. He's having a very close battle there with Darren Turner, isn't he? Yeah. Swapping for position, but hats off to Alex Buncombe. He, he's off the 5.5 seconds clear of the Wilson and Bradley car in P2, but we've got a right good battle here now, haven't we, for fifth place? Definitely, it's working out uh, pretty strongly. Nigel Webb just hanging on in there, number 55, trying to come around the outside is Darren Turner, as you mentioned. Darren, number three, right around the outside. Yes, he gets past one, can he get past the other? That's the question, Darren. So experienced, so talented, we've seen over the years. Le Mans class winner a couple of times. For Aston Martin, of course, a long-term Aston Martin driver. And this is an Aston Martin DB3S that was such a star car here at Goodwood back in period. Yeah, and I'm, a, I'm guessing he's timed it to perfection, and he has, getting a great exit out on the back corner. Now it is pretty much a drag race all the way up the slightly uphill straight all the way to Woodgut Corner. He's pulled out a slight bit of a gap. He's going to hit the brakes. Again, the tricky corner. You can see flames spitting out the back, but further back in the picture there, Ben, is the number 520 being passed. Is it round the outside of the Pearson and Brundle car? Yeah, Gary Pearson's in that car at the moment, and that's, that's a, a good sign because we did wonder why it had been slow off, and they obviously uh, did have a problem with the car, and it's now working much more like it because both Gary Pearson and Alex Brundle are very rapid drivers normally they're right up front but it's beginning to get nearer and nearer the front this car so it's the slightly lighter colored car just going through the shot as you saw has made up a good number of places now the Gary Pearson Alex Brundle car with Gary in it right now and, and definitely gaining some lost time meanwhile also moving up the order a bit Joe Wilmot in the Jaguar XK 140 GOM as it's called number 84 yeah, so that, that Brundle and Pearson car started in 14th to already seven places gained. So Alex Brundle will be smiling like a Cheshire cat on the, the pit wall and desperate to, to get in as the 520... Oh, the number seven just there, <laughs> kicking up some dust on the outside. But this scrap is not over, is it, Ben, for, for this sixth place? Definitely not. No, this is good fun. And Gary Pearson is now going to lose that place back again. So the number four car has just dropped behind uh, Gary Harmon in the number 520, who is now putting the pressure on Nigel Webb, who can he hold off or not? I'm not sure he can because the, the 520 is really flying along. The Cooper Jaguar, big, quite a lumpy looking machine. It did get some damage earlier, but it is running OK as Gary Pearson also nips through at the same time. And then you've got the little blue Cooper Climax behind them. That's a little mid-engine car, much smaller engine, one of the first of the mid-engine sports cars, that little blue car, number seven there. But it's it's got great pace, considering it's got a 1500cc engine up against really quite powerful machinery around it. Yeah, I have to say, looking at going through the chicane, that looks pretty nimble, looks pretty good handling-wise. So, because we've got such an array of cars, they all have different benefits around the circuit. Some will be faster in a straight line, some will have better traction, some will be faster through the corners. And certainly that number seven looks pretty handy through the corners. It does, it's looking uh, very entertaining indeed. We'll see how it goes. Now, the pit window uh, has been opened up between 16 minutes and 34 minutes. So 16 minutes into the race, 
they are allowed to start making their pit stop. So we're a little bit off that so far. We're uh, seven, just over seven minutes into the race currently, because it's now a 50-minute race. So a little bit of time yet before the pit lane opens up. But we don't need it. We've got some great battles still going on here. Yeah, we don't. And some days you, you want the pit window to open, and others you don't. This is one of those times that we don't want the pit window to open. We've got a great scrap here now for eighth place. It's been raging on and on and on, hasn't it? But meanwhile, out front, we're still waiting. He's crossed the line as Alex Buncombe, but we're waiting for the Wilson Bradley car. 8.4 seconds is the gap now uh, in the lead between the first and second place. Gosh, that really is a big gap, as you say. Looking at that lovely Allard, uh, that's number 77 I'm talking about there. That's Mick Jarvis driving it. It's called an Allard J2X. That's got a big, big engine in it, so it's it's great comparison to the little Cooper that's up ahead of it, which has a tiny engine. The Allard has a, a big engine. It's nearly six litres up against a 1,500cc. Uh, so it's got the straight line speed in theory. It might get through, but no, because the Cooper could break so much later going into the corners. Yeah, and the Cooper's getting really good exits, actually. It's very neat and tiny going through the chicane there. But obviously, you know, you have to drag your drive so you go, right, OK, I'm not fastest in a straight line so what's the thing i've got to try and maximize is carrying that speed and getting the exit so great job there from felix who's a real of the number seven yeah yeah felix got on yeah as you say brakes don't have to be on for too long we saw the lights come on there briefly um, but it's all about momentum can he carry the momentum in that car or is it going to be a challenge we've got the at the back of that group is the jaguar xk 140 was a special built car in 1954 and we shall see how it goes uh, for that little group but this is a great little group that's going on so far up front as you mentioned there's no doubt about alex buncombe's lead he's still opening up he's still doing some fabulous lap times but further down the order here this is the fight for ninth place and it's still to be decided certainly has been a bit of a drop back for nigel webb in the number 55 car at the front of this little trio having started from the front row but chris ward was the man who set the pace in qualifying in this car and we've seen chris's incredible performance in other cars today as well yeah certainly have Definitely a driver that can can show the way around here. As again, pulling out of the slipstream, foot to the floor, is the number 77 car. Not quite close enough. Almost the light of repeat of the previous lap. Deja vu going on there. You can see a little wiggle there from the, the Cooper Climax, who's just trying to grab on to the rear end of the number 55 and, and, and try and pressure into a mistake. But it looks like at the moment, that the 55 car is being driven quite beautifully and making no mistakes at the moment. Yeah, and it's so lovely. I mean, this really gives us an image of, of how the design of cars was changing because mid-engine became the thing. You know, they learned that we put the engine behind the driver, made a, a car faster. Oh, big slide from the Allard there in the background. Wonder if he was going to hold it. Just about managed to do so. So well done to Nick Jarvis. That was a good job. But yes, going mid-engine was the way to go. But at this time, of course, up against big, powerful front-engine cars, you get a, a, a real battle between them. There's a, a slightly uh, more unusual car going through as well. Uh, that's a bit further down the order, actually. That one's uh, being lapped, one of the cars down towards the back of the field. But this is the group that's still battling for positions in the top 10. Yeah, it is. So it's Nigel Webb behind the wheel of the 55, who's doing, as I said, a, a good job. Oh, yeah, even more of a wiggle through the Cooper climate. So he's absolutely trying to, to wring the neck, is Felix. And he's a little bit closer, but again, he won't quite have the straight line speed. So will the back marker come into play? I doubt it. Uh, but the Cooper Climax is going to be hoping that it stays out the way it does. So it hasn't affected this this sort of battle going into turn one. No, it's a good point, though, because once you get into the back markers, it can often be a, a, either a big help or a big hindrance, it, can't it, in terms of making an overtake? Yeah, it certainly can. So we've got some lap cars that are down to roughly about 18th place, I think 20th place at the moment. But the number 56 car... Currently third. The Fiskin and Hill, so both are doing a, a good job. Like I said, Jake will be very pleased with that. Started in fourth place, made up one position, now in third.
yeah, third place for them. So Jake Hill will be looking forward to taking that over. Um, but uh, dropping back a little bit, some six seconds behind the second place car of Richard Wilson, and that is the Maserati 250S that's in second. This third, this third place car is the HWM Jaguar, a car that uh, would take victories. Uh, Crystal Palace had won in 1953, so there you go, another 70-year anniversary since it had a, an important victory with Tony Gaze. Uh, Peter Collins was also uh, a successful driver in this car. Peter, of course, another star uh, driver in the 50s and 60s, and, um, well, the 50s anyway, and... Uh, he was also a driver of this car in period. It's going well, holding on to third place, but I tell you what, the leader, Alex Bunker, is just disappearing. And considering he's going to be handing over to Jensen Button. <laughs> uh, it's a deadly combination. He's already 19 seconds in the lead, but just looking, I'm not sure if it's a timing error, but the Pearson and Brundle car, the number four, Jaguar C-Type is dropping down the order. Ah. It's pulled out, apparently. Oh, that's a great shame, because it obviously had a trouble earlier on today. There there you are, he's just pulled off. Oh, uh, because it was uh, it had made a good recovery, hadn't it? Yeah, very good recovery. I was looking forward to seeing Alex Brundle jump in to the car and see what he could do behind the wheel. As a flash of the lights there from the number 56. Uh, I don't know if there was traffic there, or it was just a, just a cheeky flash of the lights for, for no reason, but... Uh, yeah, that's a big, big shame. Maybe we should give Alex a, uh, a shout to come and join us in the commentary booth. We both work with Alex in the commentary world, and uh, he's not more gonna, than happy. He's to. not going to drive the car, so Alex, come and join us in the booth. It'd be lovely to see you. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry that he's not going to get a, a chance to, to go out and play in that one. He has got uh, plenty of other things to drive over the course of the weekend, of course. So we are only um, um, what just over a minute away from the pit lane opening up uh, just under two minutes actually from the pit lane opening up so we'll see how quickly they decide to swap uh, quite often it is the faster more professional drivers that are, are waiting in the pits to be taking over for the second part I would imagine for example that Nigel Webb who is sharing with Chris Ward may well make quite an early pit stop in the number 55 car yeah I would say so it's a very tight pit lane isn't it and that's the problem when it you want to come in and you want to make your driver change there's not much space to do it and now yeah. moving forward is the number 77 card the allard has uh, picked off the number 55 but the little climax is coming back yeah the cooper just dived back past again which is lovely to see as you say but they have both now got past the car that started from the front row and as i mentioned nigel webb i think he'll be coming in pretty early to hand it over to Chris Ward. Now, I'm not sure the pit lane will be open when he next comes around. It'll be nearly open, actually. Close. Yeah, it'll be pretty close uh, to close. be able to do that. But this ever so close to, to the grass there. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, no, I saw that. Yeah, you're right. Very, very tight. We've got uh, oh, another side-by-side -side action here. Oh, wheel on the grass. Don't get too carried away. And also joining in all the fun and games is the Ferrari TRC, the 500 TRC, Scott Redding. Is at the wheel of that at the moment, a bit further down than uh, hoped for, but doing okay. Yeah, that's given Nigel a little bit of breathing space in the number 55, and it's Joseph Wilmot that's at the wheel of the number 84 at the moment, as the Ferrari has uh, made place. And there, look, in the box at the bottom of your screen, we can see driver changes have began already. Yeah, just as it's opened up. So the pit lane is officially open now. they are seeing uh, a few of those cars beginning to, to come in for the swap overs. Number 78 in there, Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley making an early switch over. And they are front runners in this, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah, we saw some great shots, didn't we, earlier on in the practice session, the qualifying practice of Richard Bradley really ragging the neck of this Maserati and here is the leader in so Bunkins in and we're going to get a great shot of the onboard camera there as he slings himself out of the car Johnson Button will hop in quick adjustment of the belts making sure he's not going to sit on the belt that can be extremely uncomfortable as he slides into position now he looks very small there in the cockpit doesn't he <laughs> that's right and although they get on with it they do it as quick as possible there is a minimum time they have to be in the pit so you can't just do it as fast as possible and go straight out you have to then wait be told by 
your crew when you've been in there long enough. He's just got his radio cable there, and it's not quite on his hands device either, is the belt. So that, oh, I was going to say, you probably need to pull that radio cable out, but they've left it in. Maybe Jensen will try and give it a little bit of tug out when he, he leaves the, the pits. Now Jake Hill's going to take over this car from Gregor Fiskin, and this is running in third place. So let's see how this goes as Jensen Button gets going now. So he's, he's done it. He's got a reminder on the steering wheel. <laughs> Pit speed, 20 miles an hour. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no speedos on that one. It doesn't actually look like it's working. So he's going to have to judge 20 mile an hour. It'll be a lot slower than anything that he's he's used to. As he lights the rear wheels, heads out the pits. Jake Hill still getting strapped in now. So this is an important time to have a smooth pit stop. That was a very professional one. I love the way they put those little signs on the steering wheel, just to remind the driver of exactly what matters on the pit stop. Uh, Jensen is immediately on the case. He's being chased by that lovely little Cooper uh, that we've been watching and enjoying. Now, Jake Hill, the touring car star, is now heading out. He's a Goodwood star as well, of course, in this lovely little 56 machine, the uh, HWF Jaguar of 1954. So, what can he do? Is there any chance of catching Jensen Button? I think that's a bit of a tall order because they've got <laughs> such a big lead. They have got such a big lead, but on track lead, not necessarily overall because of the pit stops, is the number three, Darren Turner, yet to, to come into the pits. But we're riding on board with Jensen Button, who's uh, as pro as ever, quickly got used to hopping into a different car, doing a pit stop. A little bit of vibration there on the steering wheel, it looks like it, from our, our onboard camera, but that won't hinder him whatsoever as he comes up the very very long straight now and he'll hit the brakes going into woodcut uh, jaguar c-types were wonderful cars at the time they were lamont winners in 1951 and in 1953 for jaguar and in fact um, a jaguar c-type won at lamont at a an average speed of over 100 miles an hour for the first time that was the first time 100 mile an hour had been uh, beaten by the Jaguar C-Types. They started out with about 180 horsepower, went up to about 220 horsepower, but in modern days now, even with those same engines, they're getting a fair bit more horsepower than that out of them with a bit of modern uh, understanding of how to make them work. Yeah, we certainly, certainly are. So this car currently holds the fastest lap of the race. Not that one, unfortunately, for the, for the climax, but Jensen Button set by Alex Bunker, 128.9. There we go, a little puff of smoke there Ooh. out of the, the side. Or was that just my item? Was that a car peeling off to the right-hand side going through St Mary's, or again, was that my eyes? Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, the race leader of this race at the moment is actually Darren Turner, because, of course, uh, they haven't made a pit stop yet. So Darren Turner in car number three is the current race leader. And then we've got the number 520, Gary Harmon in the Cooper Jaguar, currently in second place. But then you've got Jensen Button in third, having made the pit stop with a comfortable advantage over everybody else that uh, was racing before the pit stop started. So that's why we're focusing on Jensen. He is effectively the race leader, even though officially right now he isn't, because Darren Turner is the official race leader. And of course, you never know what can happen in a race. If you get a, an incident or something, then making a pit stop then will cost you less time. But right now, it's looking very composed for Jensen Button. Let's just see. Very yes. composed. He's driving around with his visor open. <laughs> he does a 131.9. Um, so that's an impressive lap time. It's not as quick as his teammate was early on, but it's still impressive. Now, the man who did such a great job in that first in, of course, was Alex Buncombe. And Ed Foster's with him. Uh, as, as first stints go, that surely was the dream first stint. Yeah, it certainly was. You know, I haven't started this car for over 10 years now, so a little bit apprehensive off the line. Um, actually, on the green flag lap, me and Nigel had exactly the same start, so I was like, I'm going to have to up my game when it's the real start. So, um, yeah, I didn't want to over rev the start, and yeah, I managed to get the lead to turn one, and then just wanted to get my head down. But the track seems really greasy out there. I don't know why. I found that a little earlier in the Cobra, it just didn't. Just overall, just felt generally quite low grip out there. I don't know why. Maybe quite a lot of oil down or something. But car's going excellent. Um, yeah, like you say, dream sort of start to the race. Happy to have Jensen in a really good spot. So hopefully he can just keep the car nice and consistent. 
Is it worse waiting here watching Jensen or waiting for the start that you're doing yourself? Yeah, of course it is. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to jinx anything, but we're looking good at the moment. But you know, they're historic cars, and you know, anything can go wrong. But um, car felt fine when I got out. So nice and consistent. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know what sort of lap times I was doing because the the guys changed the the race logic in the car to the actual speed, and they thought they'd done it for just the pits, but it was actually the whole lap. So I had no idea of my pace, but you know, I just had to go off my gap to to B2. But um, yeah, it's looking good at the moment. Great drive, well done. Thank you, kids. Cheers, guys. Yeah, well done to Alex. Great job. And Jensen Button's just cruising along. He's uh, he's lapping a little slower than the fastest lap that Alex Bunkham did set. But they're, they're in a good shape, so they don't need to be pushed in too hard. Well, you're exactly right. They don't need to be setting purple sectors, do they? You don't want to put anything at risk with the gap that they've got to the cars behind. So uh, that is the the Wilson Bradley car that you could say is technically in second place. So uh, Jensen just needs to keep it nice and tidy. But as Alex reminded us there, that this is historic racing, so anything can happen. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Jensen's had mechanical problems in cars that when he's been leading. I saw that later last year. So it doesn't, he knows it doesn't always go exactly to plan. But as the light starts to drop here, what a wonderful view we've got. Celebrating a, an event that used to be a nine-hour race here at Goodwood between 3 p.m. in the afternoon and midnight. This is normally a one-hour race. It's ended up being a 50-minute race, or will be, because of the, uh, the changes. Now, this is the current leader coming in. So Darren Turner is now heading into the pits, and he's going to be handing over to Simon Hatfield. Simon will be quick as well, so a good chance. But we do know that this is a big gap, and this is effectively going to bring the lead back to Jensen Button once these guys come back out again. Yeah, Darren Turner, a pro, of course, racing in Le Mans, and he's done plenty of pit stops in his time. So as Simon jumps in the car now, we can see Darren's whipping the helmet off. We'll be relieved to have some fresh air. It's open cockpit, of course, so it won't be nowhere near as warm as racing and in cockpit, but Simon looks all set and ready to go. I'd say that's a pretty clean pit stop there. Yeah, that went smoothly, didn't it? Um, we've still got 25 and a half minutes to go in this session. Lights coming on on some of the cars, but out in front with a comfortable advantage right now. It is Jetson Button. And if you look at that list you've got top left of the screen there, the car that's uh, effectively closest to them is actually in third place because that has made a pit stop, whereas the car currently running in second place, the pretty little Cooper Climax, that has not made its pit stop yet. So it is officially second now, but once it's made its pit stop, of course, it's going to drop back a little more. That's been a part of the game. Meanwhile, Jake Hill, of course, trying to close up some of that gap himself, currently running in fourth position and putting in, I think, some decent lap times. Just have a little look at uh, his lap times. Yeah, 31-0 last time around. But uh, indeed, Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley. Actually, it's Richard Bradley in Richard the car Bradley's now. The car. Yeah, he's in the 29s, isn't he? He is. And actually, that gap has... I've been keeping an eye on the gap, but he's been slowly coming down and down. So the gap is, time-wise, is two seconds between Jensen Button's pace and uh, Richard Bradley's pace. As we can see, the climax will be bleeding into the pit lane now. Nice job for, for raising the hand there, just to letting know your competitors around you. Coming into the pit. So Felix now brings in the car and the, a change will begin. Yeah, Christian will take over. So the two Goddards uh, swapping over here in their pretty little car. And he's done a, a great job. I thought Felix did a, a really nice job with that stint, competing in what is a, a small engine car. Doesn't look the easiest thing to get in and out. No, of, it's odd having a sports car with the central seat, yeah. isn't it? But a uh, great car, as you said, and actually a really, really good job by, by Felix. As we've touched on already, not the fastest car in the field, but looks pretty nimble, flashing the lights there, just making sure the controls are working properly. As a good teamwork there to strap, uh, strap him in. Double check to see if uh, everything's OK, and he'll be on his way. Yeah, it's a lovely car, as you say. In its period, in the, between 1955 and 1962, the Cooper Climax T39s, they, they took 
90 victories. There were plenty of them, of course, all around uh, UK, Europe, and into the States. But 90 victories they took. They were absolutely dominant. It was the beginning of mid-engines, and it was Jack Brabham who raced for Cooper, who converted one into an F1 car, basically. And F1 started to go mid-engined as a result of the uh, performances of those little Cooper Climax sports cars. So it was such a, a key beginning. And uh, they've shown us well in this race how they go up against these big, powerful front-engine cars and be truly competitive. But no one's quite got the pace of this car, this beautiful Jaguar with Jensen Button at the wheel. He's consistently in the 1 minute 31s. And although that's not quite as rapid as Alex did a 28.9 on his best lap in that first stint, it's just about controlling it and looking after it. It is, and uh, that gap's still coming down, though, so Richard Bradley is uh, really pushing the Maserati to its limit. Uh, it looks like Jensen is doing that same, similar thing, but the gap is coming down. It was considerably bigger, wasn't it, when Alex Bunkel come into the pit? So Richard Bradley, who we know here, is very, very fast, and already looking at the first sector times, will be half a second up already on this lap. Now we're on board with Jay Kill here. Now he's running in third position currently. And he's also trying to gain some of that, uh, that ground. But it's quite a long way back in third place. But he's got cars to lap and get past and get through them as quickly as possible. That's all part of the parcel of it. He's, got a, he's, he's quite lonely there, I would have to say, in third <laughs> position because he's got a 29-second gap between the Turner and Hatfield car, but he's got a little bit of traffic, and that is an added challenge to, to try and pass these, because I'm, sure, I'm sure at the members' meeting we, uh, we commentated on some races where there was incidents with lapped cars uh, and the, the lead cars, but uh, Jake's experience as he is ever so sideways showing off his car control. He must know that we're currently riding on board with him. It's a lovely view, though, and it's great to have the on-board cameras. You see things that you just don't see on board in in much motor racing, the car keys hanging in there with some spares. Lovely. Uh, You've got the tag on it. <laughs> exactly. And there, there's the car that you were mentioning that's going really well at this stage, being driven by Richard Bradley. Um, so gradually actually closing the gap to Jensen Button. Now, it's still a decent gap with nearly seven seconds, but he is lapping quickly all the time. Yeah, he has got the upper hand in the first... Uh, first sector, they're fairly evenly matched in the middle sector, but then Richard's got the upper hand on Jensen in the final sector. So that gap is creeping down and down and down. And you can see Richard is a really working hard on the wheel. The driver that I raced up against in karting was extremely fast. He is the 2010 Formula BMW Pacific champion as well. So he's got great experience behind him but he is pushing that car to the absolute limit. And actually, that lap, that time around, he was slightly quicker in the middle sector as he comes into Woodcup Corner now, fully sideways, taking the car all the way to the end of the track on the brakes, bleed it in through the chicane, and we'll have a little look at what the time will be when he comes across the line. But Jensen Button has gone slightly faster, so he's picking up the pace right. now as Jensen. He's gone into the 130s, but as I say that, Richard Bradley sets a personal best, and he's in the 129s. Wow, that's great. So he's got it down to only just over six seconds now. So he is still just closing the gap bit by bit, Richard Bradley. As you say, he's got a great... Uh, heritage in, in motorsport of what he's done in sports car racing um, and other forms and he started out in single seaters and actually he took his first win here at Goodwood um, in the members meeting earlier this year that was the Nuvolari trophy in the Aston Martin speed model Red Dragon that was his first win here at Goodwood um, so he, he is uh, looking for another one if he can try and close up the gap to Jensen but that six second gap with what have we got? 19 minutes to go. That's a challenge. It is a challenge, but it's it is possible. It's certainly possible. They've pretty much matched each other in the first sector. Um, traffic again can come to over. You don't get the the, the smooth side of the traffic, uh, and you have to overtake and really slow yourself down into corners, and your competitor gets the, the good side of the traffic and ends up just breezing past them in the straight. That can come into play as well. Yeah, well, let's see. I mean, it's not impossible. The, 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 the pace difference between them does make it possible still. Can he get it under six seconds on this lap? Let's keep an eye on Jensen. So, race leader here, you're watching. Jensen Button, 2009 Formula One world champion in his Jaguar C-Type. He goes over the line, and in the background, 
We're waiting for the Maserati to come over the line, and the gap is, it is coming down. It's down to 5.6. It's coming down. It's always that final sector. Richard's very, very good in that final sector, and keeps finding time of time. And I noticed, remember Alex said that the, uh, the track seemed quite slippy, so I wonder if the track's improving, because we can see all down in that final sector at Woodcut, Cor uh, Woodcut Corner, didn't we? So I wonder if the track's slowly improving, but Richard, Got fairly lucky loop there with the traffic, passing the car on the exit. But then again, so, so did De Jensen. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep a, a close eye on the on these sector times. No, absolutely. You keep an eye on that because this is actually intriguing me now as to whether uh, Richard Bradley here, you're looking at him now, in the number 78 Maserati. This is a, a very rare car, but it's also jolly fast. It's a 2.4 litre straight six. Um, they, they, Maserati increased the engine size uh, for the 250S as opposed to the 200S. They only made a couple of them, but they were winners uh, in, their, in their years in the 1950s. And Maserati, of course, was a tremendous racing company anyway. Um, Maserati and Jaguar were, were often racing against each other for big wins, and we got it again today. The Jaguar C-Type with Jensen Button up against the Maserati 250 of Richard Wilson. Two incredible names in the sport, but Richard Bradley's got the carrot. He can see the carrot, can't he now? Right up there in the distance, and Jensen's gained some time in that last sector, but nothing Look compared at the lap to, time to Richard between, Bradley. Look at the lap time between. So, so Jensen's done a 130.071, Bradley did a 1 minute 30.070. There was one thousandth of a second between them. Yeah, so Richard lost a little bit of time in that first sector. And uh, I, Jensen, I'm sure Jensen knows, he's probably giving us a false hope here of a great battle towards the end. He's probably saying, well, I don't, there's still five seconds. I don't need to push, I don't need to risk anything. But saying that, Richard Bradley, look at that first sector, Ben, on our timing screen. Six tenths quicker than Jensen. Jensen, OK, had a slightly bit of traffic. Yeah, yeah. And as we were saying earlier, this could be fundamental, because I know when we've been commentating on these races before, sometimes it's when they catch traffic and get it at just the wrong moment. One car can lose much more time than the other. Exactly, and when you're approaching that traffic, you go, please, can you either just slow down a little bit or speed up a little bit, depending where they are on the track. And again, it's a good chunk of time that Richard is quicker in that middle sector. And, and because of the long straights here in the sector and where the sectors are, let's say if you catch someone going into Fordwater, then you can make lose a lot of time heading into that next sector down the straight. The challenge is getting past this next car. It's actually quite a quick car. That car's running in eighth place. So the number 520, which we saw in that big battle earlier on. So Nick Firmer is in it now. Um, it's actually quite a quick car, so he's got to find a way past. Look, what's the gap now? 3.8 seconds is the gap. Is he going to just try and sneak down the inside? Blue flags will be out. So that was nicely done, nicely timed there by Richard Bradley. And there's a little bit of more traffic in front of him. I'm guessing that'll be the 77 car. Jensen's cleared that car at the moment. But again, Richard Bradley setting the pace in that first sector. He certainly is. This is uh, impressive stuff. And he, died, he timed that pass so perfectly. He didn't lose any time at all by getting past at that stage. In the meantime, in third place, we've still got Jake Hill, but he's quite a long way back. He is uh, 16 seconds behind this car, 19 seconds behind the race leader. Again, he's oh, got to get through here. He's got through. Yep, yeah, good job. I was uh, squirming in my seat because you just never know if the car that you're overtaking seeing you down the inside. Yeah, you see the, see the blue flags. But uh, pit window is now closed, by the way, so no one can come into the pits. Everyone, I think, has pretty much done all their driver changes, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, the only one that didn't, of course, was the Pearson Brundle car, which stopped on, on, on yeah. the track, sadly, so Alex never got a chance to play. But uh, we still have a battle up front, there's no doubt about it. Um, and we shall see what the gap is next time around. Meanwhile, there are other little groups going on here. You're looking at battle for fourth position, so the number three car currently in fourth, but not for very long, because the number 11 car is almost coming through. That's being driven by Sam Hancock now, the Jaguar C-Type number 11. And Sam is definitely picking up a few places here as we go through the rest of the race. And they're also uh, 
racing up, uh, up against. In fact, the, the, the little seven car's going a bit slower now. That's dropped back. That's down to 11th position. That's not in the same group anymore. And we've got number 78 and number 11. So that is ah. one of the cars on the screen under investigation. Yeah, but 70, that is important because that's Richard Bradley. And I did wonder, when they made their pit stop, I wondered if that was a fraction before the pit window opened. It was very quick, wasn't it? Which is going to be a big shame for us. And of yeah. course, a big shame for them if they happen to do get penalty because the gap's now down to 2.8 seconds. <laughs> 2.8. I mean, I'm not sure what the penalty is. Let's say it is five seconds, uh, which in other racing series, you usually get a five or a 10 second penalty. We won't mention the, the, the championship, but you know what it is. He's he's lapping very quick. It's, it's around about a second a lap quicker at the moment than Jensen Button. And you can see he's, he's near enough right on the back of him now. But there is an investigation on that number 78 car. Let's look how close it's coming into Jensen Button. I think he's got a real chance to get past Jensen's car's just not going as quick as it was earlier on. As they go across the line, it's down to 0.2 of a second. He's going to have a look into the first corner. We have a change of lead. Jensen Button drops down to second place as Richard Bradley takes the lead in the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. But is he going to be able to hold it? There is a pit stop infringement investigation currently being taken. And I suppose it's not impossible. Jensen might have been told that and told, don't worry, that's a funny noise. Oh, very good. I was just wondering if there is a problem because he was in the 130s, nearly in the 129s not longer. He's now in the 132s. So that doesn't sound very healthy at all, does it? No, there's a lot of shake, a lot of rattle. Let's listen in here. There's a misfire. Misfire, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Just uh, as it starts to rev a little more, you'll hear it again here, I think. Change up early, isn't he? Yeah, he's actually lifting on the straight now because he's worried about that misfire. Yeah, so that is that is a real big shame, and he is losing a lot of time in these sectors. So that is huge frustration for Jensen and Alex. Big disappointment, but. As you, as you mentioned, the number 78 is under investigation. It all just depends on what the penalty is. Absolutely. Well, uh, this is fascinating. I do feel for Jensen because every time he's like leading races by a long, long way, he does seem to have mechanical problems with his cars here at Goodwood. It's so unusual in his professional life. He's always been actually very good at looking after cars and not uh, wearing them out like some drivers do, I don't think. Uh, he's a very smooth driver. He doesn't tend to put too much uh, strain on them, but it's just not coming together. And I, I wonder if this is going to give Jake Hill a chance to close up that gap himself. Uh, he's doing about the same lap time, though, isn't he? Yeah, I wonder if Jake got a little bit of traffic because he was lapping a little bit faster in the 131s, 132s, so they're both floating in the 133s, but that could give him a chance. But uh, Alex Wunkham called it. He said it's historic racing and anything can happen, and unfortunately it's... Uh, just just shown how uh, how that certainly can be the case so the rattle the misfire continues on Jensen Button's car and it's a it's a tough feeling when you're driving a car that you know is not fully healthy he'll be uh, in a slightly anxious situation number 74 that's in sixth place just going through so that's been driven by Pat Blakeney Edwards now who is uh, very much a star of Goodwood, Pat Blakeney Edwards, very experienced historic racer. He's chasing down the number three car, Simon Hatfield now driving the number three car that Darren Turner was in earlier on, the Aston Martin DB3. The Aston Martin DB3 was such a successful car here at Goodwood in those nine-hour races. Now we know what the penalty is, so tell me what it is, Alice, the penalty. So car 78, which you could say was our race leader, is a 10 second penalty and car 11 as well. So that puts Button and Buncombe back in the lead, but it's not going to be for very long. The gap technically is five seconds, but uh, the pace difference now is, uh, is quite considerable. So uh, I still think, and I don't want to commentators curse it for the Bradley and Wilson car, but uh, we still expect that to, to come down the gap quite dramatically and uh, they will slot back into first place.
Meanwhile, uh, Hatchfield versus Blakeney Edwards here. The, these two are going to be side by side, virtually coming down to the end of the straight. Not quite. So Hatchfield's got just enough straight line speed to keep Blakeney Edwards behind him. But Blakeney Edwards is not going to hold back for long with the HWM Jaguar as it chases after the Aston Martin. So uh, the Aston Martin certainly has good straight line speed, but the uh, other one seems to have some good cornering speeds as well. Another of the little Coopers in the mix there. That's down in 10th position, and they've got these other cars all rattling around them. So some of these are being lapped, and some of them are racing against each other. It all gets quite complicated at stages and quite busy out there. Yeah, it certainly does. This is great racing between these cars, and it, the penalty did affect the number 11, which is the Jaguar C type of uh, Frederick Wakeman and Sam Hancock. But they're all setting good lap times compared to those around him, actually, that last oh, lap. Jensen Button's in. Jensen Button is retiring. So I tell you what, Richard Bradley may still win this race, even with the penalty because Jake Hill is a long way back. Once you apply the penalty, he's 11 seconds back. But what a shame for Jensen and for the crew. We'll no doubt find out more later. He's explaining what he's been feeling. Yeah, we can't quite hear, but it what the guys are saying but such a shame such a shame and there we go and this car is now back in the lead even with the penalty so the penalty was for coming into the pits a fraction too early and they get that 10 second penalty but they've now got an advantage uh, the other penalty that was given out to the number 11 car which is actually up there but with the penalty is being pushed back out of a potential podium uh, so that's a bit of a tricky one maybe they could still get a podium but no, that... i think they can their lap okay. times if you look they're in the 131s and uh, hunt and, and blake the engine's car are in the one uh, well they were in the 136s but they popped up in 133s but it's going to be close sorry ben no it's right they got the penalty there for actually their their pit lane stop i believe rather than for coming in too early so it's just a, it was a slightly different reason for it yeah but that uh that's not affected. <laughs> Richard Bradley has it out on track, who has been absolutely fantastic as he weaves his way through the traffic, not slowing him down at all. Even with the penalty, he has a good gap over Jake Hill of 10.1 seconds at the moment. So you could say that he just needs to to bring it home. <laughs> and But as Alex said, that it is historic racing, so anything can happen, and that's been proven once more than that's probably more than once because obviously another retirement as well in the Brundle car so several times during this session but the Hancock and Wakeman car is on the podium at the moment as it stands and you've still got this battle for what is currently fourth place and in taking that fourth place Pat Blakeney Edwards I think has actually got it this time yes he has as they go down the straight uh, he has managed to nip past and go into fourth position that will be confirmed when he comes over the line of course on the uh, timing screen, but that's a good effort. And the number three, Aston Martin, has now dropped a down one with Simon Hatfield at the wheel. He fought him off for a good long time, but uh, didn't quite work to, to fend him off for much longer. It's a bit of a gap to the next car, 5.8 seconds to try and catch the number 11, although that, I think, includes the penalty, presumably, already. But if he could gain, uh, over five seconds, there is a chance of still getting a podium out of this. Yeah, there's still a chance, but the number 11 has just set a personal oh, best yeah. on that last lap, so the track's still clearly improving. Richard Bradley, funnily enough, has now totally backed off. He was in the 129s. He's now driving around in the 131, so because he's got nothing to chase and he's pretty safe with his penalty, uh, he's now just out there bringing it home. Uh, still probably going to get it sideways on occasions just to, to, to show off as he still bleeds it right to the edge of the track but uh, he's, he's pretty safe now let's have a look oh. at oh that was a bit of a slide from uh, Sam Hancock managed to sort it out well didn't he yeah and he doesn't want to be doing that because he has got that penalty so he needs to make sure that he keeps it on the on the tarmac uh, and pointing in the right direction as it, he comes through 
the chicane gets close to those tyre barriers on the left-hand side. But what a great sight, Ben. I mean, we can't really see it out of our commentary box window, just about the very tinted windows here. But uh, a lovely sight of these cars driving around this circuit with, the, with their lights on. Yeah. Yeah, great going sight. into darkness. It really is a lovely view. And uh, it's lovely that uh, the fans are still enjoying it, absorbing some beautiful action out there. And what is looking now, despite getting a penalty, uh, so it's going to be a, a comfortable victory for the two Richards, Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley. And it's Richard Bradley who has really delivered superbly, managing to make up for the loss of time even before the sea type went completely wrong. Maybe the sea type was already losing a bit of pace earlier than we realized. Um, and now it's out of the race altogether, of course, Jensen Button's car. Whereas Richard Bradley is now, as you say, going a bit calmer lapping quite consistently but he's got a good advantage over jake hill with the gregor fiskin car that's now running in second place some 10 seconds behind now they're going to get a, a good result in that one but richard bradley this is great news the man in his early 30s who was karting from 11 years old and uh, did the full european karting championships he was based in bangkok uh, himself though and uh, then went on to win the formula bmw pacific series in 2010 he did japanese f3 racing and he did super formula in japan as well and uh, then he went on to race in gt cars lmp2 class at le mans taking the uh, the victory in the class at le mans in 2015 in one of the orica nissans and uh, he really has had a, a tremendous career with that victory earlier this year in the Nuvolari Trophy here at Goodwood. And now he's going to back it up with one of the Revival. He is definitely a master around this circuit, isn't he? I remember watching that race. I think we were commentating on that race, weren't we, Ben? It was a, a great display from Richard and uh, really showing off his talents, and especially around this circuit as well. But he can take it a little bit. He's only doing very consistent lap times, even with the traffic even backing off he can break a little bit earlier he can change the gear slightly earlier just to save the engine and not put anything at risk just to make sure that he brings the car home because him and uh, jake hill there in second place are, are doing very similar lap times and there's nothing to risk and the, the team will be showing that for sure on the pit bull yeah absolutely right and it looks as though the uh the podium is going to go the way uh, still of another pen penalised car, uh, the car that Sam Hancock is. The penalty podium, isn't it? Yes, the yeah. penalty podium. There are going to be two, two uh, sets of drivers, two pairs of drivers who end up with a penalty, but still end up on the podium, which is quite impressive. Um, but it looks as though that is going to be the way it is. And we've got the time ticking away. Um, I think he's going to get over the line just before the chequered flag comes out. It's going to be quite quite close they got the timing wrong on the pit stops <laughs> hopefully the timing won't go wrong at the end of the race no let's have a look i think it will be uh, it'll be close he's coming into woodgut corner now so he's gone through the middle sector and usually the last sector is around about 24 seconds so uh, this is going to be close i think he's just about with a around about seven seconds i'm guessing left on the clock there we go he crosses the line so this will be our final lap yeah we're on to it we're on to the last lap here and it's the number 78 car that's on target for victory the 1957 maserati 250s being driven by richard wilson initially and now richard bradley who has set some very very impressive lap times chasing down the jaguar c-type of alex buncombe and jensen button that sadly has now retired from the race completely because there was something going wrong with the c-type but nonetheless richard bradley hunted down the c-type while it was still out there moved ahead then we gathered he got a penalty because they came into the pits too early there was a, a strict limit of when you were allowed to come in the pits they came in just a few seconds early they got a 10 second penalty looked like they weren't going to get the victory but that's not the truth they are going to earn the victory as long as he can make it around the final part of the lap i know it's it's not near the end yet but a great display of uh, a great driving and hats off to richard wilson as well he got it off the line and he made a place didn't he over the 55 car of nigel webb as he's coming down the back straight now levant straight and heading into woodgut corner and a few more corners now to navigate and he's going to bring the Maserati home to uh, a great victory. Into the chicane for the final time. 
Richard Bradley in the Maserati 250S takes victory in the Freddie March Memorial Trophy at Goodwood. The first race of this 2023 Revival Weekend and a dramatic race as well. Doing it with a 10 second penalty, he has still managed to take outright victory. Second place is going to Gregor Fiskin and Jake Hill, the touring car star who's done a good job. The gap just under 10 seconds in the end, even with a 10 second penalty. So that means he's effectively 20 seconds ahead um, are in the win. But nonetheless, getting a good podium finish. And then we'll just get confirmation in a moment of who finishes in third as they cross the line. It looks as though it is going to be uh, Sam Hancock. I think it's going to be Sam Hancock. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, in the number 11 car, uh, Sam Hancock and Fred Wakeman. I think they're going to end up with that third place. But what a great victory by Richard Wilson and particularly Richard Bradley, who drove that second stint. Yeah, he did a great job. And uh, the crowd clapping and very special race. And we've been treated. That's just a taste of what's coming up for the rest of the weekend as he puts his hand aloft. And look at that great sight of the, the headlights there shining, but a great job there by Richard Bradley. Beautiful images as they head around for the final time. And the last run of cars on the track here today. But of course, over the next two days, we've got plenty more action to come. And, and we'll see more dramas all the way. We saw various dramas in this one, particularly seeing cars retire. That is not something we're not used to here at Goodwood because they are older vehicles, older machines, and often things go wrong just at the a key moment. And it definitely that happened today for Jensen Button and Alex Buncombe. Yeah, it certainly did. And actually, just looking on the timing screen here, a mover in the last couple of laps was the number 77 car. They were in around about seventh place, so they they jumped the, the number three, the Turner and Hatfield car, and also the number 74 of the Hunt and Blakely Edwards car to, to pop up there in, in P4 and still setting personal bests there on the last lap. So OK, that was well Benoit Trebouillet who yeah. was doing that. So he obviously uh, he obviously got to grips very well with that Allard that we were looking at earlier on. Um, so, yeah, well spotted. So, yeah, they got up into fourth place, Nick Jarvis and Benoit Trebouillet. A very, very impressive run, but they just missed, they did miss out on the podium, I'm afraid. They didn't quite come together for them. And there we go then, Richard Bradley getting a lovely celebration as he heads back towards the pits. And we'll, uh, well, he'll actually park out uh, on, I think he'll park out on the grid. Let's have a look. No, he is, is he coming in? Coming yeah, in. he's being told. You go straight on. Yep. You're the winner, mate. <laughs> and there you can see Jake Hill, who's ahead of him on the road, but Jake actually has ended up finishing in second place in the car that you see in the front of the shot, the number 56 car. Uh, that's the car he shared with Gregor Fiskin. They, they did a really great job together. They didn't have quite the pace of the C-Type and of the Maserati, but nonetheless, they, they did extremely well with it. And I think Jake Hill will be very happy to have yep. got a second place finish in the HWM Jaguar. Yeah, it's his first time driving that car this weekend as well. And he's brought it home in a, in a podium, so well done, Jake. And he said he was moving around in the, in the seat in it quite a lot as well, so... Uh, that's not terribly easy in a car it's that's... very small. Yeah, car that's worth sort of into the millions, like so many of these cars are worth. You sort of forget sometimes. But there's Richard Bradley being celebrated and Richard Wilson. What a great combination they made there to take the victory. Well, let's take a look at the result then of the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. And it was the two Richards, Wilson and Bradley, who took victory in the end, even with a 10-second penalty. They won it by nearly 10 seconds from Gregor Fiskin and Jake Hill, with Fred Wakeman and Sam Hancock finishing in third place in the Jaguar C-Type. Benoit Trelouille brought the Allard up into fourth place towards the end there, uh, going ahead of Pat Blakeney-Edwards. Uh, we saw the Darren Turner, Simon Hadfield, uh, Aston Martin finishing in sixth place in the end and the top 10 completed by another lovely group of cars the cooper jaguar ferrari aston, another aston martin db3 and uh the number eight cooper climax the little cooper climaxes that were showing us so well throughout the course of that race finishing in 10th position further down the order the ferrari 250 
MM number 25 car of David Franklin and Emanuele Piro. We didn't really see a great deal of that. And then the number seven Cooper Climax of the Goddards. That was running very strongly in the early part. Not quite so quick in the second part of the race, but nonetheless, it was fun to see. And uh, Andy Middlehurst and Peter Hardman, they ended up finishing it in 16th place in the Jaguar Hansken. That's an, a special, a real one-off there. Uh, that got them into 16th place. So let's take a little look at some of the highlights of the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. And from the line, Alex Buncombe made a very good start. He did, but so did the winning car in the end of Richard Wilson, who sent it right round the outside. Very brave stuff, but it was a, a very clean start, uh, which uh, makes me sound quite surprised, but I was quite surprised. Gregor Fiskin in the number 56 car made up some good places early on as well, and that would help both him and Jake Hill as we got towards the latter stages. It was all daylight uh, when the race started, and it was looking extremely good for Alex Buncombe. He was opening up a huge lead. Yeah, he was. He was cruising, was the out front, uh, a big, strong lead. And here is where the infringement occurred of the, the Richard Wilson car, Richard Bradley car coming in slightly too early. And then we saw Jensen Button hop into the car and they was all going swimmingly, but not for too long, was it, Ben? No, sadly, uh, we thought that this car was going to dominate the whole race. They had such a lead before the pit stops. He maintained a good lead for a while, but then gradually it was being chipped away. Uh, didn't seem to have quite the pace that it had earlier on in the race. And it was then when we were riding on board that we began to realize there were some nasty noises, some misfires coming from the engine and uh, a lot of rattling going on. And that gave the opportunity to Richard Bradley to leap into the lead of the race. At that stage, he thought, oh, I'm in front. And then there was news that he'd got the 10 second penalty. So at that stage, he wasn't still leading, but then we saw the C-type have to retire and this speed against everybody else was plenty more to be able to hold on for victory. Yeah, and a great job. And a great job by Jake Hill as well, who boosted himself up into second place as more battles carried on. But it was Richard Bradley that brought home the Maserati for a t fantastic win. Yeah, well done to them and uh, fully deserve to celebrate the Freddie March Memorial Trophy, our first race at the Goodwill, Goodwood Revival meeting this weekend. And we can hear from the drivers with Ed Foster. Richard and Richard. Wow. Well, let's start with you. A uh, few better places to be than this. Oh, it was just what a fantastic revelt, fantastic race. We had fantastic time. And what, a, what an event to do it at. We're just absolutely over the moon. And Richard, I, you don't often get to chase down a Formula One world champion. No, I, um, we have a, quite a good mutual friend called uh, Kevin Quee in Singapore. And uh, I was thinking, OK, Kevin will enjoy this. So I thought, screw it, I'm going to go for it, you know. And yeah, it was awesome. But they told me that we got a penalty afterwards. I, I had no idea. I thought once I got a gap to the 66, I was like, OK, we'll just manage the car uh, because I was getting brake fade. But yeah, had I known, then I would have put on a bit longer. But yeah, it's, I'm just delighted, absolutely delighted. And, you know, Richard did fantastically well, got the car in a good place at the start very very quick lap times i need to pull my finger out but no it was it was excellent fantastic job guys well done i'm going to squeeze past you because uh, it's it's amazing they're like buses they're all queuing up jake gregor uh, I mean, what a race, Greg. Let's start with quite a busy first few laps. Oh, it was just fantastic out there. I mean, I had best seat in the house. And, uh, you know, there were C-types to the left, HWMs to the right. And it was just a case of, you know, just trying to get your head down. And I could see uh, Richard in the 200S ahead. And I just could see the pit board. And I was just kept on trying to close it down, close it down, having big talks to myself. Now, come on, Gregor, come on, Gregor. And we came in pretty close. And then after the pits, we weren't quite sure where we were. So uh, we're giving Jake here the kind of hurry up board. And then poor old uh, Jensen uh, and, and Chris Buncombe retired. It was a shame. But, you know, it's an endurance race. And you've got to look after your cars over, you know, over an hour. And uh, this young man here had never sat in this car before qualifying today. And he's an absolute, you know, he's looked after the car beautifully. And for Olivia and Jonathan Turner, who own the car, big thanks from both of us. Jake, I was going to say your first race in a 1950 sports car. You'll probably want to do another one now. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, if these guys will have me back, it will be a pleasure, you know. But no, firstly, can't thank the owner, Jonathan, enough for, for agreeing to let me drive this bit of kit alongside this wonderful man next to me. And um, we've just had the best fun. You know, it's just been fantastic. And to come home with a P2 when we thought a podium may be on the cars, but to second, yeah, it's just brilliant. And I can't thank Goodwood enough.
Great job, guys. Well done. Uh, it's, it really is literally like the taxi rank at Heathrow. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for queuing up and waiting. Uh, Fred, yeah, Fred, let's start with you. I mean, um, what, what a climb up the grid. Yeah, that was fantastic. I mean, coming from all the way to the back and finishing at the podium is sort of the dream. And you feel a little bit like a hero when it, you do that. So I'm feeling on top of the moon. As you should, Sam. What, what a second stint, though. It was good fun, really good fun. And actually, as the sun goes down, it's just kind of magical Goodwood. And I'm in a sea type and the car feels nice. And you're thinking, yeah, this is, this is just great. And then the sun goes down a bit further and the light evaporates rapidly. And I have to say, it started to get quite tricky, though. Yeah, uh, it was a bit of a challenge the last couple of laps. Well, fantastic job, guys. Well done. So here we are, another chapter in the car's illustrious life at the Goodwood Members Meeting, the 80th Members Meeting, where we're participating in the 75th anniversary celebrations for Porsche and the 60th anniversary of the 911. I must admit, I've driven a lot of RSRs in my time. I've never driven anything quite like this because of its originality. It feels like it's still got its Lamont gearing in it, and the engine is an absolute delight. In most 911s, you've got time to think. In this car, you look down and it's already turning 8,000 RPM. It's quite amazing. You're never too young to fall in love with classic cars. It's a passion that lasts a lifetime, and it's a passion we share. Backed by over 75 years of motoring experience, Goodwood Classic Solutions is a unique new way to ensure your pride and joy. Goodwood Classic Solutions. It's a passion we share. Wow, just wow. We have been completely spoiled today. What an incredible battle there between the Maserati and the Jaguar. Unfortunately, you know, we feel uh, condolences, I think, to Jensen Button and Alex Buncombe there. But huge congratulations to Richard Bradley and Richard Wilson on the first win of the weekend here at Revival. Um, but guys, you've been out and about all day soaking up this incredible atmosphere. Rosie, what's the highlight been for you? Oh, do you know what? It's just been brilliant. So many fantastic people, some great outfits, but I got to do the Lindy Hop, and that was one of the best moments, I have to say. We're seeing it on the screen now. It was just so much fun. Lovely Mark danced me around for a little bit, and it was just really enjoyable, actually, and the atmosphere down there was a really electric, and they said to me, you know, as soon as people come down here, there's a massive smile on their face. I'm a terrible dancer. Don't put me on Strictly anytime soon, but it was good fun. <laughs> I think you had all the footwork going on there. I don't know, it took a while. For Strictly there. <laughs> um, David, what about yourself? Well, sadly, no hopping for me, but I did really I think that's good for all of us. Yeah, I think it's best thing for all around. But I really enjoyed the Carol Shelby tribute. I just yeah. thought it was fantastic to see all those cars that were associated with that man's life out there. He would have been 100 this year. But looking at that cars, it's always a great celebration of British and American engineering combined, right from that. Uh, MGTC that he raced in Oklahoma in 1952, 1949 car, all the way through to those GT40 winning. Almost reads like a Hollywood film, which oh, of course it, it was. Oh, it really does. And it's just wonderful to, to revisit that moment earlier today. And the good thing is we do get to see it again over the course of the weekend. But I'm sure Carol Shelby is looking down, celebrating his 100th birthday um, and getting stuck into all the fun that we are here at Goodwood Revival. And yeah, you can't beat for me the GT40s. It was the kind of pin-up car uh, that I had on my wall as a child, that kind of epic golf livery that really does encapsulate so much history and heritage. 
but we might be closing today. But the good news is we've got so much action to look forward to tomorrow. Seven races over the course of the day. Uh, we'll be kicking off early doors. Nine o'clock, of course, with the motorcycles. 200 of them taken to the track. Then we've got the seven races. Goodwood Trophy, Barry Sheen Trophy and the St Mary's Trophy, which will take us down to 12.30 followed by the track parade starting again with Carol Shelby at 1.40. Then we have the next race, the Levant Cup, followed by the Rutwich Whitworth Cup, the Ford, the Ford Water Trophy and the Whitson Trophy. And that will take us to the end of an absolutely exhilarating day of historic racing here at Goodwood Revival. Thank you so much for joining us from all four corners of the world. We really do appreciate you watching and tuning in. And for everyone here as well, we hope you've had an incredible day and we cannot wait to see you bright and early tomorrow morning as we kick off Saturday's racing for Goodwood Revival 2023.